Chapter 121 The Powerful Three Prophets I never expected that the prayer of the goddess of justice could also be applied to the goddess of darkness. The kiss of the goddess will drive away the god of death and bring hope of life. The warrior swears blood to honor justice and gain strength and courage. This sounds like a proper and decent god. No wonder these people believe in heretics so easily. These guys are probably convinced that the dark goddess they respect represents justice. Fight for justice? I'm afraid those heretics think so too. They might think that they are the righteous party. Because Astelia, the goddess of justice, has no ability to resurrect those who died in battle. This prayer seems to be more in line with the actual situation when used on the dark goddess. By seeking death on the battlefield, these heretics swore an oath with their own blood. And the dark goddess did drive away the god of death. Gave them hope of life. Made these guys who lost their lives stand up again. And gave them violent strength and the courage to not be afraid of death. However, it probably also deprived them of another thing. These people seem to have lost their minds. In other words, they gave their souls. Godric also saw the scene. And he naturally understood that it would be impossible to maintain a steady confrontation and engage in a war of attrition. The three prophets can actually bring people back to life. Kill them quickly! Godric gave the order with a look of fear on his face. But the soldiers behind him hesitated for a moment. No one had ever seen such a scene. It was so terrifying. Soon, several men tore off a large amount of skin on their bodies, turning them into a pile of red flesh. They picked up the weapons on the ground and began to kill the people around them. But they seemed to have completely lost all consciousness, and they were actually killing their own people together. Leong had just led his men to chop off the heads of two or three fallen ones, and gathered his new recruits into the team. Then he saw several fallen people killing each other, and he immediately asked the team to stop and start to retreat. It seems that the resurrection technology of the three prophets is not very perfect. These fallen ones seem to have no distinction between friend and foe. This is true. If these fallen ones could be completely controlled, then the three prophets would have become the three queens long ago. More and more men in underwear stood up, roared, tore off their skin, and then started fighting each other. These fallen beings who could not distinguish between ourselves and the enemy could not cause any effective damage. But in any case, these fallen ones did scare the Union Army. After all, this kind of thing like resurrecting from the dead and then forming a group to shed its skin seems really scary. Hundreds of devils with only red flesh on their bodies were fighting each other in a state of confusion. The entire battlefield looked like a real H. L. Although the troops of the United Army all come from the border. And the border troops who have fought for a long time are very courageous and courageous. The problem is that the enemies they have faced in the past are basically human beings. Or occasionally they have to deal with a few Nolder Elves. Apart from the fact that the Nolder have longer ears. Looks like a human too. But these people in front of them don't look like humans at all. Not to mention these soldiers. The Lord felt a little guilty when he looked at them. Stay back dot stay back. Avoid them. Don't come here at all. Leon shouted loudly. Stopping the coalition forces who were about to move forward and led the team quickly back to a position where there were no corpses. At present, the soldiers of the Union Army were a little hesitant and did not rush fast. When they heard the Lord shout, most of them stopped. Lord Godric, let the entire army retreat. Seeing that Godric seemed stunned, Leon rushed to Godric and shouted, Don't let the troops pass. They are killing each other. Godric reacted immediately and immediately used the command flag to order the troops to stop advancing and slowly retreat. But when a large force of 1,500 people is advancing and is ordered to retreat, it will definitely disrupt the formation. This is not a modern force that has received long-term formation training, but a mixed force from the five lords. Naturally, it cannot be used as an arm and a finger. Moreover, we had planned to besiege before, so the queue was spread out. Fortunately, the Union Army soldiers hesitated just now. Otherwise, if you rush forward, you won't even be able to take it back. But now, the coalition's formation is still a bit chaotic. At this moment, the prayers that enveloped the battlefield suddenly stopped. The Prophet Legion stopped praying, and their team began to disperse at an incredible speed. From behind the female soldiers, a large group of strange soldiers wearing blue-gray armor rushed out. These were 200 skinned men wearing heavy blue-gray armor, but without any skin on their heads. Perhaps the fire in the camp burned their black cloaks and robes, and they just appeared on the battlefield without wearing helmets. At first glance, apart from wearing armor, they look no different from the fallen ones who are killing each other. If I had to say something different, it might be that the flesh and blood of the fallen 
who had just shed their skin looked brighter. After all, the blood on their bodies was still flowing. As for the heavily armored female soldiers without skin, their heads looked dry reddish brown. But these women were wearing heavy armor. But they ran very fast. They took advantage of the coalition's formation to be disrupted and launched a rapid charge. The heavy armor on their bodies seemed to weigh at least 50 pounds. But they could still charge faster than most adult men. Behind them, the Prophet Legion was divided into more than a hundred squads, with the Doom Bringer as a unit. They dispersed at an unimaginable speed and rushed over behind those skinless, heavily armored female soldiers. The distance between the two sides was only 300 meters, and such a charge only took a few dozen seconds. The coalition's array was not very neat, and it was too late to regroup. Meet the enemy! Hold them off! There were a lot of shouts from the coalition forces. These experienced border troops knew that in this situation, there was no way to retreat, and they had to engage in battle to face the enemy. They had been arrayed as a night squad before, and now they were also in formation to attack head-on. Routes rangers were also divided into more than a dozen formations, and began to parade on both sides. They were horse archers, and their specialty was riding and shooting. It would not be worthwhile to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At this time, Godric's archers were still in a relatively forward position, facing the rapid charge of the Prophet Legion. They only fired two rounds of arrows before they had to retreat. The knight formation stepped forward to resist the charge. The heavily armored Skinner came over. These spontaneous responses were all correct. But the only problem was that as groups of knights faced the enemy head-on, the originally uneven array suddenly became very sparse. And those misfortunes led the female soldiers to run wildly. After the two sides engaged, they did not attack the troops in the front row. Instead, they directly bypassed the heavily armored skin flayer in front of them and passed through the gap in the coalition army. Then, each female soldier team directly faced a knight formation. They obviously wanted to fight the coalition army in a full-scale hand-to-hand combat with the smallest unit. It seems that the Prophet Legion obviously knows that the Fallen will kill each other uncontrollably. Their weird ritual is not for the Fallen to kill the Union army. But for this moment, they first gathered together and waited for the Union army to disperse and surround them. Then let those men in underwear rush over to die. And then summon the Fallen on the battlefield to disrupt the Coalition's formation. Then he took the opportunity to charge and turn the battlefield into a melee. The Three Prophets' ability to adapt to temporary situations is really very strong. Judging from the previous behavior of those doom-inducing ones, the female soldiers of the Prophet Legion are probably not good at fighting in formations. They are not regular soldiers. And they probably have not received formation training. Moreover, including the Doom Bringer, the IQ or knowledge level of those female soldiers should not be too high. They are just good at seducing and deceiving men. Really smart or knowledgeable girls will not be deceived like this. Even with their faces. No more. But judging from the Lord's personal experience, these doom-inducing individuals are indeed very powerful in personal combat and are not afraid of pain. And they are probably not afraid of death either. Judging from their skills and lack of fear of pain or death, the Prophet Legion would definitely be happy to fight a melee. People who don't feel pain may lose the ability to protect themselves from danger. But in a melee, people who don't feel pain are very scary. As long as they are alive, no matter how injured they are, they have 100% combat effectiveness. Moreover, Cultists, who have been brainwashed by heretics must have a terrifyingly high will to fight. Using hundreds of unequipped cannon fodder to achieve such a result must be quite cost-effective for the Prophet Legion. The battlefield suddenly turned into the melee that the Three Prophets wanted. And the response method of the Three Prophets was obviously very effective. A team of six or seven people led by the Doombringer could actually compete with a dozen or so knights in the melee. It's hard to tell the difference between two men. Liang and his team did not disperse and no bad luck attractors came to them. The Doom Inducer targeted those night formations, and no one rushed into his team of hundreds of people for excitement. However, the Lord did not support the other night formations. Instead, he quickly led the team back to Godric to act as a guard to prevent Godric from encountering beheading tactics. Because at this time, there were not many people around Godric, the coach, and only the more than 100 guards led by Amy were protecting Godric. The heavy infantry from White Deer Castle held off the skin monsters. And some rangers and Long River Town sentries were supporting them. All other troops, including Ralph, have already used knights as units to fight fiercely with the teams that have been led by bad luck. It seems fair that this formation of more than a hundred knights is just right against the team led by more than a hundred doombringers. At this time, 
The three prophets were very conspicuous on their tall horses. They stood still and did not get close to the battlefield. They only had about a hundred people behind them. But they were obviously better equipped. It seems that this is the group of close men of the prophet legion who were responsible for organizing the army when the fire broke out and killing the disobedient people. They seemed to be focusing on Godric's flag. But they did not get close. After all, Godric was surrounded by a large force of more than 200 people. Godric also saw the three prophets. Leon, do you think we are confident in dealing with the people around the three prophets? The Lord shook his head directly. I feel that if we rush over, it will only end in a melee. I think so too. Godric then pointed at the skinless female monsters, who didn't know whether they were human beings. Are those wearing heavy armor also fallen? They look like skinned women. Those are the ones I saw in their camp before. They are probably the blood-sworn witches who swore a blood oath to the god of darkness and abandoned their bodies to pray for strength. Leong answered while observing the battlefield situation. But those blood-sworn witches don't seem crazy. Godric looked at the few fallen who were still killing each other. And then at the blood-sworn witches. Those blood-sworn witches are not only not crazy, but they can also patrol in teams and can talk. Maybe they are completely different from these fallen ones. I feel like they are not dead, but alive. If they are alive, then there is nothing to be afraid of. Leon, I am going to kill those blood oath witches. After destroying those heavily armored monsters, the rangers and archers can rule the battlefield. Amy, stay away, Dot Leon. You are responsible for keeping an eye on the three prophets' team. You can also distract them. Don't let them enter the battlefield. Godric seemed to have strengthened his confidence and made a decision, leading the guards to defeat the group of heavily armored female soldiers first. He has also seen that the strongest combat power of the Prophet Legion is the Doombringer and the Bloodsworn Witch. And they are particularly good at individual combat. Each Doombringer is slightly stronger than the average Metenheim Great Swordsman and will definitely have the upper hand against ordinary knights. In fact, almost every one of them is now playing one versus three. Or even more. But they are still not falling behind. The power of the Blood Oath Witches looks extremely terrifying. Their power definitely exceeds clothes and may even be comparable to Alaric, the noisy one that Leon once encountered. It's just that none of the blood-sworn witches wore helmets, and their combat skills were far from those of the Doombringers. However, the heavy armor on their bodies is obviously very defensive, and even the rangers' arrows cannot penetrate it. You know, the bow used by the horn summoning rangers is the famous eagle strike bow. This is a first-class powerful bow. Each one is a treasure heirloom by the members of the rangers. It is not for sale unless you shoot the blood-sworn witches in the head without the protection of their helmets. It will be difficult to injure them. But such a melee situation obviously does not support the rangers and Chunghat town sentries to take careful aim. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, their strength advantage is particularly terrifying. These scary-looking guys hold two-handed sabers, and can often cut through shields with one swing, and can even easily knock away the weapons of infantrymen. There are only more than 200 heavy infantrymen of the Union Army. They are obviously no match for the blood-sworn witches. They can barely resist it now, with the support of some rangers and Chang'e town sentries. Leon also believed that Godric's decision was okay. Except for the blood oath witches. The remaining troops of the Prophet Legion only wore chain armor or leather armor. If we can kill those blood-sworn witches, we can free the horn call rangers and the white deer castle archers from the melee, and then organize long-range firepower to clear the battlefield. The three prophets had been staring at Godric. When they saw Godric leading the team to besiege the Bloodsworn Witches, they also rushed towards Godric's flag. Amy, you go to Chunga Town and ask the garrison to come out of the city to provide support. I will deal with the Three Prophets' troops. The Lord Lord looked at the positions of the Three Prophets opposite. It stands to reason that the Chunga Town garrison can see the situation here. Ask them why they don't go to war. Indeed, the figures on the walls of Chunga Town can be seen here. In fact, they can barely be seen from a distance of about four miles. But they cannot be seen clearly. Besides, the previous fire was so obvious. But Chang'e Town has never had any troops leave the city to receive reinforcements. Amy knew that Leong did not want her to be put in danger. And she was not the kind of willful girl. After nodding to express her understanding, she took a few guards and rode in a large circle, avoiding the battlefield and heading to Chang'e Town. And Leong led the team in an arc blocking the three prophets before they were about to join the battle group. Brothers, shoot your arrows! The Lord would not charge foolishly. From a distance of nearly a hundred meters, he began to let the archer shoot arrows. 
such a long distance would definitely not produce any effective results. But it successfully attracted the attention of the three prophets. There are more than a dozen doom bringers under the three prophets. And the other more than 80 confident female soldiers also look calm and indifferent. They are obviously their elite troops. There are about a hundred people on both sides. And they seem to be evenly matched. However, these women are neither afraid of death nor pain. And their fighting ability cannot be treated by common sense. So Liang does not intend to fight head on. He just wanted to hold them back. However, there are only three prophets and those doom bringers riding fast horses. Those female confidants are all infantry archers. If they can be separated, maybe they can also fight? After the three prophets noticed that Liang's team was releasing arrows, they indeed launched a fierce charge against them immediately. The three prophets went into battle in person and rushed over with the doom-inducing ones. Are you so direct? Brothers, stay back. The Lord led the team and ran away, looking back while running, planning to retreat a short distance first, and then try to besiege the three prophets. But then, he saw a terrifying scene. It was a knight, probably one of Godric's men. After he had just dealt with a doom bringer, he also noticed the three prophets. While the three prophets were charging at Liang and their attention was not on him, the knight held a lance and charged at one of the prophets from the side. But after seeing him, the prophet holding a huge broad-bladed sword just waved his hand. And the knight who had rushed in front of her was knocked away by the sword. Yes, this heavily armed knight was sent flying several meters by the sword. Blood sprayed in the air and splattered on the prophet's armor. But the knight's death didn't even make the prophet stop charging. It seemed like he killed a mosquito casually. This kind of fighting power is so terrifying that Liang feels that he is definitely no match. Note some values in the game for reference. Human limit strength, 39, this is the strength of an adventure hero. The book assumes that close is close to 39, which is the limit of human beings. The strength of ordinary knights, that is, the top arms, is between 24 to 27. Bloodsworn which power, 57. The lowest level of fallen power, 57, as long as it is a fallen nature. The power is 57 or above. Power of the three prophets, 138, this is the highest power data in the entire game. In fact, the panel data of the three prophets is also the strongest in the entire game. With a full proficiency of 650, and a standard dragon bone axe these three witches can the unparalleled ones in the player's team are actually more powerful when dismounted than when mounted. Chapter 122 Settled in Chang'e Town The prophet's combat power seemed to be beyond the reach of human beings. No normal person could take down a 2 to 300 pound knight with a single wave of his hand. The huge broad bladed knife in her hand, which was two and a half meters long, emitted a strange light in the sunlight. There was no trace of blood on the blade, and it looked absolutely extraordinary. Her dark red armor began to show signs of strangeness after being soaked in blood. The lining of the armor seemed to be trembling. It looks like pouring a ladle of hot oil on a piece of fresh meat. Then the armors revealed their true form. It was dark red flesh, intertwined with gray bones, forming a strange texture. The bloody flesh and bones swayed slightly in the sunlight, and it felt like the flesh and blood were alive. That is armor made of flesh and blood. In other words, it was not armor at all. It should be regarded as some kind of witchcraft item made by the three prophets using human flesh and bones. It may look like a gorgeous red armor at ordinary times. But once it is stained with blood, you will see its original bloody appearance. The Lord was obviously frightened. He gritted his teeth and took out an arrow, turned around and shot it. The arrow passed through a distance of tens of meters and accurately pierced the chest of the prophet. But it only pierced lightly and fell off with the prophet's caress. Is the defense so high? The prophet is charging towards the arrows. But he can't even hit them? The Lord's heart sank. He finally knew what the moth was caused by the voice of the goddess of justice Astalia. The three prophets not only have outstanding deception and adaptability, but their own fighting power is also so powerful. This is no longer a witch. This is completely a female ghost. No wonder they didn't retreat even after the whole camp was burned down. There was no need to retreat at all. I originally thought I could fight them if they were separated from each other. But now it seems that it would be better if I don't risk my own life. But the horses of the three prophets were very fast. And most of Liang's team were infantry. So running like this was definitely not an option. The Lord gritted his teeth. Slowed down Alice's pace. Turned around and stopped. Stop! Spread out and attack! There is no other way. Running is not possible. Take advantage of the fact that there are only three prophets and a dozen doom bringers rushing over now. 
let's try to swarm them. Although the outcome is unpredictable, and the losses are bound to be huge. We can only give it a try anyway. Looking at the three prophets coming towards him, the Lord took off the lance on the hook. This was the one, gifted to him by King Ulrich. I wonder if all living beings are still equal under the gun this time. Seeing Leong raise his lance. The thirty cavalrymen also raised their lances, turned their horses, and prepared to follow their boss in a countercharge. Cavalry prepare! Hoo dot hoo Just when Leong was about to launch a counterattack, the whistles of the Owl Knight suddenly sounded from far behind. But the three prophets, who were charging in front of them, actually slowed down their horses, then made a small circle and retreated with the bad luck attractors. Leon turned around. And a few hundred meters away, the team that set fire to Baron Leofric came back. What a perfect time to come back. Although there are only more than 200 lightly armed soldiers on draft horses. At this moment, Leofric's team has become the key to victory or defeat. Their draft horses are obviously not suitable for combat. In fact, Leofric may not know much about the current situation. But in the eyes of the Prophet Legion, this is a cavalry force of nearly 300 people. If this is really a 300-man Lion Realm cavalry, as long as it enters the battlefield, the Prophet Legion in the melee will most likely be destroyed. Maybe it's because you haven't been deceived in front of the goddess recently. The Lord feels that his luck has improved? The three prophets obviously stopped charging after seeing this cavalry team. Even if they were female ghosts, they were probably not strong enough to dare to fight with 20 people against 300 cavalry. Just after the three prophets rejoined the ranks of their trusted female soldiers, a sharp voice, like a ghost's cry, rang out. Squeak. It was like the sound of metal being rubbed hard. It was extremely harsh and disturbing. That should be the order for the Prophet Legion to withdraw its troops. Just after this harsh sound sounded, the team of blood sworn witches launched a violent charge. They seemed to have completely lost their minds and no longer cared about their own lives. They rushed madly towards each doom inducing squad, as if they wanted to free the female soldiers trapped in the melee. Their strength was so astonishing. And the incident happened so suddenly that hundreds of soldiers around them were unable to stop them. Subsequently, under the support of these crazy blood sworn witches, the Doombringers of the Prophet Legion led the team away from the battlefield and quickly retreated to the position of the three prophets. But in this kind of melee, only a little more than half can successfully withdraw from the battle group. Many female soldiers are completely trapped in the melee, and even with the support of the Blood Oath Witch, they cannot escape at all. The blood sworn witches who forced the attack suffered even greater losses. Only a few dozen were able to successfully retreat. And most of the others had their heads chopped off. They would rather suffer huge losses than forcefully withdraw their troops and assemble. The three prophets were obviously worried about being forcibly attacked by this cavalry regiment. And they obviously paid more attention to their own safety. But his family knew what was going on. Godric also saw Leofric's team. He knew very well that this cavalry on draft horses could not fight at all. So he did not order a pursuit, but led the team to clean up quickly. Kill all enemies still on the battlefield. Leon also immediately led the team to clean up the remaining enemies. It is true that none of these female soldiers will surrender. They will all fight silently until death, which is quite difficult to deal with. Moreover, after discovering that they could not withdraw from the battlefield, some of the trapped doombringers also went crazy like the blood-sworn witches. They suddenly burst out with the same strength as the blood-sworn witches and then began to fight regardless of life and death. But this sudden burst seemed to come at a price. They gained amazing power, but seemed to have lost their original dexterity and wisdom. They no longer dodge or move around, or even defend themselves. Although they did cause a lot of casualties to the coalition forces quickly, they were also besieged and killed faster. After clearing away the female soldiers trapped on the battlefield, the coalition forces regrouped. After what he had just experienced, Godric would never let the army disperse again. Facing these women, fighting in formation was the way to go. Not long after, the battlefield gradually calmed down. The Prophet Legion lost more than 300 people, which was one third of their strength. Currently, there are still about 60 blood sworn witches, 100 doom bringers, and more than 500 female soldiers. As for the Union army, more than 200 people were killed in battle. And with the addition of about 300 casualties, the battle loss has reached one-third. No one is seeking any benefits. In fact, if the fight continues in such a chaotic manner, the Union Army will be the first to collapse. No matter how elite the human army is, it is impossible to maintain extremely high morale despite increasing battle losses. Sooner or later, it will reach a critical point 
unless they have firm revolutionary beliefs. What is happening now is that the troops with firm beliefs are these heretical witches. They looked like they would fight to the end even if they fought to the last drop, which the Union Army couldn't do. But now, the Prophet Army has gathered around the three prophets to form a circular formation. The blood sworn which in heavy armor stood in the front row, while the female confidants held long handled knives and stood in a dense array. The other women were in the middle, holding bows and arrows in their hands. Obviously, this is a purely defensive form, and it seems that the long handled sword is used to defend against cavalry assault. It seems that the Prophet Legion also knows some simple battle formations. But judging from their equipment, the formations they can use are limited to this. Look at this. Are they worried about us using cavalry to charge into the battle? Do they think Leofric is bringing lancers? Godric also saw this situation. But in fact there were not many traditional cavalry from the Lion Realm in the coalition lineup. Ralph's rangers are heavily armored horse archers. Although they can charge like the knights of the Lion Realm. They use spears and bows instead of lances. The length of the war spear is not even as long as the long-handled knife in the hands of the prophet's cronies. Except for the specially made extended war spear in Ralph's hand. Other rangers may not be able to gain favor if they rush forward. In fact, the war spear was originally used to deal with the lance rangers who had been fighting against the Jata people for a long time. The relatively short but more flexible war spear was a close quarters weapon specially used to fight against the Jata lancers and was not used to perform lance thrusts. The knights under Godric and Leofric are all traditional noble knights from the Lion Realm, but they are not many in number. Excluding casualties, there are only about 40 of them. Moreover, these knights are grassroots lords. Once they die, the troops they bring will probably no longer obey their orders. Liang's cavalry can be regarded as traditional lancers, but the number is too small. The others are all infantry and archers. As for the nearly 300 guys on draft horses that Leofric is bringing with him now, these are just the soldiers he brought before to escort grain and grass. Most of them are not cavalry, but they can drive and ride horses. Therefore, the coalition army could not use cavalry to charge into the formation. But the Prophet Legion did not know this situation. They thought that all the cavalry brought by Leofric were Lion Realm cavalry. So they could only form a defensive formation. With the horn summoning the rangers of the ranger regiment watching, the Prophet regiment did not dare to retreat directly and would definitely be pursued by the tail. It would be very miserable to be pursued by the mounted archers. The battle just now demonstrated the powerful combat effectiveness of the Prophet Legion. So Godric did not dare to attack directly. As a result, both sides formed an array to confront each other several hundred meters apart. And no one acted rashly. The battlefield formed a strange confrontation. If there weren't corpses and blood all over the ground, those who didn't know would have thought that there was no fighting at all. If the war really didn't start, then this situation must be in line with the Lord's wishes. The camp and food of the Prophet Legion were burned down, and they had no supplies. However, both Leon and Godric are not sure whether they still need to eat. The Dark Goddess can even resurrect from the dead. What if she can also achieve the freedom of living without food? If this continues, will there be other dead people turned into corrupted ones by them? After all, it seems that a lot of people have died near their camp. It was Close who spoke. Yes. The Lord also thought that when the two sides approached before, the Prophet Legion was reorganizing their army, and they could be seen from a distance slashing and killing the noisy men. But why didn't any fallen get up near the burning camp when they were praying just now? In other words, they can't create degenerates at will? At this time, Sarah answered, Probably not. Only those who believe in the Dark Goddess can become corrupted. What I mean is that you must dedicate your soul and flesh to the Dark Goddess in order to obtain the so-called power. Moreover, without sacrificing souls in the altar, those fallen ones are of little use. You have also seen that they will kill each other. Sarah, have you seen these heretics? Leon was a little surprised. Then you didn't tell me about it before? I've never seen a fallen person before Dot, and it's not a glorious thing. When I was in Cliff Bay many years ago, I was almost tricked into becoming a follower of the Dark Goddess. Sarah shook her head. A rare expression of shyness appeared on Anson's face and it was really unbelievable to see it on Sarah's face. Deceived? Leon looked at Sarah in surprise. You? Being deceived by others? You didn't say the opposite. Did you? Sir, everyone has times when they are young and ignorant. Sarah's tone was a little low. I was only 18 years old at the time. Not long after I left my hometown, I fell in love with a knight I shouldn't have liked. He was a believer in the goddess of justice. And he was a decent person. Because of him, 
I also, I became a follower of Astalia. But you didn't expect that a bard like me actually worships the goddess of justice. He taught me swordsmanship and once took me to an elf girl's auction. But that was the last time I was with him. And he suddenly disappeared after that. I thought he had abandoned me. Later in the pub, I met a woman who said he was a playboy and fell in love with someone else. She said she could take me to him. I was so naive at the time that I believed her. Then I was taken to the swamp north of the mystery castle, where there was a hidden lair. There I heard the prayer of the Lady of Justice. This was a prayer he often recited, and I believed that he was indeed here. Here. But I didn't expect that it was a heretical group that seduced girls. What they believe in is the dark goddess Arida. I saw their altar. I knew that heretic believers would obtain power by sacrificing flesh and blood. So I was prepared. There. I learned that the dark goddess Arida has no entity. No fixed appearance. And her statue has no face. Heretic after the fanatics peel off their skin. The power of the dark god can be added to them. Of course. This is just what I heard there. I had never seen a heresy like the blood oath witch at that time. Nor could I see it with my own eyes. Seeing their rituals. Because I escaped quickly after seeing the altar full of flesh and blood. After all. I'm not the kind of ignorant girl who doesn't understand anything. Sarah smiled bitterly and looked at the Lord. It's just that at that time. My mind was full of that man. So I didn't observe it too carefully. Later, I traveled around. And I actually wanted to find him. But now it seems that I have met him. The heretical group that arrived is probably helping the three prophets find followers. Leon sighed. Sarah, the gang you met may not be looking for believers because of your appearance. I think they are probably looking for skins. Fortunately, you escaped. Otherwise, what we are seeing now are the three prophets. I'm afraid one of them will look like you. Sarah gasped. This is indeed possible. But what should we do now? It's not okay to waste it like this. If we continue to waste it, the morale of our team may become lower and lower. After all, we haven't slept all night. We are not sure about attacking. But I don't think so. Let them run away. Leon, do you have any ideas? The one who spoke was Godric, who had joined Liang's team at some point. We really can't let the three prophets run away like this. With their abilities. As long as they are not dead. They will probably come back soon. It is nothing more than reorganizing a pig-killing plate of seduction and brainwashing. Since the Prophet Legion is worried about our cavalry, let Baron Leofric and the Rangers work harder and keep an eye on them from a few hundred meters away. Let's lead the other troops to Chang'e Town. They won't do it anyway. It's very likely that the main force has launched an attack. With a large number of cavalry watching, they definitely don't dare to retreat like that. The Lord felt that it was easier to deal with now. At least he knew what the enemy was afraid of. And the three prophets were obviously no longer able to summon the fallen. But we must first strengthen the soldiers' confidence. Sarah, go and tell the soldiers that these are the most evil devils. Their skins come from the women and children they killed. And their wealth comes from the knights who were deceived. Their armor and strength come from the flesh and blood of the villagers. If we fail to kill them here, no one in the surrounding villages will be able to escape their clutches in the future. We must fight them to the end. You know what to say. Leong turned around and looked at the soldiers behind him and motioned Sarah to go to the team to promote it first. Godric also recruited Ralph and Charles and asked them to lead the rangers to popularize the horror of the Prophet Legion in the Union Army. Afterwards, the Union Army divided into two groups. The large army maintained its formation with the wounded and began to slowly advance towards Lona Town. Leofric took his cavalry to clean the battlefield and Ralph's rangers patrolling behind the Legion of Prophets. The Prophet Legion did not move in the circular formation, and just watched as the infantry array of the Union Army kept a distance of about 300 meters and bypassed them. Both sides were on guard and no one took action. The Union Army advanced slowly and cautiously, watching the Prophet Legion slowly move. It took more than an hour to move four miles and arrive outside Chunga Town. Entering the city went smoothly, as Amy had been negotiating with the garrison before. However, as soon as he entered the city, the Lord saw Amy coming over angrily. Teacher, these guys are too selfish and don't want to fight at all. It won't be troublesome at all to let you enter the city. Chapter 123 This is how business is discussed. There are still nearly a thousand garrison troops in Chungha town at this moment, including 300 real Lion Realm cavalry. They did express a very sincere welcome to the arrival of the coalition forces. With just a fire, the situation was completely reversed. Chungha town was already safe. And of course, 
they would welcome reinforcements. They did not express any objection to Godric's offer to temporarily take over the defense of Long River Town. After all, Godric was the king's brother-in-law. He brought a large number of elite troops to the rescue and even defeated the enemy. And now that the governor of Chongha Town is away, it is appropriate for Baron Godric to temporarily take over the defense at this time. However, although these garrison troops were very polite, none of them were willing to go out of the city to fight. It's not that they are afraid of death, but it's not good for them to go out to fight in the city, because they were soldiers brought by the Duke of Alma from Lion Lake City. These guys previously told Amy that their duty was to guard Chang'e Town. And if the Prophet Legion attacked, they would definitely fight to the death. But if the enemy does not attack Chang'e Town, or if the enemy wants to retreat, that would be the best. This is what the commander of the Fierce Lion Realm Cavalry said. These garrisons are all under the Duke of Alma. For them, as long as nothing happens to Chang'e Town, it will be fine. As for whether the Prophet Legion will run away or harm other villages, it has nothing to do with them. It is actually normal for them to have this mentality. After all, they are not from Chang'e Town. They were just arranged by the Duke of Alma to take over the defense of Chang'e Town a few months ago. As a garrison, it is their responsibility to guard Chang'e Town. But other than that, they have no local feelings for this area. This is why Liang must let Godric gain military control of Chang'e Town. Alma's people will not care about the life and death of other people in the eastern region. This has nothing to do with their own character. If they fail to defend the city, they will definitely be responsible. And the Duke of Alma will not spare them. So they will naturally fight tooth and nail. But if they were fighting out of the city, winning would not be of much benefit to them. And once larger casualties were caused, the leading knight would have to bear the responsibility. So they would definitely not be willing to go out of the city. In fact, most nobles don't care about other people's territories. There are only a few nobles who are as willing to consider the overall safety as Godric and Leofric. In fact, if the entire Chang'e town garrison were dispatched to fight out of the city, they would definitely be able to win in one battle under the current circumstances. Even if they didn't dare to dispatch their entire army, relying on this fierce Lion Realm cavalry alone could completely put the Prophet Legion in a dilemma. Judging from the current situation, as long as there are enough cavalry troops watching outside the city, the three prophets will definitely not dare to retreat easily. As long as they have the slightest intention to retreat, the cavalry can rush into the formation, at least to hold them back, and then the army will have time to fight out from Chang'e Town. The prophet army will be trapped under the city and cannot move, unless the three prophets are willing to leave all the female soldiers alone and lead the doom-inducing ones to escape directly. Even then, they may not be able to escape. But the problem is that those Lion Realm Cavalry are not even willing to go out of the city to replace the rangers who have not slept all night. Not to mention Amy's request. Even Godric's request was rejected by the leading knight. Now we can only let Ralph's rangers work harder and cooperate with Baron Leofric to hold on for a few more hours and keep an eye on the Prophet Legion so that the large army can have a good sleep. Godric was still calm and ignored the cavalry. He only issued an announcement throughout the city indicating that he would temporarily take over Chang'e Town. But he still couldn't help but sigh. It's because every great lord's troops have this mentality that these heretics can run rampant in Pender. They are all selfish guys. However, Leon didn't want to just let it go. Lord Godric, they just don't see the benefits. Don't worry. If I knew it most, they will have their entire army out of the city to fight. After saying that, the lord took Amy directly into the largest tavern in Chang'e Town. The Adventurer Tavern. Amy, go to the garrison camp and invite the leading knight. Tell him that Baron Leong, the chairman of my Xiang group, invited him to drink and ask for his help. Teacher, do you want to convince him? But they do have reasons not to go out of the city to fight. After all, Amy is too young and has not yet learned to see through phenomena to see the essence. It's okay. Just call someone over. I have to put on some drama. As the Lord spoke, he approached the tavern owner and said, Boss, you have a private room here. Right. Let's have a sumptuous dinner. Whatever is the most expensive here will be served to you. The tavern owner burst out laughing when he heard this. Yes. Yes. Sir. Please come this way. The so-called box is actually the boss's own room. But it doesn't matter. Treating guests to dinner is not the purpose anyway. As long as it looks good, it'll be fine. Not long after, the leading knight who had previously refused to fight was brought into the box by Amy. He had to come out of the city to fight, and he could refuse. 
but it was hard for him to refuse a dinner invitation from an official baron. Moreover, it was an eldest lady like Amy who came to invite her in person, which gave her enough face. It would be foolish not to come. However, as soon as he entered the door, he almost ran away. Ten strong men from Mettenheim stood in a circle in the box, leaning against the wall, all surrounding a large round table with expressionless faces. There was only one young nobleman sitting at the round table, but the table was indeed filled with all kinds of wine and food. As soon as he entered, close at the door closed the door and leaned against it, obviously not intending to let him out. This looks like a scene for the underworld to scare people. The knight's head started to sweat. He came to the banquet and didn't even bring a decent weapon with him. This, Baron, what can I do for you? This knight was still a bit brave, seeing Close blocking the door with an expressionless face. He turned around and asked the Lord, appearing quite calm, but his tone was obviously not as harsh as when he refused to fight just now. However, the Lord's attitude seemed very gentle. Please sit down. Sir Knight, don't be nervous. I'm just asking for a favor. You seem to be sweating? Are you very hot? Who wouldn't be a little sweaty in this scene? The knight couldn't figure out the lord's intention. So he sat down a little awkwardly. But his movements were a bit stiff. And only one third of his buttocks were in contact with the chair. Amy also sat next to the lord and began to observe and study. You should already know Amy. But you may not know who I am yet. My name is Leong. The chairman of my Xiang International. Amy is my partner. The lord's attitude was gentle. But his tone was cold and his eyes were slanted. As he spoke, he reached out to pour a glass of wine and handed it to the knight. The knight took the cup, but did not drink it. He put it on the table and asked the lord with a frown. Sir, you might as well say it directly. I know I have offended a few adults today, but we do have reasons not to go to war. Li Angpi twitched his lips with a smile. Don't get me wrong. I understand you, and I'm not here to trouble you. In fact, I want to talk to you about a business. The knight's frown deepened. Business? I think you should have heard of my Xiang Group's industry. Leon took out a dinar with a smile and bounced it on the table. Just like a gambler placing bets on the table. Um, those dot those casinos are open by you? The knight's face suddenly became a little weird. It seemed that he had also lost money with a certain operator. Businessmen opened many casinos around Shurhu City. The garrison in this era was the largest customer group of casinos. And only a few had never participated in gambling. Since you know my main business, you must also know the strength of my Xiang International. Leong raised his eyebrows. But you may not know what kind of opportunity you almost missed today. The knight was a little restrained by Liang's formation. Of course, he can realize how profitable those casinos are. And the young baron sitting in front of him now is a rich man. The knight's attitude became obviously respectful. This is how humans are. When the other party has a higher social status than themselves and has more wealth than themselves, people will always involuntarily lower their posture. Many people even think it is an honor for a big boss to talk to them on an equal footing. When people have this attitude, it's usually easy to do business. Leon smiled. Casinos can indeed make a lot of money, but this is not the most profitable business in the world. I actually want to open another more profitable business, but I have always lacked resources and no chance. However, today, we have finally found enough resources. Having said this, the Lord Lord showed a greasy smile. The knight was stunned for a moment. And then he showed the same smile. Sir, you are thinking. Yes, you know, I actually really want to open a service business. I even thought about the name of the new business and called it Heaven and Earth. What do you think of this name? Leong raised his eyebrows. With an even more disgusting smile on his face. Isn't it just right that it can be connected to the south and the north of Chiao and Bay? He he he. This knight looks very experienced and he is probably an expert in Feng Yu field. Originally, I didn't have much resources, but now there are at least five to six hundred top beauties out there. If I can get some, I might be able to start this new business right away. Leong touched his chin and said, Lord Leong, that's a heretic witch. The knight was shocked, obviously not expecting that the Lord was plotting against the three prophets. I don't believe you have no idea about those beautiful heretics. Leong glanced at the knight. Besides, why do you think we came here with our troops? Do you think we are simply here to rescue Chang'e town? The Duke of Alma will not give me any benefits. That's true. They do look tempting. The knight himself also felt that it was unlikely that the reinforcements came specifically to rescue Chang'e town. After all, the reinforcements came so quickly, 
and the Prophet Legion had not yet attacked Changha Town. The big troops are coming. That's why I came to you. I have too few troops to do anything with those women. Most of Lord Godric's troops are archers. And it's difficult to capture them. But you have thousands of troops here. Plus the army brought by Lord Godric must be enough to capture those women. I am willing to pay a very high price to buy 20 Doom Inducers. I will pay 3,000 dinars for each Doom Inducer. I only accept 20. First come, first served. Leon offered an irresistible price. 3,000 dinars for a Doom Inducer prisoner of war. This kind of price. Let alone seen it before. This knight has never even heard of it. This is not an older elf. Just a heretical witch. You know, 3,000 dinars can buy a dozen sets of ordinary standard equipment. Or, you can buy dozens or even hundreds of strong slaves. Or, you can buy a huge manor in the hinterland of the kingdom. The kind with hundreds of acres of land. 3,000 dinars is a huge sum of money that most knights cannot save in a lifetime. And it is enough for a person to have enough food and clothing for a lifetime. And the wealthy man in front of him wanted to buy 20 of them. Leon could see that the knight's breathing suddenly became rapid. So, he added another price. If I can capture any one of the three prophets, I can pay 50,000 dinars. I believe many people will be interested in these three prophets. They will let me the new business became a success overnight. As for the other female soldiers, it depends on their quality. But at the lowest, I can pay five times the market price. The knight immediately expressed his strong interest in this big business of buying and selling heretics. Lord Leon, I think your business will be started soon. I understand what you mean. Then he picked up the wine glass on the table and drank it in one gulp. After finishing the drink, he bowed to Amy. I'm sorry, Miss Amy. I didn't expect this reason. If you had told me this earlier, I wouldn't have offended you. Leon knocked on the table. Amy is a girl. How can she mention this business in public? Now you understand the matter. I will let Amy wait here. And when she sees the goods I want, she will pay. Don't worry. Sir, you will definitely make a lot of money. After saying that, he stood up and left. Probably because he couldn't wait to do business. Leon smiled. As long as you find the right direction, there is no one who can't control you. Amy was still a little confused. Teacher, you don't really want to create a heaven and earth. Do you? The Lord curled his lips. How is that possible? Dot am I like that kind of person? Amy sighed, but did not say the word like. After all, actually, you could also directly use money to lure them to fight. Why do you want to engage in such a scene? She pointed to the food on the table. Amy, if you want to drive someone you don't know, you must first make him willing to listen to you. And making people willing to listen to you carefully and develop a submissive attitude is much more important than the content of your words. I want him to know that I am rich. And I also need to let him know that I have a good reason for being willing to pay. So that he will believe that I can really pay a big price. If there were no such scenes to create an environment, he would probably reject me outright. By then, it would not be easy to talk to him again. Besides, these things won't go to waste. Brothers, come on. Let's have a good meal. The strong men of Mettenheim immediately sat down at the table with smiles on their faces. They couldn't wait for it. Leong and Amy quickly grabbed a chicken leg and fled the room as fast as they could. Neither of them wanted to eat in a pig pen. Just a few hours later, at noon that day, all the leading knights in the Changha town garrison collectively asked Godric for a tassel, expressing their intention to fight to the death with the Prophet Legion. There are even a few mercenary groups who don't know where they came from, and they claim to eliminate evil and eliminate heresy for the people. Leon even took a nap after eating and drinking. As soon as he came back with a yawn, he heard Baron Godric say in a happy mood, You are all heroes of justice. These heretics will definitely be destroyed today. Then Godric waved his hand. The whole army goes out to fight. There are thousands of garrisons. And together there are enough soldiers to fight against the enemy. Except for Ralph's rangers and Leofric's. Drawing horse cavalry who need to retreat from the battlefield to catch up on their sleep. All the combat forces of Longha Town have been deployed. This is an army of more than 2,000 people, for times the current number of the Prophet Legion. And they are all highly motivated and fighting spirit. Godric was also preparing to leave the city with his own guards. When passing by the Lord, he asked, Sure enough, people die for money. But if they can really capture many heretics, will you really let Amy pay? Leon smiled and whispered, Capture the heretics? Those women are not afraid of death at all. How to capture them? Those misfortune inducers can't even feel pain. 
Want to capture them? This is harder than capturing the Nolder Elves. As for the prisoners, if someone really has this ability among the three prophets, then I will definitely be willing to pay money to be friends with such a hero. After saying that, he went up to the city wall and lay down on the wall, intending to observe before leaving the city. The prophet legion, which had not moved for a long time, finally took action. After discovering that the army had left the city, they dispersed into dozens of squads. The Blood Oath Witches were also divided into various squads, with about seven or eight people in each team. These teams spread out in all directions, apparently trying to break out. The three prophets were still together. They fled westward with dozens of doom-inducing people, and their attitude was quite decisive. Are you abandoning the other female soldiers and running away? Leon stood up in surprise. If these three prophets wanted to run away, wouldn't it be more appropriate to retreat directly when the large army entered the city? Although there are so many cavalry watching all the time, they will also suffer huge losses if they retreat. But at least it is much better than facing the army now. Moreover, the coalition forces also got a few hours of rest. How could the three prophets make such a decision? But it didn't take long for the Lord to realize that the three prophets' decision to run away was actually the right one. They were afraid of being chased by the rangers before. But now the rangers had gone to the city to rest. So they wanted to take this opportunity to run away. Indeed, being chased by a large number of mounted archers is the most terrifying thing. Those doom-inducing ones are themselves mounted archers. And they probably know this well. Anyway, for the three prophets, as long as they decide to run away, they must give up those female infantry soldiers. No matter when they run, the price is the same. Since there is no difference in the price paid, then when the rangers are not on the battlefield, the three prophets themselves will indeed have a higher chance of successfully escaping. But, but, but the three prophets certainly didn't expect that the Lord would buy them at a high price. Under the temptation of the Lord's huge sum of money, the Lion Realm cavalry and mercenary groups all pursued them. The three prophets only brought a few dozen doombringers. There were not many of them, and they all happened to be bought by Lord Leong at a high price. Type of Cargo These Lion Realm cavalry do not have the mounted shooting capabilities of the rangers, but they now have the firm determination to chase the dinar. Therefore, their pursuit became more targeted. They completely ignored the female soldiers who broke out in all directions and went straight towards the three prophets with a very clear target. Weird things in Penn's game, LSP's thoughts. When the prophetic crumbs encounter the prophet legion or the prophet patrol, they will always take the risk of being shot and explode and use blunt weapons to knock out the prophet's henchmen and female soldiers. After knocking the prisoners unconscious, they always uncharacteristically do not package them up and sell them to Ramon but instead recruit them into the team against all opinions. Honestly, have you ever done this? Chapter 120 for the special function of the New Year Sword Technique When the Lord led the team out of Changha Town, the three prophets could no longer be seen. The three prophets were running very fast with the Doombringers. Their horses were all light and fast horses. When they made up their minds to escape, they did not care about their horsepower at all, and disappeared after a minute or two. However, the Lord felt that they still couldn't escape, because the Lion Realm Cavalry and the mercenary groups have been chasing closely, and the members of the Owl Knights scattered around have also been using whistles to send messages. Although they are both riding horses, there are differences between horses. In the Prophet's Legion, the horses that the Doombringers ride are probably provided to them by the Knights and deserters who follow the Prophet. They are all thoroughbred hunting horses that are relatively fast over short distances. This kind of war horse is actually a very delicate war tool, which is completely different from the Jata horse. Although there is a groom named Drash in the territory who is responsible for raising horses, Alice has always been fed by the Lord himself. And Leon knows this very well. Those Gatam horses that Drash feeds are somewhat similar to Mongolian horses. Gatuma is not tall. With a shoulder height of only 1.3 meters and a weight of 700 to 800 pounds, he is considered small among Mali, and has a very docile personality. This kind of horse has a strong constitution. Thick coat, is not afraid of cold, and is not selective about food. Moreover, they run very fast, and have excellent endurance. They don't even need to feed or drink during long journeys. This is a typical nomadic horse. A model of hard work and hard work. They can almost just eat grass. And they can ride on horses, and pull carts to carry goods. They can do any kind of work, which has many advantages. But Jata horses also have shortcomings. They are relatively small in size and are not convenient for equipping with horse armor. 
They are also not suitable for the heavy armored knights of Pinder to charge into battle. Therefore, the Jata people usually use their speed and long endurance to carry out mounted shooting to defeat the enemy. Those Jata war riders who use lances to charge into battle do not wear heavy equipment. At the same time, they always lower their heads to look for grass and don't look powerful at all. If you use a car as an example, this is like a certain Hongwang, who can do any job, has no requirements on the grade of oil, and can run extremely fast on any road. It just doesn't look cool in appearance. And its explosive power isn't that strong when running at high speeds. The thoroughbred hunting horses ridden by the Doombringers are very similar to thoroughbred horses. Such a horse is tall and elegant, with strong explosive power and impact. The shoulder height can reach more than 1.5 meters. The throat and neck are also relatively long. It looks beautiful with its head raised and chest raised. Well-bred hunting horses are very fast in short and medium distances and good-looking. They are indeed very suitable for these plastic surgery women who have been fishing for success for a long time. However, this kind of horse has very low endurance and has high food requirements. A war horse needs to eat more than 10 pounds of grain horse feed such as oats, beans, etc. every day. And a few eggs must be mixed in if possible. If you don't feed them well, these big guys may go on strike. This kind of horse is more suitable for riding in the arena, socializing with nobles, or hunting. After all, it looks elegant and respectable. If we still use the car analogy, this is like some so-called luxury car brands that are loved by green tea people. They need to use higher grade oil. They have small space, poor horsepower, and poor battery life. It just looks outstanding and the brand's social value is relatively high. This is why the Horn Call Rangers have been introducing Jata horses in the hope of improving the mainland horse breed. The Chungha Town gelding they improved is a hybrid of mainland horses and nomadic horses, and has the advantages of both. However, this kind of hybrid horse with great advantages must be castrated from an early age before it can be used as a war horse. Otherwise, it will not only not grow taller, but also be very irritable and disobedient. This can be considered a gain and a loss. Nothing in this world is perfect. This is like some domestically produced cars with relatively good quality that have combined the advantages of all parties after a joint venture. The workmanship may be a little rough and some things have been emasculated, but the configuration is very good and the overall cost performance is very high. The reason why the three prophets waited for Ralph's rangers to enter Chang'e town to rest before running away was probably because they thought they might not be able to escape under the pursuit of those endurance-rich Chang'e town geldings. At this time, all the rangers in the original coalition army, including those fake cavalry riding draft horses, all entered Chung'a town to rest. The three prophets probably thought that as long as they ran dozens of miles without any effort, no one would be able to catch up with them. Those misfortune inducers have been fooling around with those nobles for a long time. They must have a good understanding of the mentality of those nobles, and know that the garrison in Chung'a town is not willing to go out to fight in the city. But they didn't expect that the Chang'e town garrison and the mercenary groups would pursue them closely because the Lord paid a big price. In addition, the previous camp of the Prophet Legion was completely burned by a fire, with the granary and stables being the worst burned. The three prophets had not even a single straw left in their hands, let alone grain. Moreover, the Prophet Legion has been on the battlefield without any rest. It might not matter if a person is hungry for two meals, but if these delicate, well bred hunting horses are hungry for two meals, they may not be able to run very far and will have to go on strike. But the Lion Realm Cavalry, who had just come out of Chung'a Town were all well fed and drunk. And their horses were all civilian war horses. Lion Realm Hunting Horses. This kind of horse is a standard war horse between a Jata horse and a thoroughbred horse. Its endurance is better than that of a thoroughbred horse. And its speed and size are not much worse than that of a thoroughbred horse. Moreover, the combat effectiveness of the fierce Lion Realm Cavalry itself is actually very strong. In the Kingdom of Lions, the status of cavalry is much higher than that of infantry. Usually only the best and bravest warriors have the right to mount war horses and fight with lances. The social status of the Lion Realm Cavalry is even comparable to that of the Knight's Retinue. Most of them are warriors who have been trained for a long time. They have very strong fighting power and are generally stronger than those of the Knight's Retinue who have been trained since childhood. Moreover, the Lion Realm Cavalry brought spare horses. They came out to capture prisoners and sell them to the rich. Not just to rush into the battle. The Lion Realm Cavalry all have one person and two horses. There is not much difference in speed between their red hunting horses and the Doombringer's thoroughbred hunting horses. But their endurance is better. The result of the pursuit is obvious. 
Therefore, the Lord felt that the three prophets could not run far and would be besieged soon. The area outside Chungha town has turned into small battlefields. Basically, every team of female soldiers will be beaten by men four times their size. And most of the most powerful doombringers are not around. These female infantry soldiers cannot be beaten or run away. Their fate is already doomed. So, Leon led the team and followed the Owl Knight's return. And leisurely searched westward. This is the road upstream along the Tontian River. It is also a route that Leon is very familiar with. He took this road when he went to Qin village a few days ago. The whistle of hoo 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 has always come from this direction. The people of the Owl Knights have been scattered for dozens of miles around Chungha town. And there are naturally many night owls in the west. With the condition of the horses of the misfortune bringers, they would have to dismount after running for 20 miles at most. So the Lord was not afraid of losing them at all. Sure enough, just an hour later, more than 20 miles west of Chang'e town, he saw the Lion Realm Cavalry and the three prophets fighting together. However, the situation seems a bit strange. Although the three prophets team had less than 80 people, and the cavalry plus the mercenary group had almost 600 people, they actually couldn't handle the three prophets team for a while. The main reason for the uncertainty is not that the three prophets' personal combat effectiveness is too strong. They are indeed powerful. But they cannot defeat one against a hundred in the open wilderness. Moreover, their horses were clearly running out of strength. And several horses seemed to have died on the road. All the Dumbringers had dismounted and were on foot. The three prophets are now on foot. Surrounded and protected by the doom-inducing ones. It is estimated that those mercenaries shot their horses to death. No matter which continent they were in. The trick of shooting people first and shooting horses is still the same. This is also what they will definitely do when chasing the enemy. But now a large group of cavalry, facing dozens of women fighting on foot, failed to gain the upper hand. The main reason was that these Lion Realm cavalry and mercenary groups were reluctant to kill them. The three prophets cost 50,000 each, and the Doombringer cost 3,000 each. But they will definitely not be sold if they die. As a result, these guys who are thinking about dinars actually use blunt weapons. So, the current battle situation is that the Lion Realm cavalry surrounded the team of the three prophets and then began to exchange hammers with the Doom Bringers. However, the strength and skill of those misfortune bringers are far beyond ordinary people. The hammers in their hands are the usual weapons they have always used. Their skills in playing with blunt weapons are obviously much better than those of these cavalry and mercenaries. Dozens of bad luck bringers were beaten by hundreds of people but they were still able to fight evenly. After losing their horses, the three prophets stood back to back in the middle. There were several corpses of cavalry in front of them. The horses and humans fell to the ground, all of which were fatally struck. It was obvious that some cavalry had tried, but they were cut down by both men and horses. So for a while no one was willing to step forward to deal with them. But they were surrounded by hundreds of people, and they obviously couldn't get out even on foot. The Lord stood a hundred meters away and stopped moving forward letting the brothers disperse to prevent the three prophets from escaping. Since this area was flat, the cavalry and mercenary regiments surrounded the three prophets team very tightly. In many cases, the three prophets could not even be seen. The Lord did not try to shoot arrows to avoid accidental injuries. He just needs to stay on the outside and watch the show. Leong is very satisfied with the current situation. Anyway, Godric or Charles will definitely bring a large force over soon. He is already thinking about how to get the spoils of the three prophets. The goddess watches all injustice and evil. At this moment, the three prophets once again chanted the prayer of the goddess of justice. The doom-inducing ones, at the moment when the prayer sounded, became extremely crazy again, and they launched a violent and deadly attack on the cavalry. These fierce Lion Realm cavalry and mercenary groups had been carefully besieging them with the intention of catching them alive. But they did not expect that these women would suddenly go berserk. The encirclement of hundreds of people was suddenly breached by the doomed seducers. These women who lost their horses did not escape through this gap, but continued to fight fiercely. But the three prophets immediately broke out towards this gap. The prophet in the middle wielded a long-handled broad-bladed knife and swung it left and right to kill. The huge blade swept across a large area with a violent sound of wind. At least three shields were shattered by this blow, blocking several men near the gap. They all backed away, not daring to take advantage of him. The gap suddenly expanded several meters. Then, the other two prophets rushed out side by side, holding golden shields in one hand and waving dragon bone axes in the other. Stop them! Upon seeing this, the Lord Lord quickly led his men to stand in front of them. This time they were close. 
and Liang finally saw the appearance of the three prophets clearly. Their faces looked beautiful, but there was no human emotion in their eyes. Just like three robots, the three prophets were still chanting prayers, and their voices became louder and louder. Perhaps this was a kind of strange witchcraft. Leon once again felt that the whole sky was filled with their voices. This may be a special chanting technique, or it may be a way for them to deceive their believers. But this kind of chanting obviously has a strong effect. The eyes of those who attract misfortune have turned blood red, and the expressions on their faces have become ferocious, like wild beasts. As for the three prophets, their armors were dyed red with blood as they broke through. The flesh and blood armor once again revealed its true appearance. The cavalrymen who had originally surrounded them turned pale with fright and quickly backed away as if they had seen a ghost. In fact, they did see a ghost. That armor made of human flesh and bones can still make people feel chills in the back of their heads even in broad daylight. Several archers shot arrows quickly. But just like what the Lord had tried before, the arrows stuck in their flesh and blood armor and seemed to have no effect. Leong immediately realized that this was witchcraft armor made of flesh and blood. It might actually be very thick. But it just didn't look obvious. Arrows couldn't penetrate it. And blunt weapons certainly couldn't cause damage. But since it is flesh and blood, the long sword and broadsword can definitely cut it. Cut with a sword! Their armor can only be cut with a sword! The nearest armed infantrymen had already charged forward with heavy fan-shaped shields, waving their long swords to surround them again. The two prophets carrying shields and dragon bone axes were quickly surrounded by thirty soldiers and beaten with swords. They had to block left and right, and they couldn't even use their hands to fight back. It was obvious that although the flesh and blood armor on their bodies could protect them from arrows and blunt objects, they really did not dare to be slashed with swords. Although they seemed to have excellent skills and were flawless in the face of the siege by dozens of people, it was obvious that they were besieged again, and the prophet holding a broad-bladed sword in his hand rushed over and the blade swung out, bringing out a dazzling light. And the power was extremely terrifying. She came to save another company of prophets. Liang's infantry couldn't withstand it at all. The two thick infantry shields were cut through in an instant, and the two soldiers were even knocked away, seeing that she was about to wield the broad-bladed sword again. The Lord rode Alice up and charged forward, stabbing the prophet in the chest with a shot. With a boom sound, the lance shattered, and then the Lord himself flew up. Liang's lance skills were impeccable, but his spear was blocked by the prophet, who used her long knife to hold the tip of Liang's spear. Not only that, the prophet also moved his hands forward and used Liang's horse power to crush the lance with his sword. The Lord never expected that such a situation would occur. How could anyone push forward against the charging lance? As a result, the Lord, who had no time to let go, was pushed away by the blow, and his shoulder was almost dislocated by the shock. The prophet's power was so terrifying that when he charged with a lance, Leon on horseback flew backwards for more than three meters. What about the promise that all living beings are equal under the lance? Alice is a very smart horse. She suddenly stopped and turned back to the dead end. But this swift and violent hoof was still blocked by the prophet with his sword. Such terrifying proficiency. However, no matter what, basic physics still existed in Pender Continent. The continuous and huge reaction force caused the prophet's supporting feet to sink deeply into the mud. And the mud was up to his ankles. While one of her feet was stuck in the ground and before she could retrieve the weapon in her hand. Close took this opportunity to slash at her with a heavy sword. You have to be reliable. Close's ability to seize opportunities on the battlefield is first rate. However, his powerful and heavy sword strike was blocked again by the prophet's quick eyesight and quick hands. Using the hilt of the sword. Then he kicked him away and flew more than three meters, and fell together with the Lord. This kick was more powerful, and could kick close, who weighed more than three hundred pounds. Away. The reaction force encountered by the prophet was also stronger. After this kick, her supporting foot had sunk deeply into the mud. It was not a problem at first. The hard soil covered half of his calf. Originally, getting stuck in the mud was not a problem. With the strength of the prophet, it was just a matter of lifting his legs. But the problem was that the tough men from Mettenheim had already gathered around her, giving her no chance to move even half a step. They swarmed forward, greeting each other with about a dozen big swords, and all of them used the woodcutting sword technique, which is also the New Year greeting sword technique. The prophet, who was stuck in the mud, raised his weapon to block. She was really powerful. With such a long, broad-bladed knife, she was able to block all the attacks with a clang. However, 
she was driven into the ground like a pile by this group of strong men holding heavy swords. Both legs were submerged in the mud for a foot and a half. And you couldn't even see your knees. The prophet's physical strength was also outrageous. When the strength is too great, but the body size is not enough to match. Something will happen that will never happen under normal circumstances. When the Lord got up, he rolled his sword to the ground and hit the prophet's leg. The strong men who were blacksmithing held back the prophet, and she was completely unable to defend herself against the sword that was close to the ground. This time, no miracle occurred. Her legs were cut off by the griffin sword. But the prophet didn't seem to feel any pain, and the leg didn't even bleed much. However, after losing a leg, the prophet also lost his balance and could no longer block the Menheimer's attack, and was slashed in the face with a big sword. That beautiful face was chopped to pieces. She staggered and fell. The surrounding fierce, Lion Realm cavalry were dumbfounded. Could they still fight like this? Looking again at the Doombringers, who had already killed more than a dozen people, but not a single one was captured. They felt that they seemed to have mastered some trick. Chapter 125 Lehman's Difficulties These fierce Lion Realm cavalry and mercenaries began to imitate each other. Seven or eight people gathered around each other and began to use the blunt weapons they all used in the hammering method. They probably thought that using hammers would be more effective. But the problem is that they are obviously not as powerful as the Menheimers. Nor are they as skilled in blacksmithing skills. The effect is there. Half of the crazy doom-inducing people really can't withstand such an attack. But none of the cavalry could achieve their goal of capturing them. Most of the doom-inducing ones ended up with their Tianling caps broken. And then they fell to the ground and died. The other half of the Doombringers actually killed many cavalrymen because of this unskilled siege. They didn't sink into the ground. But they did not take the opportunity to run away. But swarmed towards Leon. The Lord Lord rolled out and slipped out. And the Menenheimers stepped forward to resist them. However, naturally there was a gap. And one of the doom-inducing ones successfully pounced on the fallen prophet. Close got up with difficulty at this time. He was almost knocked out by the prophet's kick. The heavy armor on his waist even had an obvious dent due to the force of the kick. Charge on a war horse. When Close stood up, he happened to see the 1.9 meter tall doom bringer hugging the dead prophet. My lord, this is the one next to Lady Bella. He shouted loudly and flew towards him with his sword. Last time in Chungha town, this woman jumped into the river and escaped. Close was obviously a little bit upset. But then, the doom inducing person picked up the broad bladed knife and forced Close back with one blow. It wasn't even called forcing him to retreat, but he took the initiative to slash Close's sword, causing a harsh scream and huge sparks. The big sword bit into an arc, and Close was knocked back several steps, and the handle of the sword cracked. Leon clearly saw that the misfortune inducer seemed to have regained her clarity. Her eyes were no longer blood red, and her expression was no longer crazy. This woman's expression became the same as that of the three prophets at this moment. Without any human emotions, Leon rushed forward again with his sword in hand. Close was also surprised and raised his sword and pressed forward again. But after the woman just made a thunderous sweep, the two of them were repelled again and flew three meters away again. And this time, the woman spoke. No one can kill us! He he he! This is definitely not the power that a misfortune inducer can have. This is the prophet. They can actually borrow corpses to bring back souls. The Lord suddenly realized that every doom-inducing person was a spare body found for himself by the three prophets. They can be replaced by these doom-bringers at any time. But there is probably a price to pay. The original soul of the doom-inducing person will definitely be erased. Or in other words, sacrificed. The new body is probably not as strong as the original. No wonder. No wonder they only ran away with the uninjured doom-inducer. No wonder their misfortune-inducers are all tall men over 1.8 meters tall. This is to better adapt to the powerful power of the three prophets. Kill those doom-inducing ones first. The Lord couldn't get up for a while. So he sat on the ground and ordered his men to kill all those who brought misfortune to prevent the three prophets from resurrecting their corpses again. At this time, the prophet entered the crowd and rescued the other two prophets with a broad-bladed knife. Then, the three prophets rushed out side by side in the same direction. But they were not escaping from the direction but took the initiative to rush into the place where the Lion Realm Cavalry gathered. The three prophets took the initiative to attack the Lion Realm Cavalry, who were waiting in fear. I swear by my blood to uphold justice. They sang a song-like prayer again. This prayer could obviously control the Doombringers. And the remaining Doombringers went crazy again, desperately holding back the Lord's troops. Afterwards, 
the three prophets easily chopped down a few fearful Lion Realm cavalry and snatched away their horses. All the Lion Realm cavalry and mercenary groups saw their flesh and blood armor and also saw how the Lord was easily knocked away. These men did not want to fight against this kind of monster and they all backed away. The three prophets actually seized the horses and ran out quickly. Who is blaspheming the goddess of justice? Just when Leong thought that the three prophets would run away because of this, a knight came galloping from the south. Before the person arrived, the sound was heard from a distance. Judging from the voice, this knight must be quite old, but his voice can be clearly heard 200 meters away. It seems to be exactly the same as the way the three prophets recited prayers. Moreover, his voice actually drowned out the chants of the three prophets. He wore a black and white knight's robe, held a white extended lance, carried a fan-shaped shield on his back, rode a white horse, and had white feathers on the top of his helmet. Heretic! Die! The knight rushed directly towards the three prophets, who were still chanting prayers, and without hesitation raised his lance and launched a charge. Leon took a breath and climbed up, mounted Alice again, reached out to take a lance from a cavalryman, and rushed towards the back of the three prophets. The leader, the tall bringer of doom, the prophet who had just changed his body, raised his long broad-bladed sword towards the knight. The moment the two horses crossed each other, the knight's spear tip swung left and right, and then stabbed the doom-inducing man in the shoulder. This knight seemed to be very familiar with the prophet's martial arts. He managed to knock the prophet off his horse with a shot that didn't look very fast. Another prophet holding an axe and shield had already turned around on horseback. When she turned around, she saw Leon behind her. After seeing the knight's successful performance with one shot, the lord also shook the tip of the spear, and then fiercely handed the lance to his left hand. Alice's originally left-leaning route was also led to the right by Leon. So, when the two horses passed each other, he successfully knocked the prophet off his horse with one blow. The lord was a fast learner. This shot from this knight made him understand that the three prophets were only powerful, quick in reaction and highly proficient. But the martial arts they knew were very simple. As long as it's a technique they haven't seen before, they can't stop it. Their bodies don't belong to them. They don't have the instinct to fight. They just rely on strength and reaction to defeat their opponents. As long as they don't have time to think about what to do, no matter how powerful or fast they are, there's no way their brains can't react. Using a gun with the left hand was not unusual. But when the line was about to come into contact, the line was suddenly changed. And the gun was suddenly switched from the right hand to the left hand. The prophet had probably never seen it before. And he was immediately confused. Before she could react, the Lord's gun had already arrived. This shot also hit the shoulder socket. I learned this from the knight. Instead of pursuing a fatal blow, it was effective. The only prophet still riding a horse did not move. Because in front of her was the knight. And behind her was Leong. The two powerful knights were coming towards her at the same time in an arc. Roland! It's you? She seemed to recognize the knight. Shouted and drove her horse to meet the knight. It's me! Heretic! Suffer death! The two passed each other again, and the prophet was shot in the side again, and fell off the horse. The lord also rushed past the two of them at this time. But he still did not put away his gun. Instead, he rushed towards the tall doombringer, who had been shot down by the knight with his lance. She stood up again. This time, she was shot in the other shoulder by Leon. The lance was broken, and the prophet had obviously lost most of her combat effectiveness. She lay on the ground with a long spearhead stuck in her shoulder, and her bones must have been broken. What a great skill! May Lady Justice protect you! The knight praised, and his footsteps did not stop. Like Leon, he once again rushed towards the other prophet, who had just climbed up with his lance. He also crippled the prophet's other hand. The dragon bone axe flew out, and his lance also broke, piercing the prophet's shoulder. At this time, the soldiers had cleared away the remaining doombringers and rushed over. All three prophets fell from their horses. All were injured, and they were about to die. But at this moment, the sound of horse hooves was heard in the distance. Ho ho ho! Sir! The Lion Knights are here! The whistle of the Owl Knights and Close's shout came at the same time. Leon stopped his horse and looked back. That's Lehman. He is coming here with a large number of Lion Knights. The three prophets got up and gathered together again. All of them were injured. But they were no longer expressionless. And seemed to have a sarcastic smile. Uh-huh. Roland! You can't kill us! Little Lord! I remember the black and white griffin flag! What's the meaning? 
Do you dare to say harsh words under such circumstances? Do they think the Lion Knights are here to save them? Brothers, chop them to death. Leon was a little far away from the three prophets. Seeing that Close had already rushed over with his people, Leon shouted, and then he faced the Lion Knights. Lehman, are you here to catch heretics? The Lord rushed straight to the middle of the road and stopped the leader Lehman. Lehman stopped. But the Lion Knights behind him did not stop. They bypassed Leon and rushed to the three prophets, blocked Close and the others. According to the order of His Majesty the King, I will bring these witches back to Lion City for interrogation. Lehman then answered. His expression seemed a little complicated. Are you sure you are taking them back for interrogation? Not to save them? The Lord frowned, and there was a hint of ridicule in his words. Huh? Lord Leong, I don't know why your majesty issued such an order, but I am a lion knight, and my duty is to obey your majesty's orders. Lehman sighed, and there seemed to be some inexplicable emotions in his words. What were the king's exact words? To bring these witches back? Leong suddenly felt that Lehman's words were true. He seemed very calm, but his expression was unswerving. He seemed to be very unwilling to carry out this task, but he could not break his oath of allegiance to the king. I received the order at Chicha Fortress. His majesty came to Chicha Fortress in person to give it. His majesty's exact words were, Those three witches led troops to surround Changha town. Go and bring them to Lion City. Dot. Lehman's voice was very soft, and he explained patiently, The prophet legion stayed outside Changha town for many days. Someone will definitely report the military situation to Lion City. It is normal for the king to know about their existence. But the king's order was just to bring those three witches to Lion City. This is a heretic leading a large army to siege the city. The king's order was not to destroy their troops? Didn't you ever question such an order? The lord suddenly felt a little depressed. What did Ulrich want to do? I am your majesty's direct knight. Lord Leon. I really cannot question your majesty's orders. Lehman seemed hesitant to speak. Lehman, when you passed Truburn before, you should have discovered that the heretics massacred that village. Why didn't you tell me about this? Who are you hiding it for? Leong thought of Lehman's confusing behavior again. Lord Leong, I have been strictly ordered not to disclose anything related to the pursuit of heretics to anyone. I'm sorry. I have to take my leave. Lehman wanted to leave after saying that, but Leong grabbed the reins of his horse. Lehman, are you really a lion knight? What is the first oath of the lion knight? Maintain the stability of the country. Right. Can heretics bring stability to the country? Massacre. Can villages bring stability to the country? Lehman shook his head and said softly, I arrived early this morning, Lord Leong, and I happened to witness you defeating the Prophet Legion with my own eyes. So I waited until now to come out. I know Ors from the Owl Knights. He you also sent me some news. I think you can understand why I waited until now. And you should also know what the consequences will be if I disobey His Majesty the King's order. Lehman's voice was very soft. He didn't want others to hear these words. Leon let go of his hand. Lehman's face did look tired. As if he hadn't slept for a long time. Those night owls were originally only cooperating with Leon. And there was no loyalty relationship. As long as they did not tip off the heretics. They could not accuse others. They live in the kingdom of lions. And it is normal for them to make friends with famous knights like Raymond. Lehman, I understand your difficulties. But please answer me a question. People in Trubrin village, you know that heretics did it. But you concealed it. This is because the king knew that the three prophets massacred went there, but ordered you not to mention it, and even asked you to destroy the body to cover up the truth. Right. Maybe the words, I understand your difficulties, played a role. When Lehman looked at Leong, his face finally showed a bitter smile. He shook his head. Lord Leong, I shouldn't have told you, but I don't want you to keep making wild guesses that will damage his majesty's reputation. You must know that there are many careerists who claim to be Panders orthodoxy who have been causing trouble. And especially Lubrin village was once a place where careerists raised armies. They deserved to die. In other words, it was the king who asked the three prophets to massacre that village in order to get rid of those rebellious careerists. So, the king and the three prophets have cooperated more than once? So this time the three prophets surrounded Chungha town. Are you also cooperating with the king? Lehman didn't answer. But he didn't deny it either. He just silently drove his horse to the vicinity of the three prophets and asked the lion knights to tie up the three witches. The rope used by the lion knight was very ordinary. And it was obviously impossible to tie these three powerful women. But the three prophets did not struggle at all. This time, 
Lehman brought out most of the Lion Knights. The Knights and retinues totaled more than 1,200 people. This was obviously not only to shock the three prophets, but also to prevent other, local troops, from causing chaos. Come! Lehman was able to hold them down for a whole half day, and waited until the three prophets' troops were completely wiped out before coming out. This was already trying his best in another way. Liang's army only had a hundred men, and he could not openly disobey the king's will. And those fierce Lion Realm cavalry and mercenary groups didn't even dare to fart in front of the Lion Knights. A group of people watched helplessly as the three prophets were taken away by the Lion Knights. Only the knight who charged against the three prophets alone drove his horse to Leon. But he obviously didn't understand what this meant at all. Since they are about to receive a fair trial, that's a good thing. I hope the Lion King will tie them to the stake. Leon shook his head. Of course he knew that the three prophets would not die. But he didn't know what to say. I had no choice but to ask. I am Leon. Baron of McLeanland. Sir Roland. This is your name. Right. Those three witches seem to know you. Do you know them? I'm Roland. I'm sorry. Sir. I don't know who they are. And I don't know why they know me. I was once a member of the Knights of the Dawn. The Knights of the Dawn. As Sir Roland calls them are the most powerful knights in Buckley Continent. This knightly order honors Astalia, the goddess of justice. Astalia, the goddess of justice, is the main deity of Buckley's continent. Although she no longer lives on the earth, she has always been Buckley's most respected deity. As fanatical believers of the goddess of justice, the Knights of the Dawn are very famous. The Knights of the Dawn are not only active in Barkley Continent, this famous knights also have a hall in Pinder Continent. The auditorium is in Guangxu Bay in the Kingdom of Fields Way, which is the coastal city closest to Buckley Continent, thousands of miles away from the vast ocean. It is the first stop for sea trade between Buckley and Penn Continent. But what makes the Knights of the Dawn famous is not their strength, nor their belief in punishing evil and promoting good and upholding justice, but their extreme fanaticism. At the beginning of the establishment of the Knights of the Dawn, they may have indeed practiced justice and upheld justice, and the rule of law in the name of Estalia. But as the knights became more and more fanatical, the knights of the dawn gradually began to implement their own justice in the name of Estalia, the goddess of justice. Anyone who made some small mistakes or did not believe in Estalia would often be labeled as heretics by them, burned at the stake, and then divide the property of these heretics. Many innocent people were also burned at the stake for desecrating Estalia. Yes, the knights of the dawn will, in the name of Estalia, the goddess of justice, kill evil those they deem disrespectful of the goddess or guilty, and burn them at the stake. What they did was no different than the cruelest bandits and heretics. When they killed more and more innocent people, they didn't know whether it was because they really fell into madness or out of conscience. They began to declare that everyone was guilty. After killing the sinners, the goddess would naturally classify them. The Knights of the Dawn believe that if a person is innocent, he cannot be harmed even by being burned at the stake. So they came to a perfect closed loop conclusion that since they were burned to death, they were guilty. Everyone will be burned to death, indicating that everyone is guilty. Therefore, man is born with sin, so he must atone for his sin. In fact, this kind of fanatical belief is probably the direct reason why Astalia lost her godhead and left the mainland. This goddess of justice was turned into a tool to kill people by her own believers. But the Dawn Knights are not the kind of scoundrels who are greedy for life and afraid of death. They never flinch even when faced with dozens of times the number of heresies they consider guilty. They will still wave their long swords and charge with white lances, either to purify the heretics or to atone for themselves. Yes, they are a group of wise men who are so fanatical that they misinterpret justice at will, and are so extreme that they turn justice into lynching. Chapter 126 The Last Paladin The Knights of the Dawn were originally the National Knights of the Buckley Empire. Of course, it is no longer the case. They were judged as an illegal knighthood by the Buckley Empire a few years ago and were expelled from the Buckley continent because their devotion to the goddess of justice is too fanatical. In the minds of those members who are overly obsessed with the goddess, the standards for blaspheming the goddess have reached the point of being picky. They committed countless unimaginable atrocities. They sent countless innocent businessmen, farmers, and even nobles to the stakes for the reason of purging their sins. And those so-called sins are actually daily trivial things such as spitting, horses urinating everywhere, being distracted during prayer, the altar of the goddess not facing the direction of the sunrise, or there is dust on the statue of the god. These things are heresy in their eyes. 
It's all blasphemy to the goddess. Anyway, to put it simply, everyone is guilty. If there is any doubt in this regard, then send the suspect to the stake first and let the goddess judge. Of course, there are probably political reasons for this. The Buckley Empire was transforming from a purely feudal country to a capitalized country. Since muskets were introduced into the army by Emperor Buckley and the civilian legion system began to be implemented, the status of merchants and civilians has actually been greatly improved because of the existence of muskets. A farmer who had only trained for two weeks could easily kill a knight who had been practicing martial arts for 20 years and how cheap it is for farmers to use. Therefore, traditional knights based on blood, martial arts, horses and armor are no longer the first choice for the Buckley Empire to ensure combat effectiveness. Since the source of military strength has changed from knights to farmers and the source of military expenditures and weapons has also changed from nobles to merchants. The status of civilians such as farmers and merchants will naturally be improved, although it may not seem obvious. The nobles will definitely feel it. For example, when class conflicts arise, His Majesty the Emperor may protect the rights and interests of civilians and businessmen. For example, most of the policies promulgated will be beneficial to increasing the civilian population and developing commerce. But the nobles may suffer losses. Naturally, the traditional knight class, which has gradually decayed over time, cannot just sit back and watch this situation arise. The behavior of the Knights of the Dawn, in addition to their fanatical beliefs, is probably also the final madness caused by these traditional noble knights to protect their own privileges. They implement their justice in the name of the Goddess of Justice and clean up those who support the New Deal. Heresy. But their behavior of resisting the New Deal was so extreme that even Emperor Buckley couldn't accept it. Who knows whether these fools would not wash their hands before eating and after using the toilet and put his majesty, the emperor who was implementing the new deal, to death, sent to the stake. Therefore, the Buckley Empire expelled him, abolished this powerful armed force, and even started a civil war. Sir Roland was once a member of the Knights of the Dawn. Sir Roland was not actually from Buckley. He was born in an inconspicuous village in the Bacchus Empire, where the snake cult was once very rampant. Snake cult believers often raped villagers and sacrificed their blood to the evil god Aziz Dahaka. The young Roland was unlucky. He once witnessed the snake cult followers taking away his parents in the dark. He was only 10 years old at that time. But he was also lucky. After becoming an orphan, Roland received selfless help from a believer in the goddess of justice, who sent him to Buckley to join the Knights of the Dawn and receive good education and combat skills training. At Buckley, Roland grew into an outstanding knight. But he is an outlier among the Knights of the Dawn. He has been helped by being a believer in the Goddess of Justice. He believes in the Goddess of Justice more devoutly than anyone else. But he believed that the Goddess did not give anyone the right to judge others privately. And he was not willing to kill innocent people indiscriminately for the sake of power and gain. For this reason, Roland swore an oath of honor not to pursue wealth or status throughout his life, but to be an enemy of evil and to uphold justice and fairness as his own responsibility. He made a great wish in Astalia's temple and was officially named a holy knight. Paladin is not a noble status or title in the ordinary sense. It actually refers to a devout knight who swears allegiance to the goddess, is willing to abide by the rules and precepts throughout his life, fights only for his beliefs, and aims at sacred ideals. It can also be considered as an ascetic. Of course, becoming a paladin of the goddess of justice means that you cannot have any moral flaws and that you should not aim at wealth and land throughout your life, but practice justice throughout your life. There are naturally very few such people. So paladins will be respected by most people, and their social status is much higher than that of ordinary noble knights. But in fact, very few people who can become a paladin, or who are really willing to become a paladin, swear to fight for the goddess, abide by virtue, and strictly abide by all the precepts. This can indeed gain the respect of the world, but they will not get any benefits. In the Barclay Empire, which has a strong business atmosphere, capital consciousness has risen. Egoism and colonial mentality have gradually become prevalent. And paladins, who do not seek personal gain for themselves may even be considered fools. Especially when the fanaticism of the Knights of the Dawn has ruined their reputation. Because of its overly fanatical behavior, this knight is actually secretly called the Dawn Idiots. In Buckley. But when you become a paladin, you no longer listen to others' orders. Paladins will not be loyal to the royal power, but to the divine authority and faith. At the same time, they also have the responsibility to pass on the faith and combat skills of the entire knight order. 
since he no longer pursues power and wealth and only serves the goddess. The paladin does not need to obey anyone's orders. And Roland will not be ordered to kill innocent people. After becoming a paladin, Roland also plans to correct the behavior of the Knights of the Dawn. His persistence in true justice and fairness is completely different from what other members of the Knights of the Dawn do. But the correction gradually turned into a disagreement. The differences were so great that they were at odds with each other. When everyone is lying, the only truth is a lie. When everyone is evil, the only good becomes evil. As a result, Sir Roland was banished by the Knights of the Dawn, and a reward was even put on his head. Roland had to escape Barkley and return to Pender. As a paladin, the black and white coat of arms on his chest was originally a symbol of honor, but now it has become a wanted symbol. The last paladin of the Knights of the Dawn was regarded as a traitor and hunted down by the Knights of the Dawn. The situation in this world is always so incredible. However, Roland did not despair. While fleeing, Sir Roland kept dreaming of the goddess of justice, Astalia, asking him to correct the fallen knights of the dawn and drive away all evil on the earth. He dreamed that Astalia called him the only knight of the dawn. Lady Justice also told him that Astalia would return when justice and justice once again rule the earth. This was his lifelong belief and he never doubted it. Therefore, he still firmly fights against heretics, still charges against bandits who harm civilians, still helps the poor and weak, and still maintains flawless morality. Although he is still on the run and is still being hunted, as long as justice and light do not come to Pendor, he will not fall. I believe that after the night comes the dawn, one day, Astalia, the goddess of justice, will return to the earth. I am very happy to fight side by side with you to drive out the heretics. Your Excellency Leon. After Sir Roland said, okay, with the standard knightly etiquette, he planned to leave. Wait, this is your trophy. You should take it with you. The Lord handed the broad-bladed knife more than two meters long to Roland. Of course, Leong respects such a devout believer. This is a true paladin who dares to charge against any heresy alone. Moreover, Roland's skills seem to be worthy of making friends. As for Roland's story, the Lord believed it because he himself heard a female voice calling herself Astalia not long ago, although he was not sure whether it was the Lady of Justice. But Roland shook his head and refused the trophy. Although the weapon itself is not sinful, I am not good at using this weapon. You can keep it. It is not convenient for me to carry it. But, Sir Roland, where are you going? You want to correct the Knights of the Dawn. But how can you do it alone? Leong threw the long sword to close, jumped off the horse, took a lance from the cavalry behind him, and handed it to Roland. To be honest, I don't know how to complete this mission right now, Dot, but I will definitely do it. Thank you for your gift. Roland was obviously a very polite person. Seeing Leon get off his horse and talk to him, he quickly got off his horse, took off his helmet, and bowed to take the ordinary lance. The Lord sighed. You have to guard against pursuit, deal with heretics, help the poor and practice justice, and correct the Knights of the Dawn. There are your enemies all over the continent of Pendor. But you are alone without an ally. It is estimated that the nobles of Pendor continent will not help you. How can you do this? Roland lowered his head and fell silent. But after a moment, he raised his head again. His eyes still bright. There will always be a way. Maybe. I can reestablish a new Knights of the Dawn. The Lord shook his head and smiled. Then you have to set up a garrison first. Right? And establishing a knighthood is no different from opening up a territory. It requires a lot of dinars. You don't look like a rich man. Of course. Roland was not a rich man. In fact, he was almost penniless as he insisted on helping the poor and the poor during his escape. This time, Sir Roland frowned. This is indeed a problem. I am willing to help you, Sir Roland. But I hope that you can fight for me without violating the will of the goddess of justice. I can guarantee that you can refuse any war that you think is unjust. And you can supervise me. Keep me from becoming corrupted. Leon once again started the recruitment mode. This paladin with firm faith has served the goddess of justice all his life. He will not swear service to any lord. But as long as he doesn't do anything that goes against his beliefs, such a person will be more reliable around him. The lord will not believe the oaths of most people. But he believes in the beliefs of people like Roland. Sir Roland does not even want any trophies. He is really just to eliminate heretics. Moreover, he believed in justice. The more friends he had, the better. At least, he could trust him with his back on the battlefield. As for whether the lord would occasionally do some less just work secretly. 
Leon had countless ways to make his actions at least seem just. Sir Roland thought for a while. Thank you. Lord Leon, you are right. I do need help. If it is like you said, of course, I am willing to fight side by side with people like you. But can you lend me a loan? Money? I saw a terrible tragedy down south in Serenmes. People there need help. Serum is? What's going on there? Almost all the young people there were killed. And the village was plundered. I can see that it was the work of the heretics who blasphemed the goddess. The flesh and blood armor on the heretics just now may have come from there. It was the goddess. They showed me their location. So I came here. But now there are only some old people left in Serenmes. I want to help them. But there is nothing I can do. The Lord's heart sank. He could realize that it was probably the king's tacit consent to the prophet army. Ulrika, what is the difference between his method of driving heretics to deal with rebels and what his father, the mad king, did? How much do you estimate it will cost? Sir Roland, it would cost about 8,000 dinars to resettle them. It was a big village, but almost nothing was left. At least more than a thousand people died. Now there are only a few hundred old people left there who have lost their children. Sir Roland did the math and frowned. Of course, the Lord can afford 8,000 dinars. But Leon didn't intend to do this. This kind of charity seems noble. But in fact it is useless and will kill more people. If dinars are given to the elderly, bandits and scoundrels will swarm in just one or two days later. As a result, none of the old people there can survive. Sir Roland, giving money will not solve the problem. It will only allow thieves to run rampant and kill them. You can bring those people to my territory. And I will let them farm to support themselves. The old people may not be physically strong. But they at least have sufficient agricultural experience. And I just need them. You adhere to the principles of Lady Justice. Which is worthy of respect. But you should also learn the laws of Eunomia. The goddess of order. So that everyone can play a role in establishing order. And use this to establish orderly groups and legal principles to protect the people. The Lord stretched out his right hand. Every goddess has its own meaning. And a single belief will make the goddess fall into the abyss. You have been in the Knights of the Dawn for so long and have seen the actions of your former colleagues. You should understand this. Simply giving money for relief is a kind of arrogance in itself. Sir Roland, you should forget your noble status so that you can truly understand the mission given to you by the goddess of justice. Sir Roland was struck by lightning. After a long time, he stretched out his hands and held Liang's hand tightly. Lord Leon, Thank you for your teaching. I know what to do. The goddess must have guided me to meet you here. The goddess knows that you will give me real advice. The bearded man, who was nearly 50 years old, had excitement in his eyes. Like a teenager. I am a Stalia dot fight to defend justice. Child. Leon recalled the goddess's voice again. Perhaps. The goddess was indeed guiding him. And also guiding himself. So that he could meet the last paladin of the goddess. Sir Roland has joined your party. This battle did not have the best result as expected. And the three prophets were taken away by the Lion Knights. The Lion Realm Cavalry and mercenary groups were also frustrated that all the Dumbringers had died in the battle. And they had not been able to successfully capture any woman. Nearly a hundred people were killed and injured. But almost nothing was gained. Because of their shrinkage and fear when the three prophets broke out. The Lord did not give them a good look and did not even let them clean the battlefield. Leon asked the troops to take away the weapons of the three prophets and the wing hammers of the doom bringers and looted most of the loot, leaving only the bodies of the doom bringers to the cavalry and mercenaries. Those misfortunes bringers are very rich and they carry many valuable things with them, such as the luminous pearl that the Lord once obtained, as well as the jewelry, gold bars and some nolder products they carry. These things are worth at least 10,000 dinars, which is considered a good harvest. However, before the Lord left, he still generously gave the leading knight of the Duke of Alma a chance. You should know that with your fearless performance just now, I shouldn't have let you get any benefits. The knight remained silent. They took the initiative to apply to fight. But they were afraid on the battlefield. This was indeed a huge stain and a loss of honor. But now, I can give you an idea. If you lose troops here, the Duke of Alma will probably find you trouble. But if you lead the troops back to Lion Lake City to swear allegiance to Lord Father, I think he will probably it can keep your position. And you can even move to the next level. I can help you write a letter to Father and ask him to accept your submission. With that said, Leon took out a bag of jewelry. This is a payment for you. Madame Bella is the leader of the heresy under the three prophets. Duke Alma did not report the knowledge. 
he will definitely not be able to return to Shurhu City in the short term. You can take care of it yourself. Opportunity. Am I considered a good enough friend? The knight's eyes widened suddenly. After being stunned for a few seconds, he accepted the bag of jewelry and nodded. Lord Leon, I understand what you mean. Thank you for your reminder and help. I will repay you. The bag of jewels was only worth about a thousand dinars. This was not a bribe. The Lord was indeed just giving him money. What Leon really meant was for him to take away the troops stationed in Chunga town, take advantage of Alma's involvement in the heresy lawsuit, and return to Lion Lake City to align with the eldest son of the Horton family again. Leon had no idea of garrisoning these troops. Their families were all in Shurhu City, and it was impossible to stay. Sending them back to Shurhu City was the best way to deal with it. Chapter 127 Harvest Season After leading the team back to Chang'e Town, Leon handed a letter to the leading knight. Bring this letter to Lord Fawcett. You and your people will definitely get a satisfactory result. The knight took the parchment sealed with fire paint, took a deep breath, and turned to ask Leon, Sir, I know you have good intentions. I also know that under the current circumstances, those of us who stay in Chang'e Town will only do nothing, arousing suspicion from all sides. But if Dot I mean if, if Lord Fawcett does not accept our surrender, then we will become the traitors of the Horton family. Indeed, giving up allegiance to Alma and switching to his son Fawcett was normal behavior within the family. Just taking sides. In order to avoid taking responsibility and to get out of the embarrassing place of Chang'e Town, these garrison troops must really want to return to Shurhu City. And if they go to Father now, they are indeed very likely to get a higher status. And they are switching to the Duke's heir when Alma is likely to be convicted. It is just and logical that this knight will certainly not refuse. However, if Fawcett loses his mind and fails to accept their surrender, then these leading knights of the garrison will become masterless knights. They will definitely be safe with their troops. But the leading knights will be regarded as rebellious being appointed by Alma as the leader of the garrison. This knight obviously has a very high IQ and will not be fooled so easily. Friend, do you underestimate Lord Fawcett too much? Well, if Fawcett's head is caught in the door and he is unwilling to accept your surrender, then you can bring your family members to Chunga Town and switch to me or go Lord Derek. I think you can understand that Lord Godric and I need a lot of manpower now. I can even buy your fiefdom with dinars to prevent you from being rebellious. The Lord smiled and gave him a safe way out. The garrison in Chang'e town left with satisfaction. Of course, Liang's operation had deep meaning. It was not for the purpose of seeking military strength or to be a benevolent nobleman. He is trying to make the external situation more favorable. First of all, this allows Godric's troops and the Horn Call Rangers to naturally fill the vacancies in the garrison in the shortest time, and in fact control Lung'e town. Secondly, this is probably in line with King Ulrich's intentions. The time when Lehman received the order was almost exactly after Fawcett brought Lady Bella to Lion City. King Ulrich must have detained the Duke of Alma after seeing Father and Lady Bella, and then gave Lehman the order to send the Lion Knights to take away the three prophets and stop their destruction of Long River Town, because Chang'e Town will soon be taken over by him as a direct jurisdiction. The king can let the three prophets harm the village in order to eradicate rebellion, but the harm will be to other people's villages. Once it became his own direct territory, how could he continue to let the three prophets run wild? As he was about to take back Chang'e Town, Ulrich definitely didn't want to keep a large number of Alma's troops in Chang'e Town, because it was difficult to guarantee how these garrison troops would react. But it wouldn't matter if Rivertown was taken over by the Horns Call Rangers or Godric's forces. After all, the purpose of the Rangers is to protect their homeland, and Ulrich must be relieved that Godric's wife is in Lion City. In the end, the Lord asked the garrison to defect to Father just to make Alma and his son fight completely. If Fawcett was not stupid, he would definitely take advantage of his father's absence to recruit these troops under his father to protect his position. And once he does this, in Alma's eyes, he is truly a filial son. If nothing else goes wrong, the drama of a loving father and a filial son will soon unfold, and they will not have time to trouble the Lord. As for the letter that the Lord wrote to the knight, it was actually to make a deal with Fawcett. He did not actually want to give the garrison to Fawcett. Instead, sell to Fawcett. The things that come to your door for free may be deceptive. But the ones you buy will definitely make you feel more at ease. Father is the type who thinks a lot. Moreover, these garrisons are a large force of nearly a thousand people. How could the Lord give them to Father for no reason? Although these people do not belong to Leong. So what? Father doesn't know the situation here. 
The leading knights of the garrison didn't know what the relationship was between Leon and Fathers. They only knew that the Lord was a super rich man. And he could obviously command big men like Godric. Therefore, information is the most important resource. Information between the two parties is not smooth. And if Leon knows more information, he will be able to gain nothing. First cheat a wave, and then sell a wave. This is called a win-win situation. Win twice against the same wave of people. Moreover, the Lord's selling price is very low. It is completely a friendly price. All he needs is father to send 600,000 pounds of grain to Amy. Yes, in Amy and Godric's name. Fawcett had previously falsely accused Godric of being a heretic. So with their identities, Amy and Godric could naturally ask him to compensate for the damage to their reputation. The market price of these grains is only 10,000 dinars, which is nothing to father, but it is just more troublesome to transport. This is a very measured request. In fact, the food was given with a certain degree of goodwill. Your previous frame-up of Amy's family is over. You can concentrate on dealing with your father. Buy the castle and makes the angling won't give you any trouble. At the same time, the Lord asked your father's troops to switch to you. So the previous kidnapping of you will be considered a thing of the past. To account, clear and clear. If Fawcett refuses to admit his guilt, it will be tantamount to expressing unrelenting hostility. And we will fight to the end. As for whether Fawcett will recognize these two accounts, the knight is currently in a state of uneasiness. Leong specially asked him to go to Fawcett with a letter. If Fawcett is unwilling to provide food, what will the knight do? Think? Fawcett would not be so stupid. If he still couldn't understand at this juncture that this was the step that Leong handed him, and he had to be unrelentingly hostile, then this would be a better thing. Only a mentally retarded person would do that. Do this. The Lord is not afraid of being an enemy of a weakling. And in this way, Leon could also take the opportunity to trick the knight's troops and their families away together. Soon, Baron Godric's troops were stationed in Long River Town. And the Horn Call Rangers returned to their familiar station hall. When all this becomes a fact, as long as King Ulrich is not crazy, he will probably make a formal appointment and let Godric temporarily take charge of Lunga Town. Otherwise he will offend the armed forces of the entire eastern region. Other harvests include gold bars, luminous pearls and Nolder products, including several sets of Dumbringer leather armor and a disaster wing hammer. Leon packed them in the same box and asked Sarah to bring a team of people to escort them to the Lion City. These were worth almost exactly 10,000 dinars. The word, disaster wing hammer, was said by Sir Roland. The Doom Inducers used these exquisite hammers to kidnap girls in various villages and eventually brainwash them into fanatical believers. He wanted to give these things to King Ulrich as the promised 10,000 dinar. Protection fee. Leon believed that Ulrich would understand. This is telling the king that I have just fought to death with these heretics and suffered huge losses. I know about your cooperation with the heretics, but I still let you take away the three prophets and even help you clean up all the troubles in Chungha town. So how do you make up for the losses I suffered when dealing with these heretics? It's up to you. The king has eaten the meat of Chongha town. So he must let the people who were affected by the troops have to drink the soup. Otherwise it will not be in line with the principle of fairness between the king and the nobles. But the lord is still a little confused. Judging from the fact that the three prophets left with the lion knights without any resistance. Ulrich must know the secret of the three prophets. So why does Ulrich cooperate with the three prophets? Is it for the prophetic? ability of the three prophets? Or, is it because of their ability to use the body of the doom bringer to resurrect corpses? This is truly a way to live forever. The Lord didn't know what Ulrich wanted to do, but he felt that the king would definitely not get what he wanted. What about the king? In the eyes of the three prophets, I'm afraid they are just more advanced Kaizi who use each other. The mad king also worked with the three prophets, but he still died in the toilet. Etc. Etc. What if the mad king hadn't died? If Ulrika, it's the Mad King. Leon suddenly thought of this. His expression changed drastically, and he was dripping with cold sweat. During these few days in late April and early May, everything went smoothly. This is the season of harvest, and every leader who participates in the war has gained a lot. After this battle with the Prophet Legion, Leofric was completely respected and recognized by the military and civilians in the eastern region, which would give him more support for his cause in Fort Brave Shield. At the same time, Leofric received an invitation from the Lord and exchanged 240 draft horses for 8% of the equity of Maishang International. This price is actually the price of the original stock. And the two parties have reached a strategic partnership. 
Leon will be able to continuously obtain horses from Brave Shield Castle, which is a strategic material that my Xiangling lacks. Leofric will also continue to receive large dinar dividends, which is what he lacks. Charles returned to Fletcher with a team of sentries. After this battle, his determination to defend his homeland was recognized by the sentries, and he officially became a core member of the Horncall Rangers. Ralph did not live again in the familiar garrison camp of Long River Town as a military officer. He took a part of the rangers back to the ranger camp next to Fletcher with Charles, preparing to continue building the new castle he had planned. He became a pioneer baron because he received a pioneer certificate from the House of Lords. It seems that the king does not want anyone to get the horn to summon the rangers. This pioneering certificate is rewarded with expulsion of heretics. He obviously hopes that the rangers will maintain a certain degree of independence. But this is exactly what Ralph expected. As a comrade, Leon is certainly happy to see this happen. Anyway, he, a foreigner, cannot directly take charge of the horn summoning rangers. He has a very good relationship with Ralph. And he is also Ralph's superior consul, together with Charles. Now he can actually dispatch the rangers. Dodrick did receive an appointment from Lion City. But he was not appointed as the consul of Chang'e Town but as the military chief of the entire eastern region. Of course, the chief's residence is also in Chang'e town. And in the appointment letter, Godric's title was specifically marked as Great Baron. This is a very interesting situation. The Great Baron is actually a term used in the kingdom of Pindar hundreds of years ago. At that time, there were only three levels of title, Duke, Baron, and Knight. The most prominent and powerful among the barons was called the Grand Baron, indicating that he was above the other barons. However, the title of Great Baron had been completely replaced by Count at the end of the Kingdom of Pendor, and no one mentioned it again for 200 years. There are no Marquises or Viscounts in the Lion Kingdom. After all, the Lion King calls himself Pendor Orthodoxy, and the ancient Pendor Kingdom does not have these two levels of titles. Now, King Ulrich reused the title of Great Baron, but did not promote Godric to Earl. This meant that he did not want Godric to gain too high a status. You know, Godric is a royal in law and now he is given an important position. It should be natural for him to regain his status as an earl. With the status of earl, he legally has the right to manage the nobles below baron in the jurisdiction. If he has a vast fief and a powerful army, he is actually enough to stand on his own. Just like the Earl of Odin during his lifetime. In the eastern region where he was located, if the king had not used the Duke of Alma as a check and balance, the Earl of Odin would have even been able to establish a country based on Lona Town. The great baron's statement was different. It recognized that Godric's status was above all barons, but he did not have the power to allocate other barons at will. Only military management rights. Of course, in the face of a major war, the chief of military affairs has the authority to impose comprehensive military control over the entire eastern region. The appointment of acting consul of Reach was given by King Ulrich to another duke, Duke Brennus, Lord of Craggy Bay. This appointment was not unexpected and the king would certainly not leave the military and administrative power of a region in the same hands. Let the Duke of the Northwest region manage the administration of the Eastern region. The barons of the Eastern region will definitely not obey his dispatch. Just like when Alma, the consul of the Northern region, was asked to manage Chang'e town. A great baron, with a low title is in charge of military affairs, and a duke from other regions governs remotely. These two appointments mean that the nobles in the Eastern region will not take refuge. So who will they listen to? Of course, I listen to His Majesty the King. Ulrika's appointment was clever. Moreover, this is obviously an attempt to create conflict between Duke Brennus and Baron Godric, which is also a way to divide powerful nobles. King Ulrich does like to have checks and balances. There is indeed one unexpected appointment, which is about the Lord. Leon was appointed consul of Air River County by the Kingdom's House of Nobles. But the problem is that there are actually only two baronies in Air River County. One is White Deer Castle, and the other is Makes Angling. The original consul was of course Godric. But since Godric would serve as the military commander-in-chief of the eastern region in Lunga Town, it seemed that there was nothing wrong with the king transferring his county duties to the Lord of Maishiang. But in a border county like Air County, the power structure is very clear. It's no trouble to be the consul. There are only two baronies in total. And the remaining nobles are all knights under the two barons. It is very simple to manage. No substitutions are needed at all. This appointment is purely sowing discord. This is probably King Ulrich's response to the 10,000 dinars. He knew that you had suffered losses. So he gave you a higher status as compensation. 
but you formed a gang to form a coalition. Hum hum. Fortunately, the relationship between the Lord and Godric is not a conventional alliance. They are both business partners and old friends from the previous generation. Amy and Leon are relatively close, so the two sides will not be easily separated. Godric even asked Leon to live in White Deer Castle directly. He wanted Leon to guard White Deer Fort. Leon, it was your idea to let me settle in Chunga Town. Since I agreed, I will do my best. But I don't trust White Deer Castle. And if I'm not there, probably only you can hold it. So, I hope you can garrison White Deer Castle. Amy can help you manage those trivial affairs. But you can't let anything happen to White Deer Castle. Godric was still a little anxious when he talked about this. He really didn't like political struggle. If possible, he would prefer that the military chief be Leong, while he would still be a simple border commander in White Deer Fort. Indeed, judging from their personalities, swapping places would be the most perfect result. But things in this world are often like this. Leon achieved most of the goals he envisioned. Lord Fawcett is indeed not a fool. He has already sent a reply. There is only one sentence in the letter. The previous things were all misunderstandings. The food will be delivered within two weeks. The food is abundant and can last for a whole year which is enough to support the rapid development of the territory. Alma's family was temporarily unable to move, and the eastern region was free of enemies. He has obtained the highest status in the county, and has also attracted several powerful allies that can withstand most powerful enemies, and can ensure the security of the territory. The military power in the eastern region is in the hands of the most trustworthy people. Even if the Bacchus Empire or the Jata people launch a war, it will be enough to sustain it. In short, his own safety is indeed more guaranteed. Everyone's needs actually start from the safety of their own life. After ensuring safe survival, they will rise to other levels. From survival, to dignity, to reducing constraints, then increasing material needs, and finally to ideals and self-realization. The Lord is currently only in the intermediate stage of reducing restraints. So, the only thing to do now is to develop quickly so that you can have strong strength as soon as possible and make most of the constraints non-existent. All complicated things are actually to make the next thing easier. What aspects should a lord start to quickly increase his strength? In fact, there are three aspects. Money, food, population, military power. Chapter 128 Long River Express Transport The lord was in no hurry to return to his territory. In Chang'e Town, Leon directly sent out all the remaining troops in his hand. A part of the soldiers followed Sir Roland to Serenis, to escort back the lonely old people there, which were the ready-made population and farmers. Don't look down on the elderly. They are actually more reliable than young people when it comes to farming. The other part was led by Anson to inspect other surrounding small villages to see if there were any other places where similar tragedies had occurred. If so, a kind and loyal man like Anson would naturally bring the survivors back to his territory. Leslie also got a difficult task to open a transportation company. Of course, these days, it should be regarded as a complex of armed escort and logistics transportation. In fact, Penn Continent already has a mercenary fleet that specializes in the transportation industry. But they are actually mercenary logic and can be regarded as some small independent car dealerships. These car dealerships have no standards at all. They usually negotiate prices based on the value of the goods and distance. Their operation method is more like an ancient escort agency. Most of them provide services for valuable items such as transporting gold and silver money, luxury goods, wine, war horses, equipment, and even prisoners, captives, etc. Occasionally, they will transport heavy goods such as grain or ore. However, because such goods occupy too many horse-drawn carriages, the transportation cost is very high. The transportation price will greatly exceed the value of the goods themselves. It is difficult for employers and car dealers to negotiate with each other. Close. Generally, deals are only possible when employers are willing to do whatever it takes. In addition, the scale of these fleets is generally small, with only a few vehicles or dozens of vehicles, making it difficult to undertake the transportation of bulk commodities and unable to resist larger-scale bandits. Probably the only advantage is that these fleets are relatively professional and rarely misappropriate goods. After all, most of them are civilians with families, and they cannot afford to offend nobles and wealthy businessmen. But there are also the kind of temporary convoys that do not follow the rules and can change their jobs to become bandits at any time. There are such gangs in every place. 
They usually only prey on foreign businessmen. And most of them belong to the Red Brotherhood. This is the main reason why the business atmosphere of Pendaland is far different from that of Buckley. The continent of Pindor had previously experienced a massive Red Death, which had decimated the population. Five countries still coexist, and wars and disputes continue. And large-scale transportation is relatively lacking, making the circulation of goods very difficult. There are not many inland routes that can carry out large-scale water transportation throughout the continent. There are only the Sava River in the south and the Lion Lake Inland Sea area in the north. However, these two waterways face the same problem. Two or even three hostile countries have been arguing with each other to seize control of waterways and engage in waterway transportation. You have to face the enemy's army at any time, which is something that civilians do not dare to do. There are also carriages that specialize in passenger transportation. But these carriages are smaller in scale and are basically self-employed. The safety of passengers must be taken care of by themselves. If an attack occurs, the coachman may run away immediately or even rebel. In fact, sometimes the coachman may also act as a robber. So the transportation of Ponde is a big problem. Whether it is passenger transportation or freight transportation, when ordinary noble lords and merchants need to carry out large-scale transportation, they can only organize their own fleets or hire multiple carriages to go on the road together. And they also have to hire mercenaries to protect them all the way, which is equivalent to renting the carriages of the carriages. In fact, I still make my own luck. As for other conventional mercenary groups, they usually have a large number of soldiers. This results in very high transportation costs for goods. So it is normal for the price of goods from the west coast to increase 20 or 30 times when they are delivered to places like Chang'e town in the east. But this is a huge business opportunity. The Lord has just received more than 200 draft horses from Baron Leofric. And there will be a steady supply of horses from Brave Shield Castle. Seeing these large animals specially used to pull carts. The Lord's first reaction was that logistics and transportation could be improved. Even passenger transportation can be done. Moreover, this is also a reliable way to quickly accumulate troops and population. In this dangerous era, only brave and mature people can engage in the logistics industry. Of course, with Godric and the Horncall Rangers in River Town, the security of the eastern region will definitely be more secure than before. Leong had actually wanted to engage in the transportation industry for a long time. But he couldn't start until the entire region was stable. Because the market is obvious. Every noble lord and big businessman needs logistics and transportation. The market size is quite large. And bulk logistics can currently be considered a blank market. As for passenger transportation, it is even more urgent. Everyone has a need to travel. Especially businessmen and nobles. Therefore, the lord handed over this important business to Leslie. Leslie is very good at managing long-distance transportation affairs. Her previous business has been between Miss Cloud City and Chang'e Town. She once led a caravan to complete the 2,000-mile journey in a week. This is the case for other caravans or other caravans. Efficiency that no military can match. This transportation company is named Chang'e Express and is a subsidiary of Maishang International. It has two businesses, logistics and passenger transportation. This name is of course used to make people in the eastern region more familiar. After all, the main customer group in the initial stage is the lords and merchants around Chang'e Town. Leslie was placed by the lord outside the headquarters of the chief of military affairs in Chang'e Town, which was actually outside the inner fort of Lady Bella, where the Chang'e Town garrison had previously surrounded the inner fort. Godric's chosen location for the commander-in-chief of military affairs was the inner fort of Chang'e Town and that small square has now become the camp of Godric's personal guards. There is a large area of houses and open space outside the inner castle. Alma originally arranged for people to keep an eye on Lady Bella. Now they have left, leaving just enough land to carry a large number of motorcades. This is the back door Godric opened for Leon. He actually requisitioned this place as a military service area, and then gave the public equipment to Leon for private use to start a company. After all, he is the major shareholder of Maishang International. And that place is right next to the central street of Chang'e Town. Just walk straight along the wide central street from the outer gate of Chang'e Town. It is a very suitable location for the company's headquarters. The first task assigned to Leslie by the Lord is to buy all the transport fleets available in Chang'e Town. That's right. As long as we can agree on it. We'll just buy the person and the car together. Leon will not think about how to start small and gradually grow bigger at this time. He now has money and the ability to quickly raise a large amount of funds. He can directly adopt capital logic. To put it simply, it means quickly monopolizing the market at all costs 
and in setting industry standards yourself. In today's Chang'e town, no other nobles would interfere with this. And this large purchase went smoothly. After all, those engaged in transportation are small fleets or self-employed people, all civilians, and there are basically no nobles who would do such hard work. Godric had just assumed the post of chief of military affairs, and Leon was the county governor. These civilian convoys were eager to climb such a big tree. Within five days, the Lord used Dinars to smash out more than 400 carriages and more than 500 strong men, all of whom were armed, because fleet transportation often faces risks. Basically those who work in this industry will have some martial arts skills, but they are no longer willing to fight life and death like ordinary mercenaries. In fact, many regular mercenaries will engage in the transportation industry after they have families. Most of them were the mercenaries who stayed in the tavern for a long time a few years ago. In the past five days, the Lord spent a total of 100,000 dinars. He finally spent all the gold coins in his hand. And now only the silver coins in the warehouse in the territory are left. Changha Express, which had just been established for five days, suddenly had more than 500 employees. There are also close to 700 horses. Of course, all draft horses and pack horses. Leslie was a little panicked about this. She had never managed so many people before. However, the Lord obviously took this situation into consideration. In the past few days, he transferred Eric to serve as the leading knight. In fact, he served as the head of the armed department of the Chang'e Express Company. Eric has a flexible mind and is smooth in dealing with things. But he does not lack courage and loyalty. Such people often have a bright future. And the Lord will always think of him first. Besides, the Lord did not assign him a knighthood. So he had to make up for it. Serving as a company executive can significantly increase his salary and dividends. With Eric's income, it is not a problem to support more than a dozen followers. Eric was a mercenary. And now, he has an official knight status. He is responsible for managing those rough guys. Those from the car dealer will not have any objections. In fact, even if Eric is given a big knight to lead him, he will definitely not be willing to change it. He can now manage 500 soldiers responsible for armed transportation. This is much more impressive than ordinary knights. There are few nobles in the entire kingdom who can. There are so many subordinates. With Eric in charge of these people, Leslie can be free to concentrate on business operations and transportation deployment and do what she is best at. The Chang'e Express was forced to operate like this. In fact, this is not a regular transportation company. After buying most of the fleet in Chang'e town, the Lord changed their original operating ideas. He asked Leslie to recruit a large number of people who could drive as grooms, that is, as temporary workers, so that these armed men with combat effectiveness would no longer do hard work. The newly recruited temporary grooms are the ones responsible for handling and driving. They will use the company's vehicles, obey the company's unified management, and will be paid once for each order. The armed personnel from the convoy were also divided into two parts. Those who are not strong in combat, but have a flexible mind will be responsible for receiving business and distributing orders. There are about 40 people in this department. Managed by Leslie, most of the remainder would be converted into purely armed escorts close to 500 men, who would be managed by Eric. At the same time, the Lord has directly standardized the prices based on distance and number of vehicles in each county in the past few days, and even made a table and published it. And the pricing is low. For example, when transporting a truckload of goods from Chang'e Town to White Deer Fort, no matter what the goods are, only 10 dinars are charged. From Chang'e Town to Wulong City, the charge is only 80 dinars per car and it depends on the distance anyway. The manpower dispatched is also standardized. Each vehicle is equipped with a driver and an armed escort as standard. The reason for standardization is to make it convenient to receive orders and calculate payments. And it will also be more convenient for customers. Drivers are not considered formal employees. They are only paid on a per item basis. For a total shipping order of 10 dinars, they can get 2 dinars. This reward is actually very high. After all, the coachmen have not provided any equipment or supplies. And there is no need to fight. Two dinars is enough to buy more than 100 kilograms of wheat, which can feed a family for a month. If they were doing other jobs, it would take an ordinary employee at least half a month to earn it. But now, it only takes a week at most to get from Chang'e Town to White Deer Castle. And a round trip by car only takes a week at most. A round trip to Fog City, even if they can't do it as well as Leslie, will take a month but they can earn 16 dinars a month. 
which is a high salary that they could not get before. Of course, the purpose of operating in this way is to reduce labor costs and free up those who are capable of fighting. Many noble farmhands are very good at driving carriages, but they had nothing else to do before, and now they can do it in their spare time. I would run my car for a period of time to earn some extra income. This will attract a large number of part-time workers in a short period of time. Of course, even if they are not formal employees, they cannot just drive cars casually. The coachman must first go to Leslie to register and verify his identity to avoid attracting any robbers. Then the driver has to wait for the assignment in Chungha town and decide whether to accept the order by himself. If he is not on site, he will definitely not be assigned. Almost like an extra on a set. Armed escorts are regular employees. They will be responsible for the safety of carriages, horses and roads. They will also keep an eye on the driver to prevent him from messing around. Their remuneration is also higher and they can share more than 40% of a single order. The reason why I say above is because there will be subsidies for businesses that need to leave the eastern region. Because the further away, the more dangerous it is. When transporting goods, the escort is responsible for delivering the goods to the recipient designated by the customer. And only after receiving the receipt can he receive his salary. If the goods are not delivered, there will be no money. The remaining nearly 40% is the company's revenue. But this is not a net income. Because to pay basic wages to regular employees, there may not be much profit in the early stage. And there may even be losses. Since he paid a basic salary, Eric would also train these subordinates. Of course, other people will also come to help with training when they are free. Such as Sir Roland or Close. Anyway, the big boss Leon is paying the salary. However, the standardized service of Chang'e Express does not guarantee the safety of the goods. The company only promises to refund the freight if the goods are not delivered. After all, each vehicle only sends one armed person to accompany it, which cannot guarantee the safety of the goods. If customers want to ensure the safety of the goods, they can use customized business. If the goods are lost, the company will not only refund the freight, but also compensate according to the market price. But the price of customization business must be discussed in detail with the person sent by Leslie. As long as the money is enough, Chang'e Express can escort 500 armed personnel to Penn Continent at the same time. Basically no one would dare to rob a security force of this size. If we follow the traditional method of previous teams, we must first see what kind of goods it is. If it is a high value item, then charge more. If it is of low value, then you may not accept it. And it is also impossible to guarantee the safety of the goods. After all, there are only a few dozen people in a fleet at most. And no matter how high the price is, there are only a few dozen people. In contrast, Chang'e Express new standardized operation method will naturally have great advantages. At least for conventional transportation. Customers can clearly understand the transportation cost. And Chang'e Express will definitely accept the order. In the eastern region, the safety of Maixiang International's companies is also guaranteed. And the possibility of accidents is low. If someone really robbed him, the two barons Godric and Leofric would definitely send troops to chase the robbers thousands of miles away. They were shareholders of the parent company Maixiang International and wanted to share the dividends. Therefore, merchants would think that this cost is much lower than transporting it themselves. In fact, it is much lower because just hiring a mercenary to escort them from Chang'e town to White Deer Castle costs more than 10 dinars. In such a comparison, the price-performance ratio of Chang'e Express will appear to be quite high. But in fact, the Lord changed the concept of those car dealerships. Originally, the staff of the car dealership were only regarded as grooms or carriage owners by their employers. And this was indeed the case. Now, these people are professional armed security personnel and professional soldiers. They are even regarded by businessmen as more trustworthy warriors than ordinary mercenaries. After all, they are now under Baron Leon. And at least they will not suddenly turn into gangsters. In this way, the price-performance ratio is suddenly improved. In addition to the driver, each vehicle is equipped with a professional armed security personnel as standard. Does this mean that the work of transporting goods is for free? In fact, people are still the same people. But after it was reorganized into a regular army, the effect was completely different. In this way, merchants will naturally take the initiative to generate a large number of orders. The price is completely standard. As long as they determine their own needs, they can generate orders. No negotiation is required. Just go to the company headquarters in Chang'e Town to pay and sign the order. You can even wait for the Chang'e Express company's vehicle to pick up the goods at your door. 
Of course, door-to-door -door pickup is also priced based on the distance and number of vehicles. Businessmen are the group that considers comprehensive costs the most. And they have a good relationship and trust with Maishan Company. After weighing this, they will definitely take the initiative to control operating costs again, which will encourage them to no longer support their own transportation vehicles and drivers. So where will the laid-off coachman and the carriages no longer needed by the merchants go? Where else can they go? Join the Long River Express. A positive cycle will quickly form, with more orders generated as merchants no longer maintain their own fleets. A large number of orders means that brothers who join Chungha Express can always have continuous business to do. In the past, small fleets often spent most of their time idle due to business negotiations, waiting, various communications and management, unable to find suitable business, industry competition, etc., and could often only do two or three high-priced businesses a year. In fact, most practitioners are vain, and their average income is not that high. After becoming an employee of Changha Express, you will have a fixed basic salary every month, a commission for every order, and you will probably always have something to do, which is of course more stable. Moreover, they don't have to do hard work and only need to focus on security work. This is very attractive to them. They used to be mercenaries. If they were not forced by life, no one would be willing to do hard work. In addition, the company is large enough to handle bulk logistics. And being able to handle bulk logistics ensures long-term business. In fact, they have been busy from the beginning. Chapter 129 A Very Difficult Goal Changha Express's business has been very good since its inception. After all, Godric's White Heart Castle and Leofric's Brave Shield Castle are both major shareholders of Maixiang International, together with Charles and Ralph. These insiders have a lot of business to do on their own. White Deer Castle needs to transport food and ordnance. Brave Shield Fort needs to transport horses and war preparation materials. Maishan Collar needs to transport food to its subordinate territories. And it also needs to go to Kerwin Village to transport back the food collected by the noble manors. These are obviously direct initial sample businesses. It's just that passenger transportation has not yet begun. The existing horse-drawn carriages are not suitable for transporting people. This requires the carpenters and blacksmiths in the territory to work together to build a box carriage. Teacher, why do you spend a lot of money to buy so many carriages? Is the transportation business so profitable? Why do I think I might lose money? Amy is the most concerned about the economy. She feels that the speed at which her teacher spends money is too scary. She has thrown away more than 100,000 dinars in five days. This money can no longer be said to be like water because it does not flow so fast. Now almost all the carriages in Changha town have been marked with the Griffin mark. And all the vehicles on the road are Changha Express vehicles. But to pay wages to more than 500 people and to maintain nearly 700 horses. The expenses are obviously huge. Even the expenses of White Deer Castle are not so huge. This kind of operation seems to be uneconomical in this era. A large number of carriages and draft horses are just free money. The people in those teams are not the citizens of Maishanling and have not sworn allegiance in the eyes of the nobles of Pendor. This is the behavior of a prodigal, because the land is the foundation of a lord. 100,000 dinars is enough to buy 10,000 acres of fertile land. And it can even come with a few large manors and mansions if a fool is willing to sell it. Amy, losses and profits cannot be measured purely in terms of money. What kind of business do you think can allow a lord to gain strong comprehensive strength in the shortest time? The lord lord had just finished enjoying the pleasure of spending a lot of money. He was sitting on his horse twisting a silver coin and looking around, and asked casually, What does comprehensive strength mean? Amy had never heard of the word. It refers to the comprehensive and comprehensive assessment of strength in terms of money, food, population, technological level, and war potential. For example, your father, for now, in a normal year, he can earn more than 20,000 dinars a year, and he can also receive about 400,000 pounds of grain tax every harvest season. There are more than 50 night territories under the jurisdiction of White Deer Castle. And all territories combined have nearly 10,000 civilians. Although the population is not large, most of the border counties are young and strong. Therefore, he can now mobilize more than a thousand troops at any time. And the equipment level and combat effectiveness of the troops are pretty good. Even excluding his status as military chief. As a lord, his current comprehensive strength ranks among the top four in the entire Lion Kingdom. Apart from King Ulrich and Duke Brennus of Cliff Bay, only the Horton family of Lion Lake City should be stronger than him. After Leon finished speaking, 
He calculated his family wealth again and shook his head. As for my territory, the population is only a few hundred and the army is only more than a hundred. The food tax is not even enough to feed the people. Even if it is fully mobilized, it can't make up two dollars. An army of a hundred men. In terms of overall strength, it is probably the last among the barons in the kingdom. Once I lose a battle, I will lose everything. Then you should open up more land and absorb more people. With your ability, you will definitely become one of the top nobles in ten or eight years. Amy still has confidence in her teacher's abilities. The problem is that using the traditional method, I have to develop slowly for many years. With a small population base and a small territory, no matter how wealthy I am, I cannot develop strong war potential in a short period of time. But I have too many a powerful enemy. There was some worry in Liang's words. Amy can understand that her teacher has offended many people. The Horton family will definitely deal with him after they calm down. And the three prophets may also make a comeback. In addition, the two governors of the Bacchus Empire, and Agathon, and others may take revenge on him. And Amy also knows that no matter what, she will definitely stand firmly on Liang's side. The teacher saved her twice. In Amy's view, most of Leon's enemies are related to him saving himself. So his troubles are also his own troubles. But Amy also knows that only in fantasy stories, there will be situations where powerful enemies watch the protagonist slowly develop. But never kill the protagonist. In the real world, who would give the enemy time to develop? In less than a year, after those enemies have solved the trouble Leon caused them, they will start to take revenge. Leon had been trying his best to fight for time and space for himself before. He offended so many people. Not for Amy, but for himself. His enemies were far more than those on the surface. And he only has half a year to a year at most. Amy, I must make myself as powerful as the Duke within a year. So now, the criterion for measuring whether something is worthwhile is not whether it makes money, but whether it can achieve this goal. Amy was stunned for a while before she was sure that the teacher was not talking nonsense and that he was serious. However, she felt that her teacher might still be a little distracted. What was she talking about? To rival the duke within a year? Is this goal too difficult? Which duke has not developed through the continuous efforts of several generations and hundreds of years? But thinking about her teacher's Maishan group, she felt that it was somewhat possible. So, you want to use this transportation business to achieve this goal? But, Amy was a little confused. After all, she was only 18 years old. No matter how talented she was, she couldn't think of more aspects. In fact, it is indeed possible for the transportation business to achieve such a goal quickly. Although it is indeed possible to lose money in the early stage, the Lord does not care. Even if he spends all his money, he will continue to do it. How could it be possible to deliberately expand this kind of business just for money? With just such a business, money, food, people, and troops can all be obtained. Reality is not a game. You can't lead a team around the map to make money, hire people, and build troops. Then you can only let the transportation team roam around the map on your behalf. The food problem is actually a transportation problem. Of course, in the final analysis, we have to farm. But the results of farming are slow, and it can take several years, and we still have to depend on the weather. However, the results of improving transportation are very fast. As long as you have the ability to transport bulk commodities over long distances, you don't need to rely on land at all in the short term. When you have to rely on it, the land will have enough time to develop. As for people, this refers not only to the population, but also to other special talents, such as technical personnel. The places that Chang'e Express footprint can cover are the places that Liang's hands can touch. That is, the places where people can be recruited. You can recruit people from all over the continent, which is much more reliable than squatting in a small Maishan collar to recruit people from among the people with a transportation company with footprints all over the mainland. Leon can bring back more technical personnel and more advanced experience. Some things are impossible to make directly for someone who has never seen them before, such as muskets. Even if the Lord can't draw blueprints, he can't actually make them. You know, in a poor place that doesn't even have a standard scale for rulers. Even if you come up with precise longitudinal and cross-sectional structural drawings, you can't let an ordinary blacksmith who has never seen these things make things by hand. It's not as simple as just doing what you want. It's an entire industrial line, and it has to start with a standard vernier caliper. It is necessary to have higher precision measuring tools, qualified steel, reliable drills, lathes and boring tables, 
And finally, they can be built by skilled blacksmiths. This is a whole system. And even with the help of various professionals, it will take many years to build it in a place with neither industrial foundation nor industrial standards. And most of the people in the territory don't even know the words. How can we do this? The only way is to have the transportation team go to coastal trading cities to buy it. Or you can get samples from Buckley or other technologically developed areas and then imitate them and modify them. Only then will you be able to develop technological capabilities in a short period of time. In terms of military strength, the armed security personnel of Chang'e Express are already a ready-made army. They are all young and strong and have experience. And this is an army that will not attract attention. They are not in the territory and are not easily tabooed. King Ulrich's thinking, the Lord has already understood that whoever has the strongest military force will be attacked by him. If you want to have the strength of a duke, you will definitely be suppressed by the king. After all, any king is eager to achieve centralization. And Ulrich is obviously paying attention to Leon's appointment as the governor of Air County. This is a warning to him not to form gangs and collude. The king would be worried that his lords would be too powerful or form an alliance. But if the lords were not powerful enough, they would be bullied by others. So Leon has grown up obscenely. And he maintains a force that meets the status of a barony. So he won't be tabooed. Right? As for the company that is bigger and has more employees, it is called the legal property of the nobility and should be protected by the kingdom. But the Lord will not simply rely on a single business system. He has backup options. The transportation company's business is just a premise. To achieve the goal, we need to control more rigid needs, such as food sales. This requires your help. The Lord twirled the center of the silver coin with two fingers, blew on the silver coin in his hand, and held it to his ear to listen. The purity of the silver coins is quite high, and the buzzing sound is very pleasant. What can I do to help you? After hearing Leong say that he needed his help, Amy cheered up. She really hoped she could help. She actually felt a little guilty for getting into trouble with her last curse word. Although Leon controlled the final result quite well. After all, he made a powerful enemy because of it. And she was actually more nervous than Leon and Godric. I need your help in negotiating some food procurement business. I want to ensure that we will never be short of food again in the future. Leon threw the silver coin to Amy. This is exactly what we should do. Although we have enough food now, there is no guarantee that we will not be short in the future. We should stock up on more food. Amy took the silver coin and nodded. It was a Barclay silver dollar. A large silver coin weighing one ounce and one dinar. The same value as the small gold coin of Pinder. In the Troy system, one ounce weighs about 31 grams which is equivalent to one tail of silver in the hexadecimal period of the Chinese dynasty. The front of the silver dollar is the head of Emperor Buckley, and the edge is a circle of weave ears. There are no holes or bubbles. It seems that it was pressed and polished again after casting, and the level of craftsmanship is quite high. This weak ear is probably used to prevent counterfeiting. The grains are very fine, making it difficult for ordinary small workshops to imitate on a large scale. It's not just for food storage. Amy. You may not understand it now, but you will soon. In fact, Leon already has quite a lot of food, which will not be used up for a while. Even with the hundreds of elderly people Sir Roland is about to bring back, it will not be used up. Most of the employees of Chang'e Express travel frequently and do not need to take care of their meals. And unless they swear allegiance to Leon, join my Xiangling, and become non-commissioned officers according to my Xiangling's requirements, there is no need to take care of the food. But for future planning, the Lord still plans to make Griffin Grain and Oil Company bigger and stronger. If a Lord wants to enhance his strength, he can actually have many ideas. There are many roads to your goal. But the one that suits you best is definitely different from the one that your predecessors have taken. The one chosen by the Lord Lord is the most suitable for him. It's just right and matches Amy's business talent. The Duke of Alma is good at maneuvering. So he uses power to control the jurisdiction by seeking more territory. This is the normal thinking of nobles. Earl Odin is good at fighting. He uses the army and knights to strengthen his strength and controls the place by controlling the army. This is also a way. And Leon is good at making money. So he will naturally take the commercial route and use commercial monopoly to kidnap the entire region. If Leon had money, grain, and soldiers, he would also have the power to price grain in the eastern region and monopolize transportation. So even if he is still a small village baron, who can do anything to him? Unless he was assassinated, the king would not dare to touch him. You don't have to have a lot of land and farmers to be called a powerful lord. 
you can still be a wealthy merchant lord. After arranging the affairs of the transportation company, the lord and Amy took a convoy to Kerwin Village, where there were more than 200,000 pounds of grain waiting for him to receive. That was the food that the nobles of Kerwin put together to give to Liang to express their gratitude. It was not appropriate to send others there. After all, it was free of charge, and the lord had to come forward in person. Of course, if you want to discuss long-term business, you must come in person. He specially brought Amy here because he wanted to deal with the nobles of Kewen. He wanted to negotiate all the excess grain produced by Kewen Village in the future. Grain is a strategic material, and it is controlled by the nobles. Leon already knew how troublesome it was to buy grain last time. So he would not think that he would become fat with one bite. He could only take his time and take Amy to negotiate deals with various villages and towns. And use contracts to receive all future food output in his hands. In addition, their own territory continues to open up a large amount of wasteland for planting to increase output. Then, in the next season, harvest day in the fall, see if you can make yourself the largest grain merchant in the east. The Lord wants to rely on his ability to transport bulk grains and try to control the grain trade in the area. Not to control output, but to control transactions. The business negotiations in Kewen Village went very smoothly. With a certain relationship foundation and the reputation of Amy's parents, the nobles were very polite, and no one refused. Since Liang said that he would let the transportation team come to take care of all the loading and transportation work, this would avoid causing trouble to the nobles. So there was no need to put the excess output in the noble manor to mold in the warehouse. A few days later, the 300,000 pounds of grain business for the next quarter was settled. And the settlement was simple, and could even be accounted for. Amy's face is still good, and those nobles will not care too much about her. In fact, many of the small gifts given to her by the old nobles are worth a hundred dinars. She is noble, beautiful and lively. Such a girl always looks good in front of the elderly. Is welcome. Feeling that talking about acquisitions like this would work, the two people became more confident and let the convoy deliver food to return on their own. They planned to cross the river from the bridge in Kewen village to the north and try to see if they could talk to other nobles in the north. Crossing the river is actually the northern part of the kingdom. But the area around the Tontian River does not belong to the Horton family's sphere of influence. After all, it is too far away from Sherhu City. Although there are no villages or towns marked on the map, there are actually quite a few noble estates in this area. The Tontian River itself is indeed dangerous due to its strong water and high waves. But the fields near the river are quite fertile. Especially around the gentle lake behind Chang'e Town and across the lake from Chang'e Town. A few decades ago, there were many it was used to pioneer the settlement of nobles. Nowadays, most of those places are the estates of small nobles. They usually use boats to fish or cross the lake to travel to Chang'e Town. For Leon. Of course, the more grain transactions that can be negotiated in advance, the better. The spirit of contract and pander is very strong. The nobles will not publicly break the contract because it is equivalent to breaking the oath, which is the nobles' greatest reputation. Once the contract is broken even once, it means that the person's oaths and covenants are not trustworthy. The king, his subordinates and allies will abandon such a person as long as there is a transaction contract in hand. Even if the other party is short of food next season, they will find a way to get enough food to complete the transaction. If deals can be negotiated with more large manor owners, it is indeed possible to achieve the goal of becoming the largest grain merchant in Chang'e Town soon. After all, the Lord's bid is very generous. Liang's business philosophy has always been to monopolize if he can, and to gain a leading position even if he cannot monopolize. Only a successful company can be considered a successful company if it can formulate its own industry rules. The two of them discussed how to be a reliable profiteer, and gradually came to a large lakeside manor. There were at least several thousand acres of wheat fields around the manor that had been harvested. Whose manor is here? Amy? Do you know? I've never been here. Wait. Amy's expression changed drastically after just one glance. And she even pulled out her sword. Red Brotherhood? The Lord Lord looked at the manor in surprise. There is a mark in front of the manor. But the Lord doesn't know what it means. It looked like a red cross. Painted on the side of the stone archway at the entrance to the manor. As if it was daubed with blood. A long black sword is drawn upright inside the cross. Teacher, this is the mark of the Red Brotherhood. Is this manor their stronghold? But such a large manor cannot. Chapter 130 Medenheim's Death Swordsman The owner of a large-scale estate with several thousand acres of land must be at least a powerful baron or even an earl. 
the Red Brotherhood in the Lion Realm should not be so rampant that they dare to openly occupy large-scale territories. Right? The Red Brotherhood is a gangster who lives in the dark side of the city. It usually only engages in some illegal transactions or does some killing and smuggling. On weekdays, the various big brothers also fight fiercely with each other. It is difficult to integrate them together and they usually do not have the ability to break into such a large manner, especially near Chang'e town. The Red Brotherhood has almost disappeared due to the presence of the Horn Call Rangers. How could they gather in such a large manner in broad daylight? This is not a town either. At present, the Lord only has about ten people from the guards around him. Of course, he will not be easily involved in danger. So he asked Close to go in and see what's going on. But Close just walked to the door and took a few glances. Before he could go in, a throwing axe was thrown from behind the low wall on the other side. Moreover, this flying axe seemed to be aimed at Leon. The attack was so sudden that even Leon didn't have time to react. He was paying attention to close his side, and the low wall was in front of him. And the trajectory of the flying axe was just blocked by Amy beside him. Fortunately, Amy reacted quickly. She saw the flying axe and blocked it with a sword. However, her strength was really not that good although she barely blocked the flying axe. The sword was also knocked to the ground. Amy! Hide! The lord flew out on horseback to fight back. Alice jumped directly over the low wall, which was only more than one meter high. Then she heard Close shout, They are pirates! In fact, Leon has already seen it. Several guys wearing horned helmets were running towards the big house in the center of the manor. This look looks very familiar to the lord lord. It is exactly the same as the pirates he encountered after coming out of Miss Cage City. How did these pirates come to this inland area? It's a pirate, and it's a brotherhood. So it's obviously a gangster den. Now that we have encountered a bandit den, we must destroy it first. Brothers, charge! Don't kill them all! Leave one alive for questioning! This time, the Lord is not going to be nagging. He had experienced the fighting power of these pirates on land. A dozen hungry naked Medenheimers could be twenty pirates away. Now that the great swordsmen were well fed and well armed, it was estimated that killing hundreds of pirates would not be a problem at all. The Lord didn't even have the interest to join the battle and directly drove his horse back to Amy. Amy had already picked up her noble sword, rubbing her wrist and looking at him. I didn't expect you to have this skill. Who is better at swordsmanship? You or Sarah? Leon was quite impressed by Amy. This young apprentice was very calm when facing the enemy, and he blocked the sword very accurately. Almost a teacher. Aren't you worried about the fighting situation inside? Amy was indeed not nervous at all. After seeing two large-scale battles, she was no longer afraid of the battlefield, and her adaptability was amazingly fast. These pirates are nothing to worry about. There is no need to worry. But just as he said this, someone in the manor was heard shouting, Where did you bastards come from? How dare you run wild here? Do you know who I am? Come on! Kill them! Leon was stunned. This voice sounded so familiar. This male duck is a voice. Let me guess. This sounds like Fauché's voice? The illegitimate son of the Duke of Alma. Leon felt that he might have made a mistake. This place may indeed be regarded as the stronghold of the Red Brotherhood. But it is too normal for the Red Brotherhood to gather here. This manor probably belongs to Fauché. As an investor in the Red Brotherhood, there will naturally be a Red Brotherhood sign on the doorstep to prevent the brothers from looking in the wrong place. Perhaps this manor was a place for Fauché's father, Alma, to settle down and start a business after he determined that he could not obtain a pioneering certificate for his illegitimate son. It turns out that they are the intruders. But who told the pirate to throw an axe at the first sight? Could it be that the pirate had a grudge against him? Leon hurried in. When they entered the manor, the two sides were already fighting fiercely. There are more than 30 pirates in the manor, as well as about 30 men in black all dressed in familiar attire to the Lord. These pirates were obviously the same group as those who kidnapped Anson, and were probably the majority of the pirates that Anson said were not in the lair. The way these guys attack people when they see them is exactly the same as the pirates in the lair. Those men in black were dressed similarly to the people who had chased Leong in Lion City, and even looked similar in how they used flying knives. These two groups were besieging the great swordsmen led by clothes. But although there were many people, they could not stop the strong men at all. The heavy armor of the Mendenheimers was very thick, and those flying knives and axes could not even break through the armor. However, there are still a few guys who look like tin cans in the manor. They seem to be some rogue knights, probably the leaders of the men in black. They do have some fighting ability. 
these are the only people the great swordsmen are guarding against. Otherwise, they would probably be able to chase the others everywhere. Fauché was indeed standing outside the mansion at the center of the estate. An axe in his hand. But this time he didn't rush forward, but said something to a bodyguard beside him. It was a tall bodyguard. No smaller than clothes. He seemed to be carrying a two-handed sword on his back. And the steel helmet on his head covered the upper half of his face. Hurry up! Kill them! Are you scared? Bastard? Fauché's voice suddenly rose, and he seemed a little angry. The Lord heard Fauché say this again. This time, he also said it to the bodyguard beside him. But the tall bodyguard did not fight. He kept looking at the swordsman and turned to say something to Fauché. Then Fauché became furious. Old guy, I pay to hire you. And I am the son of prophecy. You actually disobey orders? What happened to my fellow countrymen? Can't you beat my fellow countrymen? It seems that the bodyguard is also from Medenheim. Leong remembered the words of Andrew, the fat boss of the Fog Cage City Arena. The great swordsman he hired before was injured in the last game. And I have to change his formation members. Otherwise it will be too fake. Is this talking about the bodyguard in front of me? The Lord shook his head, stepped forward and shouted, Stop! Stop the one on the other side. Sir Fauché, are you okay? Fauché immediately noticed Leong and frowned. It's you. This guy seems to remember Leong. But he was not as impulsive as he was on the field. But glanced sideways at Liang's flag. You are now the Baron. Everyone. Stop. It seems this is a misunderstanding. This guy's gloomy face suddenly became sunny. And he even smiled. This guy doesn't look stupid. He just doesn't know how to fight. Right. The contrast between Fauché's previous performance on the field and now was really big. And for a while, the Lord was completely confused. The leaders on both sides said to stop. So the fight naturally stopped. And both sides retreated to their bosses. And Close also saw the Menheimer on the opposite side. Is that a fellow countryman of yours? He seems to be quite old. Do you know him? The Lord asked. Close whispered. His helmet covered his eyes. So I couldn't recognize him. But at his age, since he is still on the battlefield, he must be a swordsman to the death. A decisive swordsman? The Lord looked carefully at the bodyguard. He has a thick beard on his lips, which seems to be combed into two sides. He looks like he is in his fifties. He is wearing a yellow and black striped imperial breastplate with a cape. This is not Menheim plate armor, but from the Bacchus Empire. Half body armor. It's just that the yellow and black stripes are indeed Menheim's flag pattern. This guy. Could it be Frederick? The Lord remembered the appearance of a partner in the game. He seemed to have two big beards, but this old guy actually followed Fauché. Isn't it too miserable? Seeing the Lord looking at the Mendenheimer opposite, Crozier added, Don't worry. Sir, we have sworn allegiance to you. No matter who the other party is, we will fight for you. Probably because he was worried that the Lord would have random thoughts. Close showed his loyalty. There are many people from Mendenheim working as mercenaries in the Pender continent. Sometimes they do meet on the battlefield. It is not uncommon for people who know each other to be on opposing sides on the battlefield. When encountering this situation, they can only discuss with their employers to see if they cannot participate in the war. But if the employer doesn't agree, then you still have to fight. As mercenaries, the people of Menheim must keep their word. It would be shameful to betray the employer. So they can only try not to fight with their fellow citizens. However, Close and the others have officially pledged their allegiance to Liang. And they will take action no matter who the enemy is. But what the Lord is thinking about is not whether their fellow villagers will kill each other. But how to get the people from Menheim over? Sir Fauché, is this your manner? I think you should know that your subordinates can easily cause misunderstandings. Unfortunately, I have the responsibility to assist Lord Godric in improving the security around Lona Town. Leong pointed at the gangs around Fauché who knew at a glance that they were not decent people. Fauché still smiled and curled his lips. This is not the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town. Lord Baron, this is private property. You trespassing on private property. I'm afraid this is not called a law and order. The Lord made a serious face, took his griffin flag from Samur and raised it. This is the first time I have seen a commoner dare to talk to a noble like this. You, a commoner who doesn't even have a last name, have what a shitty territory. Are taxes paid on these properties? The smile on Fauché's face disappeared. I remember your name is Leon. Right? How dare a pioneering baron be so arrogant? This is the territory of the Duke of Alma. You enter the Duke's territory without permission and kill the Duke's attendants. Just wait to be wanted. 
The Lord frowned and expressed disdain for this verbal slander. When did I kill the Duke's attendant? Why didn't I know? Fauché grinned and struck an axe on the neck of a pirate who had been seriously injured by the swordsman before. The pirate fell down at the sound with a deep bloody groove cut on his neck. He must not be able to survive. Now you know? Surround them. His. This guy seems to be a real gangster and he seems to be very skilled in such things as false accusations. His poor performance in the arena was probably just because he was used to being arrogant and he was really not good at fighting. In addition, he knew someone was protecting him and he didn't restrain himself. However, the Lord was not frightened. Instead, he said to the pirates, Your people were killed like this, and you just watched? None of the pirates spoke, but Fauché smiled conspiratorially. This kind of injury would have killed you. Do you think my man is a fool? Come together. Catch him. Fauché then began to back away quickly. The Lord Lord sighed. He also knew that Fauché's call to stop before was actually to have his people surround him. But he didn't care. After all, these pirates and underworld gangsters couldn't surround Alice, who was now wearing horse armor. Fauché does have a good ability in dealing with underworld affairs. But his weakness is also obvious. He is not good at fighting, does not understand real war, and does not understand how powerful a fully armed and skillful heavy armored force is. Gangster gangsters always like to build numbers. He also always likes to surround his opponents with more people. They did now surround the 12 men on their side with 70 men. But the problem is that neither the Menenheimers nor Leong care about being surrounded by such lightly armed gangsters, or even unarmored gangsters. This will actually prevent them from running around throwing axes. Then kill them! The Lord rode Alice and easily broke through the siege of the Red Brotherhood members. The power that burst out when Alice charged was simply not something that these unarmored men in black could stop. Then Leong rushed straight towards Fauché. Fauché was retreating. Seeing the Lord rushing over so easily, he became obviously panicked and danced around shouting, Come on! Old guy! You have to protect me! The Menenheim man did take action. He took off the sword from his back and faced Leong. But the Lord did not intend to deal with him. He rode his horse and planned to go around and directly deal with the weakling Fauché. However, just when he passed by the Menenheimer, the big sword took action. The Menenheimer used a turn, vertical jump and one-handed horizontal slash, which is a very rare practice on the battlefield. This kind of unreserved sword power usually only appears in swordsmanship performances. But the long dual sword jumped with this turn and actually covered a distance of more than two meters to his side. And the blade went straight to Liang's chest. The force of this sword does not seem to be strong. But the acceleration of the turn makes the blade speed terrifyingly fast. Liang didn't even hear the wind of the sword. And the blade was already in front of him. Fortunately, the long sword in the Lord's hand was already standing upright on his chest. The two swords intersected and made a gentle, check sound. After just a slight contact, the Menenheimer's dual sword was retracted by the force of blocking. And then it was pulled sideways again from the opposite direction. This is another horizontal slash after turning in reverse. Leon directly carried Su Qin's sword on horseback and blocked it again. This time, he did not give his opponent a chance to use his strength. But the Menenheimer stepped forward directly, grasped the hilt of the sword with both hands, and slashed along the blade of Leon's sword. His pace was surprisingly fast. This is an attempt to cut off his hand. If Leon dares to let go, he will cut off his horse. Leon kicked his legs directly. Alice took a step forward, and Leon also used the horse's forward jump to fly down, half turned in the air, and used the strength of his waist and abdomen to throw away the sword. Then, he took a long stride and rushed in front of the Medenheimer. Liang's sword was much shorter than the Medenheimer's dueling sword. He could only passively take a beating while riding a horse. And he could only fight back if he got close in front of him. Moreover, the Lord did not want to give his opponent too many chances. He even reached a distance of less than half a meter. The sword in his hand was not used for stabbing. But for cutting, the one meter long sword was not suitable for this distance. So he could only cut. But with this close quarters fighting method, the opponent's 1.7 meter long two-handed dual sword is completely useless and cannot be blocked. The Menenheim man did not retreat. He knew that if he retreated, Leon would conveniently change his attack from cutting to stabbing, which would inflict even greater damage. So he stepped forward and bumped into him with his shoulder, seemingly trying to knock the Lord away. Seeing this situation, Leon also bumped into each other. As a result, the two did not retreat from each other, and it became a real hand-to-hand -hand fight, and the armor was squeezed out with a squeak sound. Neither of them could use their swords. 
The opponent freed up one hand and started punching, seemingly planning to grab Liang's armor. But the Lord Lord was obviously better at fighting in this state. He kicked his opponent's calf on the bone, then dodged sharply, and then swung his sword over. The opponent's upper body was already pressing forward, but his calf was kicked again, causing him to lose his balance and stagger, although he stabilized and did not fall. Liang's sword after dodging had already hit his shoulder. The outcome has been decided. Excellent skills. I am Frederick from Mettenheim. Since I lost one-on-one, -on -one, I will leave it to you. The man from Mettenheim dropped his dueling sword in a shameless manner and opened his hands to admit defeat. It's indeed Frederick. Friedrich, withdraw from the battlefield yourself. Your fellow soldiers are my bodyguards. And I will not harm you. The Lord took back his sword and turned around to look for Fauché. No one was seen. He has entered the building. There are still a few people in the building. Be careful not to be ambushed. Frederick was speaking behind him. His words contained relief after admitting failure. And he also seemed to be a little gloating about his misfortune. He was probably also a little dissatisfied with Fauché. Thank you. The Lord ran directly towards the house. It was a two-story white painted wooden building, covering an area of about one acre, and looked like a standard manor villa. But as soon as Leong ran to the door, he saw someone holding a long black pole inside the door. There seemed to be sparks burning. The Lord's hair stood on end. He turned around suddenly and threw himself at the foot of the wall like a dog chewing mud. Although he looked embarrassed, he managed to avoid it. At the same time that Leong threw himself at the wall, a loud voice sounded from inside the door. Boom! There was smoke coming out of the door. That's a hacking matchlock gun. Chapter 131 Matchlock Gun The little spark that the Lord saw was obviously the match rope clamped on the snake's head. This should be a matchlock gun that has just developed a rod-type trigger. Pulling the trigger can make the matchlock contact the gunpowder pool on the outside of the gun body. Fortunately, this is just a matchlock gun in its early stages. After the match ignites the gunpowder pool in the gun body, you need to wait for nearly half a second until the gunpowder burns from the powder pool into the bullet chamber before the bullet can be fired. It was precisely because of the half second of gunpowder burning time that the Lord was able to avoid this fatal ambush. Fortunately, Leong is a modern man and is very sensitive to this kind of black pipe. If it were another noble knight, he might not have the consciousness to avoid it if he was pointed at by an iron pipe. However, after the gunshot, the Lord moved quickly. He quickly peeked his head from the corner into the dim light inside the door and could clearly see only one spot of fire inside. It looks like a cigarette but in the dark. There is only one flame head, which means there is only one musket. That's a shame. This kind of matchlock gun cannot fire continuously. If you can fire one shot per minute, you are considered a qualified musketeer. Leong rushed in with his long sword in hand and kicked a strong man who was blocking the door with a shield. It was a dazzling sunny day outside but the light inside the door was relatively dark due to the huge gap. After Leong rushed in, he could only see three dark figures for a while. Since he couldn't see clearly, the Lord swung his sword and started to chop at it no matter who it was. They were all enemies anyway. The gunman holding the matchlock gun was hurriedly shaking the medicine bag and preparing to fill it. When he saw Leong rushing in, he shrank back and hid, and then directly threw the medicine bag in his hand towards Leong who had just rushed through the door. This technique is quite skillful. It seems that he often uses dirty tricks like spreading lime. The Lord reacted quickly. He saw something floating over him and immediately stepped back to the door. And then, he smelled the unique smell of nitrate and sulfur mixture of black gunpowder. People in China are familiar with this smell. And most traditional fireworks and firecrackers have this smell. The Lord's heart skipped a beat. And he reacted very quickly and rushed out again. What the HL? These uneducated underworlds. Spreading gunpowder in a closed environment? Especially in an environment with an open flame like a match rope. However, the gunman was probably lucky. The gunpowder bag he scattered did not cause a big explosion. But the Lord also clearly heard a sizzling sound of burning gunpowder. Then, a violent burst of smoke floated out of the house. A violent coughing sound was also heard. It was obvious that some of the black powder thrown around must have been ignited by the matches attached to the guns. Then Leon heard Fauché's screaming voice. You idiot! Don't run! Put out the fire quickly! But a few seconds later, two strong men ran out together, crawling and coughing. Neither of them had matchlocks in their hands, and their faces were blackened by smoke. These two guys were obviously choked to death. But the Lord did not see Fauché come out. Leon turned over and hit two swords. 
the two strong men couldn't block it at all. In fact, their tears were boiling and they basically couldn't block it. One of them was chopped down to the ground easily. Then Liang held the griffin sword in one hand and put it on the other's neck. Where is Bo Shea? Ahem dot still in there dot ahem. The strong man was still out of breath at this time, and his violent coughing made him bend over without any resistance at all. But now, he has an extremely sharp sword on his neck. As a result, when he bent over and coughed, he put his neck on the blade of the sword and Leon didn't even have time to stop. So the idiot slowly fell to the ground with blood spurting from his neck. I don't know if it was a suicide or an accident, but when the Lord planned to enter the small building again, he saw a blazing fire at the door. The gunpowder just now has set the wooden building on fire. The gunpowder scattered everywhere caused the area inside the door, on the ground floor, to burn very quickly. The flames had sealed the entire door and spread rapidly upstairs. The weather was sunny, and there was a breeze blowing in the manor by the lake. The building was made of all wood. The fire ignited in just ten seconds, and there was a violent, sizzling, sound from the door again. It seems that more gunpowder has been ignited probably because the amount of gunpowder was not particularly dense. There was no explosion in the building, but there were continuous deflagrations. Pong! Pong! There were constant flashes of fire and smoke in the building. The Lord had no choice but to retreat far away. It was obvious that Fauché had placed gunpowder everywhere in the building. Such explosions would soon engulf the wooden building. It looked like Fauché might not be able to escape. There was such a loud movement in the house, including the sound of gunfire and smoke which naturally attracted the attention of others. In the matter outside, a group of people were still fighting in a melee, but the smaller party had already gained the upper hand. The great swordsmen were well equipped, with thick armor and long swords, and could withstand the enemy's attacks and slash at random. Now they were chasing those pirates and gangsters all over the fields. At this moment, after the small building began to explode, all the enemies seemed to pause for a moment, then dispersed and began to flee in all directions. The pirates ran straight into the lake, while the Red Brotherhood guys scattered in all directions, all running very fast. The great swordsmen wore heavy armor and were few in number, so it was impossible to catch up with everyone. Those rogue knights and a dozen or so miscellaneous troops also planned to run into the building, but were immediately blocked by clothes and the others waving their big swords. The minions dispersed in a hurry, and the great swordsmen blocked a few rogue knights and hacked at them, and the situation was quickly controlled. In fact, these rogue knights also planned to run, but they were dressed like cans and couldn't run fast at all. The great swordsmen chopped off their legs one by one with swords from behind. The Lord Lord had already walked around the side of the building, wanting to see where Fauché was. Leon didn't want to save the illegitimate son who was sealed in the fire. He wanted to save the matchlock gun. This building was built close to the lake, with a balcony on the second floor at the back. The balcony on the second floor faces the wide lake and there is a wooden boat on the side of the lake. At this time, a dozen pirates were pushing the wooden boat towards the back of the house, and then jumped on the boat and started paddling. In this case, it was definitely impossible to catch up. There are specialties in the art, and since the pirates have boats, most of them can, can run away. But Leon still couldn't see Fauché. There was only the pirate's boat on the lake, and Fauché was not on it. Fauché, come out and surrender. You must have died inside. Right? Leon shouted loudly. The entire building has been surrounded by fire, and the second floor is about to be completely swallowed up. There will definitely be a dead end in the building. In such a short period of time, Fauché, a fat guy with little physical strength, wouldn't just disappear without a trace. Get out of the way. This was Amy's voice, coming from behind Leon. Amy was riding a horse on the side of the building, just a few dozen meters behind Leon. She was holding her lady's crossbow in her hand, aiming at the second floor where the flames were rising and filled with thick smoke. Leon only glanced back at Amy and found that Amy looked quite nervous, realizing that something was wrong. He rolled on the spot holding his head. Bang. Whoosh. At this moment, a gunshot rang out from the balcony on the second floor. Amy's crossbow bolt also shot out at the same time. Then, a figure fell from the balcony on the second floor of the wooden building and fell into the lake. The great swordsmen also reacted and swarmed towards the lake, intending to find the shooter. Leon! Are you okay? After Amy fired the crossbow, she saw that the lord had rolled around and stopped moving. She quickly dismounted and ran over nervously. Then he threw away the crossbow in his hand and started to pull at Leon. When she gets nervous, 
She no longer uses the title, teacher. Hiss dot it hurts. The Lord bared his teeth and clutched his lower back. His face twisted in pain. Are you injured? Where are you injured? Amy openly Ang's hand in a panic. Tears almost coming out of her eyes. There was no external injury to the lower back area that Leon was covering. But his pain was not an act. He rolled subconsciously and was knocked hard by a stone on the ground. His half-armor could not protect his waist. And he had indeed suffered internal injuries. After rolling around just now, I almost lost my breath. And right where he was standing just now, a small hole appeared in the ground. And white smoke was coming out. Leon gritted his teeth and sat up, covering his waist and eyes and moving a bit. Fortunately, his internal organs should not be hurt. Looking at the bullet holes around him, he let out a long breath. Fortunately, Amy saw the enemy. Otherwise, she would have been hit hard. Why did you come in? Didn't I tell you to hide? Most men are like this. If they receive help from a woman passively, their first reaction is not to say thank you, but to ramble on. You told me that to make sure you don't get caught. It's best to stay behind the person with the strongest fighting ability. So ever since you broke out of the siege, I've been on guard behind you. Seeing that nothing serious happened to Leon, Amy became calmer. Fortunately, the gunman didn't attack you. Leon dug into the bullet hole a few times and dug out a deformed lead bullet. Sir, this guy is dead. In just a moment, Summer had dragged out a wet person, or rather a corpse, from the shallow water near the lake. By the way, he also fished out the matchlock gun. This is the man who just fell from the second floor balcony into the lake. The man who just shot Leon. This is Fauché himself. But at this time, the blonde young man had a crossbow arrow stuck in his neck and was already dead. Looking back at the famous pirate boats and Fauché's body, Leon sighed. Apparently, Fauché randomly scattered gunpowder in the living room on the first floor, causing an accidental fire. Two of his men failed to put out the fire and ran out choked by the smoke. And Fauché's legs and feet probably weren't that flexible, and he couldn't run out. This basically created a real self-inflicted situation. Fauché then retreated to the second floor balcony with a gun, presumably planning to jump into the lake to escape. But when he saw Leon coming to the side, he planned to kill Leon with a cold shot before jumping into the lake and running away. As a result, Amy saw him and shot him a crossbow. Amy's shooting skills are really quite accurate. Amy, good job. Do you know who he is? The Lord gesticulated with his thumb, signaling Summer to throw the body down. Amy shook her head. Isn't he the leader of the Red Brotherhood? What? He has a good background? Leon raised his eyebrows. It does have a good background. This guy is the illegitimate son of the Duke of Alma. Fauché. Amy was stunned for a moment. But then she shook her head indifferently. I heard Sister Sarah mention him. It is said that he is a scumbag? Leon nodded. Probably he is indeed a scumbag. Then I guess Sister Sarah will be very happy. Why did he plan to attack you? Anyway, we are enemies of the Horton family. So we will kill him. Amy behaved quite calmly. After experiencing two wars, she was no longer a weak girl. Leon smiled and shook his head. That's right. They are all enemies anyway. Although he said he didn't care, the Lord still felt a little regretful in his heart. It's not because of anything else. It's just that I failed to maximize my interests. Fauché was probably Alma's favorite son. And judging by his age, he would have been the eldest. If he were caught alive, he could be a means to coerce the Duke of Alma or a bargaining chip to plunge the Horton family into civil strife. In fact, even if Leon does nothing, with this illegitimate son letting the underworld cause trouble everywhere and calling himself the son of prophecy, this behavior will probably lead to civil strife in the Holden family. But Amy was right. Who made him plan to attack the Lord? Just kill him. It's not worth pity. Samer, what kind of weapon is that? It looks very powerful. You can't even see the arrow. Amy pointed to the musket. This should be Buckley's new musket. Dot, it's really powerful. Seeing that Amy kept looking at the matchlock gun in her hand, Summer handed the gun to her. Amy took the gun, and the heavy gun body made her hand feel heavy, and she almost dropped it to the ground. The match rope had been extinguished due to immersion in the lake water, but the gun body was intact. This is a double sleeve matchlock gun. The barrel is made of two layers of steel pipes nested inside and outside. The outer tube is octagonal, and the inner tube is round. The diameter is about half an inch, which is quite large. High-tech equipment such as muskets is actually no secret in the Pender continent. Many nobles have seen it, 
especially on the west coast of Fields Way. This weapon comes from the Buckley Empire on another continent. But the Buckley Empire would not sell muskets to outsiders. Buckley's emperor obviously knew the value of this weapon better than the average person. However, since Emperor Buckley had begun the pace of seafaring colonization, weapons such as matchlocks were occasionally brought to ports on the west coast by ocean-going merchant ships from Buckley. But in inland areas like Chongha Town, it is very rare. In fact, even in Buckley's hometown, muskets have only begun to be installed in the army in the past few years. And they are still a supporting role in the war. Because this was roughly equivalent to a 15th century matchlock, which had a very slow rate of fire and could only be used in good weather. Rain will cause the match to go out or the gunpowder to get damp. And wind will blow away the gunpowder in the gun barrel, making it impossible to fire. In fact, it is quite laborious just to keep the match rope alive. And it must be held steadily. The gun body cannot shake or turn sideways. The powder pool is a shallow pit on the outside of the gun body. There is a hole leading to the gun chamber. If you are not careful, the gunpowder will fall out. As for when the weather is nice, you have to be on guard against fires. After all, the fire pool and match rope are exposed. So it is normal for these things to catch fire. Moreover, this is a muzzle-loading gun. After each firing, the barrel, fire door, and powder pool need to be cleaned to ensure that the heat in the barrel does not directly ignite the gunpowder before reloading can begin. The interval between firing a shot is often as long as one minute or two minutes. Anyone who can fire three shots is a skilled gunner. However, despite its many flaws, the matchlock had two great advantages. One is powerful enough. The other is short in training time. This kind of matchlock gun has a range of 200 to 300 meters and can penetrate plate armor within 100 meters, which is obviously difficult for ordinary bows and arrows to achieve. Of course, the accuracy is actually not very high, since there is still nearly half a second of response time after pulling the trigger. Good opportunities are often missed. It is actually more difficult to hit a moving target although smarter shooters will make predictions. Due to the heavy weight of the gun, it is difficult to maintain stability when held flat, and the recoil is so huge that improper operation can even break the ribs. In addition, there is no front sight cover door, and the match rope and the burning gunpowder in the fire pool will also interfere with the aiming, so its accuracy in actual combat is different from that of modern firearms. However, just the fact that it can penetrate plate armor at a long distance is enough to make it a weapon valued by the Buckley Empire. After all, the accuracy is not enough and can be combined with the number of people. Huge power is the first pursuit. Moreover, muskets do not require long-term training. A farmer can go to the battlefield after two weeks of training. Although the manufacturing cost of the musket itself is relatively high, the cost to the farmer is so low. Therefore, the Buckley Empire has been vigorously promoting the mass installation of muskets in recent years. But people in Pendor are actually not too keen on this kind of weapon. This is due to ideology. Pender's knightly culture is the mainstream. No noble knight is willing to let such a weapon without training appear on the battlefield. For thousands of years, the nobles have used the knight class to monopolize force. And the emergence of muskets will obviously break this kind of monopoly. No one wants to see the possibility of farmers turning over. For kings and nobles, class status is far greater than disputes between countries. Just like a certain emperor of a certain dynasty, in another time and space would order the destruction of his country's extremely advanced weapon inventions. All to maintain their dominance. Therefore, things like matchlock guns rarely appear in the lion realm. And even their existence is deliberately hidden. But if nothing else, the lords of Fields Way on the west coast probably know about muskets. However, as a new kingdom, the leaders of Fields Way, who have just transformed from pirates and smugglers into nobles, are also pursuing long-term class status and hereditary rule. And they will probably do the same thing as the Kingdom of Lions. Decide. The nouveau riche who have just achieved a class jump in to oppress the proletariat more harshly than the traditional aristocrats. And are more concerned about maintaining their class status. But now, things like matchlocks have actually appeared around Chunga town. And they are still in the hands of Fauché. I don't know how he got them. But Fauché is already dead. So now, he probably can only ask Frederick. Chapter 132 The True Crumbs of Prophecy Coach Frederick! It's you? Why are you here? This was Close's voice, which seemed a little unexpected. The Lord looked at the burning wooden building and came to Close and Frederick. Frederick had taken off his helmet. He looked to be in his late fifties, but he still looked very strong and his eyes were bright. The two Medenheimers had already begun to chat with each other. Close knew Frederick. 
and he could even take the initiative to introduce him to the Lord. Sir, Mr. Frederick is a member of the Medenheim Death Squadron and a respected coach. I also received guidance from him when I was serving. Close seemed to respect the veteran, but Leon felt that Frederick seemed a little hesitant. Friedrich, how come you are under Fauché? Frederick is still somewhat well-known in Medenheim. He is a professional soldier, a veteran who has served in the Medenheim Standing Army for half his life and one of the coaches of the Medenheim Swordsmen. As a member of the Death Squadron, he held a high position in the military. Unlike Close and the others who worked as mercenaries in order to make a living, Frederick came to the Pender Continent with a mission. A year ago, as his hometown of Medenheim, formerly Eisenberg Island, fell into famine and was once again invaded by the Barclay Empire, he and his Legion commander were sent as an envoy to Pender to perform trade missions. But I don't know if the people of Medenheim all have the negative attribute of easily falling into the sea. Anyway, Frederick, like Close, also suffered a shipwreck on the Pender continent. However, he did not encounter pirates in Fields Way, but encountered a storm on the coast of the Bacchus Empire in the south. The envoy originally planned to land at the imperial port of the Bacchus Empire, but just the day before arriving at the port, the fleet deviated from its course due to a hurricane. Subsequently, their ship was broken into planks in the stormy waves. After being pushed by wind and waves for a whole day on the sea, Frederick finally took a few Menenheim soldiers and landed with difficulty in the bay near Malisburg in the Bacchus Empire. They lost most of their equipment, all their belongings, their supplies, and were exhausted. This was already miserable enough. But misfortunes never come singly. This team, which was already in dire straits, was attacked by snake cult believers just after landing. The place where they landed happened to be near the lair of a group of snake cultists. Frederick's envoy was dispersed by a sudden attack by a large group of snake cultists. Fortunately, he was very skilled in martial arts and was able to fight and escape all the way. He killed all the snake cultists who were chasing him and barely managed to escape. He didn't know where his other comrades had fled. Or, maybe, he was the only one who survived. The army was wiped out. The ship was destroyed by the hurricane. And he was left penniless. Not even his armor which he had thrown away after the hurricane. There was no way out for him. The only thing left is the sword in his hand and his rich fighting skills. He became a money-grubbing mercenary, taking on any task. For an old swordsman who was forced to a dead end, nothing else mattered. He wanted to make money, and he wanted to complete the tasks entrusted to him by his motherland. Mission. From Bacchus to the Lion Realm. He has been running around in the bustling cities of this continent, taking on high-value tasks in a greedy way and some of them are even black jobs that violate his own moral principles. Because Frederick never forgot his mission. He was a soldier. His hometown was in war and famine. And he must bring food back to his motherland. But half a year later, during the harvest season in October, he was almost desperate. Because he is not a noble. It is not difficult for a skilled swordsman to make a living as a mercenary in Pinder. But no matter how greedy Frederick was, it was difficult for him to save enough money to purchase food in a short period of time. As a civilian, it was impossible for him to let the noble sell large amounts of food to him until he met Fauché six months ago. When he met Fauché, Frederick was drowning his sorrows in a tavern in Lion Lake City. By then, Fauché already had a lot of manpower around him. There were pirates, gangsters, and some other soldiers. More than 300 of them. Fauché only chatted with him for a few words probably only heard his name clearly, and hired Frederick. He also promised that in another six months, he would be provided with a large amount of food during the next harvest season. After learning that Fauché was the illegitimate son of the Grand Duke of Lion Lake City, Frederick felt like he had seen hope. In order to complete his mission, Frederick became Fauché's bodyguard and followed the underworld brother to many places. Shirhu City, Wulong City, Xiaoyan Bay, Shirjue Bay, and Raven City. Fauché took him to visit many big cities. All the way to the big cities in the north. All the way to Chansong Port in the Crow Kingdom. In Frederick's memory, whenever Fauché visited a city, the first place he went to was the city's tavern. But most of the time Fauché seemed disappointed. He seemed to be looking for someone or something but found next to nothing. In Lonsong Harbor, Frederick saw Fauché's particularly disappointed and depressed look. And also saw that the illegitimate son finally changed from normal to cruel. Frederick said that Fauché spent several days searching the entire Longsong port, and in the end found nothing. Then he kept yelling, Where is the treasure chest? Why is there no treasure chest anymore? After that, 
the illegitimate son's temper became worse and worse, and his attitude towards others became worse and worse. If he wanted to get something, such as supplies or women, Fauché also began to send people to rob them directly, often even burning down villages or killing people for fun. These dishonorable practices caused a large portion of the soldiers to desert the bastard. But more thieves and thugs joined Fauché's ranks. As a soldier, Frederick naturally could not accept such behavior. He had advised and threatened, but to no avail. He also tried to rectify the discipline of the miscellaneous troops under Fauker. But all he got was scolding and rolling eyes. Fauker himself had no self-control. Naturally, those bandits and underworld also followed the same example. This kind of thing was rotten at the root. The troops simply cannot be trained well. Later, Fauché only used him as a bodyguard. The illegitimate son said more than once. I didn't expect that the coaching ability was useless. If I had known that you, an old guy, were useless, I shouldn't have spent so much money to hire you. I still have to post a large amount of food. Of course Frederick was aggrieved, but he did not defend himself, but endured it. He had a mission, and every time he heard about food, he would think of the famine in his hometown. And the half-year period was not long. He just wanted to endure it until then and leave with the food. In fact, before meeting Fauché, Frederick also knew the behavior of noble children like Pind. In fact, most of them were similar, and Fauché's evil deeds were not too special. The last big city Fauché went to was Xialu City. I don't know what news Future got from the tavern in Xialu City. Anyway, he stopped running around since then. Instead, he took people back to Lion City and sent many pirates everywhere to look for some ruins. Then, in the Lion City, Fauché met Sarah. After just one meeting and knowing Sarah's name, Fauché vowed to get her. These were Fauché's exact words. Maybe it was the power of love. But Frederick had never seen anyone fall in love with a woman so quickly. Of course, Frederick also felt that it was normal for Fauché to fall in love at first sight with Sarah's appearance. Probably just because Sarah was a noble. Fauché did not directly rob her as usual. But Fauché's approach was not much different from Mingqiang. He first invited Sarah to his home to perform singing and dancing for two days. And then he showed his love to Sarah and said he wanted to marry her. He didn't care whether Sarah wanted to or not. After Sarah clearly refused, Fauché unilaterally declared that Sarah was his fiancée. As a result, Sarah fled immediately. Fauché lost his temper for a long time and kept saying, There was no quarrel. How could she run away? And, I will always recruit her again in the pub. And his temper became more violent, and his behavior became more violent. It's becoming more and more unbearable. However, the forced marriage to the bard did not follow up. Because Fauché's father, the Duke of Alma, happened to let the illegitimate son go to the Miss Cage City to participate in the athletic competition at this time. In the arena, Frederick was slightly injured trying to save Fauché, who didn't know the heights of the sky, and had to temporarily recover. However, the illegitimate young master did not win the championship. He sprained his ankle and, like Frederick, could only recuperate in Fields Way. They stayed in Fog City for a short time. However, even with injuries, Fauché continued to struggle. After barely being able to move, Fauché took him to Guangxi Bay and robbed a Buckley merchant. This was the only thing Frederick did under Fauché that he was willing to do. Medenheim is facing a second invasion by Buckley. Robbery of the Buckley people is considered appropriate by the people of Medenheim. And Buckley's ocean-going merchant ship itself is not a simple trading ship. After grabbing a musket and some gunpowder and lead bullets from the Buckley people, Fauché began to call himself the son of prophecy and his temper became increasingly weird. He killed people frequently and robbed caravans or villagers. Frederick clearly heard Fauché say, Fortunately, this treasure chest does exist. But why can't I find it in Chansong Harbor? He didn't know what the treasure chest Fauché was talking about. In fact, most of the time, he didn't know what nonsense Fauché was talking about. At this time, the war between the Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire began. Fauché was just an illegitimate son and a civilian would naturally not participate in the war. However, taking advantage of the relative emptiness of the villages during the war, he let his men plunder many small villages, including some in the jurisdiction of his father's Shurhu city. This is probably to steal money. Of course, it might also be for the girls in the village. Perhaps it was for the sake of others that Frederick heard Fauché say that he wanted to create some refugees in order to complete the mission. But Frederick didn't understand very much. What kind of task would require creating refugees? 
a mission issued by the Red Brotherhood? It is also possible that he knew Fauché was a patron of the Red Brotherhood. The endless robbery, murder, rape and plunder lasted for two or three months. Fortunately, Fauché kept Frederick with him as a bodyguard, so that the veteran did not kill innocent people with his own hands. But Fauché didn't seem satisfied. He kept mumbling. Why can't the soldiers be upgraded? Why can't we see bandits bringing out refugees? Frederick didn't know what Fauché meant by upgrading soldiers. But he could understand that it probably meant improving combat effectiveness. But without changing their equipment or arranging training. How could a group of bandits get any improvement? Moreover, as a veteran who has been in the army for decades, Frederick knows very well that no bandit would run around with refugees. Bandits are just for plunder. And even if they want to take away people, they will only take away girls from the village. Just like Fauché himself. But at this time, Frederick no longer tried to persuade him. He could not stand what Fauché had done. He felt that Fauché was definitely not a son of prophecy. And he just wanted to leave this madman with no reputation. But Fauché once again stabilized him with grain. It was almost time for harvest. And soon there would be a lot of wheat ripening. After that, Fauché, who couldn't find the so-called refugee, seemed to still find the so-called ruins. But he found almost nothing in this ruins that he spent a lot of effort on. In the end, Fauché, who was so disappointed that he cursed loudly, took his team to the vicinity of the Jata grassland, saying that the Jata people were experienced packs, and that he wanted to train a large army to dominate Pinder. Frederick didn't understand what an experienced pack was, and he didn't think Fauché had the ability to unify the continent. But they did encounter the Jata people. Then Fauché's miscellaneous army was severely punished by the Jata people. The miscellaneous army of nearly 200 people was easily defeated by a Jata cavalry of less than 100 people. If Frederick hadn't blocked the pursuers with one man and one sword, Fauché would have died in the hands of the Jata people. But when Fauché was so frightened that he turned pale, he was still mumbling words such as, They didn't charge. Or, How could they be so strong? Since then, Fauché, who had lost most of his manpower, finally stopped wandering around. He restrained his temper and kept saying, This is wrong. Different all day long. And then said that he wanted to farm and develop. He did find this farm and obtained a large amount of grain during the harvest season. But the way he obtained food was very inhumane. Fauché directly led people to massacre the farm and occupy it. But no matter what, there are indeed hundreds of thousands of pounds of grain that have just been harvested here. If it can be transported back to Mendenheim, it will be enough to tide over thousands of people. Fauché also said that Frederick could transport the grain away. And it seemed that he was finally starting to fulfill his promise. In the next few days, Fauché seemed very quiet and kept studying how to make muskets. But apart from the underworld, the only people he had were pirates. These guys had no culture. And Fauché himself didn't even know how to make steel. Don't know? But Frederick could not solve the problem of food transportation. He doesn't have that many carriages or boats. So he can't transport the food. Just when he was at a loss, Leon brought people here. Leon had been quietly listening to Frederick telling his experience. Without any expression on his face. But in my heart, there was already a turbulent situation for Fauché. He knows that there is a treasure chest in Changda Port. And he knows that there are musket bullets in Guangxu Bay. In the game, there is indeed a treasure box in Changda Port. There is a dragon tear in the box. Which is the easiest dragon tear for players to obtain. However, this box was probably found by Alaric of the Drunker Group. There is also a treasure chest in a boat in Guangxu Bay. Which contains a pack of musket bullets. This boat was apparently the one that Fauché had robbed. Every time Fauché arrives in a city, he goes to a tavern first. It's obvious that he is looking for a partner in the game. In the game, all NPC companions will appear in the tavern. And players will always go to the tavern first. But Leon has long known that anyone will appear anywhere. There are not so many friends in the tavern. But there are indeed a lot of right and wrong. Recruited partners will quarrel because of their different personalities. Which will cause some partners to leave the team. And just two days after Fauché, recruited Sarah into the team. Sarah ran away because he forced her to get married. So he would say, Why did she leave without a quarrel? He wants to forcefully marry Sarah. Which is probably just an attempt. Because this is impossible in the game. But many players have had this idea. As for the ruins of the Griffin Knights that Fauché has been looking for. It is a very famous ruins mission in the game. Players need to find a large number of refugees and supplies to complete the mission of Rebuilding the ruins. After completing the mission, they can acquire a secluded night station. In the game, 
It is a private territory like a safe house and cannot be attacked. But as long as you think about it on your knees, you will know that there is no place in the real world that cannot be attacked. He looted the village to prepare refugees and other mission props to complete the ruins mission. And he probably also wanted to level up on the way. In the game, troops can be upgraded as long as they gain enough experience. And they will directly change their equipment after upgrading. And coaching skills can automatically allow soldiers to gain experience. But the reality is that even if you have coaching skills, you still have to arrange training. Soldiers can only be improved through training and comprehensive replacement of equipment. And this is the case with the Lord's troops. He said that the Jada people are experienced packs in the game. Which is indeed true. After all, most of the enemies in the game can only charge mindlessly. But the Lord Lord has fought against the Jada people. And he knows clearly that the Jada people, who are good at riding and shooting and fearless in deadly battles, are not easy to deal with. They have strong tactical execution capabilities. This Fauché belongs to this game. Player. Yes. Only players can have this kind of thinking logic. And only players can know this and make these incredible behaviors. No wonder the Duke of Alma likes this illegitimate son. Probably Fauché is consciously maintaining the favorability with the powerful Lord, like in the game. Fauché's poor performance in the Miss Cage arena may have been a player's thinking. At that time, he probably thought that he would not be injured in the arena. Right? But how can reality be the same as in the game? Moreover, Fauché is probably mistaken about one thing. He is probably indeed a player. But what about players? In the game, when the player takes Lafayette near Lion Lake City, Frederick will tell his story. Chapter 133 Even Death is Useful. Leon checked again. Fauché's body was shot through the neck. He was not alive at all. He was indeed dead. However, in order to ensure that nothing could happen, the Lord still cut off Fauché's head with a sword to avoid any disgusting things like resurrection from the dead. The body and head were separated without any abnormality. After all, Fauché is just an ordinary person and does not have the weird abilities of the three prophets. Considering Falker's poor combat effectiveness, and considering that Frederick said that Falker had a team of more than 300 people when he first started, he was probably a smart player. Right? Huh. But what about the players? In front of the real world, players are nothing. The Lord has long stopped thinking about things using the logic in the game. He has long known that it is unreliable. Not being able to integrate into this world and wandering around this continent with the mentality of a player is seeking death. How can the code written in the code be completely consistent with the actual situation? Each partner has his or her own thing to do. And they won't stay in the tavern all the time. The ruins definitely don't require any tasks. And the refugees are not mission props. They are all real people. Even the elixir that can be exchanged for dragon tears in the game will have terrible side effects. Alaric has been turned into a madman. According to what Sarah said before, there were many heroes who claimed to be sons of prophecy who appeared in the continent of Pendor. But without exception, they all failed. The illegal knight who did all his bad things and was strong with the sword, but was ultimately skinned. The slave merchant who relied on a large amount of wealth and mercenaries to run rampant in Pendor but was built into a capital under the Misty Mountains. The leader of the snake-worshipping sect who has witchcraft and even created a live broadcast with goods. Maybe they are all players. But in the end, they failed to make any big waves and only caused some more topics of ridicule in the tavern. This Fauché is indeed the son of prophecy. One. But at the same time, he is also a crumb of prophecy. In the true sense, even in the end, he failed to have a clear understanding of the world. He probably never encountered a time when he really needed to fight for himself. Fauché is the kind of so-called senior player who only plays games and uses games as a reference for everything. He has good early stage conditions. And he is protected by the Grand Duke as soon as he appears on the stage. He has no shortage of money and manpower. He has rich game experience. These are originally advantages. But it is probably because of his rich game experience that Fauché has a deep-rooted mindset. Coupled with the early conditions of not lacking anything, he never had to face real danger. The result was that he did not realize for a long time that what he faced was no longer a game at all. He easily recruited Frederick and easily obtained the musket bullets from Guangxu Bay, which undoubtedly deepened his mindset. It was probably not until he was taught a lesson by the Jata people that he realized that he could not face the world in a game way. But now, this veteran player who finally accepted the reality and planned to farm and develop was shot to death by Amy with an arrow and died silently. 
This piece of prophecy didn't even make waves in the continent of Pindor, and was even inferior to those guys who became jokes in the tavern. With the possible exception of the Duke of Alma, no one would have expressed the slightest regret at his death. A lot of people are like this. Even if they give him the treatment of a protagonist, he will just mess around. However, this player did leave some good legacy to the Lord. Of course the matchlock is a good thing. And it is what the Lord is looking for. In fact, Leon even felt that the two goddesses Eunomia and Astalia had indeed been taking care of him. Did the goddess specially arrange for Fauché to deliver the goods to her? By the way, I also gave an old swordsman as a gift. Oh, and he also gave me a life. By the way, although Fauché is dead, he is still useful. Leon looked at Fauché's body. And after sitting there and thinking seriously for a long time, he called Frederick again. Frederick, you should have met the Duke of Alma. Does he know what Fauché did? Frederick shook his head hesitantly. The Duke should only know a small part. At the end of last year, he asked Fauché to help him do a lot of things. At that time, Fauché had not done so many bad things. But since he went after Miss City, due to injury in the arena, I stayed in Miss City for a while and separated from the Duke. Duke Alma probably doesn't know anything about what happened after that. It seems that when the Duke of Alma is in charge, Fauché is still normal. This should be to maintain his favorability. So at that time, he just took people around the tavern, looked for treasure chests, and sent people to complete the tasks assigned by Alma, such as building a bridge at the border of Jat to Grassland and sending bandits to seize Chang'e town. Son, without Alma's restraint, he probably started to let himself go and started to create refugees on a large scale. Although Alma is not a good person, his plans are only for power, and he will not do evil at will. If he were around Fauché, he would certainly not allow Fauché to do these things. Then the Duke of Alma probably doesn't know about this manor? The Lord pointed to the building that was still burning. People here definitely don't know that these murders and arson were all done by Fauché himself. In fact, the Duke even scolded Fauché after he knew about Fauché's previous evil deeds of creating refugees. So Fauché Sia Air will stay here for this period of time saying that the son of prophecy can do well without relying on the duke. Frederick said and shook his head. But now, without the protection of the duke, he will be finished immediately. This kind of nonsense will definitely get scolded. And it will also create refugees in the village belonging to the duke of Alma. Alma has not peeled off a layer of his skin, which is considered true love. Then have you ever met Lord Father? Liang's eyes have lit up. Frederick nodded again. I met him once. Fauché originally wanted to entertain him and build a good relationship with him. But Lord Fawcett didn't like to associate with Fauché. And there was no friendship between the two parties. Leon smiled. That's good. It was inevitable that Fawcett would not want to associate with Fauché. The Duke of Alma did not shy away from letting people know that Fauché was an illegitimate son. But an illegitimate son did not have any inheritance rights. So Fawcett, the legitimate heir, would naturally leave him alone. Fawcett will definitely be dissatisfied with his father's love for illegitimate children. And it is human nature to not want to associate with Faucher. Moreover, the people of the Horton family definitely have no good impression of Fauché, and most of them even want him dead. Because he massacred the Horton family's village. But for the Duke of Alma, it is a good thing to have a dark boss in the family. Many dirty jobs that are inconvenient can be done by Fauché. Alma probably arranged this deliberately. The legitimate son is a legitimate noble knight and the illegitimate son is the black boss. Both sides can play a role. No one in the family likes Fauché, which is a good thing in a sense, because there will be no inheritance disputes in the family. This is actually much smarter than how Count Odin operates. But it was precisely because this Grand Duke was so cunning that the Lord decided to cause him some more trouble. For example, let him know that Fauché died in the jurisdiction of Shurhu City. This matter is as simple as asking Frederick to take Fauché's body away and dump it near Lion Lake City. Friedrich, take Fauché's body to Lion Lake City and hand it over to Father or anyone in the Horton family. And then come to the manor to find me immediately. After taking a look at Fauché's body, Leon added, If anyone asks, just tell the truth. Be honest. Everyone in Mendenheim, including Frederick, was shocked. Sir, are you going to start a war with the Duke of Alma? Leon spread his hands. What kind of war are you starting? Don't worry. Alma has no intention of causing trouble for me. The Lord is very sure about this matter. Only Amy was not surprised. She was probably the only person who could understand the Lord's intention. 
because Leong has been telling her to get used to thinking of others. Those pirates and members of the Red Brotherhood ran away a lot, and they would definitely spread the word about the battle here to the Duke of Alma. So Leon asked Frederick to tell the truth. The pirates, who escaped by boat must have seen Fauché fall into the lake. They knew that Fauché was either caught or killed. But he was not burned to death anyway. Moreover, all these people knew that it was a nobleman holding a black and white griffin flag, who had a conflict with Fauché. This nobleman seemed to know Fauché. So lying is not okay. Alma knew the black and white griffin flag. So Alma could know that Fauché had a conflict with Leong. But this obvious truth can sometimes be misleading. Archduke Alma certainly knew that. And Leon must have known Fauché. And knew that Fauché was his son. Alma had watched the competition in Fog Clan City. What would Alma think if Fauché was still killed by Leon after his men escaped? How could a little baron deliberately kill the Duke's son after winning a victory if no one instigated him? But Fauché had no fatal conflicts with Leon or Godric. Or even any other nobles in the eastern region. Moreover, Fauché died in the jurisdiction of Lion Lake City. So, in the eyes of the Duke of Alma, who is the most suspicious behind-the-scenes instigator? Who else could it be? Of course it's Fawcett, the dutiful son. Anyone in this situation would involuntarily doubt this filial son. You know, the Duke of Alma was just tricked by Fawcett and accused of harboring heretics. The Lord often wrote letters to Fathert, and also guided the Chungha town garrison to defect to Fathert. Moreover, Fathert has just provided Leong with a large amount of food. I am afraid that everyone will suspect that he used food to instruct Leong to kill people. Because Alma doted on the illegitimate child. And Fawcett exposed Lady Bella's affairs. The family lost the best chance to get Lunga Town. So Fawcett was about to lose Alma's trust. So he first sued Alma before the king so that she could not escape. Then bribe others to kill the favored illegitimate son. Since Fauché once harmed the Holden family's village. Killing Fauché can gain the support of other members of the family. And he took advantage of this period to recruit troops within the family to protect his inheritance rights in a coercive manner. Isn't this quite reasonable? The motive for murder and the biggest profiteer both point to Fawcett. He lacks nothing but Leong, who has no motive for murder and is not the biggest profiteer. With Alma's brain, which has been studying conspiracy for a long time, he will definitely think that Leong may be just an executor and may not even be the final executor because Fawcett was beheaded after being shot in the neck with an arrow. If Fosher died after being shot with an arrow, there would be no need to behead him. In Alma's eyes, the most likely possibility is that Leon did not kill Fauché, but shot and captured him. Then, he handed the person into the hands of the person behind the scenes. And what about Fawcett? He had very little contact with Fauché. Knowing that Fauchier was dead, he would probably feel happy secretly. But he would also think that something was wrong. Fauchier died in the northern part of the kingdom. In the jurisdiction of Lion Lake City, he might cover it up. Or he might proactively tell Alma that it had nothing to do with him. But no matter what he did, it only deepened suspicion. Yes, many things are like this. In fact, everyone has seen the truth. But everyone will doubt the real truth. The key is to tell the truth in everything. No rumors. No deception. Everything is true. But it makes these people doubt the truth. This kind of simple operation, but quick results can of course be done quickly. Frederick took the body to Shurhu City. And the round trip only took three days. When he returned to the manor, he happened to see Leon loading food into the ship. After returning Fauché's body and terminating this unbearable employment relationship, Frederick seemed to have been relieved of his burden and felt much more relaxed. But at this moment, he showed hesitation and uneasiness again. His previous uneasiness was because he had helped Fauché do evil in order to complete his mission. And now, it's because the food here is about to change hands. And he still has not completed his mission. Leong transferred the fleet from Chungha town to the manor to transport food. Crossing this flat lake, he could directly send the food back to make angling. There is a large cellar in this manor, which contains the newly harvested wheat of this manor. Sir, there are more than 400,000 pounds of grain here. Aye. Frederick looked at the lord. He seemed to want to beg for food, but he couldn't open his mouth. His current status was equivalent to that of a forgiven prisoner, and it was senseless to make any demands. Of course, Leon could see what he was thinking and shook his head. Of course I am willing to help you. But Mettenheim is far away from the ocean. And there is no way to transport food. It must be transported to the port by carriage first. And then shipped back to Mettenheim. Heim. But this manor is 2,000 miles away from any port on the mainland. Once it is shipped there, I'm afraid there will only be empty trucks left. Frederick, 
clothes, and the other side in unison. Indeed, the manor's grain cannot be transported to Medenheim. Long-distance land transportation consumes too much and is too slow. Medenheim is too far away. After 2,000 miles of land transportation first, and then thousands of miles of ocean transportation, how much food can be successfully transported? Sir, can you help me think of a solution? There are difficulties in our hometown, and we can't just sit idly by and ignore them. It was Close who spoke, and other Medenheimers nodded together, saying that they all wanted to contribute to their motherland. After all, Medenheim is a country that has only been independent for a few decades, and the patriotic enthusiasm of its people is indeed unmatched by other countries. But Liang is just a small lord now, and wants to help an uncle. This is really not easy. Therefore, the people of Menheim did not have high hopes. And Close just wanted his boss to help come up with ideas. Naturally, the Lord cannot remain indifferent to the requests of his capable men. This is difficult to handle. Let me think about it. He is really thinking about a solution seriously. But the Lord is not trying to be a good person. Nor is he trying to win over his subordinates. He wanted to exploit the metallurgical technology of the Menheimers. The small island country of Medenheim is not large and has a small population. It is said that it only has a population of 50,000 to 60,000. The entire country itself is just a larger county. The islands covered with volcanoes have little cultivated land and are rich in minerals. Although it is a small country with few people, their metal smelting technology is considered to be world-leading. It is said that Medenheim plate armor and dueling swords can make the Nolder Elves marvel at their actual combat capabilities which are comparable to the Nolder's enchanted equipment. Leon's griffin sword was considered by Close to be the only high-quality weapon he had ever seen in his life. But Frederick's dual sword had fought twice with the griffin sword. But he was not even harmed by the griffin sword. This is enough to show that their forged dual sword is just the standard weapon of the Medenheim Death Squadron. But this griffin sword is obviously an heirloom of the royal family of the ancient Penn Kingdom. Moreover, in the confrontation with the Buckley Empire, the Medenheimers also built ironclad ships. Of course, in the era without steam power, ironclad ships powered by sails and oars could only operate offshore and could not sail across the ocean. But this was enough to allow them to continuously defeat Buckley's powerful navy. You know, the navy of the Buckley Empire is now launching their great voyage and colonial journey. If the nation that can build Medenheim dueling swords and ironclad ships is given the technical structure and samples, they might be able to mass produce muskets. Leon told Amy that the standard for looking at profit and loss today is not whether it makes money, but whether it is possible to achieve the goal. That matchlock gun is the most precious legacy that Fauché, the prophetic scrap, left to the Lord. According to Frederick, this is Buckley's latest matchlock gun. This veteran who had fought against Buckley's army for a long time had seen this kind of weapon. Buckley's army had installed this kind of matchlock gun a year ago. The people of Menenheim actually attach great importance to this kind of cross-arrow weapon. The class consciousness of this emerging country is not so stubborn. And they are willing to use any weapon to strengthen themselves. But they didn't have time to start imitating Medenheim. The biggest problem at the moment was famine. And they had to find ways to repel powerful enemies. So they couldn't spare any time. Therefore, the Lord is certainly willing to help them. Although what he can do is limited. Maybe because of his help. He can just solve Medenheim's urgent need? This is a timely help. Chapter 134 It's all about food. The people of Medenheim will definitely help. But before that, the Lord must return to his territory and take care of his own affairs. The only way to solve the famine problem in Medenheim is by transporting it by ship like this. After all the food was transported to McFragrant Collar through the Air River, Amy sighed, the efficiency of shipping is indeed very high. It only took less than two days to transport 400,000 pounds of grain from the area across the lake behind Chamna Town back to make the angling. This is much faster than the land route since we are always traveling with the current. The boat never stops. Although the only boats used to transport food were small wooden boats with paddles in inland rivers. It still took less than 20 boats to take away all the food. This is a flat-bottomed barge that is only about 10 meters long and 2 meters wide. It does not seem to have much space. If it carries people, it can only carry 20 people at most, but used to carry grain or other heavy objects. This kind of boat can carry more than 20,000 pounds, about 10 tons. People cannot overlap or be too crowded. But grain bags can. The advantages of shipping in this era are obvious. This is just a rowing riverboat. If it is a sea ship, an ordinary catch can carry hundreds of thousands of pounds of grain. 
but only requires a dozen people to operate it. This means extremely low cost in transit. As Amy said, the problem can only be solved by transporting a large amount of food directly from the seaport city of Pender Continent to Mendenhain using ocean-going ships, completely avoiding land transportation. As long as a few ships of food are shipped to Mendenhain, they can survive the most difficult time. Amy, who is the governor of the Bacchus Empire in Lin Gang? Is it Governor Kairos? Thinking of the seaport city, the Lord's eyes suddenly lit up, and he turned to ask Amy. Yes, that's Kairos. He is also the grand leader of the Shadow Army of the Bacchus Empire and has a very high status in the Bacchus Empire. Amy nodded. She was relatively familiar with the enemy countries that White Deer Castle had faced for a long time. The Lord Lord nodded and asked, General Agazon should be from Kairos. Right. He brought many Shadow Centurions with him in previous battles. Yes. General Agathon himself came from the Shadow Army. My father talked about him saying that he was the most terrifying enemy. You seem to have said so when you rescued White Deer Castle last time. It is said that Governor Kairos and there was some discord between Emperor Marius. But General Agathon was the confidant of Emperor Marius. I feel that it is precisely because of the existence of General Agathon that the Shadow Army of Kairos and Emperor Marius have been able to maintain a relatively stable relationship. Relationship. Leon nodded and his eyes lit up. General Agathon. Justice and Lidius do not belong to the same faction. This can be seen from the kidnapping of two governors at White Deer Castle last time. And Agathon is an old subordinate of Governor Kairos. From the Shadow Legion. So Kairos must be very difficult to deal with the other two governors. It seems that every governor of the Bacchus Empire is a faction. And together with Emperor Marius himself. It seems that there are four factions. This is normal. The Kingdom of the Lion is similar. King Ulrich. Duke of Alma. Duke of Brennus, and the Boer forces are now four factions. However, since there is a factional struggle, the Lord does have a way to help Medenheim complete the trade. Friedrich, you originally planned to trade at the imperial port of the Bacchus Empire. Right. Yes, sir. We originally brought a lot of dueling swords and plate armor, intending to use these valuable weapons to trade food with the Bacchus Empire. But after a hurricane, all our goods sank to the bottom of the sea. Frederick sighed his eyes full of frustration. How much are the weapons you brought approximately worth? How much food did you originally plan to trade? The Lord seemed to have made up his mind and started asking for details. It should be worth at least 20,000 dinars. They are high-quality weapons and can arm an army of at least 400 people. Originally, we planned to transport at least 1 million pounds of grain. Frederick thought for a moment and replied. 50 dinars for a suit of plate armor and a dueling sword? This is probably the local cost price in Mendenheim. Frederick was obviously not very good at business. 400 sets of plate armor and dueling swords produced by Mendenheim would cost far more than 20,000 dinars in the continent of Pendor. And even 10 times that would be about the same. You know, Leon originally spent almost 100,000 dinars to purchase more than 200 sets of heraldic chain armor robes, helmets, swords, lances and crossbows. Of course, there are more types of equipment and customizing emblems does cost extra. But the equipment in Pinder is indeed several times more expensive than places like Mendenheim, where there are blacksmiths everywhere. However, the people of Mendenheim are now facing famine, and they really have no room for bargaining under the current circumstances. Is one million pounds of grain enough? I remember that there seemed to be more than 50,000 people in Mendenheim? The Lord felt incredible. 20 pounds per person. How many days will it last? and the people of Menheim are also foodies. We are suffering from famine due to poor food varieties and continuous reduction in production. It is not a complete food shortage. Sir, in fact, the one million pounds of food planned to be exchanged are not for eating. What we need are the seeds of food, and it is best to have seeds from the southern coastal area, which will be more in line with the climate of Menheim. So we will go to the imperial port of the Bacchus Empire for trade, Frederick explained. So it's no wonder that even though a year has passed, he is still obsessed with completing his mission. The people of Mendenheim rarely farmed in the past. In the past, they mostly relied on iron tools and mercenaries in exchange for food. However, since the Declaration of Independence, the Buckley Empire no longer conducts any trade with Mendenheim and has continued to launch wars, which has forced the people of Mendenheim to rely on this small peninsula for self-sufficiency. After all, Mendenheim has only one neighbor and only enemy the huge Buckley Empire. 
such commercial sanctions imposed by big countries on small countries make them very uncomfortable because their cultivated land is already scarce. And the yield of wheat they are currently growing has become very low. During the long war, wheat varieties have not been improved and the seeds have not even been properly maintained, which has resulted in reduced yields every season. By last year, in the absence of major natural disasters, Medenheim's average yield per acre had dropped to more than 60 pounds. You know, one acre of land alone requires 20 pounds of seeds. Under this situation, farming is almost meaningless. The seed-to-yield ratio is only 1 to 3, and the quality of seeds in the next season will be even worse. Such output would naturally lead to widespread famine. But the Barclay Empire launched another war at this time. The underfed Medenheimers had no power to fight back and could only huddle in the mountains for passive defense. So the current Count of Metenheim, Eudurian von Metenheim, called on everyone to find ways to get new seeds, because a famine of one or two years could survive. But if new seeds were not available, it would be completely hopeless. Therefore, the purpose of Frederick's Legion was to exchange for the best grain from the most suitable place. The southern part of the Bacchus Empire and Metenheim both have an oceanic peninsula climate. In scientific terms, the latitude and climate environment are not far different. So the food seeds there will be more suitable. One million pounds of grain is indeed useless. But if one million pounds of suitable seeds are obtained, maybe in a year, the country can be completely saved. If that's the case, then I really have an idea. After I arrange the affairs of the territory, I will take you to Dilinyang. At the beginning of May in the 355th year of Pander's calendar, the eastern region of the Lion Realm ushered in a rare period of peace. The Jada people did not go south this year but instead set their sights on Xialu City in the Crow Kingdom in the north. It is said that the two sides fought fiercely. The Bacchus Empire did not launch another war. It was said that the snake worshippers in their country were once again rampant and causing chaos. Emperor Marius was ordering all the lords to pursue and suppress them. Within the Kingdom of Lions, King Ulrich did not make any movement. He only sent some knights to Chungha Town to investigate the case, saying that he wanted to investigate Lady Bella's heresy case. But anyone with a discerning eye knows that these knights are here to monitor Chang'e Town. Duke Brennus, who was appointed as the acting consul of Long River Town, has also been in his own cliff bay and has not been to Long River Town at all. He only said his son, Lord Marbert. However, Lord Malbot seemed completely uninterested in managing affairs in Long River Town. Probably Duke Brennus had told him not to conflict with Godric, and he would never be found in the administration hall anyway. This young man, who is only in his twenties, is either hunting, fishing or traveling around every day. The scenery around Chungha town is indeed very beautiful, and this lord seems to enjoy it very much. Since the armies of the three prophets were defeated previously, many knights in the prophet army fled with their defeated troops, in order to prevent the fleeing rogue knights and broken troops from causing chaos around Chungha town. The first policy Baron Godric promulgated as the eastern military chief was to rebuild the bugle call patrol system strengthen public security, and suppress bandits and thieves. So the Horn Call Ranger sent a large number of soldiers and horses to patrol everywhere. Brave Shield Castle and White Deer Castle also responded fully and actively. And even the Owl Knights participated in the hunt for bandits. For a time, the entire eastern region was full of patrols. And high-level night scouts like Owl Riders were probing around. As long as there are bandits and bandits who dare to show up, they will be hunted down for hundreds of miles once discovered. The eastern part of the kingdom quickly became calm and peaceful, and most of the gangsters were estimated to have fled to other areas. Facts have proved that no matter what era, as long as the leaders on the political side are really willing to do something practical, or even if no one is messing around, then this place will definitely become better. Of course, the leaders in the eastern region mainly want to cooperate with the business of a certain transportation company. But in any case, for the civilians in the eastern region, this is a rare and good sight. There have been no large-scale natural disasters since last year. And this year's grain harvest is pretty good. Heretics were eliminated. Bandits disappeared. A large number of carriages could be seen coming and going on the roads every day. And the number of merchants from various places was also increasing. It seems that there is hope for life again. Except Serenis and Trubrin. Trubrin is now empty. There is no one left. The people in this place were completely killed by the heretics. The village of Serenis is slightly better but only 500 poor old people are left. The houses were burned down. All the young men were killed. All the young girls were taken away by the three prophets. And all the property and food were looted. 
Sir Roland was at Serenet at this time. Serenis was once home to more than 2,000 people and was originally the domain of a baron. The skinny knight Morgan who followed the Prophet Legion before was a subordinate of the baron. And his former knighthood was in Serenis. But the baron did not want to follow the three prophets. And his whole family was killed a few months ago, leaving only two elderly people. One is the baron's wife, and the other is an old housekeeper, both in their sixties. Morgan once gave up his territory to follow the heretics, which was originally a stain that could never be washed away in his life. However, at the last moment, he turned from darkness to light and helped Leofric set the fire successfully, which was regarded as his own redemption. Therefore, under the joint guarantee of the three barons Godric, Leofric and Leon, he returned to Serenmes and became the adopted son and guardian knight of the Baroness. If he could rebuild the village, the Baroness could leave the territory to him. This is certainly a good opportunity for Morgan, a mediocre knight, but he cannot afford hundreds of old people who have lost their homes and have nothing. There are no young men left in Serenmes. The only young men left are Morgan and his nine soldiers. He cannot bring hope to these old people. So sending them to a place where they can live is a kind of simple kindness. Hearing that Sir Roland wanted to take these old people to make Zangling, he actively assisted Roland in sending the old people out of Serenis, and even gave them three days of food as gifts. Morgan's nature is not bad. He sincerely hopes that these old people from the same hometown can live a better life. The rhetoric used by the three prophets to confuse people's hearts, as well as the sacrificial texts they used, are originally consistent with the goddess of justice. With such teachings, coupled with the beauty of the doom bringer. Most of the knights they deceive were actually ordinary people like Morgan, not willing to do evil at will, but unable to do good, having some desires and ambitions, but limited wisdom, having some knowledge and skills, but not much courage, getting some opportunities, but often unable to grasp them. Morgan is like this. In fact, all living beings are like this. If Sir Roland's original views were to be followed, he would have looked down upon people like Morgan. He has followed heretics has little ability, and seems to have no merit. He is just a mediocre person, the kind of person who would not be found in a crowd. But now, Roland did not show any arrogance and prejudice. After being reminded by the Lord, he saw in Morgan the shining points that belonged to ordinary people. Morgan was quite friendly towards those old people. He may be mediocre himself, but his status was that of a noble knight and the lord of this village. But he did not regard himself as superior to others. His attitude towards Sir Roland was completely consistent with his treatment of those frail old civilians. He would say goodbye to each old man and send some meager food. He will not actively seek justice. But he will try his best to help the elderly when they need help. Of course, many times he can't do it. At this time, he will smile and say that there is really nothing he can do. Morgan's actions inspired his soldiers. And those who could survive tried their best to participate in this migration. Maybe there isn't much that Morgan can do. But he does use his greatest ability and heart to give the elderly people who originally lived in the same hometown with him a better chance of survival. Even if he will lose the vast majority of his territorial citizens and his small amount of property. At this moment, Roland understood what Leon warned him about. Let everyone play a role in establishing order. And use this to establish orderly groups and legal principles to protect the people. That is the teaching of the goddess of order. It is not simply good and evil. It is not killing in the name of justice. Nor is it relief and charity from above. Morgan seemed so mediocre. And he didn't have the ability to do much. But at this moment, he led everyone to do good. And no one even mentioned the subject's ownership. So, Sir Roland also dismounted and began to bow in front of the common people. This paladin, for the first time, personally supported an elderly civilian and took the first step towards the true mission given to him by the goddess. If we want the goddess of justice to return to the earth, what we need is not to kill heretics and expel robbers, nor to give charity and sympathy, but to pass on the good deeds of ordinary people and spread them into the hearts of people. In the past few days in Serenis, Roland developed Morgan into a believer of the goddess of justice and truly took the first step in rebuilding the knights of the new dawn. Leon once warned him not to just look at the teachings of the goddess of justice. Every goddess is meaning. Don't think of yourself as a superior spokesperson for justice. Because what you can do, others can't do. You may be a superhero that others admire. But others will only see you as a superman. They will only pray for help. But will not think about what they can do. Because they will feel that they can't do it. Charity like kindness is actually a sin. This sin is called pride. What we should really do is to get involved. 
in a way that an ordinary person can do. Guide the people around you to do justice and have kind thoughts. We don't insist on being flawless. But we don't indulge in evil deeds either. This is enough. The fire of kindness will continue to be passed on. The station established in people's hearts is the ladder for the goddess of justice to return to the earth. When Sir Roland led people back to make Xiangling, Leon was calculating the food reserves in the territory. The food that the Lord planned to obtain is actually almost enough. Extorted 600,000 pounds from Fawcett. 400,000 pounds were received from the Fauché estate. Nearly 300,000 pounds were brought back from the village of Kerwin. Coupled with the wild wheat, received from Trubrin and makes the Angling's own output. Makes the Angling has now become the most abundant place in the eastern region. In the next harvest season, in addition to its own harvest, it could also receive another 300,000 pounds from Kewen Village. White Deer Castle is not short of food now. And Godric has also transported a large amount of food back from Chang'e Town. This baron was indeed a decent man. But in fact, he often used public money for personal gain. In the name of suppressing bandits, he emptied the food stocks that Alma and Fawcett had left in Long River Town. The goal of becoming the largest grain merchant in the eastern region may be achieved if by Lubo and makes the angling can grow a large amount of wheat this season. The Lord is looking for food everywhere. Not just to eat, but also to get more grain. Chapter 135 Capitalists' Ways There are already 500 more old people in the territory whom Roland brought back from Serenmi's village. Anson has also led the team back. But the people he brought back are basically the proletarian poor who came to seek refuge after hearing that Maishion Collar had low taxes. They are basically young and strong. And there are about a hundred people. The three prophets did not harm other villages. On the contrary, the extremely high taxes of those unscrupulous nobles harmed many civilians, such as some knights of Ermond, who were able to raise the food tax to 70%. Makes the angling which charges only 30% tax, is a complete paradise in their eyes. If it weren't for the good weather this year, more people would probably come. Businessmen no longer do the human business. Due to the existence of transportation companies, many businessmen have discovered new foreign trade opportunities and have begun to travel long distances with transportation teams. After all, being a human trafficker is not very good, and they have also discovered that the cost of transporting people bigger than they imagined. Therefore, Leon also stopped the policy of acquiring people and changed it to propaganda. It will take some time for the transportation company to fully gain the recognition of all merchants. But most merchants are already following the transportation team, which is considered to be taking advantage of the transportation team's protection along the way. This is actually a good thing. As long as the merchants follow up several times and confirm that the transport team will not turn into robbers, they will start to consider the cost issue and gradually no longer support the fleet on their own. In fact, a few businessmen have already packaged their carriages and drivers and sold them to the Chang'e Express Company. The overall development seems to be going smoothly. Now there are 1,200 people in Makes Yangling, and they are reclaiming a lot of wasteland. The Lord really knows nothing about farming. He has never farmed, let alone medieval land. However, just because you don't know how to farm doesn't mean you don't know how to engage in agriculture. As long as agricultural production is turned into corporate logic. Lord Lord can still do it. People in Ponde Continent are sometimes like modern people. They will misunderstand various production capacities and often make some strange comparisons. For example, in two counties, one county has an average yield of 100 pounds per moo, and the other county has an average yield of 200 pounds per moo. People will think that the former is too weak and is simply a primitive society. Then, they all expressed how advanced the latter was, how they should cultivate more intensively, and how they should improve their tools, etc. But in fact, the county that produces 100 pounds per acre is likely to have a per capita planting area of 50 acres. In a county with a yield of 200 acres per moo, the per capita planting area may be less than 5 acres. If the difference in population is not too big, which county has higher total production? The latter is indeed intensive farming and technologically advanced. But these technologies do not necessarily mean that the former cannot use them but that they cannot use them. In this era without large machinery, it is impossible for one person to cultivate 50 acres of land and cultivate it intensively. Only when resources per capita are scarce. People will be forced to build a dojo in a snail sh. L. There are many people and little land, and they have no choice but to do so. The Lord does not know how to farm and cannot increase the yield level of the territory in a short period of time. But now he has a large amount of grain seeds in his hands and there are countless unclaimed wastelands around the territory. 
in a situation where there are many people and few land. The Lord can use large area farming to increase the overall total output. Therefore, Liang's logic is to plant in large quantities and use the area to increase the yield. Moreover, the old people brought back by Roland and the destitute people brought back by Anson were all experienced farmers. And they knew how to work. The Lord only needs to provide them with seeds, tools and wasteland. In fact, even the tools only provide raw materials. There are carpenters and blacksmiths in the territory. Many old people can also do some technical work and can make many farm tools. In fact, these so-called old people are not old in the eyes of modern people. Most of them are only in their fifties. But in this day and age, this really means being half buried in the ground. Liang did not allocate shares to these newcomers again. If the shares were divided too much, they would be worthless. He used another method. In order to avoid unfairness and improve efficiency, the Lord promulgated a rare policy. In other words, it is a policy that people here have never seen before. The group responsibility system. To put it simply, several young people and several old people are divided into groups according to the same proportion. So that the age structure is basically the same. After grouping, each group has six young adults and four elderly people, two of whom are women. This group is regarded as a basic production unit. And all production is based on the group and not on individuals. This is of course a short to medium term strategy mainly to deal with the current situation where only the lonely elderly people are single. Young adults can be responsible for various physical activities. The old people impart work experience to the young people and take on the trivial tasks that are relatively easy but require patience, such as picking seeds and weaving ropes. In this way, people of all ages will form a group to cultivate the land together, and taxes will also be collected according to the group. This is of course for complementarity but also for the proper use of all labor to improve overall efficiency. This policy soon made makes Yangling a place where the age structure of the population seemed relatively normal. Ponde Continent has never really respected the elderly. The main reason is, of course, that the elderly are old and frail and cannot afford high-intensity labor. In fact, even in modern times, this is still the case in many places. In fact, this is mainly because the way of evaluating work is too rudimentary. The nobles will only see the superficial things. Of course, so will most of the unskilled capitalists. For example, only young people can be recruited as soldiers. Only young people can do coolies. And only young people can work overtime and repeat the work. While the consumption of the elderly is not much less than that of the young. But this is all superficial. What you can't see is that the experience of the elderly can avoid pitfalls and greatly improve efficiency. In fact, in most industries, an experienced old employee can be worth 10 raw melons and eggs. But the problem is that these experiences cannot be seen. And it is difficult to make a purely quantitative evaluation. Because any work requires design and planning. However, design and planning cannot be evaluated. For example, what should be planted in farming? In what way? What tools to use? In several stages? How to fertilize? And how to prevent pests? These are all design plans that rely on experience and knowledge. The actual execution is the process of digging the ground with a hoe, which requires physical strength, even if it's hard work, like resisting sacks, how to resist, whether you can use tools, what tools to use, and what route to take are all design and planning. And the process of resisting is the specific execution. This broad sense of design and planning is usually invisible, and its actual effect cannot be evaluated. After all, Nobles and bureaucrats usually do not consider specific matters. The nobles can only see the representatives who perform those things specifically, who look stronger, who can work overtime, who is more obedient, and who asks for less. Then, they will use the logic of single target quantification to evaluate each person's output. After all, farming in this era is mostly individual labor, and teamwork is almost non-existent. And if quantified in terms of individual goals, the disadvantages of the elderly are even more obvious because they are not physically strong enough to keep up with the actual implementation process. Therefore, most of the time, when people evaluate a noble territory, they look at how young and strong the territory is. The elderly are basically seen as a burden. Even in modern times, most capitalists always only want young people who are young and strong and can work overtime for a long time. Old guys who are a little older and can't stand it will be abandoned. But the experience of the elderly combined with the physical strength of the young is the most reliable way of working. And it is also the basic meaning of segmented work content and teamwork. However, even in modern times, 
there are still a large number of stupid companies that do not understand this most basic truth, especially some internet companies. The Lord's Group Responsibility System was quickly fully accepted. This was actually a mandatory policy. Those who did not fit in with the group would not be allocated land and must be accepted. The young people may not understand. But none of them dare to complain. After all, the Lord here is God and he has the final say. But soon, this seemingly simple policy worked. Those old guys who claimed to have only a few years to live used extremely fast speeds to make my Xiangling fully move. It's not because they are so quick at work, but because they can keep young people from taking detours. These old guys really didn't expect that my Xiangxuan would be treated so well, with food to eat and things to do, and they would treat them as equals to young people. So they burst out with unimaginable enthusiasm. When you truly show respect for people, people will naturally reciprocate, especially those who were originally in dire straits. In addition, Morgan and Sir Roland planted a seed of kindness when they moved them here. Now this kindness has been passed on. The old people almost devoted themselves to the construction of makes angling without sleep or food. Not only did they spare no effort to teach the younger generations how to do things, they even took the initiative to grab jobs. This makes the young and middle-aged people also have to work overtime. Why can't everyone in a group be working while you do nothing? I can't afford to lose this person. And he'll probably get beaten. This is the common interest of a group. Seeing that everyone in the territory was moving, Leon ordered again that each group of cultivated land must be connected together to form a farm. But there is no upper limit on the amount of land to be reclaimed. Anyway, it is all wasteland from Makes Angling to Bailu Fort. You can circle it yourself. Just land. There is only one field where the seeds must be planted. If the amount of seeds does not match the land, all members will be expelled from the wheat field. This free reclamation policy requires a large number of grassroots managers. In order to manage these production groups, the Lord used all non-commissioned officers. There are about a hundred non-commissioned officers in the territory, and they even learned some culture. Leon assigned all the farmers to the non-commissioned officers, and each non-commissioned officer was divided into a group. These non-commissioned officers will be given a farm and serve as leaders of the people under their command. The four senior non-commissioned officers will become the middle managers. Good and Eric will go to manage the transportation team. There are only four senior non-commissioned officers in the territory, but there is no master-slave or employment relationship between them, but a corporate management employee relationship. In other words, the Lord has established four agricultural departments, each with more than 20 production groups. The loyalty of these hundreds of non-commissioned officers to the Lord is unquestionable. It can even be said that every soldier wearing a griffin emblem chain armor robe looks at the Lord like his own father. They will carry out whatever Leon says. After all, they have shares. Allocating shares to core employees and letting them manage ordinary employees is a common practice in modern companies. This operation also seems to be in line with the enfeoffment logic of this era. It is like enfeffing the people and territories for several nights. And then the knights let their attendants manage some farmers. Precisely because they look similar, they are easy to accept. After all, those difficult to understand operating methods are not suitable for this era. However, the actual logic of this operation is completely different from that of the enfeoffment system. The non-commissioned officers only have management rights, but no control over the people in their territories. Those non-commissioned officers are not the owners of the land. They are also the people themselves. And they have to farm the land when necessary. Of course, they also come forward when collecting taxes. But everything will be received in the Lord's treasury. Leon does not intend to infest the land in the core territory. He wants to maintain unified management in the Maishiang Collar area. After all, the prevailing logic of night enfeoffment in Pinder is that once the territory is sealed off, even the superior lord has no right to manage matters in the knight's territory. That is full authorization. This is caused by the knight culture of Pinder. Knights are all about force. The big lords need to win over knights to monopolize force. The power of knights in the territory is already very high. After the establishment of the kingdom of Pindor, the birth of various knights gave the knights new backers besides the lords. The original knights were more like an alliance. An alliance of warriors who both belonged to the knight class and shared common beliefs. Because of their common beliefs, under this alliance, knights would put aside the struggles between their superior lords and cooperate with each other to improve the status of the entire class. This will cause conflicts between the noble lords and the knights. In fact, the mainland-wide policy of not allowing any knights to enter the noble territories was also due to the conflicts between the great lords and the various knights. This is a contradiction caused by the monopoly of force. 
high-ranking nobles want to monopolize force. But armed groups like the knights are not necessarily willing to obey because they may have different beliefs. And maybe half of their members support political opponents. Then the nobles were naturally very worried. After all, the internal power of the knights had increased. And they had moved from force to politics. And there had been situations where they had overwhelmed high-ranking nobles. Therefore, the establishment of the knights is strictly restricted and has always been strictly controlled by various countries. Therefore, in order to win over their knights, the noble lords gradually delegated their power, allowing the knights to taste the power of the aristocratic class, and use privileges to offset the knights' inclination towards beliefs or hobbies. This decentralization made the knightly territory a completely independent territory. The knights gradually became the emperors of their own territories, and legal principles were formed. The knights also became real nobles. The privileges of a local emperor were indeed very tempting. From then on, it was rare for a knight to turn his back on the nobles. If there is a conflict between the knights and their own lord, most knights will choose to obey their own lord. This earth emperor model can easily lead to some evil things, such as brutal abuse and oppression of civilians, such as all kinds of rape and robbery, such as Rainier's bastard thing of burning down and looting his own village. Therefore, Leon was not willing to entrust the land of my Xiangling to avoid such a mess as two worlds in one place. Instead of waiting to make up for the bad consequences later, it's better not to make the mistake in the first place. Unless it is an enclave like Fletcher that is not next to the core territory, it really needs independent management by the knights. The matter of assigning personnel did not waste much time, and everyone was very cooperative. Subsequently, with each department and production group as a unit, the Lord started an internal competition mode. As a famous and scrupulous entrepreneur in Pender Continent, the Lord directly turned the matter of land reclamation into a quantitative competition like a sales team. The North Star Indicator, also known as the Core Indicator, is of course, the effective earnings per quarter, but the current short-term indicator is the area of reclaimed land. Since almost all the people in the territory are currently proletarians, the Lord also immediately opened the agricultural loan. This is not a loan, but a loan of grain and seeds. That is to say, each production group is registered by household, goes to the warehouse to receive grain and seeds every day, and keeps accounts. But after harvesting, the money must be paid back. Simply put, this is cost consumption. After all, the core indicator is effective profit, not total production minus all costs. For the top four departments, management dividends will be doubled, and residents will only need to pay 30% of the tax and will be exempted from repaying agricultural loans. In the departments ranked at the bottom, the management bonuses are gone, and the residents have to pay 40% tax, and they have to repay the agricultural loans with interest double. There is also competition between the groups. For the top three groups, the non-commissioned officers responsible for management will receive a heavy reward equivalent to killing the general and capturing the flag, and the leaders can be awarded shares of Maixiang International. As for the groups with the worst results, the whole group received a lazy man, sign, and hung it on their farm. The team leader temporarily loses all benefits as a non-commissioned officer, and the team members will be responsible for various hard work in the territory during the off-season, until they can use their performance to wash away their shame in the future. Doesn't this mobilize enthusiasm? Moreover, the Lord used this method to easily conceal his core purpose. The substantial owner of all the fields was still Leong himself. He did not grant the farm to anyone but only let them cultivate it and obtain the output of the land. How can production materials be given directly to employees? In the entire territory, only the first 800 acres of land belonged entirely to the earliest members. With title deeds, this is a benefit for old employees. These old employees are today's non-commissioned officers. That is, the Menenheimers, the Crossbowmen, and most of the first batch of territorial citizens, numbering over a hundred. As founding members, these people have experienced a lot of dangers following him. And naturally they have to be treated differently. Leong didn't plan to create a big pot meal. Although his reputation in the territory was high enough now. A commune model might be feasible. But the big pot meal was not suitable for future development. So he used a commercial model. Chapter 136 The Past and Present Life of the Bacchus Empire Perhaps these policies to corporatize agricultural work still seem a bit rough. But in any case, the effect that the Lord wanted is achieved. After the Lord's policy was determined, everyone in the territory was frantically clearing up wasteland. In just two weeks, more than 500,000 pounds of grain in Mexiangling were turned into seeds. 
almost every production group received almost 5,000 pounds of sea grain. You know, there are only 11 people in a group, including the sergeant leader. If it were to be unpanned as normal situation, each group would save at most 800 pounds of grain and plant dozens of acres of land. But now, almost every group has cultivated 300 acres of land. Yes, you need to know that if the average person cultivates two acres of land every day, this is reclaiming wasteland. My Xiongling, a group of a thousand people, managed to create more than 30,000 acres of land in two weeks. Along the road, large areas of wheat fields extend from Mexiangling to White Deer Castle, making this territory truly worthy of the name Mexiangling. In order to prepare for the future, the Lord also required all farms to dig pits in the wheat fields and fill them with wheat straw and plant ash and everyone is required to urinate in the pit, but must go to the ground or toilet to defecate. This is not for storing fertilizer, but to make saltpeter. This indigenous method is not high-tech in the Pinder continent, because the Pinder people would have used this method to obtain high-purity saltpeter. However, the Pinder people use saltpeter mainly for tanning leather or making bacon, and occasionally as fertilizer. If explained in a scientific way, potassium carbonate solution can turn sodium nitrate in saline soil into potassium nitrate. The main component of plant ash is potassium carbonate, and potassium nitrate is often referred to as saltpeter. By burying wheat straw, fallen leaves, and plant ash in a piece of land, and then pouring human and animal urine into it, you can harvest a large amount of saltpeter in the coming year. The output of saltpeter will also be part of each team's evaluation of output. Amy followed the Lord's operating model throughout the process and applied some of the policies to White Deer Castle such as group competition. Although she couldn't control the Knight Commandery under White Deer Castle, she could learn from Godric's direct commandery. The direct territory belonging to Godric has nearly a thousand households, but the population is actually only about 3,000. The population per household in border counties is particularly small. Amy changed the Lord's policy and organized groups of five households into groups, managed by Godric's guards. The reason for this is that Godric had previously used a recruitment method of five households and one small man. And this was how he got all 200 of his own guards. Using levies from these families to manage this working group would at least not cause any harm. And Godric's guards were obviously loyal enough. After all, the people in White Deer Castle don't have any shares or anything like that to support them. Godric can also change the defense of Chongha Town. Now that Chongha Town has stabilized, he can let the elite troops directly under him guard his own territory and let the newly recruited soldiers cooperate with the Horn to summon the Ranger Regiment as the Chongha Town Garrison. This is exactly Godric's plan. As for the internal competition method used by Amy at White Deer Castle, rewards and punishments are more traditional. To put it simply, the top few managers, who are members of the Guard, will become knights and own the land cultivated by their group. The groups with the worst grades will be heavily taxed. The method is slightly different but the effect is still good. Bailubo also reclaimed nearly 50,000 acres of additional wasteland during the half-month planting period. Now, Mexiangling is really connected to Bailu Castle. Both sides of the road between the two places are full of wheat fields and farms. In early May, spring and summer meet, and the climate becomes warmer. This is also the time when spring wheat is planted south of the Tontian River. Usually at this time of year, all countries in Pinder continent will cease fighting. And this year is no exception. After arranging the internal affairs of the territory, the Lord asked Sir Roland to be responsible for the security of White Deer Castle and Anson to be responsible for the affairs of McFragrant territory. He took Mendenham. Amy and Sarah South together, following a group of the transport team, went to the Bacchus Empire together. The destination is of course Dillon Port. He was going to solve the famine problem among the people of Mendenham. After Sir Roland joined the team, Sarah was finally able to give up her training as a soldier and start seriously serving as a foreign affairs officer. She has compiled a lot of information and information for the Lord, such as everything related to the Bacchus Empire. The Bacchus Empire was not originally native to the Pender continent. They came from the Amara continent overseas in the south. The Bacchus Empire used to be a major country in the Amara continent, and it once formed a three-kingdom situation with the Barclay Empire and the kingdom of Pender. In other words, three continents stand together. There were two groups of human ancestors living on the continent of Amara. One is the ancestors of Gubaks, who live in the Amara continental plain and coastal areas, mainly engaged in farming and fishing. The other is the ancestors of Jatu, who were originally nomads living on the grasslands of the Umla continent. Later, 
the Bacchus ancestors established the unprecedentedly powerful Cuban First Empire, with unprecedented cultural prosperity and great national power. At this time, the Jata ancestors were just vassals of the Bacchus. But powerful empires will always be destroyed by civil war. After the First Empire of Bacchus completely ruled the continent of Amara, internal strife arose due to cultural barriers, and then it split. The ancestors of Amara gradually evolved into two different ethnic groups, the Bacchus and the Maritan. The Maritan established an independent country and occupied part of the Amara continent. From that time on, the Jata ancestors no longer relied on the Bacchus Empire and became a warlord-like independent force. The Bacchus Empire at this time was called the Second Empire of Bacchus. But even if it was split into three parts, the Bacchus Empire at this time was still powerful and could still compete with the Gupan Kingdom and the Buckley Empire, and even had a larger population. By the year 198 of the Penn Calendar, the ancient Penn Kingdom collapsed rapidly due to the Red Death. Royal members died of the disease one after another, just a few days after the death of the king. His successor also died of illness, and several kings were replaced within a month. This situation will naturally make the lords everywhere have some thoughts that they should not have originally, coupled with the Misty Mountain tribe taking the opportunity to invade on a large scale. The kingdom of Pender became torn apart in a short period of time. First, the Northern Crow Kingdom, which faced the barbarian army of the Misty Mountains alone, but could not get support for a long time, declared independence. They summoned the northern lords to form a coalition and defeated the rebellious Misty Mountain Army, and then established the Crow Kingdom. After that, various lords in the south saw that the Kingdom of Pender was too weak to fight against the rebellion, so they established themselves in the city. For a time, countless principalities and counties appeared in the continent of Pender. The Kingdom of Pender was completely plunged into warlords' melee, and wars broke out everywhere. Naturally, neither the Barclay Empire nor the Bacchus Empire would give up this good opportunity to invade the Pender continent. But before the two powerful countries could swallow up the extremely weak kingdom of Pendor, they started fighting over who could share the bigger cake. Both sides fought from the sea to the land, and from the land to the sea. But the two sides were evenly matched. So they fought a protracted war of attrition. But neither side can retreat. Otherwise, all previous efforts will be wasted. As a result, the two sides fought for several years, and both countries were dragged into the quagmire by the war. This actually allowed Pender to take this opportunity to resurrect. Alfred, the Lion Duke of the Kingdom of Pendor, defeated many rebellious warlords during this period, established a huge duchy in the center of the kingdom, and gathered countless knights in his camp. Moreover, because he had sent troops to support Crow Realm in repelling the Misty Mountain Army, he had a sense of comradeship, so his duchy formed an alliance with the Crow Kingdom announcing that they would temporarily put aside their internal fighting and jointly resist the invasion of enemies from the outer continent. The war between Bacchus and Buckley lasted for several years, which consumed too much money, and there were also many domestic conflicts that needed to be resolved. Pender was resurrected under the alliance of Crowland and Lionland. This once again forms a tripartite situation, and the cake will probably not be divided. So the three countries re-signed the peace agreement. However, before the ink on the agreement was dry, the Second Empire of Quebec sent General O.S.A., leading a large fleet and expeditionary force to land directly from Dillon Port in the southern part of Pender Continent, and invaded Pander without declaring war. Virtue. This was a raid to tear up the agreement. The people of Pender Continent did not expect that the Emperor of the Second Empire of Quebec would make such a decision. Due to the signing of the peace agreement, the Kingdom of Pendor, which thought it no longer had external enemies, was dealing with internal strife. Duke Alfred the Lion was currently crusading against other independent rebels and had no time to react. The southern part of Pender's continent is basically full of small forces, and they basically do not obey the kingdom's command, and have almost no resistance. General Asa went all the way north, and the only decent resistance he encountered was the Knights of the Radiant Cross. This knightly order had been treating the Red Death Plague in the south of Pender. After encountering the invasion, they resisted desperately as soon as possible. Giving Asa the general caused a lot of trouble. However, a knightly order that is good at medical skills alone could not stop General OSA's conquest. During the Battle of Sagan Forest, the Knights of the Shining Cross fell into a tight siege by the Imperial Legion. All the combatants of the Knights were lost in the fierce battle. The remaining civilian staff and doctors had no choice but to surrender. Impressed by the order's devotion, General Auxerre accepted their request for surrender and retained the order's emblematic cross. General OSA then marched all the way to the gates of Lion City. At the time of life and death, 
Duke Alfred of Lyon launched a call to all the Pender lords, hoping that everyone would abandon their internal conflicts and unite with the outside world, and go to Lyon City to resist the invaders. The lords from all over the country were deeply aware of the truth. They stopped fighting one after another, summoned their followers to sort out their equipment, and gathered outside the Lyon City, with Alfred as the marshal. They blocked General OSA near the Lion City with the determination to fight to the death, and established the Chicha Fortress there. Then, a long tug of war began. Alfred at this moment can be called the guardian of the Kingdom of Pender, and the Goddess of Luck finally stood on the shoulders of the guardian. After a year-long tug of war of attack and defense, news came from the Bacchus Empire on the continent of Amara that the Emperor had been assassinated and that there was a major rebellion by snake worshippers in the country. The originally vast Second Empire of Bacchus ended up similar to the Kingdom of Pender. It also quickly fell into a bloody civil war in a short period of time. The extremely powerful Bacchus Empire also fell apart in just one month and became dozens of principalities, city-states and kingdoms. One of the most powerful regimes was a religious state founded by the priestesses of the snake cult. The emperor was assassinated for obvious reasons. General OSA, who is far away in the continent of Pendor, is in a stalemate. His motherland has been destroyed. He has lost all support and even lost contact with the continent of Amara. He has no way to retreat. After thinking for a long time, General OSA evacuated Chicha Fortress. He decided to consolidate his gains and rebuild the Bacchus Empire. He claimed himself as a conqueror in the southern part of the Pender continent that he had already occupied. He executed and exiled a group of nobles from the southern part of Pender who were not loyal to him. And after surrendering some lords, he proclaimed himself emperor in the coastal city of Siyuan City. His country is today's Bacchus and can also be called New Bacchus. The names of Siyuan City and Dillon Port were changed when General OSA established the New Bacchus Empire. From the names of these cities, we can probably imagine the mentality of General OSA at that time. But places conquered by force are not so easy to manage. In order to successfully rule the people of Southern Pendor, General OSA integrated the Shining Cross into his elite cavalry. He re-established the Knights of the Radiant Cross with the remaining civilian personnel and doctors as the main body, and set an example to protect civilians and business travelers, so that the army could pursue the spirit of chivalry as much as possible, and gain the recognition of the people with the fact of doing good and eliminating evil and the influence of the Radiant Cross. This method is very effective. Although these knights are not true knights recognized by the Charter of Rights, Citizens still believe in the Shining Cross heraldry and consider them to be the continuation of the once noble order of the Shining Cross. Although General OSA's act of arrogating the throne was condemned and ridiculed by almost all the lords of Pendor. In any case, he survived with his lone expedition to Pendor and achieved the conquest he came for. And those Jata people were originally mercenaries brought by General OSA from the Amara continent. After the collapse of the Gubax Empire, the Jata mercenaries rebelled against General OSA and went to the eastern grasslands, becoming an independent warlord force, which is today's Jata people. This rebellion was actually the work of Alfred, Duke of the Lion. He gave all the horse-breeding land of the Pen Kingdom and the large grassland east of Shurhu City to the Jata people, and allowed the Jata people to plunder, in exchange for the Jata people to cooperate with him. The new Emperor OSA, who had lost the Jata mercenaries and the support of his mother country, could not defeat the Duke of the Lion, and could only accept the result of a close match. The rebellion of the Jata people made General OSA use a similar method, causing the Principality of Dexia, which was originally subordinate to the Kingdom of Pander, to also rebel against General OSA and take over the southern town of Singal and Turda Fortress that were about to occupy it. He gave it to Duke Desha. This means that the Desha people can begin to transform from nomadic to semi-nomadic and semi-settled. The Desha Principality, which has obtained the rich and prosperous city of Singal, can no longer succumb to the barren desert, and it is enough to withstand the revenge of the kingdom of Pender. Therefore, this fierce people rebelled against the kingdom of Pender and became an independent principality. As a result, Pender has become a stalemate among many parties. The kingdom of Raven resists the Misty Mountains and Vans carry pirates. The kingdom of Pender lost most of its territory and was surrounded by enemies on all sides. Unable to regain its homeland, the new Bacchus Empire and the principality of Dexia are both newly established and need to be consolidated and digested internally. So Pender ushered in a strange truce. The situation of Duke Alfred the Lion was not optimistic at this time. As a powerful minister, he suffered a lot of criticism. Pender had almost no royal family members who could serve as king, and only an infant was left. 
Others will of course suspect that this is the hand of a powerful official. But not long after. Even the baby disappeared mysteriously. As for why the royal heir disappeared, Sarah could not find any information. And probably no one would disclose these secrets. Anyway, Duke Alfred the Lion was condemned and attacked by countless nobles loyal to Pindor. And it quickly evolved into a civil war. But at this time, if the internal friction intensifies and breaks the weak balance of Pandor continent, the consequences will be needless to say. I don't know what the Duke of Lyon was thinking at the time. Anyway, the result was that within a few months, he got the support of the Lion Knights and the Jada people, and used the fastest and most violent means to suppress all dissatisfaction. Expel or kill them. He killed all the lords who attacked him. This was obviously not something that could be achieved by a simple frontal war. Then, he usurped the throne and established the kingdom of Lyon. And the kingdom of Pender was destroyed. No one knows the specific details. But in any case, this Lion King has indeed stabilized the country and assembled a powerful fighting force that is enough to compete with enemies on all sides. Alfred the Lion King and General O.S.A. Emperor Bacchus are actually trespassers without legal principles. But were they really careerists from the beginning? Not necessarily. Before the demise of his mother country, General O.S.A. was a famous general with great military exploits and an invincible conqueror. He probably had no intention of proclaiming himself emperor. After establishing New Bacchus, he has been committed to protecting his subordinates and people, and has never initiated any conquests. When the kingdom of Pender collapsed, Duke Alfred the Lion was also the marshal who turned the tide and was the guardian of Pender. He did not declare independence when the kingdom of Pender fell into full warlord rule. But after defeating the powerful enemy, he became king instead. Maybe it's for profit. Maybe it's to save the country. Maybe it's for ambition. Maybe it's all. Who knows? The world is like this. Full of chance and full of changes. These are all over 150 years ago. Today, the Bacchus who still remain in the mainland of Amara are divided into two parts. Some of them are called ashes. That is, the descendants of the Bacchus who still insist on resisting the snake cult in the ruins of Guba Bac. They established a federation to resist the invasion of the snake cult. The other part are completely followers of the snake cult. The snake cult established a huge religious state on the site of the second empire of Gubaks. Whether voluntarily or by force. The Bacchus who converted to the snake cult are attacking the remaining Ashborn compatriots while invading various continents. Including the continent of Pender. The route taken by the snake cult to invade the Pender continent was almost exactly the same as the original route taken by General OSA. They also landed near Dillon Port, and then gradually eroded the people from south to north, and slowly penetrated into the upper echelons of the Bacchus Empire. Chapter 137 Marius Reform The snake cult believes in the evil god Aziz Dahaka. According to Anson, this is a god who lives in gray cumulonimbus clouds. He has a body like a giant snake, scales like a horned viper, and fleshy wings on his back. This is the pattern of the Bashi City Seminary. Logically speaking, the shape of this giant flying snake often means fear and destruction. But in the eyes of snake cult believers, this is not the case. Anson and Roland have both seen snake cult believers. The territory of Bacchus was once filled with snake cult believers. According to snake cult followers, Aziz Dahaka is the goddess of mercy. It's hard to imagine that this giant snake could be a goddess. But according to snake worshippers, people are born to suffer. And the world is inherently purgatory unless everything is destroyed and then the Kingdom of God is rebuilt on the earth. The merciful goddess will respond to the prayers of every believer, bring strength to the devout believers, and will take the believers to the kingdom of God after their death to enjoy all beautiful things. Moreover, if the kingdom of God can be built on the earth, then the devout snake cultists will be able to have their dreams come true, become eternal immortal beings, and enjoy blessings forever. Obviously, this is a sect that promotes despair and fear, and promises beautiful results such as power afterlife, and the kingdom of God as a way of deception. It is also extremely inflammatory. Basically, everyone all doctrines exist for the sake of rebellion. At the same time, the snake cult is also very good at using various intoxicating tools, such as snake heart stones. This kind of clearly organized sect has a fatal attraction for the people at the bottom who have neither knowledge nor hope. It just so happened that the Bacchus Empire had always implemented the law of civil equality. This was the tradition of the ancient Bacchus. People were divided into several classes based on blood and wealth. And the classes were clear and fixed. As conquerors, the descendants of the Bacchus are naturally superior people, and the aboriginal people 
and their descendants in the southern part of Pendor are naturally inferior people. Only the descendants of the Bacchus can join the legion. The native people of Pend are not allowed to own weapons, and can only work as farmers or hard labor throughout their lives. In fact, for a long time, the lower class poor and slaves in Bacchus were not regarded as human beings at all. But as livestock, the Pen natives in Bacchus are destined to have a fateful ending from the moment they are born. This situation is the norm for colonial rule by conquerors of foreign nations. But now that the motherland of Bacchus and the Amara continent has been completely destroyed, this conqueror's rule not only makes the Bacchus empire weaker and weaker, but also provides the best soil for the spread of the snake worship cult. The descendants of the local nobles, who had been surrendered by General OSA, leading the indigenous, lower people, who had lost hope in life, had been continuously launching resistance during the more than 100 years of colonial rule. And rebellions continued in various places. Many Pender natives, even though they know that there are problems with the snake cult, will still join the snake cult to gain strength to fight against the Bacchus Empire. The long-term oppression and hatred and hopeless life make them convinced that what they are in is H. L. And they would rather ruin everything. The Bacchus Empire did not have enough military power to suppress it. General OSA's fleet that invaded Pindor had only tens of thousands of Bacchus in total. And many died in the battle. The descendants of these Bacchus were a minority group compared with the Aborigines in the entire southern part of Pindor. And their traditional civilian-level law means that only the descendants of the Bacchus can join the legion to fight. It is conceivable that the number of soldiers is scarce. As a result, the snake worship cult became more and more intense in the territory of Bacchus. And more and more believers were suppressed and even gradually penetrated into the upper echelons of the consul level. Fortunately, there was a mad king in the Lion Kingdom at that time, and the country was even more chaotic than Bacchus. The two countries were competing at the time, which gave the Bacchus Empire a chance to change. Emperor Marius was a sensible man. After he ascended the throne 20 years ago, he launched targeted reforms. He first established the harvest goddess, Demaya Providence, as the main god of Bacchus. The image of this goddess is that of a mature woman with a kind face and no hair, only covering her key parts with a wreath of wheat ears. She looks gentle and plump. This is one of the main gods of Pendor, and a harvest god generally believed by farmers in the southern part of Pendor. Emperor Marius required all descendants of the Bacchus to honor the native goddess Demaya of Pendor. He even changed his crown to a wreath of wheat ears from the goddess Demaya. This is of course to change the image of the Bacchus invaders. Try to integrate into the native Pendor and reduce the hostility of the indigenous people. At the same time, this policy can also play another role. The image of the goddess of harvest is beautiful and abundant. Using this image of the main god full of beautiful yearnings and hopes of prosperity can actively fill people's beliefs and inhibit the spread of snake worship. After all, compared with a big snake with wings, the harvest goddess looks more approachable just from the appearance. Subsequently, Emperor Marius personally destroyed the traditional civil laws of the Bacchus Empire and reenacted the civil laws. The citizenship law abolished the hierarchical system of people and stipulated that the Bacchus and the Pen natives were citizens of the empire, with equal status and no distinction between superior and inferior. Emperor Marius did not completely abolish slavery, but he gave everyone, including slaves, a ladder to rise. Anyone could join the legions to fight, and their status could be improved by establishing military exploits. But if you join the snake cult, you will be treated as a slave regardless of your previous status. At the same time, he promoted many Pender natives to lords and in theft local lords to exercise self-government in those areas that could not be restrained. In civil affairs, the traditional one-vote veto power of the tribune was also abolished and replaced by a collegial panel system in which the lord, superior consul, and elected tribune jointly deliberated. The tribunes are representatives elected from the common people since only Bacchus were considered human beings in the past. The original tribunes were all Bacchus. They would only serve the Bacchus and would not protect the interests of the native people of Pind. The elected tribunes in the new policy are selected from the villagers in proportion to the population. They include people from all ethnic groups, which is relatively fair to the people. This is to move closer to the Pender mainland or to fully integrate the Bacchus people into the Pender continent. Moreover, he implemented a complete separation of soldiers and peasants in the Bacchus Empire, replaced compulsory conscription with a recruitment system, and then established multiple large-scale legions. And these new legions were uniformly equipped by the country or the emperor himself. This professional military system is actually more advanced than the local knight recruitment system in Pindor. And civilians have more opportunities for advancement. His newly formed Legion of the Immortals
also doesn't care whether the recruits are Pinders or Bacchus. They are all treated equally within the Legion. The Imperial Gladiator troops are all slaves and criminals who crawled out of the arena. This allowed the Bacchus Empire to obtain a wide source of troops. So in the past 10 years, when facing the Lion Kingdom, the Bacchus Empire was mostly able to have the upper hand and occupied a lot of territory. This political reform carried out jointly by the gods, the people, and the military has truly integrated Bacchus into Pander in the past 20 years, and has also brought hope to most people. Internal conflicts have gradually eased, and the national strength of the Bacchus Empire has also improved. Stronger. Emperor Marius' reforms also received strong support from the Knights of the Shining Cross at the first time. Scholars of the Knights of the Radiant Cross even helped Emperor Marius establish some seminaries, not only to spread Damien's faith, but also to spread more scientific medical skills. Spreading common sense about theology and medicine can also suppress the snake worship cult, and at the same time allow the country of Bacchus to be recognized by the people. Anson once studied at the seminary in the City of Knowledge. These new policies gave Emperor Marius a high reputation. Most of the Pande people in Bacchus no longer regarded him as a descendant of the conqueror, but regarded him as a real emperor, but with a different nationality. From being an invader to being recognized by the native people, it took the Bacchus Empire 150 years to achieve true rule. However, the reform policies that achieved actual results were promulgated by Emperor Marius, and it took him less than 20 years. In the past 20 years, he must have faced tremendous pressure, abandoned tradition, faced opposition from the Bacchus people, and completed national policy changes despite various internal and external troubles. As a foreign ruler, actively seeking to integrate into Pinder and return rights to the Pinder people is far more courageous than being a pure conqueror. Of course, these were not the only reforms initiated by Emperor Marius. But neither Anson nor Sarah knew much more. Of course, the information Sarah found was verified. And she would not tell such uncertain rumors. Just like the specific things that happened with Alfred, Duke of Lyon, in the month before he became king. She couldn't find any information. So she wouldn't make random guesses. She would leave the judgment to the Lord himself. This is undoubtedly the style of an excellent foreign affairs officer who does not add personal subjective speculation to his work, but only collects information objectively and executes tasks. Leon was digesting these contents along the way. For him, these historical data are of great significance. They not only allow him to confirm his original strategy, but also allow him to learn and think. Emperor Marius' reforms greatly touched him, and the Lord even wanted to meet the Emperor. Of course, not now. Now the convoy is moving forward, passing through hundreds of miles of no man's land, and has entered the territory of the Bacchus Empire. The transport team did not have many people, only five vehicles and a dozen people, and the people in charge of driving were all from Menheim. The Lord disguised himself as a businessman in the fur goods business, or he had no disguise at all. He was originally a businessman, and the people of Menheim were originally mercenaries. This trade route from Chang'e Town to Dialingang is actually a very reasonable route. And the Lord has thought about it carefully. Leather happens to be a relatively scarce commodity in the southern part of the Bacchus Empire. The southern part of the Pender continent has a hot climate and few pastures, which is not suitable for large-scale cattle and sheep breeding. Moreover, there are few wild boars and deer making a living there. The Lord already knew this when he held double eleven last time. At that time, the merchants from Chang'e Town basically sold all their inventory to Bacchus. Southern coastal ports like Dillon Port have a lot of seafood such as pearls and corals, as well as cheap salt and spices. They are also a good place to purchase goods. There are many people in the Lyshire Kingdom raising cattle and sheep. There are many forests and mountains around Chang'e Town. And there are many wild animals. And fur and other things are relatively abundant. There are many leather products produced in Chang'e Town, Yongdun Castle, Shirhu City and other places. Of course, some leather goods were obtained through private transactions with the Jata people. Therefore, the more common souvenirs in Chang'e Town are leather products. Of course, there is also a less common souvenir, the Nolder Elves, as one of the local specialties. Lisa Dillon is indeed on the team. The people of Medenheim, Sarah, Amy and others all know about the existence of Lisa Dillon. However, despite walking on the same road, Rasatalan did not get along with everyone. He has been not far behind Leon, either in the woods or in a dark place where the light cannot reach. Occasionally I would wander onto the road, but I always turned around and couldn't see anyone. This Nolder elf seems to be a little autistic now. He hasn't spoken to anyone for a long time. Only the Lord can occasionally communicate with him. 
after completing the mission of blowing the trumpet last time. Rasatalan hid in the forest until the truce came out. And he met his own people. A patrol team. In the Noldor forest. The sound of horns in the forest will of course attract the investigation of the Noldor elves. But the Noldor obviously don't want to pay attention to the human war. Rasatalan and his tribe just looked at each other from a distance in the woods. And no one said anything. Rasatalan did not dare to speak because he was exiled, and the great Lord Islandil did not allow him to return to the Noldor forest. He was afraid of being attacked by his tribe, and did not know how to face them. His tribe probably recognized him, and didn't say anything. Perhaps that was also the reason why they didn't want to attack Rasatalan. But they also didn't know how to face this exiled guy. As a result, Lisa Dillon was probably a little depressed after returning to make the angling. Although it had been more than 10 years since he had been unable to return to his home. This was the first time he had been speechless with his tribe in Changha Forest. As an outcast sinner, Rasatalan had no contact with his people. But most humans regard Noldor as their enemy. So he cannot have too much contact with humans. This probably gave him a sense of loneliness that was incompatible with the world. Leon can understand this feeling of loneliness. Because the Lord himself is not from this world. But no one else could help with this kind of loneliness. So Leon did not bother Risa Dillon. The Lord felt that Risa Dillon was in good condition now. Maybe he didn't want to talk to anyone. But the loneliness in his heart made him devote himself to his work wholeheartedly. As a qualified entrepreneur. Since employees are fully committed to their work. Leon will naturally not interfere. Of course. This elf killer is not a fragile person. He actually doesn't show much abnormality. But he hides deeper. Sometimes even the Lord doesn't know where he is. But unless it is inconvenient for the Lord to take him. He will definitely be near the Lord. And he will come out if Leon calls. After all, his duty is to serve as a secret guard to protect the safety of the Lord. On this long trip. Of course, I have to take this bodyguard with me. The transport team planted three flags. Leon's black and white griffin flag. Godric's three lions flag. And Leofric's red background griffin flag. They are all shareholders, and of course they have to protect their own property. Planting the three flags together can basically guarantee safety in the lion realm. After all, this represents the lords of the entire eastern region. No matter which noble or bandit they are, they always have to weigh their concerns. After leaving the lion realm, the risk will naturally be higher. But as long as they don't encounter bandits, Bacchus's lords or soldiers generally will not attack this kind of caravan with several noble flags. After all, no one is a fool. Easily plundering a business trip back by so many nobles may trigger a large-scale war. And they will definitely be traced by then. Of course, without these three barren flags, the caravan would have been robbed by Bacchus patrols not long after entering Bacchus territory. Bacchus's soldiers are not worried about ordinary businessmen with no background. However, in order to minimize the risk, the convoy carefully avoided the fortresses on the border between the two countries to avoid trouble from the border garrison of the Bacchus Empire. In this era, it was common for business travelers to enter the country secretly. After all, there were only a few defenders in the border counties, and they could not be kept track of. The Lord entered the Bacchus Empire from between Shieldwind Fortress and Karen Deer Fort. There are hundreds of miles of wilderness between these two border fortresses. Afterwards, the convoy prepared to stop briefly in Imel Village to replenish some necessities such as food, water, and horse feed. Imel Village is actually a subordinate village of Shieldwind Fortress but it is quite far away from Shieldwind Fortress, at least more than 200 miles away. The Shieldwind Fortress of the Bacchus Empire is somewhat similar to the Chicha Fortress of the Lion Kingdom. It is a relatively pure military fortress. It is the front line facing the Lion Kingdom. It can even be regarded as a lonely midway fortress. More than a hundred years ago, when the Bacchus Empire was first established, the population originally living in the border area was moved to the hinterland of the empire leaving a few hundred miles of uninhabited buffer zone on the border between the two countries, and at the same time building the Shield Wind Fortress. The location of this fortress is just south of the Dingier Mountains. The straight-line distance from Bailu Fort is only more than 300 miles, which is about the same distance as the distance from Chang'e Town to Bailu Fort. The original intention of building the fortress was to serve as an outpost when the Bacchus Empire attacked White Deer Castle, and also to avoid the counterattack of the Lion Kingdom. So the location of the fortress was far away from the villages where people lived. The buffer zone of several hundred miles also weakened the advantage of heavy cavalry in the Lion Kingdom. The heavy knights in the Lion Kingdom were actually not suitable for long-term combat in the wild. Due to the existence of this buffer zone of hundreds of miles, the knights of the Lion Realm rarely attacked the Bacchus Empire from the east. 
because it is a waste of food and effort. They cannot find supplies on the way, and they cannot find civilian husbands on the spot. In the past 20 or 30 years, Baron Godric of White Deer Castle has never attacked. So Imel Village, a village under Shieldwind Fortress, has spent decades of stable peace. As a subordinate village of the Border Fortress, it is really incredible that it has not experienced war for decades. But another border area of the Bacchus Empire, Karen Deer Castle, did not have this treatment. Almost every large-scale attack launched by the Lion Kingdom targets Karen Deer Fort. The villages under Kalen Deer Fort have been ravaged for a long time and are almost in ruins. Even Karen Deer Castle abandoned Salem Village, the closest village to the Lion Kingdom. This village is basically empty of people and is now as completely empty as Triburn Village in Long River Town. Both are subordinate villages of the Border Castle. But the difference between Imel and Salem is really huge. Nowadays, most of the original residents of Salem Village and Barug, another subordinate village of Kalunla Castle, have moved to Imel. As a result, Imel developed into a large town inhabited by tens of thousands of people in the past 20 to 30 years. Larger than the village of Kewen. But Imel Village is more densely populated, with more streets and villagers in the center of the village. It looks lively and feels like a big city without walls. There is also a small square in the village. This is of course not Rome's Marian reform. But Pondes, please don't panic, Roman friends. Since there is no specific information on Pandemarius's reforms, I set up some reform methods that are in line with the background and logic of the times based on the causes and consequences. My head was completely bald. Chapter 138 Did you meet an old gangster? While the convoy was resting, the Lord encountered a large-scale event. This is May 8th, a festival belonging to the goddess Demaya. There is a tall stone goddess statue in the small square of Imel village. The villagers are gathering together to pray to the harvest goddess Demaya. It is a traditional custom of farmers in the south of Penn to pray for good weather after sowing. At the same time, since this is also the time when winter wheat has just been put into storage, every household has food, and the busiest sowing period has just ended. So this festival has another meaning. Goddess Demaya is not only the god of harvest. She is also known as the goddess of protection. Her Protection also means that the children and grandchildren will continue to live forever. So young men and women will also gather at this time to find someone who is right with them. The opposite sex drinks and dances. If both men and women think each other is okay, they can go to a nearby place to chat alone. If they can talk well, they can swear an oath under the statue of Demaya. The local tribune will directly confirm the relationship between the two on this day. Engagement. If the courtship is successful on this day, it will be blessed by the goddess Demaya, the local lord and all the villagers, which will be more meaningful and legal for the believers of the goddess Demaya. It doesn't matter if the negotiation fails. You can come back and continue dancing and searching. It can be regarded as a big courtship day. But this is a more harmonious and civilized one. There is no such thing as snatching a bride. It is more like a modern dance party. But this activity, full of beauty and hope, was dangerous for the lord because the Lord saw an old acquaintance, General Creon, next to the statue of the goddess. Amy, don't turn around. I think I saw General Creon. We have to run away quickly. The territory of this famous imperial general is Karen Deer Castle, but most of the people under his rule have moved to Imel. It is probably because of this that he appears here. This taciturn general on the battlefield is now standing in the middle of the crowd with several radiant cross dispellers. They don't have weapons on them at the moment and they are wearing headbands made of wheat straw to offer ale and other tributes to the goddess statue. This should be the request of Emperor Marius. At about this time, all the consuls and generals would lead the farmers to worship the goddess Demaya. General Creon is a member of the Knights of the Shining Cross, and his status in the hearts of the farmers is obviously very high. This can be seen from the fact that he walked into the crowd without any weapons. However, General Creon seemed a little absent-minded and a little anxious. After completing his ritual, he even yawned and turned around to look around, as if he had something on his mind. Seeing that General Creon has been looking around, the Lord certainly does not want to be discovered. After all, the two countries have not signed an armistice agreement and are still considered hostile countries. There will definitely be no problem with the caravan. Most Bacchus lords will not take the initiative to attack a caravan carrying three noble flags, especially a general like Creon, who comes from the Knights of the Shining Cross. In fact, Imel Village welcomed the arrival of the caravan on this beautiful day, and some people planned to drag the people in the caravan to dance together. But the strong men of Menenheim were not harassed because they were too big. 
Sarah had already joined the singing and dancing ceremony of the villagers. As a bard, she would maintain respect for any main god. So she played the piano in the small square. She couldn't do it without playing. Many men in the village were staring at her. If she didn't play the piano, she would be invited to dance. This is, after all, a mating festival. Sarah was very calm. She had been to Bacchus before, and this was not the first time she encountered this festival. She could adapt to it. But the Lord can't take the lead. General Creon has met Leon, and he knows that he is a kidnapper. Therefore, before being discovered, the Lord took Amy and planned to hide quickly. Risa Dillon was peeping behind the big tree at the entrance of the village. When he saw Leong turning around and coming out, he covered his hood and came over. Sir, have you encountered an enemy? Do you need me to kill that guy? The elf killer's recent work attitude has been quite proactive. No, this is someone else's territory. Don't mess around. We can just go outside the village and guard the carriage. The Lord doesn't want to cause trouble. He just wants to avoid it. Sarah was a bard and would be very popular during the festival. So there wouldn't be any problems. Medenheimers need not worry. Either. Although the macho men are thick and strong. These villagers are not hostile to them. After all, Medenheim mercenaries can often be seen in Bacchus. As enemies of the Barclay Empire, the Medenheimers and the Bacchus were actually natural allies. Because the Bacchus Empire and Barclay had always been hostile. In fact, the Bacchus Empire was hostile to most countries. Although Bacchus is a little more depressed today than before. After all, his ancestors were richer. The wider the country, the more enemies it has. So now Bacchus probably only has Medenheim as his only ally. The first stop for most Medenheim mercenaries, who came to Pender to seek life, was also the Bacchus Empire. However, according to Frederick, the Bacchus current bid is too low. And it cannot keep up with the fraction of the Fieldsway peoples. In fact, the Lord understands very well that the cities in Fields Way are generally chaotic and there are many commercial and trade activities. So the demand for big bodyguards must be stronger. In recent years, due to the reforms of Emperor Marius, Bacchus has become plentiful of soldiers. And now there is not much demand for mercenaries. Therefore, most people from Mendenheim will eventually go to the western coast and go to Fields Way to pick up business. Imel's attitude towards the caravan is very good. No one needs to worry. The only one who needs to worry about General Creon is actually Leon. Mainly because he once kidnapped two governors in front of Creon. Are dangerous elements. In fact, it was just a coincidence that in the entire Bacchus Empire, there were only a few people who knew the Lord. So it was not that easy to meet him. No one, including Amy, probably knew anyone. Except for the two governors who had been kidnapped. Leon asked Amy not to look back. Just to cover himself. Taking a girl away with him, at this time, was the least noticeable way. However, just when the Lord was about to sneak out of the village with Amy, the absent-minded General Creon seemed to see Amy carrying a musket. He probably didn't recognize Amy either, but he probably recognized the musket, which was a weapon owned by the Buckleys. So, the General said a few words to the people around him, pointed this way, and then several plague exterminators ran this way. Teacher, they seem to be targeting me. You leave the village first, and I'll send them away. Amy glanced calmly, and then sent the Lord and Rissa Dillon away. She knew that General Creon must know the Lord, but she herself had been at the heights of White Deer Castle. None of these Radiant Cross Plague exterminators had ever been on the city wall, so it was impossible for them to recognize her. Amy's eyesight is quite good, or it is a girl's instinct. She can tell at a glance whether others are staring at her or others. So Amy turned around and faced the Plague exterminators. Leon put on his hood and covered half of his face and walked out of the village with Risa Dillon, avoiding the eyes of General Creon. Gentlemen, you seem to be chasing me? What's the matter? Amy stood in front of the exterminators with a smile. This lady. Well, I'm sorry. You don't seem to be from Buckley. But the general asked us to ask. Are you from that caravan? Where did the firearms on your body come from? Seeing Amy directly speaking out. Several of the epidemic exterminators were relieved. After taking a serious look at Amy, their attitudes became much kinder. The question was very direct and did not seem to be hostile. Just a normal inquiry to a stranger. I'm protecting the caravan. Are you trying to steal my matchlock gun? This is my trophy. If you guys dare to mess around, I swear I will fight you to the end. Amy glanced sideways and took a step back pretending to be wary. No. 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 We are just asking out of curiosity. 
nothing else. I wish you good afternoon and welcome you to join the festival of goddess Demaya. Beautiful lady. Several of the plague exterminators quickly put on smiles and then retreated. They did not want to be misunderstood as robbers. And since it is a trophy, it is obviously hostile to the Buckley Empire. So it is fine and can be repaid. Amy looked back three times and slowly walked out, watching the plague exterminators return to General Creon. Then General Creon looked at Amy, but suddenly seemed to be interested and walked over on his own. And he was walking very quickly. Amy simply stood and waited again. She already knew that Cleon's men wouldn't do anything to her. The people of the Knights of the Shining Cross were said to be basically decent. But General Creon's first words when he came to Amy scared her. My dear lady, can I treat you to a casual meal? His. Amy was really confused now. She was often invited to dinner by men. The Lion Knights and the Knights of White Deer Castle all wanted to invite her to dinner. However, being invited by an old man in his fifties, apart from her father Godric, had never happened before. But Creon's face looked very serious. And he didn't seem to have any intention of teasing. Even if this festival is special, it should be an invitation to dance. The Sergeant Major of the Knights of the Shining Cross shouldn't be that kind of person. Right? Um, you should be General Creon. Right? What do you want from me? Amy shook her head in disbelief, mentally assessing Creon's age. She must be in her late fifties at least, and her children are probably much older than herself. Isn't this the right age to treat an eighteen-year-old girl to dinner? Ah, don't get me wrong. I'm not very good at talking. I just want to ask. You don't seem to be married yet? I hope you can help. It seems that General Creon is indeed not very eloquent and he probably doesn't know how to deal with women at all. Amy was sweating. Sarah should be better at handling this kind of situation. But Amy has never had this kind of experience. And she doesn't know what to do at all. General Creon, I'm not going to think about marriage yet. Well, I have something else to do. So I'll take my leave. Amy looked around and saw that Sarah was still playing the piano and would be unable to get away for a while. So she hurriedly ran to Sarah. She knew that Sarah was very good at dealing with these troubles. Sarah saw Creon's actions and obviously saw the embarrassment on Amy's face. She stood up and apologized to the men around her. Then came over. Alas! Miss! This is a misunderstanding! A misunderstanding! I didn't mean it like this! I just... Creon also looked embarrassed. Although he was not very eloquent, he must have known in his heart that Amy must have misunderstood. But he could only shout a few times from behind. But he couldn't explain clearly. Sarah didn't hear what Creon said clearly, but when she saw Amy running over with a stiff expression on her face, she hugged Amy. What's wrong? This general actually asked me if I was married and said he wanted to treat me to dinner. Have I met an old gangster? Amy's panicked look made Sarah laugh. Sarah kept watching Creon's reaction and knew that there should be no problem. After all, no big noble would act like a hooligan in front of the people. It would be a shame. It's okay, Amy. He probably means no harm. Of course. Sarah could tell at a glance that Creon had no messy thoughts. She stepped forward and asked Amy to hide behind her. General Creon, I know you, but you seem to be scaring my sister. I'm sorry. Ladies, I'm just not well. To be honest, I'm looking for a suitable dance partner for my son. And this lady happens to be not well. I don't know what to say. Creon's face looked even stiffer. He originally came to invite out of politeness. But he was really unable to speak. Sarah was quite surprised. General, how could you personally come forward for such a thing? And in an environment with so many people? Indeed, for nobles, this kind of thing is usually done by maids. A great lord would not invite a girl in public, no matter what the reason is. Even if the girl is a civilian or a mercenary, for someone with Creon status, this is a very impolite behavior. Sarah looked carefully. The general was wearing the uniform of a Shining Cross Plague Controller. Imperial infantry armor, and he had no coat of arms. Only the plague controller behind him was holding his military flag. The military flag is a golden falcon, which is the iconic flag awarded to the leaders of the penned Aboriginal people by Emperor Marius after the reform. The yellow and brown background is also the iconic color of the Bacchus Empire after the reform, expressing the peace between the Bacchus and Penn peoples, the meaning of coexistence. So Sarah immediately understood that Creon was a high ranking officer with civilian background and he might not pay much attention to the etiquette among nobles. Moreover, he didn't know that Amy was a noble girl, so he probably thought that Amy was a businessman or mercenary. I know this is a bit rude, 
I'm worried that I'll never see your caravan again after it leaves. I'm really a little anxious. That's it. It turns out that Creon's son Lord Dean is 33 years old. But he has never been married. The Emperor Marius once issued a decree that if a man over 32 years old or a woman over 28 years old has not married, he will be found guilty and required to serve in labor force. This is a policy formulated to increase the population. And it is everyone must abide by it, including the consuls. Emperor Marius also specifically stipulated that old cows were not allowed to eat young grass. And the age difference between husband and wife should not exceed 25 years. Both couples who violated the rules had to go to jail. So as not to increase the population and waste resources. Creon himself was a staunch supporter of Emperor Marius' reforms. Of course he had to abide by the law. As a result, his son was personally sent to serve three months of hard labor last year. If his son doesn't find a girlfriend this year, he will have to go to the mines to move rocks for another three months. As a father, Creon certainly felt sorry for his son, and he himself hoped that his son would start a family as soon as possible. But Lord Dean is stubborn. Dean was one of the first beneficiaries of Marius' reforms. After graduating from the Royal Academy in Siyuan City, he became a believer in Demaya, the goddess of harvest, and was particularly good at water conservancy engineering and agricultural construction. Since the age of 20, he has been involved in agricultural construction in various parts of the Bacchus Empire and has been quite effective. For this reason, he accumulated a lot of meritorious service and was named the Lord of Imel. This place has been stable for more than 20 years. There is a lot of wasteland around it, which is very suitable for agriculture. However, I don't know if Dean is selfish or just has the wrong orientation. Anyway, he has not been interested in women for more than 10 years. Creon had arranged dozens of blind dates for him, including noble girls and beautiful commoner women. But none of them were successful. Dean looked down on ordinary girls. He felt, Just saying a word to them is a disaster. I can't be with a woman who screams at the sight of a sword. And they have no knowledge and are too stupid to communicate. General Creon said these were Dean's exact words. The students of the Royal Academy may indeed look down on village girls. So Creon was quite anxious. He thought that his son probably liked knowledgeable and talented female warriors. This is really hard to find. After meeting Amy, he felt that this seemed like a good opportunity. Because the way Amy is carrying a gun and holding a sword. She is definitely not an ordinary girl just by looking at it. Just by looking at her. She felt that she was an educated female warrior who had no knowledge and could not handle a musket. The fact that she was neither humble nor arrogant in the face of several soldiers also showed her courage. Moreover, a battle experienced general like Creon could tell that Amy must have seen war and been on the battlefield. So Creon felt that this was definitely someone his son liked. And it probably fit Dean's expectations. He didn't know that this was Godric's daughter. Amy claimed to be protecting the caravan, and he thought Amy was just a female mercenary. There is really no need for a general to go around in circles with a mercenary and play around with aristocratic etiquette. It is normal to talk about things, just like the grandparents in the park who are looking for a partner for their children. Sarah had already begun to shake her head. General, in your capacity, you can find a willing girl in the village first and make a marriage contract directly to Lord Dean, so as to avoid the guilt and then solve the problem slowly dot at most in the future. Break off the engagement. General Creon nodded sadly. That's what I thought. But Dean is a bit dot a bit stubborn. He is not interested in those women. And he is not willing to listen to my arrangements. Today was a good opportunity. He is a believer of the goddess Demaya. And I also arranged for an older girl who is also troubled by the law. Originally he agreed. But he regretted it again today. He is hiding at home and does not come out. If he does not solve this problem, he will be half he will have to go mining again in a few months. Chapter 139 Musketeers and Technicians General Creon didn't have any other intentions. He just felt that a female warrior like Amy should be able to talk to Dean so that Dean wouldn't hide all the time. It seems that Dean's temperament is a bit dull. And he is probably the kind of simple-minded person who concentrates on studying technology. He went to the Royal Academy, is more educated than his father, has his own career and ideas, and wants to pursue his ideals and true love. Plus, he may be a bit of a jerk. It is normal for such a person not to accept his father's arrangements. Moreover, Dean was a lord directly subordinate to Emperor Marius. Although Creon was his father, he could not forcefully order him. Even if it is a political marriage or a temporary engagement, it must be done with Dean's own consent. Cleon's thinking was actually quite flexible. 
he had originally made an agreement with Dean to deal with this matter first. As long as Dean showed off, he could announce with the village civil officer that Dean was engaged. Even if the two parties are really not suitable, it is okay to wait for a while and then terminate the engagement. The girl General Creon was looking for was also an older, unmarried young woman. She was already 27 or 80 years old, which was almost the age stipulated by this special law. So it was originally negotiated and both parties could avoid it. Punishment by law. But no matter how perfunctory this kind of thing is, it must at least be voluntary for both men and women. And both parties must be present. Moreover, Dean is a local lord. If he does not agree, civil officials will not dare to make false claims. But Dean had promised well yesterday. But today he quit. He refused to even show off, saying that he could not deceive the goddess Demaya. He probably did not want to have any communication with a woman he disliked from the bottom of his heart. Now he has been staying in the manor and unwilling to come out. It is basically difficult for father and son to communicate effectively. In fact, Creon just wanted to use the image of this female mercenary to persuade Dean to come out or even make an appointment. At worst, he would trick Dean into going to his Cullendeer castle, which was the front line and implemented military control. Creon was their Cullendeer castle can cover the sky with one hand. Miss, I'm sorry for scaring you just now. I just hope you can meet Dean and help me date him out. Today happens to be Demaya's holiday. If you don't have an engagement or a crush. Of course, if there is, it is indeed my fault. Creon bowed slightly to Amy and spoke sincerely. He didn't intend to force anyone nor did he mean to forcefully force him. He just wanted Amy to attract Dean to show his face. In his opinion, this shouldn't be an embarrassing thing for a mercenary. Moreover, for Southerners, asking people to dance on this festival is a local custom and normal. Creon must have been extremely worried before he took this step. He was indeed a bit anxious and wanted to seek medical treatment. But the problem is that Amy is a noble from the Lion Realm, not a Southerner or a mercenary, and she can't dance at all. No noble would agree to such a request. How could a noble girl lower her profile and do such a thing? This is actually one of the reasons why Creon has been having trouble solving the problem. Amy wiped the sweat from her head with her sleeves and breathed a sigh of relief. As long as she wasn't being a hooligan. However, if Amy was really a mercenary, it would be difficult to refuse a general's request. Although Creon did not mean to force the request, Amy was still a little uneasy. If you want to refuse... It is best to show your noble status. Creon will definitely not ask a noble girl from the Lion Realm to do such a thing that will be laughed at. But she is the daughter of Godric of Whiteheart Castle. She was not sure whether Creon would detain her. Bacchus's generals had suffered many losses at Whiteheart Castle. Sarah also frowned. She had had a similar experience and knew that this matter was very troublesome. Amy thought for a while and then refused directly. General, I'm sorry. I have someone I like and I am a believer of the goddess Eunomia, so it is not convenient for me to participate in Demaya's festival. But looking at Creon's disappointed expression, she added, However, I may be able to help you persuade Lord Dean, but not in this way. Sarah stared at Amy in surprise. But we still have to hurry. The big boss is still waiting for us. She didn't understand what Amy meant. Although Creon seemed to be just an old man anxious about his son, he was a general of an enemy country. Amy shook her head at Sarah. It's okay. It only takes a few words. The carriage also needs a rest. Creon originally thought there was no chance and was sighing. Hearing what Amy said, he was a little overjoyed. That's great. You may be able to help me persuade him. Please come with me. Noble lady. They all use honorifics. It was clear that Creon was willing to try if given the slightest chance. Then General Creon personally led the way, leading the two girls to a manor in the village. Along the way, he began to arrange for his plague exterminators. It seemed that he really planned to get Dean to Cullen Deer Castle. This is indeed a civilian general who is anxious about his son. Sarah whispered in Amy's ear. What's going on? Amy, why do you want to see Dean? Didn't he just say that Lord Dean's specialty is water conservancy and agriculture? And he has achieved considerable results. Isn't it that we came out this time to solve the food problem in Menname? I think meeting Dean well. It might be beneficial. Anyway. General Creon won't hurt us. And we won't delay anything. Amy is acting more and more like a lord now. Wanting to seize every opportunity. She even waved her hand to the Medenheimers in the distance. Signaling them not to follow. Sarah nodded. But she whispered meaningfully. Amy, 
it seems you really have someone you like. She understood what Amy was thinking. This little girl probably wanted to do something to help the Lord. She didn't want to be a little girl who was always protected. Amy didn't answer, but gave Sarah a harmless look. Amy's current way of thinking is indeed completely unlike that of a girl in this world. She likes to learn new things, and she is flexible and able to draw inferences. She does not stick to tradition. She has her own judgment and dares to make decisions. She also wants to be a heroine. Each of them has basically nothing to do with the aristocratic girls of this era. Now, after following Leon for several months, this young girl is becoming more and more like a female lord. That matchlock gun is still in Amy's hand. The lead bullets and gunpowder obtained from Fauché were also on her body. The matchlock was Amy's trophy. Fauché was shot to death by her. The gunpowder was carried in two leather bags. And Fauché's brief fall into the water did not wet the gunpowder inside. The reason why there are two leather bags is because the firing powder and the ignition powder are two different things. The firing powder has a higher ratio of saltpeter, while the igniting powder has a higher ratio of sulfur. The former is to fully detonate, while the latter is to burn quickly to avoid exploding in the medicine pool. The match rope was also made by Amy herself. It was made of hemp rope mixed with saltpeter, soaked in vinegar for a day, and then dried in the sun. This kind of match rope can burn slowly, but does not have an open flame. It can burn more than one meter in an hour. This kind of match rope can also be used to make incense, which is not a new thing. I don't know why. But Liang's shooting level with a matchlock gun is far different from Amy's. Leon tried firing a few shots. But he never hit the target. After all, his firearm's proficiency was only 40. And it was his first time using an ancient new weapon. Like a matchlock gun. It was normal that he couldn't hit the target at first. But it was also the first time for Amy to use a matchlock gun. But after only two test shots, she was able to guarantee that she would not miss the target within 100 meters. This is probably human talent. Maybe Amy is naturally good at using such long-range weapons. She is also frighteningly accurate when using a crossbow. And her bow and arrow skills are also very good. It's just that she can't draw a strong bow. So she can only play with a cork bow like Anson. That kind of cork bow can at most shoot a rabbit or a pheasant. But it's not fatal to people. So she usually only carries a crossbow. But now, a more powerful musket has replaced the female crossbow on her body. Moreover, she also designed a Y-shaped gun frame by herself without any teacher to make up for her lack of strength and unable to hold it steady and level. And also to reduce the impact of recoil. This matchlock gun weighs up to 16 pounds and is 1 meter and 3 meters long. It is not very ergonomic and it is very difficult to hold it straight without shaking. The gun stand she made was modified from her noble sword. She dug a hole in the weight of the sword hilt and made a Y-shaped stand that could be inserted into the hole. Insert the tip of the sword into the ground and place the gun on the Y-shaped stand on the hilt of the sword. This can ensure stability and avoid the huge recoil impact when shooting. She also specially got a lot of fine cloth strips to hang on the rack. Because when the muzzle-loading gun was loading, the lead bullets would be pressed with fine cloth strips to ensure a tight fit and no air leakage. When shooting, you can also hang the gunpowder and bullet bags on the rack for easy operation. If you need to use a sword for self-defense, Remove the stand inserted into the hilt, and it will become a normal sword. Do you think this is the end? No. Amy even turned the Y-shaped frame into a slingshot. Musket lead bullets were just the right size, and wait for slingshots. I have to say that Amy is really smart. And her ability to draw inferences from one instance even surpasses that of the Lord. You must know that these things were made when she had just been exposed to muskets for only a few days. At that time. The Lord was still busy formulating wasteland reclamation policies in the territory and did not give her any instructions on how to do this. It was all her own thought. So Amy is now a musketeer. Looking at her talent in business and her ability with weapons, you can tell that this pretty girl is just a man at heart. It is indeed true that Amy has no talent at all in those things that ordinary noble girls are good at. She sings out of tune, dances and taps her feet, can turn any ingredient into charcoal when cooking, doesn't know how to put on makeup, and is not good at matching clothes. She didn't even know how to wear a corset. And she never took a maid with her, because she didn't find it troublesome. She likes to wear the swordsman uniform, and the lightweight half-armor that Leon gave her because it is easy to wear, and it also satisfies her desire to be a heroine. There are no perfect people or things in this world. There are gains and losses. It's just that she has a gentle and polite temperament. Coupled with her well-behaved appearance, it's easy for others to misunderstand her as a lady. There weren't many people in Dean's Manor, 
Most of them probably went to the square to participate in the activities. The Lord was now busy with a water wheel in the farmland of the manor and was already at work, seeing Cleon coming from a distance. Dean turned around and entered the building, seemingly not wanting to communicate with his father. General Creon watched his son turn around and enter the door from a distance, shook his head and smiled bitterly at Amy and Sarah. Look, he doesn't want to talk to me. I won't go there. He will only do it if I go more conflicts. It seems that the old general knows his son's temperament. But there is nothing he can do about Dean. Several plague repellents brought the two people into the manor. And the soldiers in the manor did not ask at all. It was obvious that this was not the first time that Creon had found someone to persuade Lord Dean. Unlike the skinny and short General Creon. Dean is a slightly fat otaku. There are many models in his manor. Most of which are irrigation equipment such as water wheels. And some agricultural tools such as SH. L blowing trucks. Obviously, this is a tech geek. Probably because Cleon did not enter the manor. The technical geek did not hide in the house. But waited for a few people in the courtyard filled with models. I'm Dean. Ladies, please come back. I know it was my father who asked you to persuade me. But I'm not in the mood to talk about personal matters right now. I'm sorry. Dean frowned and issued the expulsion order directly. Speaking in a very skillful tone. Amy smiled. Sir Dean. We are not interested in your personal affairs. I heard that you are very professional in water conservancy and agricultural products. I am here to ask you if there is any way to increase food production in the mountains. Dean was stunned for a moment, and then took a closer look at Amy and Sarah. Then he laughed. If it's just to discuss this, then you are welcome. I have some friends in Mettenheim, and I think you can understand why I asked this question. That place is all mountainous. Amy does know a lot about food matters and has done a lot of homework before. Because most of the areas in White Deer Fort are mountainous. She has always been concerned about food issues. The two quickly talked about specific agricultural matters. In this day and age, Amy's practical ability can really defeat most people. When it comes to agricultural management, even intellectuals like Sarah can't get a word in. But Sarah could very keenly sense that something was wrong with Dean. There were two stunning beauties with different styles in front of her. But Dean didn't take a serious look at them at all. He didn't seem to have any feelings for women. Sarah has too much experience in looking at men. This is not a state where Leon regards Sarah as an employee, but a state where he is completely indifferent to women. The Lord sometimes glances at beautiful women secretly and jokes with Sarah and Amy when nothing happens. This is a normal reaction of a man, and he just maintains appropriate etiquette. But Dean, completely different. He looked at Amy and Sarah like they were two potatoes. Maybe it's better to look at potatoes. Dot this is a human-powered water wheel that can divert water to the mountains. It's not a new thing. But I modified it, and it can irrigate places with high heights. If it is difficult to divert water to canals, then I suggest a variety of potatoes like this, or this. Dean was talking about potatoes. He took the two of them around the manor to look at his equipment. And he also dug out a yellow-orange stick and a few potatoes covered with soil from the cellar. The way he looked at the potato was much more complicated than when he looked at the woman. What's this? Amy has never seen these two crops. They are all grains. I call this stick corn or corn. And this lump is potato. These were originally crops from the Amara continent. I have spent nearly 10 years improving the varieties. In the past two years, they have become somewhat results. The planting period of corn is similar to that of wheat. And the yield is higher than that of wheat. Although potatoes can only be grown once a year, they have a very large yield and are drought resistant. Making them very suitable for mountainous areas. When talking about what he is good at, Dean talks freely and without reservation. Corn? Is this freshly harvested? It looks beautiful. Amy took the corn cob. The corn was very big and plump. It had been dried in the sun. And the golden corn kernel shone like jade. These are just the seeds I selected. Most of them will not grow so well. But corn has a great advantage. It only requires five pounds of seeds per acre. Unlike wheat. Dean seems very enthusiastic now. Probably these things are indeed the causes he loves from the bottom of his heart and are also his pride. He was indeed happy to share these results with Amy because he could see that Amy was really interested and not being perfunctory at all. Probably after leaving the academy, there were very few people who could communicate with him on these issues on an equal footing. The people he usually faced were either submissive farmers or aristocrats who didn't understand practical matters. He was probably relatively lonely. The land in Dean Manor was divided into several parts. There was a large area of dried corn stalks standing in the ground. And all the corn had been broken off. 
Dean probably deliberately compared the corn field with a wheat field and operated the corn completely according to the wheat time cycle. Amy looked at the corn cobs in her hand, then looked at the number of corn stalks in the field, and easily concluded that the yield per acre was at least 200 pounds. Before the scientific cultivation of varieties, the yield and taste of crops were not very good. But this yield has already surpassed the wheat of this era. Amy is keenly aware of the advantages of this crop, high yield and low seed consumption, which means a very high seed to yield ratio. This is a crop that is very suitable for large scale planting. There were still a few acres of low crops in the field. Those were the potatoes Dean had planted. They wouldn't be harvested for another two months. But now they looked like nothing more than clumps of shrubs. Amy picked up a potato and waited. Is this the rhizome of that kind of plant? How many such potato knots can each plant in the field produce? Over two pounds. One plant can produce four or five potatoes like this. Dean pointed at the big lump in Amy's hand that weighed nearly half a pound. So much! Amy exclaimed in surprise. There are at least a thousand plants in one acre of land. Thousands of pounds of grain produced per acre? With such a comparison, it should be easy to see the advantages? Why are farmers reluctant to grow these new crops? Amy looked at the potatoes in her hand as if she were looking at a rare treasure. Chapter 140 A Big Profit Alas! Not everyone can perceive their benefits like you. Miss Amy, it is normal for farmers to be suspicious because they have never planted it. So I can only demonstrate it myself. And the Lord or the consul they got seriously. They know nothing except fighting and collecting taxes. When mentioning lords and consuls, Dean had some disdain on his face. It was obvious that he was a man who was very conceited about his profession. But he was obviously a bit too upright. You are the Lord here. Can't you ask the farmers to plant more crops? Amy could tell that Dean's research on agricultural products had not been taken seriously. Otherwise potatoes and corn would be everywhere. But Amy also doesn't understand. Dean is the top manager of this village. So why doesn't he forcefully promote these high-yielding crops? This place of Bacchus is different. Miss Amy, I did not become a lord by fighting, but by building water conservancy projects in the south. Most of the people who own land in the empire are Bacchus, and they are all legionnaires. Descendants, they are not willing to obey a lord like me who has no military exploits. But my father doesn't understand me. He only wants me to get married and have children. Dean's face was filled with helplessness. A person who has the ability to improve crop varieties on his own is certainly not a fool. On the contrary, he is even a genius, but his character is too straightforward, and he is not a qualified bureaucrat, which makes him not very persuasive, and he has not yet learned to use other means to promote practice. Dean's private land was only 200 acres. For a lord, this was too little, probably only enough to maintain his relatively decent life. Even his servants did not dare to raise more. Fortunately, the state provides equipment, food and military pay for the troops. Otherwise, Dean wouldn't even be able to feed the soldiers. Of course, he is not very good at leading troops in war. In fact, the small lords of the Bacchus Empire are not rich, especially the newly ascended descendants of the Pander people. This is because Bacchus is different from other countries. The logic of enfeoffment in this country belongs to dispatched governance, and the territory is not the private property of the lord. Lords are just dispatched officials who will be mobilized according to the actual situation. They are completely different from fiefdoms in other countries. The land of Bacchus nominally belongs to the people. But since the people of this country only referred to the Bacchus nation 20 years ago, most of the land is still in their hands. Although Emperor Marius reforms gave the Panders equal status. Most Panders are still proletarians. This can't be helped. 20 years is too short. And there are not many new Panders in power. In fact, just by allowing the two ethnic groups to have equal status, Factional struggles have continued, and there are many high-ranking officials who do not agree with the reform. If Emperor Marius had dared to touch the land of the Bacchus, he would have been dismissed long ago, let alone promoting reforms. General Creon and Lord Dean are the descendants of the natives of the Pender continent, or in other words, they are the new Penderites who have ascended to power in the past 20 years. Creon is the sergeant major of the Knights of the Radiant Cross. He led the plague exterminators, and made great achievements in the fight against the snake cult before becoming a general. His family was not originally rich. Dean also benefited from the academy jointly established by Emperor Marius and the Knights of the Radiant Cross. After graduating from the Royal Academy, he would become an Imperial Guard Knight. And it had not been long since he became a lord. Therefore, the father and son are not actually rich. 
and they are very different from the descendants of the old Bacchus, like Kairos or Agathon. Dean's small amount of land is not as good as the common people of Bacchus. Fortunately, as a lord, he does not have to pay taxes, so he can concentrate on research all day long. In the Bacchus Empire, in order to give the lord no worries, the lord's private property was not taxed at all. But this preferential treatment is not very effective for descendants of Pender people like Dean. Bacchus senatorial nobles, like Kairos, own countless lands. Many of the landowning commoners will actively donate their land to the great lord and become their retainers or tenants. This way they can avoid taxes that fall on them. On the contrary, I can have more in my hands. This situation will of course lead to large-scale annexation. And land annexation has always been a big problem for the Bacchus Empire. Of course, this is also a world-class problem. The internal conflicts in every country are ultimately caused by land annexation. After all, food is the most important thing for people. And whether food is meat or vegetarian. In the final analysis, it comes from the land. But for descendants of the Pindor people like Creon and Dean, even if they become generals or lords, it is difficult for them to get this kind of land donation. Most of the Bacchus people can barely accept the nominal equality of the two peoples. But they are still unwilling to take the initiative to surrender. If you are a native of Pendor, you will be looked down upon by your fellow tribesmen. So not only is Dean not rich, his father Creon is also extremely poor. Even though Creon became a general, he still wore the uniform of the Plague Hunter. Imperial Youth Infantry Armor. All day long. In fact, it was mainly because the equipment of the Knights of the Poor Radiant Cross was now uniformly provided by the Empire. Just like several other Knights. Just like the Legion. It doesn't cost money. I don't have much land myself. And I can't issue mandatory orders to people who own land. As they will be rejected by the tribunes. So I've planted dozens of acres of various crops in order to be able to carry out the same conditions. The comparison below allows people to discover their benefits for themselves. At this point, Dean frowned and sighed. But it's still difficult. How could it be? I've only been here for a while. And I've already seen their huge benefits. With such a large output. Why can't they be promoted? Amy looked at these two kinds of food with bright eyes. Everything she had experienced with the Lord these days was all related to food. She could easily judge the huge value of these two things. The yield is obvious. Dot. The main difficulty is that they all taste a little bit problematic. Dean scratched his head and pointed to the potato with some green sprouts in Amy's hand. Fresh potatoes are actually very delicious. But potato seeds that have been stored in the cellar for more than half a year may not be eaten properly. It will be poisoned. Some time ago, a villager secretly ate one and was poisoned to death. Although he brought it upon himself, it has led to the fact that no one is willing to plant it now. Grain must be stored after all. If potatoes after storage will be poisonous if eaten, then it must not be promoted. But Amy thinks this can actually be solved by calculating the planting ratio. When fresh potatoes are harvested in the summer, we rely on potatoes from a small amount of land to satisfy our hunger. In autumn and winter, we rely on corn and wheat to store food. After all, the huge yield of potatoes can completely cover most problems. What about corn? Is corn poisonous too? There's nothing wrong with the corn. And it's easy to preserve. It's just that the dried corn has a hard SH. L. So it doesn't taste very good. I've been trying to improve the variety. But no matter what, it's at least edible. Dean is just an agricultural expert. Not a chef or gourmet. It is indeed not easy for him to solve these problems alone. Amy also noticed that Dean had no interest in men and women. General Creon would definitely not understand Dean if he was all about his research. It was normal for the estrangement between father and son to arise. Amy was thinking, if her teacher were here, what would he do? Will he kidnap Dean? It should be possible. You can do such a good job in Buck's Dean. But what if you were in a place like White Deer Castle or McShell? Autocratic and theft territories sometimes have many advantages compared to territories managed by a tripartite consensus between the military, government, and civilians such as Bacchus. Of course, this is when there is an excellent leader. Sir Dean, are you willing to sell some of these seeds to me? But I have to be frank. I am not a Bacchus. Amy is testing Dean's attitude. Of course, I can give you some. No matter where you are from, keeping people full is the ultimate will of Goddess Demaya. But I can't give you too much. I only planted so much. Dean readily agreed, seemingly happy that someone could recognize his research. Such people are the ones who are truly devout to the goddess Demaya. Build water conservancy projects to protect the land and bring good weather to the south. Improve and promote high-yielding crops in the hope 
that no one will ever go hungry again, regardless of nationality. His actions are the goddess Demaya herself. When most people only know how to pray and ask, such people seem extremely noble. Sir Dean, if dot I mean if, if there was a place where you could promote your research results without any scruples, would you be willing to try it? This could potentially benefit tens of thousands, millions of people. There will even be no more famine on the entire continent. Amy looked at Dean with admiration and followed the example of the Lord and started the recruitment mode. Without any scruples? Is there such a place? Dean's eyes widened. It was indeed difficult for him to promote these two crops in this place. Not only was it a problem with the crops themselves, but the conflict between the two ethnic groups was also one of the reasons. Those Bacchus who own land are not very willing to change. Those with vested interests must not want to make any changes. And the landowners will not go hungry. Please come with me, Lord Dean, and I will take you to see my teacher. He will definitely be able to give you such a place. Amy hugged the two potatoes and corn tightly in her arms, not caring that her armor and clothes were soiled by the mud. Dean looked at Amy and smiled. Your teacher must be a learned elder. And of course, I am willing to meet him. But you don't have to be like this. Miss, I can see that you really understand their meaning. I can send you a large car in a moment. Amy was not polite. Okay, then I'm not polite. I'll have the carriage come over and take the seeds away. Dean nodded straightforwardly. No problem. I also know that Menheim has been suffering from famine. It is a good thing to have Goddess Demaya bring blessings to anyone. Sarah thought for a while, whispered a few words to Amy, and then walked towards General Creon, who was waiting in the center of the village. General, we can indeed persuade Lord Dean to come out. Sarah bowed to Creon, which was the etiquette of aristocratic girls. Creon was stunned for a moment and bowed slightly. Sorry, I didn't realize you were a noble just now, Don. I'm sorry. Is he really willing to come out? I didn't express my identity first. I am a traveling poet. General, Lord Dean seems to be quite offended by you. If you force the arrangement again, it might scare him. I suggest you avoid it for a while. We try to let him go with my caravan to the southern coastal area where there are achievements he has established, so that he can relax a little. In this way, you can avoid the punishment of the law, and you can also try to make him change his attitude. At least it is much better than sending him to the mine to move rocks. Even if it doesn't work, at least the problem will be solved this year. General Creon sighed. You make sense? But is he really willing to travel with you? As soon as he finished speaking, he saw Dean sending Amy out and walking this way. The two seemed to be having a good chat. This. Creon smiled in surprise. But his smile soon turned into anxiety. Look at him like this. There is such a cute girl next to him. But he doesn't even look at her. Sarah smiled. Just take it step by step. At least he is out and willing to communicate with girls. This is true. Creon nodded and agreed to Sarah's suggestion. If you are traveling within Bacchus, that's no problem. I will send a few people to escort you. At this time, Dean, who was walking this way, saw Creon standing near the statue of the goddess. He stopped and frowned, as if he was unwilling to go any further. Creon sighed and shook his head, letting a few of the plague hunters follow Dean, and walked in the other direction of the village. Seeing that his father was gone, Dean moved towards the village entrance again. The Mettenheimers were already waiting at the village entrance with their motorcade. One of Li Ang's vehicles in the convoy was a van he had modified before setting off. It was specially used to carry people. It was pulled by two horses and could accommodate four people inside. The roof and cargo box at the rear were for come put your luggage. This is the common four-wheeled box carriage facing each other in modern times. Close was driving. And Sarah and Amy also came in this car before. This is for use when not showing up. The other vehicles are all trucks. Teacher, I think you should meet Lord Dean. Seeing Leon coming out of the carriage, Amy stepped forward happily, like a child showing off her achievements. Dean looked a little suspicious. This dot is this your teacher? Obviously, the Lord's young appearance is very unconvincing. He doesn't look like a learned elder at all. But Leon didn't pay attention to what he was saying at the moment. His eyes were fixed on the potatoes and corn that Amy took out. Amy Dot, where did you get these things? Amy reached out and handed it over, then pointed at Dean. The Lord held the two crops in his arms almost in a robbing manner, and his actions were exactly the same as Amy's before. Dean looked at Liang's violent reaction, and his expression changed from suspicion to joy. You seem to know these things? Leon looked at Dean with eager eyes. Of course I know. These things can change the world. Mr. Dean, I am Leon. I have to talk to you. 
Then he dragged Dean into the carriage with rough movements and an excited expression. Several of the plague exterminators, who were following behind thought Dean had been kidnapped and became anxious. As they gathered around, they heard two people chatting animatedly in the carriage. Dot what? I have to take you away. People like you should never be sent to move rocks into mines. After all, it is a legitimate law. I broke the law and I deserve to be punished. No, you just don't want to talk nonsense with idiots. And you don't want people who don't understand anything to interfere with your research. I can understand it. And I often think so. Huh? That's right. But I always don't know what to say. I'm not very good at expressing. Geniuses are like this. Yes. I'm talking about you. Dean. You are the person who can change the world. By the way. I know what's going on with the toxicity of potatoes. After they sprout. Several of the exterminators looked at each other. Did these two people hit it off so well? Amy smiled and shrugged. Gentlemen. Get in the car. We are about to set off. Then he and Sarah got into the car. The motorcade drove slowly towards the village, heading to Dean's house to collect seeds. Several people in the carriage were still chatting and laughing. The exterminators were relieved. They sent one person to report the situation to Creon, and several others followed the convoy. After unloading the cargo in the car and hauling away a large cart of seeds, the convoy left Imel Village. Dean's butler was so happy that he had the same cart. Leather products were much more valuable than food. The butler felt that Lord Dean had made a lot of money and made a fortune. The Lord Lord was also beaming with joy. He had really made a fortune. Amy is really a lucky girl to be able to pick up such a treasure halfway. Potatoes. Eating this single food alone is enough to supplement most of the human body's needs. And it is the highest level of high-yielding crops. Corn is one of the most adaptable grains and can be grown almost anywhere. If you can spread these two things, the Lord feels that the future is infinitely bright. With those few plague expellers traveling together, the rest of the journey became smoother. No one in the Bacchus Empire would block the convoy accompanied by the Radiant Cross plague expellers. Even bandits will avoid them unless they encounter snake worshippers. The Knights of the Shining Cross do have this reputation in the South. And this reputation is not earned by fighting, but by the doctors who have treated illnesses and saved lives over the past few hundred years. Although the plague hunters are not doctors, they are the troops that protect the doctors and fight against the snake cult. They are a real civilian army and are very respected by the people. The convoy traveled thousands of miles south, stopping at some small villages for supplies along the way. Dean and the exterminators were traveling with them. They encountered no trouble during the five or six days of the journey until they arrived near the village of Bailin. This is a village in the southern part of Pender Continent, and more than a hundred miles south is Dillon Port. It was getting late at this time and the team originally planned to rest for the night in Bailin village. But the village was full of wailing villagers, as if some disaster had occurred. Chapter 141 Bloody Natural Disaster Bailin village is surrounded by a canal at least 3 meters wide. This is an overflow canal used for irrigation, and the water inside is quite strong. The water canal surrounds the village like a moat. It seems that the amount of work is quite large. This is probably Dean's achievement a few years ago. There is a small wooden bridge at the entrance of the village, connecting to the road. A brazier was lit beside the wooden bridge, and several knights were walking back and forth at the entrance of the village, seemingly maintaining law and order. In the village, some people could be seen leaning against the village and sitting, seeming to be moaning softly. Occasionally, a few coughs can be heard coming from a distance. Seeing the motorcade approaching, the knight at the entrance of the village stopped the carriage. The lord opened the curtains in the carriage and took a look. They were members of the Knights of the Shining Cross. The cross emblem on their chests was very conspicuous. Several of the Radiant Knights all wore pointed helmets. The helmets had a protruding mask at the nose and mouth, which looked like a pointed beak, which looked very strange. The steel beak has some holes for ventilation, and the inner layer is filled with cotton fabric filter, which can tightly cover the mouth and nose. This is not only a helmet, but also a gas mask of this era. It should still have some protective capabilities. Dean and several of the exterminators got out of the car and stepped forward to greet them. What's going on? What happened here? Due to Creon's relationship, Dean was very familiar with the Knights of the Radiant Cross. And Ublin Village was where he had worked. He had built canals for irrigating fields here. So he was very concerned about the changes here. The Radiant Knight came closer with a torch and recognized the dispellers. Then he looked at Dean carefully and pulled down his mask. Are you? Lord Dean? Sir? Don't enter the village. There is a plague in the village. This shining knight seems to know Dean. 
After all, his father was the sergeant major of the Knights of the Shining Cross, and many knights knew him. Play? The exterminators exclaimed. Dean was still calm, but he frowned deeply. Knights, do you need our help? We do need manpower. But don't go in. This is the Red Death, and it's very serious. Hearing that it was the Red Death, the Lord also became nervous. This virulent infectious disease was the direct cause of the collapse of the ancient Pen Kingdom in a short period of time. It raged across the continent for seven years. In just seven years, the population of Pender dropped by half, especially in those prosperous big cities. Social production is basically at a standstill. The reason why it is called the Red Death and the Bloody Scourge is because the skin of people infected with the disease will gradually fester and fall off. And in the end, only blood-red muscles will be left. And the whole person will be like a red gore demon. Those who die of the disease will eventually look somewhat similar to the fallen. But by the time the Red Death reaches the skinless level of the fallen, they are essentially dead. This is one of the reasons why people in various countries will be extremely nervous once they discover the fallen. Many people believe that there is a certain connection between the two. The doctors of the Knights of the Shining Cross have always been pioneers in the fight against the Red Death. It was precisely because of the raging Red Death that they began to recruit plague exterminators from civilians in order to protect the doctors from practicing medicine. But what is interesting is that more than a hundred years ago, it was not the Knights of the Shining Cross who first achieved results against the Red Death. Instead, it was the thief Alfred and the Knights of the Lion who collaborated with him. After establishing the Kingdom of the Lion and maintaining a brief peace with other countries, presumably to protect the lives of the upper-class nobles, Alfred declared that the Red Death patients were heretics, and he ordered the death of all heretic apostles. Any village where the Red Death is found will be sealed off and no entry or exit will be allowed, and all things related to the infected people will be destroyed, as long as the patient is confirmed to be infected he will be directly treated as a heretic, killed and thrown into the fire, and many of them will be burned alive. Perhaps Alfred was just trying to protect himself and the nobles, but his approach inadvertently formed an actual isolation system, and it was a very effective forced isolation. At that time, Alfred was the first generation of the Lion King and a dictator. He had always killed anyone who disobeyed him, so his orders were carried out very well. Of course, a large number of innocent people were accidentally killed during this period, and some shameless people took advantage of this opportunity to massacre and loot. However, in any case, the Kingdom of the Lion did suppress the spread of the Red Death in a short period of time. Sometimes, a more ruthless person can solve the problem. At that time, except Alfred, no king would massacre the villagers in his country like this. This is not a secret, except for the Lion Kingdom. Every country has records of this incident. But this period of history is recorded as a stain on Alfred, just as he was nicknamed the thief by various countries. He was also considered a tyrant among the people. After all, his order to kill patients indiscriminately is indeed cruel. However, this cruelty actually saved most people. But the strange thing is that there is no record of the origin of the Red Death. As if it appeared on the continent overnight, and it was probably destroyed like the records of the six months before and after Alfred became king. After the Red Death in the Land of the Lion was resolved, other countries also began to use quarantine to solve the problem. And it was only seven years later that the entire continent was back on track. However, other countries did not take too harsh measures to enforce quarantine. And the implementation was not thorough enough. Many fish slipped through the net. So they were unable to completely eliminate this terrible plague. As a result, for more than a hundred years after that, the Red Death still appeared repeatedly. But it never reached the terrifying scale that cover the continent. The Lion Realm is now the place where the Red Death is least discovered. This is indeed due to the previous killings, and the cleanup was relatively thorough. The Lion Knight's helmets were also the first to change to a pointed helmet style. But it was not for epidemic prevention at the beginning, but to avoid stench. Because most of the people who carried out blockades and killings were members of the Knights of the Lion. They changed the traditional helmets into pointed beaks and filled them with cotton fabrics or sponges. This was mainly because infected people would emit a stench, especially when burned. The stench was overwhelming. However, later, knights discovered that wearing pointed helmets seemed to be less susceptible to infection. The lion knights had to face patients for a long time to perform tasks. But few contracted the Red Death. So many knights began to follow suit, especially the knights who originally belonged to the ancient Pen Kingdom. Basically all their helmets have pointed beaks. The knights of the Shining Cross were the earliest imitators. 
they have better medical knowledge and understand better than others that masks can filter the air and play a role in preventing the epidemic. Leon jumped off the carriage and stood next to Dean. Are you sure it's the Red Death? I'm sure. I saw a few bloody patients with my own eyes. This plague spreads quickly, and there is no way to treat it. We can only seal off this village. It is too close to Dialingang. If it spreads to big cities, the consequences could be disastrous. The Shining Knight sighed and shook his head. If that's the case, you'd better send people quickly to find more manpower. With just a few knights and plague hunters, I'm afraid they won't be able to seal off this village. Leon looked towards the entrance of the village, where only a few knights and seven or eight plague exterminators were guarding. The knight nodded to Leon and Dean. We have sent people everywhere to send messages, and someone will be here soon. I hope you can help me and stay at this intersection for a while until people from our knights come. Leon nodded without hesitation and shouted to his men. Come down. Let's block this intersection. Sir, you'd better not stay here. After hearing Liang's order, Close hesitated a little, but still led the team out of the train and formed a row. Although Close has not experienced the Red Death, he knows that any plague is extremely terrifying, and he does not want Leon to face this risk. We must help with this kind of thing. If a few infected people escape, it may endanger the entire continent. This is not a matter for a country or a nation, let alone a knight. This is everyone's matter, and we cannot let the village anyone run out. The Lord finished speaking to his men very seriously, then pulled down the curtains in the carriage, tore them into face cloths and distributed them to everyone, and asked them to fold them into two layers and tie them on their faces. This curtain is made of plush and linen, which may have some effect. A group of people followed Liang's example and covered their mouths and noses with cloth. Liang didn't know how the Red Death was spread, but since the pointed helmet can have a protective effect, this homemade mask should also be able to do so. Although it is impossible to have the filtering capabilities of modern masks, it is at least better than no protection at all. People of this era already know the role of breathing in air. They can understand that covering their mouth and nose when encountering the plague is only because of the bloody natural disaster more than a hundred years ago that people have such common sense. Thank you for your selfless help. Sir, may I have your surname? The knight saluted. A knight salute to Leon and Dean. Dean began to introduce. This is Mr. Leon. A kind nobleman. Well, someone actually said that Leon was kind again. But Leon shook his head directly. I am not a kind-hearted noble. I just want to ensure my own safety. If this place is not controlled, people infected with the disease may flow to my territory. The Radiant Knight frowned and thought for a while. Sir, Mr. Leon, I seem to have heard this name somewhere. But then he shook his head and stopped thinking about it. And put on the beak mask. You are right. Mr. Leon. This is for the safety of everyone. Such an idea itself is the greatest kindness. If everyone the nobles all think like you, the Red Death can be eradicated long ago. After he finished speaking angrily, he was about to turn around. But he looked at the carriage behind Leon and turned around again. Just as he was talking, there seemed to be a little commotion in the village. And sounds were heard from a distance. Don't abandon us. Please heal us. Please. That should be the voice of a middle-aged woman. Sorry. There's nothing we can do. Another deep voice came. The Radiant Knight sighed, said sorry, and hurried over with his people. As soon as he arrived at the entrance of the village, a group of people who looked like farmers ran out in a panic. The leader of the farmer shouted while running. They want to lock us in here. They don't want to heal people. They want to we die here. Several Shining Knights stopped them with their shields and pushed them towards the village. You can't leave here. Go back. Several plague exterminators also picked up their shields and short-handled hammers and rushed forward without saying a word. It seemed that they had seen the scene before, but their manpower was too small, and it was too difficult for a dozen people to completely block hundreds of villagers. The leading farmers struggled desperately to break out of their blockade. Is this the Knights of the Shining Cross? You guys just want to kill us. You don't want to treat us, and you still want us to die here. The guy danced and ran outside the village, shouting loudly as he ran. Then all the villagers became noisy and began to rush and besiege desperately. The members of the Radiant Knights tried their best to stop them and waved their hammers to intimidate, but no one took any serious action. The Lord frowned. That guy seemed to be inciting the villagers? He pointed at the guy and said to Amy next to the carriage, Shoot that guy! A bunch of sanctimonious liars! Bang! The leading farmer shouted as he rushed out of the village. When he was still about 20 meters away from the Lord, 
A loud noise made everyone shut up. Amy was right behind Leon. Her sword was stuck on the ground. And a musket had been set up on it. A large cloud of smoke almost completely obscured her figure. The sound of muskets was extremely loud at night. And the village entrance became silent for a while. The guy who had been instigating the farmer had a hole the size of an egg made in his chest by a lead bullet. And he had fallen on his back on the road. The muskets of this era have this effect. If they are not wearing armor, the lead bullet will deform after hitting the body directly and will form a frontal wound that is much larger than the caliber. As long as it hits the torso, most of them will be killed directly. And if the armor is penetrated, the lead bullet will shatter when it hits the armor. If the armor is penetrated, irregular shrapnel will be left in the body. If it hits after penetrating the armor, it may not be fatal on the spot because the speed of the bullet is slowed down. However, the wounds caused by this kind of irregular shrapnel are quite troublesome. According to the medical skills of this era, it will basically only increase the pain of the person, and it will still be difficult to save in the end. However, the leading farmer was obviously not wearing armor, and he had been killed with one shot. The Lord is obviously much more ruthless than the Shining Knights, regardless of whether this guy is deliberately inciting. His behavior does play an instigating role anyway. So the Lord directly asks Amy to kill him, so that the situation can be controlled in the fastest way. Amy fired the shot without any hesitation. The Lord made it so clear that he wanted to shoot the guy. Leon had never given her an order before, because she was not Liang's subordinate, but a disciple who was studying. Although the relationship is very good, she is not actually in the Lord's team list yet. But now that Leon has given Amy a murder order, Amy naturally understands that this person must be killed. She always had a round of ammunition loaded in the chamber. She just needed to light the match and aim and fire. This is the correct way to prepare a musket in this era. After all, it is a matchlock gun. As long as the ignition powder is not poured out and the matchlock is not ignited, it is impossible to misfire. The match rope would be lit just before the battle. And the ignition powder would be poured into the medicine pool just before the battle. But there would always be a round of already pressed ammunition in the gun chamber so that it could quickly enter the battle. In fact, this is the real reason why the muzzle is pointed upward when marching with a gun on your back. This habit started from the age of matchlocks. It is to prevent the compacted ammunition from loosening and falling out when walking. Amy waved her hand to fan away the smoke. Put down the butt of the gun and raise the barrel. Clean the chamber with a purge. Tested the temperature of the barrel. And began to reload. Everyone, go back. My temper is not as good as that of the Shining Knights. The Lord took a few steps forward. Walked to the corpse drew his sword and drew a line on the ground. As long as someone dares to cross this line, I will kill him without hesitation. The people of Mendenham also drew their swords, stood behind the Lord, and lined up behind the line. The corpses on the ground have proven that this is not a lie. The gleaming sword is also in front of them. There are more than ten tall and handsome men with linen scarves covering their faces. They look like a gang of gangsters. The image of the gangsters was obviously more intimidating and the villagers retreated to the village in fear. The Knights of the Shining Cross also held up their shields and slowly retreated outside the line, standing in the front row of the great swordsmen. The knights obviously agreed with Liang's approach of cutting through the mess quickly. In fact, if it hadn't been for the shot, their shield wall would have been broken through. You should act decisively. I thought you would be more experienced than me, the Lord Lord said to the leading glorious knight. It's useless for us to start. It will only cause greater conflicts. The deterrent power of short-handled hammers is not as good as muskets and swords. Thank you for your help. Mr. Leong, you took action very timely. This glorious knight was obviously a sensible person. He nodded towards Leong and raised the mace in his hand. Indeed, their maces were a threat to knight's plate armor, but civilians were not afraid of them. The loud sound and smoke of the musket, as well as the large and long blade, can intuitively scare ordinary people. Is there any other exit from this village? Leong nodded to express his understanding and began to think about how to completely seal off the village. There is an exit behind the mountain. The rest of the area is surrounded by canals. It is not easy for people to escape. We have left manpower there. The Radiant Knight pointed in another direction. Take your knights and patrol along the outskirts of the village. And load the crossbows of the plague hunters. If you encounter a situation like this, don't hesitate. Leong stared seriously into the eyes of the glorious knight. The glory knight nodded and rode away with several other knights. Lord Dean looked at the canal and small wooden bridge at the entrance of the village and said to Leong, 
I remember that there are more than 3,000 people living in this village. If it is completely blocked, they may. The Lord shook his head with a heavy face. There is no way. There is no cure for the Red Death so far. Blockade and isolation is the best way. We cannot let them spread everywhere. Dean sighed deeply and began to pray to the goddess Demaya. The appearance of the pointed helmet, also called the beak helmet, is indeed due to the Black Death in Europe. Chapter 142 First Meeting with Snake Worship Cult Not long after, there was some commotion again in the village, and many people seemed to be crying. A few faint cries such as, Don't abandon us! We are willing to pay! And, Please save him! can be heard. Not long after, several strange men wearing long beak masks and dressed in black retreated from the village. These men wore rounded leather hats, black leather coats, leather gloves on their hands, and carried short-handled canes and incense burners. Their beak-shaped masks are made of leather, and the beak-shaped pointed masks are half a foot long. This is the plague doctor of the Knights of the Shining Cross. But this outfit does not look like the Cross of Radiance. Instead, it looks like a messenger from the underworld. These doctors wearing beak masks will wear thick black robes to cover their entire body, including their neck and hair, without exposing any skin. Even the eyes are covered by glass lenses. Although glass can be mass-produced these days, it is still not cheap. This kind of beak mask with glass lenses is expensive to make. This outfit does have some occult meaning. Plague doctors believe that as long as the patient cannot see his face, it is equivalent to the evil disease attached to the patient not being able to see the doctor. So the disease will not be overly contagious. And they dress up as messengers from the underworld, thinking that this can scare away the diseases and drive them away. They carried incense burners because the bodies of patients infected with the red death would emit stench. And they believe that driving away the stench would drive away the disease. The cane is to reduce physical contact with patients. They will wear leather gloves and use the cane to touch the patient to avoid themselves from being infected. It can be said that this outfit actually plays some practical role. And it can be regarded as a protective suit of this era. It's just that in this era where viruses and microorganisms cannot be understood. Most of the things they can do in the face of the Red Death can only rely on mysticism. Stop! Don't come out yet! Leon stopped the medical officers. He saw that there seemed to be blood stains on the medical officers' canes. Is this Mr. Leon? Night Lore has told us that you are here. Thank you for your help. We are the doctors of the Knights of the Shining Cross, a doctor said in an angry voice. I know, but you should discard the canes that have come into contact with the sick. Also, if any of you have come into contact with the pus on the sick, please retreat to the village. The Lord Lord pointed to the sticks in their hands. Several doctors did not object to Liang's statement. They obediently threw away the canes in their hands, lowered their heads, and checked their bodies. Then, they each took out a bag of lime and sprinkled it everywhere on the ground and also sprinkled it all over their bodies. The corpse was quickly sprinkled with lime, and several black ghosts turned into white ghosts. Lime does have a certain preventive effect. It seems that these doctors still have common sense and do not just rely on mysticism. Sir, we know the seriousness and will not leave here. Please help us to see if there is any lime soaked on us. It is too dark here. The doctors, whose bodies were covered with lime, pointed to the brazier next to the Lord. Leon pulled out a torch and inspected several people carefully. He shook his head and said there was no problem. Doctor, how is the situation in the village? Dean was eager to know the specific situation. There are currently more than a dozen patients with symptoms. It is indeed the Red Death. But a few days ago was the festival of the goddess. There was a large-scale gathering. The number of infected people must be far more than this. At present, we can only seal this place and cannot let it go. Anyone comes in or out. The doctors did not take off their masks. They even consciously kept a distance of more than one meter from other people. They were indeed aware of epidemic prevention. I built a canal here five years ago, and the villagers cultivated a lot of fields. This village has become one of the richest villages in the empire in recent years. But I didn't expect it. Dean sighed and covered his face. Such is the world. Despair always comes together with hope. Where is the Lord here? Isn't he in the village? With the current medical conditions, if the Lord did not care, the villagers would have no choice but to wait to die from such an epidemic. At this time, local lords need to provide guidance, such as locking those who are confirmed to be infected into closed cellars, isolating those who have been exposed to houses in the village, not allowing people to gather again, and sending people to supply necessary food. 
wait until a week or two before releasing those who are confirmed to have no symptoms outside the village. This will save at least half of them. The Lord here is Decimus. But he probably ran away. A doctor said with a bit of contempt. Run away? So irresponsible? Although this is a hostile country. The Lord feels uncomfortable. This is exactly when the Lord needs to play his role. And he actually ran away? He sent someone to our station during the day to report the news. But he himself disappeared. He must be afraid of being infected. The doctor shook his head. The young nobleman of Bacchus. Sigh. This is not just the young nobles of Bacchus who are like this. But also the nobles of the Lion Kingdom. Such as Rainier. Does Governor Karos of Dillonport know about this? We have sent people over to inform us of the situation. It is estimated that a large force will take over before dawn. In any case, thank you for your enthusiastic assistance. Mr. Leong, it should be. Hey, Mr. Leong seems to be a fur trader. The Lord Lord nodded and looked back at the leather materials in several trucks. Great. We just need some leather to make more beak masks. You set a price, and our knights will pay the bill. The doctor bowed to the Lord. Since it's to control the plague, let's use these leather goods first. We'll talk about the dinars later. The Lord doesn't bother with this small amount of money. Anyway, he doesn't really want to sell for goods. The Lord who just got a cart of high-yielding grain seeds is very proud. No, we have to buy it at the market price. Mr. Leong, giving without asking for anything in return is not a good thing. Only good deeds that can be rewarded can continue. So we also have to charge money to treat people. These cars of leather materials probably cost how many dinars? The doctor shook his head and spoke philosophically. Leong raised his eyebrows and smiled and glanced at the Knights of the Radiant Cross. I didn't say it was for you. You can use the leather first and then we can discuss the money later. His Majesty the Emperor pays the bill. Maybe I can earn more. The Lord actually has no intention of making money from the leather but he also doesn't plan to sell it at a high price at this time. He can make war fortune but not disaster fortune. But donating without asking for anything in return is not a good thing. He really would not give goods to the Knights of the Shining Cross for free. He had also advised Sir Roland this way before. He just didn't expect that the healers of the Knights of the Radiant Cross would understand so well. Large amounts of gifts may seem kind, but in fact they are not a good thing for others or yourself. Of course, this refers to a large amount, which will cause you to suffer a large loss and is completely beyond the reach of ordinary people because this will create a kind of moral kidnapping comparison. For example, if so-and-so donates 10,000 yuan, then other people will think that if I only donate 50, it seems that I can't afford it, and I might even be laughed at, then simply don't donate to avoid trouble. After all, if the standards are raised too high, then most people will feel that they don't have the ability, so they won't be embarrassed. But when others are selflessly donating, if you sell things at a low price, even if you only sell them at cost price, you will be criticized by others, such as taking advantage of money. Then don't even sell supplies to the disaster areas, lest you be slandered. As a result, the donated funds could not buy supplies in time. Yes, that's the reality. It's not that people are unwilling to do good, but most of the time, they can't bear the consequences of doing good. And if there are continuous disasters, and last year you donated 10,000, but this year you only donated 5,000 or even no donation. Usually some bullies will come out to kidnap you morally, saying that you have become inhumane and inconsistent. But these dogs never mention the fact that he himself did nothing but made sarcastic remarks. As a result, people who do good deeds suffer financial losses and have a bad reputation. This completely changes the taste of good deeds. If you do good deeds and help others, you will be regarded as a fool. Moreover, even if you suffer losses, you often cannot solve the problem. Many times, you donate a large amount of money, but the money cannot be exchanged for necessities in time. Instead, it is exchanged for some people's luxury cars and mansions. This has been true since ancient times. Therefore, the Lord will not donate easily, and he does not encourage donations, but he encourages small profits or normal material transactions, and also encourages helping in whatever way you can. If in the event of a disaster, a large amount of urgently needed materials are promptly supplied to the most scarce areas, and the goods are duly rewarded. This seemingly transactional approach will have better results. After all, money alone cannot keep people alive, but supplies can. The most reliable way to quickly deliver supplies to the places where they are most lacking is to collect money and even make money. If you want to show kindness, 
just sell things at a cheaper price. If you encounter someone who can't afford the money, you can just ask them to give you money on credit first. As long as you don't take advantage of the opportunity to make a fortune at a shady price. Then bringing supplies and receiving due rewards is the most kind kindness worth encouraging. Because this allows everyone to follow without any pressure. It can quickly bring more scarce supplies in a short period of time. And it makes it easier to solve problems. As for ordinary direct actions such as providing help, you can do it without asking for anything in return. For example, the Lord decided to help guard the entrance of the village. Because as a dedicated volunteer, you can get equal peace of mind and peace of mind. This is spiritual satisfaction and a precious reward. The leather for several large carts can be worth several thousand dinars, which is not a small amount of money for anyone. The Lord purchased the leather with his own money. So what the Lord means is that if you need it urgently, use it first. And there is no need to negotiate the price. After solving the problem, let Emperor Marius settle the settlement according to the situation. That's fine. Emperor Marius represented the country. And the Lord could also use this to see the overall mentality of the country. The doctor also nodded in agreement with the Lord's statement. You are right. His Majesty the Emperor will give you a good price. It seems that the people of the Knights of the Shining Cross have great confidence in Emperor Marius. His. Emperor? His. At this moment, a voice came from the road outside the village behind him. Who? Sir? Be careful. The voices of Sarah and Lisa Dillon sounded one after another. Then several crossbow bolts flew over from the side and behind, passing through with a sound of breaking through the air. They all seemed to be heading straight for Leong and the doctor. Leong faced the village and he couldn't see the crossbow arrows coming from behind. But the Lord reacted quite quickly. As soon as he heard the older elf's warning, he threw down the healer in front of him and rolled on the spot, avoiding most attacks. There were a dozen crossbow arrows. Most of them missed. But one of them still hit his shoulder. It was only blocked by the shoulder armor and failed to penetrate. It cut the shoulder diagonally and pulled out a wound. This is a heavy crossbow. The Lord made a judgment based on the strength of the crossbow arrow. Blood suddenly filled the air. They are people from the snake cult. More than twenty people. Rasatalan's voice sounded outside again. And at the same time, there was a scream. It should be that the Nolder elves hiding in the dark shot an enemy with a bow and arrow. Snake cult? Frederick picked up the dual sword and rushed out. Several great swordsmen also dispersed and rushed in the direction of the crossbow. Close, however, stood in front of Liang and protected the lord, who had suffered some flesh wounds. Behind him, he has not forgotten his responsibilities. He is now not the stormtrooper captain, but the guard captain. Get behind the carriage. Several carriages were lined up at the entrance of the village, which could be used to avoid the enemy's long-range weapons. The Lord asked several doctors to hide first, and then he climbed onto the carriages and took a look outside. Frederick and several great swordsmen were already fighting with a group of guys wearing green robes. There seemed to be several corpses lying down in the distance each with a shining silver arrow stuck in their bodies. They should have been shot to death by Lisa Dillon. The doctor came over, looked at the Lord's shoulder, took out some bottles and jars from his body, and began to bandage them quickly, with extremely skillful movements. After all, these are professional field doctors. Although their part-time job of treating plague is not very good, their main business is obviously very strong. Sir Leong, do you want to get in the car and leave here? The people of the snake cult are difficult to deal with. I didn't expect them to show up here. The doctor kindly wanted the Lord, an innocent and kind man, to leave. How dare you sneak up on me? If I don't kill them, how can I sleep? Come on, brothers. The Lord gritted his teeth and looked at the battle situation outside. He said this because he had come to the conclusion that he could fight. If the enemy is difficult to fight, Leon will definitely run away. But there are only a dozen snake cult warriors outside and they should be able to deal with them. In just two words, the doctor had basically stopped the bleeding on Liang's shoulder and tied it up. His technique is faster than Anson's. Leon picked up his sword and rushed out with clothes. The equipment of these snake cult warriors is better than that of the elite troops of the regular army. Their troops and equipment are extremely uniform and seem to be uniformly provided within the sect just like the Bacchus Empire. Each snake cult warrior holds a heavy crossbow, and their weapons are giant moon blade axes, all of which are expensive weapons with huge lethality. The chainmail robes they wear are also of good quality. But in fact, their combat level is not high. Basically, they are only slightly better than the new recruits. This technical level is completely inadequate for the equipment they carry. 
All I can say is that the snake cult is really rich. Junior soldiers can wear the equipment of top soldiers. The Lord swung his sword and chopped down a snake cult warrior, feeling envious, jealous, and hateful thoughts in his heart. Have the snake worshippers and Bacchus become so wealthy? Since his shoulder was injured, the Lord did not rush too fiercely. After killing two enemies and confirming that the enemy's combat power was indeed weak, he stopped and began to direct his men to encircle and encircle them. But Frederick was rampaging through the enemy ranks with such ferocity that he didn't look like an old man at all. The skill of this old swordsman is no worse than that of the injured lord. Now that he has put on the Medenheim plate armor given to him by clothes, his combat effectiveness has been greatly improved. His dueling swords are flying up and down, and his attacks are extremely fierce. Almost every beheading was done by cutting off the heads of the snake cult warriors, leaving not a single corpse under his command. Of course he would be so cruel. As soon as he arrived in Pendor, he was annihilated by the snake cult, and the hatred in his heart was not comparable to that of the Lord. With such a thug around, the Lord simply returned to the carriage to watch the show. The tough men of Medenheim were more than capable of dealing with these low-level snake cult warriors. Coupled with a cold arrow shot by Lisa Dillon from time to time, the enemy was soon wiped out. The Lord just stood up from behind the carriage and was about to call the brothers to clean the battlefield. But he heard Risa Dillon shout again. Sir! Be careful! Leon quickly retracted his head. Boom! The moment the Lord shrank his head, a javelin was past his face and plunged into the carriage compartment. Leon had already seen the enemy throwing the javelin in the distance. He wore strange green-gray armor and rode a crimson army horse. His appearance was completely different from that of the snake cult warriors. The enemy was standing far away before, and no one could see him in the dark night. He was only discovered by the Nolder elves when he just took action to throw the spear. That's Cobra, the leader of the serpent cult warriors. The doctor squatting beside the carriage whispered. Close, Lisa Dillon, capture them alive. That's a Cobra warrior. Rasadalin shot an arrow, which easily penetrated the thigh of the Cobra warrior and also shot down the horse. The enemy was pinned down by the war horse and could not get up. Like the two dozen snake cult warriors, this guy's skills are not that good, and I don't know how he can throw such an accurate spear. However, although his own ability is weak, he is making money. This mediocre cobra's equipment and horses are completely comparable to those of the most powerful lords and knights in the entire continent. Plate armor with cobra texture. A giant cobra-like helmet. A giant moonblade axe and a crimson horse covered in a full set of inlaid armor. This equipment bears the obvious mark of the snake cult. But the quality of the equipment itself is enough to make ordinary knights drool. And it is better than the equipment of many generals. It can only be said that the snake worshippers are indeed rich. Which is probably an important reason why they can attract people to join the sect. Chapter 143 You Are the Kidnapper Close had already rushed over quickly, intending to catch the prisoner. While well, Emperor Mala went to die, AZ to hawk a long live. But just before Close rushed to the side of the Cobra Warrior, the guy pulled out a knife, shouted and then stabbed his jaw resolutely. Blood spurted out. Close hurried over and then shook his head. He is dead. Another religious fanatic who is not afraid of death. What the Lord hates most is this kind of fanatical believer. The entrance to the village quickly calmed down again. Many villagers were alarmed by the fighting. But they did not take the opportunity to run out. They just poked their heads in the village and watched from a distance. These villagers did not dare to face the killing battlefield with real swords and guns without anyone inciting them. The brief sneak attack had no other consequences except for minor injuries to the Lord Lord and the two Menenheimers. But the appearance of the snake worshippers cast a shadow on everyone's minds. The Red Death must have something to do with the snake cult, Leon frowned and said. This is evident when a plague breaks out in the village and a team from the snake cult arrives to attack the team responsible for the quarantine thinking again about the instigator who was shot before. One can easily imagine that the purpose of this attack was to spread the plague to the snake worship cult. If this plague was deliberately spread by the snake cult, it would be terrible. Our grand leader, Sir Morai, thinks so too. We are often attacked by snake cult followers, a doctor answered. But the troops of the snake cult appeared so close to the emperor's port. Isn't this a bit too rampant? The emperor's port is not an ordinary port for Bacchus. Isn't the Empire encircling and suppressing the snake cult? It was Amy who spoke. Port Royal is the place where the conqueror General OSA landed in Pender. Although General OSA did not make Port Royal the capital in the end, the city has a high symbolic and practical status and is the economic center of the Empire, not inferior to the capital CUN city. Perhaps this shouldn't be said. 
but our knight order does suspect that some nobles in Dillonport have been infiltrated by the snake cult, such as some people from the Shadow Legion. But we have no evidence. The doctor shook his head, feeling a little uneasy. After experiencing a brief sneak attack together, the doctor seemed to regard Liang and his group as their own, and they spoke much more directly. While talking, the doctors once again began to demonstrate their miraculous speed in treating trauma. The two injured swordsmen completed bandaging within two minutes. This technique is really skillful. How much does such treatment cost? Frederick looked on and asked an inappropriate question. Huh? We never charge money for battlefield treatment. Several doctors could tell that this was making fun of them and shook their heads and explained. We usually charge money to treat people and we charge very high prices for wealthy businessmen and nobles. The reason is simple. We don't charge money. All minor problems will come to us and our limited manpower will result in being unable to treat emergency patients. And we always have to charge for medicine. Otherwise, we will not be able to continue. This is the same as doing good deeds. Frederick nodded and bowed to express his understanding and apology. A doctor stood up and spread his hands. You must have never seen it. I met an aristocratic woman who only had a small cut on her finger with a fruit knife. She sent someone to cry and asked us to fly. I traveled more than a hundred miles for treatment. But when I arrived, the wound had basically healed on its own. So I applied some salt water to her and charged her 200 dinars. A group of people burst into laughter. And the gloom brought about by the snake cult believer's raid was also diluted by laughter. So this is the rumored reason why you don't treat civilians. I once thought that the cross of radiance was no longer pure. The Lord Lord bowed to several medical officers. We are used to this kind of statement. The first person to spread this rumor was probably the Shadow Legion. Because we charge high prices for treatment and they are very rich. The snake worshippers have also been slandering us. The reason you have seen before that when it comes to situations like the Red Death, we really have no way to treat it and can only isolate it. So some civilians don't understand it. Several doctors turned to look at the village. Although they spoke openly, there was still some helplessness in their words. The Lord also frowned. There seemed to be a big conflict between the Knights of the Radiant Cross and the Shadow Legion. This place is only more than a hundred miles away from Dillon. And the Shadow Legion is stationed at Dillon Port. The Shadow Legion is the strongest legion in the Bacchus Empire. And the commander of the Shadow Legion is Governor Kairos. The Knights of the Shining Cross have already reported to D. Lindgang because of the plague here. If nothing else happens, they should see Kairos soon. The Shadow Army is slandering you? Is Governor Kairos colluding with the Snake Cult? The Lord simply asked directly. He actually deliberately brought the topic to Kairos so that he could learn more about the situation. This is impossible. Lord Kairos is not such a person. The doctors and Lord Dean spoke almost at the same time. Surprisingly defending Kairos in unison. Your Excellency Leon. Although our knights and the Shadow Legion have conflicts. We also feel that someone within the Shadow Legion may have been deceived by the snake cult. But to be honest. Governor Kairos is indeed a respected consul. And it is impossible for him to join those who worship the snake cult. The doctors of the Knights of the Radiant Cross are actually all protecting Kairos reputation. This reaction is a bit unexpected. The discord between the Knights of the Radiant Cross and the Shadow Legion is basically open to the public. It is not a secret at all. Even Liang, who is in the Lion Realm, knows about it. In fact, even if you don't know, it is easy to think that the Knights of the Shining Cross are mainly descendants of the Pender Aboriginal people, while the members of the Shadow Legion are all descendants of the Old Bacchus people. The reforms of Emperor Marius will definitely further intensify the conflicts between them. The Shadow Legion are all conservatives. The reform does meet the expectations of most civilians. But it is not in the interests of the Shadow Legion. Because the Shadow Legion is a representative of vested interests. The Shadow Legion was the main legion that followed General OSA in his expedition to Pendor. And the current members of the Shadow Legion are all descendants of those warriors. They were originally senior citizens. And all the Shadow Centurions among them were members of the ruling class. And most of them were former tribunes. They were born to be superior to others, and their descendants would have inherited this status. However, Emperor Marius's reforms made them now only nominally equal to the status of slave soldiers under his previous rule. The Ponde people were once regarded as serfs by them, but now Emperor Marius formed various civilian legions. In terms of status, they become equal to these serfs. The improvement of the status of the low-level Pander civilians is equivalent to the reduction of their status. Most people will have an unbalanced mentality when faced with this situation. At the same time, 
Emperor Marius vigorously promoted belief in the goddess Demaya, while most people in the Shadow Legion originally believed in Mars, the god of war, which was the mainstream belief in the old Bacchus Empire. Contradictions in beliefs are not just a matter of mental imbalance. Although Emperor Marius did not ask them to convert, the estrangement was already obvious. In addition to mentality and belief, there is also a more direct conflicting interest. Before the reform, the empire did not have that many legions, and it did not implement the separation of soldiers and peasants. The Shadow Legion was the main force of the entire country. Shadow centurions are true centurions in battle, leading dozens or hundreds of levied peasant soldiers. The Shadow Infantry is actually the Marine Corps when the fleet landed in Pender. It has its own independent organization and is a superior fleet soldier. But now, the Empire has many legions. And the separation of soldiers and peasants has been implemented again. The Shadow Centurions can no longer lead the peasants to fight. Now these original Centurions have almost become big soldiers. For the country, the separation of soldiers and peasants and the reorganization of civilian legions improved the overall eliteness of the army. But for the members of the Shadow Legion, it directly deprived them of their actual rights. At the same time, when there were no wars in the past, they would have often been elected as tribunes or held other civil offices. At that time, only a small number of Bacchus had the right to vote, and centurions were almost certain to be elected. Before Emperor Marius came to the throne, a centurion's territory often had thousands of serfs, which was essentially equivalent to a small lord. But now, after the separation of soldiers and peasants, legionnaires cannot serve as civil officials. And even if they retire and return home after serving for 16 years, it will be difficult to win elections. The Ponde people who were originally serfs now have the same civilian status and have the right to vote. After all, the Panders are the majority. And they often elect Panders, who are in the same proletarian class as themselves as tribunes. Besides, the current tribune is not the same as before. He is just a civil representative. This position that once represented noble status is now just an ordinary director of the subdistrict office. It is conceivable that in the face of the reform, the members of the Shadow Legion have indeed suffered losses in many ways, and their mentality can be imagined. Therefore, the Shadow Legion refused to accept reforms, remained loyal to tradition, and had conflicts with all legions of the Bacchus Empire. This powerful force gathered around the high-ranking governor Kairos. They only obeyed the command of the Legion commander Kairos, and were unwilling to obey the deployment of Emperor Marius. Conflict of interest? There's nothing you can do about it. The biggest conflict with them is the Knights of the Radiant Cross and the Legion of the Immortals. These are two legions that completely ignore nationality and identity. And they are the legions that support Marius' reforms the most. The conflict between them is easy to understand. But according to Dean's doctors, Governor Kairos, the leader of the Shadow Legion, is actually a reliable consul. As the leader of the Legion, Kairos would naturally maintain the status of the Shadow Legion. For this reason, he did not support the reform and had some unpleasantness with Emperor Marius. But he never abandons public service for personal reasons, and never hesitates when he is needed to fight for the country. When any other lord or legion is in danger, he will immediately rescue any other lord or legion, including the Knights of the Shining Cross, who are least able to deal with the Shadow Legion, and the Legion of the Immortals. They fight within themselves, but they still fight together when encountering foreign enemies. They are very principled. In the process of dealing with the snake cult, our knights have received timely assistance several times led by Kairos himself. So in any case, he is not the kind of person who would collude with the snake cult. Several doctors of the Knights of Radiance still agree with Kairos. Although they are both conservatives who oppose reform, Governor Kairos and Governor Levius are completely different. Although he does not support His Majesty the Emperor's reforms, he never causes trouble to His Majesty and has always safeguarded national interests. The Water Conservancy project I presided over in the South a few years ago was also completed with his support. Dean also seemed to respect Governor Kairos and compared him to Levius. Levius is the commander of the Shadow Infantry of the Shadow Legion, also the leader of the Marine Corps. Governor Levius? Forget it. When Dean mentioned Levius, all the doctors began to shake their heads in unison. Don't mention him. Did Levius do anything bad? Why do you all look like this? What appeared in front of the Lord's eyes was the image of the bald man caught between two swords. He did not expect that the governor was so unpopular. Let's put it this way. The indictments accusing him of committing crimes every year can fill a room. Except for treason. Dean curled his lips and explained. This. Doesn't Emperor Marius know? 
Liang didn't expect that skinny bald man to have this ability. He made big mistakes and kept making small mistakes. And he was probably a Grand Slam winner with small mistakes. Your Majesty must know. As far as I know, even Governor Karos once reported to Your Majesty that Liliu's raped civilian girls and expropriated them violently. But the Liliu's family is very powerful, as long as it is not a collaboration with the enemy and rebellion. His Majesty probably won't punish him for such a serious crime. Dean shook his head and mentioned Liliu's without even mentioning his title. It seems that these governors are very interesting. Where is Justice? What kind of person is he? The Lord became interested. Governor Justice is His Majesty the Emperor's think tank and the first person to propose. Replacing faith with faith. A group of people gathered together and chatted for several hours. And the topic naturally revolved around the three governors of the empire. And one of the protagonists they talked about, Governor Kairos, appeared at the entrance of the village with his troops just after sunrise in the early morning. He led an elite cavalry force of more than 200 men, all covered in black armor. And their military appearance was very neat. This group of shadow centurions can be said to be the neatest and most silent troop the Lord has ever seen so far. They all look like they have been through many battles. Black Crows, you can leave. My people will take over here. Karos was talking to several doctors. His voice was very indifferent. And his tone was quite rude. But he didn't seem to be malicious. Those healers do look like Black Crows. Which is probably Karos's derogatory name for the healers of the Knights of Radiance. Several doctors bowed and nodded. They did not refute being called a black crow, but stepped forward to report the situation. Afterwards, they expressed their gratitude to Leong and planned to leave with Leong. But the Lord came to Kairos, caressed his chest, saluted, and asked, Sir Governor, can I talk to you? Kairos looked at the corpses of the snake worshippers lined up in a row on the ground, then looked at Leon and the Mendenheimers, then turned over and dismounted. Your Excellency seems to have helped a lot. Thank you for your help. What is your name? Karos was very arrogant towards the Knights of the Shining Cross. But he had no arrogance towards other nobles. I am Leon Griffin. Lord of Ayrshire in the Land of the Lion. You may have heard of my name. The Lord did not hide his identity. And he had no grudge against Karos. Since Dean and the doctors all say that this is a disease worthy of respect. It is worth mentioning. Leon. Are you the kidnapper? Karos raised his eyebrows. It seemed that he had heard of Liang's name but it probably wasn't a good one. The governor actually knows my name. It seems that my reputation is not very good, but it was forced by the war between the two countries, and I believe the governor can understand. We are now dealing with the snake cult together. Don't be so excited. The lord spread his hand and pointed at the body of the snake cultist on the ground. His Excellency Li Ang's name is so familiar that even His Majesty the Emperor probably remembers it. General Agathon has told us about your heroic deeds. Kidnapping two consuls single-handedly is admirable for his courage and ability. So I dare not too close to you. Tell me, what do you want from me? Caro said he didn't dare to get too close, but instead took a step forward. It seemed that he was not worried about the notoriety of the kidnapper at all. His troops didn't move at all. On the contrary, several doctors from the Knights of the Radiant Cross behind Leon looked at each other. I'm here to make a deal with you. You will definitely be interested. But this can wait until you have arranged the defense here. I will wait for you in the carriage outside. Leon led the great swordsman to get out of the way of the village and stood on the roadside outside the village and motioned to the doctors to take away the carts of leather materials, indicating that he was waiting for Kairos here. Several doctors muttered and drove away in the truck, leaving only a truck filled with grain seeds and the box carriage without curtains. Kairos narrowed his eyes at the sensible Leon, turned around and ordered his men to take precautions everywhere and arranged for people to start patrolling. After everything was arranged, he came over with dozens of guards. What kind of business do you want to do with me? Mr. Leong? Lord Governor, we can sit on the carriage and talk about how your troops are here, and they can see us. Don't worry. I don't mean any harm. The Lord directly took off all the weapons on his body and handed them to clothes. He spread his hands and rolled up his sleeves to show that he had nothing to hide. Kairos shook his head smiled slightly, and walked directly to the carriage. Your carriage is not bad, Mr. Leon. In fact, even if you are armed, you may not be my opponent. I am not as vulnerable as Justice. Hit. It seems that the governor is probably very skilled and has no fear. A legion commander who can lead a traditional strong army like the Shadow Centurion must have good martial arts skills. 
but the Lord had no intention of taking action. He really came to discuss business. The two sat across from each other in the carriage. Caro's tone was still indifferent. I'm actually not interested in this kind of business that requires avoiding people. But I am very interested in you. Young man. Your miraculous performance at White Deer Castle made me suffer the shame of failure. And now you dare to reveal your identity in front of me openly. Your Excellency. Leon. I am amazed by your courage. To be honest. If it weren't for the fact that you were helping control the plague and killing these snake worshippers. You would be riding in a prison car now. Chapter 144 Creating Demand for Kairos It seems that there are indeed benefits to doing good deeds and accumulating virtue. Kairos led the elite troops, but did not take action to control Leon. Probably, as he said, it was entirely because of Leon's selfless behavior in helping to control the Red Death. Of course, it was precisely because he understood that Kairos was a principled person that Leon dared to go up and strike up a conversation. The Lord has been inquiring about the personalities and relationships of the senior officials of the Bacchus Empire all the way, just to determine how to deal with Kairos. In fact, before he didn't know much about Kairos, that is, before this night, he originally wanted to enter Emperor Lingang alone and was captured or controlled on his own initiative. Yes, this is the most efficient way to conduct a strange visit. You can send someone to your doorstep as a messenger and be actively controlled by someone. Anyway, with Li Ang's current status, he will definitely not be killed or even suffer any pain. And as long as there is a chance to speak, the Lord will have the confidence to escape and scathe, or at most spend some money. Buying food costs money anyway. Although they are in a hostile country, this is actually much easier than the previous desperate kidnapping. No high-ranking noble will kill a noble who planted three flags on the motorcade when there is no war, or even treat him rudely, unless there is a grudge. Kairos has no grudge against him. And now, Leon has the opportunity to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with Kairos, which is indeed helping to isolate the Red Death. The governor is joking. I didn't let you fail. I was just trying to protect my territory. In fact, I should be considered as helping you. Leon had the same smile on his face when he first met Count Odin. Such a great attitude. Your Excellency Leon, you kidnapped two governors in White Deer Castle, which caused the Empire to lose its troops but not be able to advance as the marshal of the last war. This was a huge failure for me. You actually said you helped me? What did you help me with? Kairos almost laughed angrily, leaned back, and stared into Leon's eyes. The Lord was very satisfied with the governor's reaction. He successfully aroused Kairos's interest in talking. He and his apprentices also said that how to make people listen carefully to what you say is more important than the content of the negotiation itself. Lord Governor, you may wish to think carefully about the fact that there are only three governors in the empire. The two governors lead you and justice led an army of 6,000. Facing the White Deer Castle guarded by a girl with 500 old and weak soldiers. Not only if the siege fails, the troops will be lost and the generals will be lost. Only you, Lord Kairos, led thousands of cavalry troops deep into the heart of the Lion Kingdom. Easily defeated the world-famous General Count Odin and escaped and scathed. There is no comparison in this world with a smile on his face. Leon clapped his fingers to help Kairos settle the accounts, with a hint of admiration in his tone. Kairos was stunned for half a minute, and then he really smiled. Your Excellency Leon is so eloquent. After hearing what you said, it seems that I have made a great contribution, but you should know that I didn't defeat Count Odin. I didn't even break through his defense. He died in the hands of your traitors from the Lion Realm. As a marshal, I ordered the division of troops to attack. But in the end, we failed without gaining any ground. Could this be considered meritorious service in the fierce lion realm? Kairos' tone was a little sarcastic. But his eyes and expression were obviously sharp. Mr. Governor, let's imagine a different outcome. If Governor Levius leads the army to capture Whiteheart Castle, he will definitely be able to capture my little Mei Fengxiang. He may also be able to capture Fort Brave Shield, which has lost Earl Odin. And it is even possible to capture the Long River. Town! This is a marvelous feat of spreading a thousand miles. And there is a great chance of obtaining the horse breeding land of the Lion Kingdom. If I guess correctly, this is the result you originally expected when you launched the war. Right. But if that's the case, Levius led the infantry corps to defeat this. And you were not present at all. In comparison, your record will be like advancing with only cavalry and underestimating the enemy. Unable to attack the city and returning without any success. 
he also ordered a traitor to kill Count Odin, whom everyone respected, so that everyone in the Lion Realm shared the same hatred and resolutely resisted. This is contrary to His Majesty the Emperor Marius's political policy of integrating into Ponde. It can be said to be short-sighted and useless. You see, everything in this world is afraid of comparison. If you get the victory, you expect it. You might lose your position as marshal because of it. Right? If this is the result, then Levius, who has done extraordinary things, will definitely replace you as marshal. Let a man like him be a marshal, either to the empire or to you, or to your troops. Are there any benefits? Lord Kairos, tell me, did I help you? The Lord once again helped Kairos settle accounts with his fingers. This time he did not smile again, but had a serious look on his face. With some emotion, Kairos really listened to it now. He probably had some realization. His brows furrowed and he sighed deeply. Then there was silence for several minutes. The Lord did not disturb him, but looked into Kairos's eyes quietly, instructing the traitor to kill Odin without authorization. This sentence? Leon actually said it completely sincerely. In a sense, Kairos was also an accomplice in Odin's death. But Leon will not have any hatred because of this. Public is public and private is private. It is Kairos's responsibility to deal with the enemy's army in battle. Leon can still understand this. However, Odin's death does not do any good to Kairos and the Bacchus Empire. It will cause the nobles of the Lion Realm to resolutely deal with the Bacchus Empire. This is a fact. The Lord wants to use this to criticize his short-sightedness. Which is also true. The reason why both sides have withdrawn their troops for so long without signing an armistice agreement is because of Odin's death. Well, I probably should thank you, Dot, but what happened has already happened. And there's no point in discussing it. You'd better just tell me why you're here. Kairos finally spoke. But he did not mention victory or defeat. But looked at Leon meaningfully. As if he was hesitating. I came with good intentions. And as you can see, I don't want to be an enemy of the Empire. I intend to help you again. Of course. Mainly for myself and my friends. The Lord pointed to the row of corpses of snake worshippers at the entrance of the village and said that he was a good man who was eager to help. So don't mess around. Kairos also turned his head and looked, then shook his head and smiled. Eh, help me again? Who do you want to kidnap again? Don't always think of me as a kidnapper. Sir, the Lord was very aggrieved. Lord Kairos, I know that your relationship with Emperor Marius is quite tense. You will probably bear a lot of responsibility after the defeat of the war. It is estimated that the two governors will also work together to oppose you. I have no other choice. I just want to tell you that I can help you solve these troubles. Kairos' smile became a little stiff, and he narrowed his eyes and stared at Leon. You know a lot. Humph. Tell me how to solve this problem. The Lord took out two crumpled pieces of parchment from his body, spread them out, and handed them over. I have two IOUs here. You might as well take a look. You should be able to understand what they mean. The parchment was placed on the small table between the two of them, and Leon thoughtfully stretched out his hand to press it smoothing the parchment so that Kairos could identify the authenticity. It was an IOU written by the two governors, Justice and Levius, for 6,000 dinars each. The two governors were released without compensation, and Leon did not ask for ransom. The two governors' IOUs were voluntarily written in connection with the purchase of the carriage, but have not yet been paid. The Lord once told Amy that demand must be created so that people will be willing to pay, and these two IOUs can now also create another demand for Kairos. The Bacchus Empire should have gone smoothly in the White Hart Castle Theater on the Eastern Front. After all, Baron Godric, who was good at defending, was not here. With a force of ten to one, the Empire could logically at least capture White Hart Castle. But they lost their troops and generals inexplicably. And two governors were captured. This directly caused Governor Kairos to fail to achieve even the minimum goal in this battle. Kairos was probably trying to chew up the two governors' justice and Levius. The White Deer Fort was about to be captured. But the enemy single-handedly sneaked into the camp and kidnapped these two guys. Okay, maybe the enemy is too powerful and has master-level kidnapping skills. But so what? Inability. In the eyes of Kairos. Or in the eyes of ordinary people. These two incompetent governors must bear full responsibility. Kairos did not make any mistakes. At most, he did not consider political factors when designing tactics. But, but, the emperor is not an ordinary person. War is a continuation of politics. Especially wars involving tens of thousands of people. Things in this world are not that simple as long as they involve politics. 
The results of political struggles are often completely inconsistent with common sense. As the marshal of the last war, Governor Caros divided his troops into two groups. But neither group achieved the set goals. The only action of the cavalry unit led by Governor Caros was to block Count Odin and let Nayang Eldred stab him in the back. Although it was somewhat fruitful, this kind of conspiracy caused the opponent to lose a general, which was no different from conspiracy to assassinate. The key is that Bacchus has not benefited from this and has not been able to occupy even an inch of land. The reason why the two countries have not signed an armistice agreement is because they can't reach an agreement. This kind of thing destroyed the tacit understanding between the nobles. The nobles in the Lion Realm did not dare to trust the Bacchus Empire. This is definitely what Emperor Marius did not want to see. He killed a world-famous nobleman in a dishonorable way. The territory of the fierce Lion Realm will definitely be difficult to conquer in the future. And it will be difficult to rule after it is conquered. In addition, Kairos has never agreed with the reform. And his shadow army is not obedient. So will Emperor Marius think that Kairos did this on purpose? Because this would make it impossible for the Bacchus to integrate into Pender. Killing nobles without authorization is what the conservative Bacchus people who regard themselves as conquerors and oppose reforms can do. So did Emperor Marius still dare to make him a marshal? And how did the reformist justice design the same use of internal responses? Let Felina get sick and trick Godric away. Let Rainier occupy the Maishion Collar to block reinforcements. And make White Deer Castle an isolated city. Since it can be called a think tank, these things must be handled by justice. It was also a pre-war plan. But justice would protect the lives of the nobles. You know, he could make Rainier treason. And naturally he could also let Rainier assassinate Godric. But he didn't do that. And he didn't even kill Godric's wife, Princess Felina. Creating a disease is much harder than directly assassinating someone. Although the main reason for the defeat of this war was entirely due to the kidnapping of justice. In the eyes of Emperor Marius, who should bear the responsibility? For Emperor Marius, things had already happened and right and wrong were meaningless. What faced him was a multiple-choice question. Should he deal with two governors or one governor? On one side were Justice, who supported his reforms, and Lebius, who kept making small mistakes but not big ones. On the other side, there is Kairos who openly opposes the reform, and Kairos has nothing to hold on to. Then, Marius would of course put the responsibility on Marshal Kairos. This was the way to cause the least loss to the entire country and the reform process. Justice had always supported Emperor Marius' reforms, and the Emperor would not touch him. Lidius was originally a conservative like Kairos, but he had a bad style and a bad temper, and he didn't get along well with Kairos, and he and Justice were kidnapped together. They had the same aspirations, and he had enough to handle is in the Emperor's hands, and old accounts can be turned over at any time in the future. Only Kairos opposes reform. His shadow army is also disobedient, and it is difficult to find a handle. So the emperor will definitely seize this opportunity to reduce Kairos' power. He is the marshal and the person ultimately responsible. So it is reasonable to shift the responsibility to him. For example, Kairos' tactics were improperly arranged. For example, there is no evidence of the sequelae caused by killing Odin. The reasons are easy to find. And the two governors will actively cooperate to eliminate their own responsibilities. 3 to 1. Yes, political struggles are not unreasonable. Camps? and interests determine the final outcome. It is normal to confuse right and wrong. So the result is easy to guess. Kairos will definitely take the responsibility. And the marshal will probably be replaced. In this case, Governor Kairos would be happy to exchange grain for the two IOUs. And he would definitely be able to trade them at a premium. Because those two IOUs are irrefutable evidence that the two governors had private transactions with the enemy during the war. These two IOUs may not seem like a big deal. But they are enough to disturb the view because in the eyes of the emperor, this kind of thing represents a more serious message than opposition to reform. You spend 12,000 dinars on a broken carriage worth 600 dinars? Ha! Huh. Isn't this collaboration with the enemy? Oh! You said this is the ransom that will be paid after being captured by the enemy? Who in the entire continent has ever seen someone pay a ransom to pay an IOU? Even if this isn't treason, there's probably something fishy about it. The enemy captured you, and then let you go with an IOU? This is not something normal people can do. If there is nothing else going on, who would believe it? Moreover, someone who can write such an IOU can also reveal other information to the enemy. Right? Then, there is clear evidence to support the fact that the two captured governors caused Kairos to return without success. If he has these two IOUs in hand, Kairos can completely avoid this scapegoat and can also change the camp from 3 to 1 to 2 to 2. 
His Majesty the Emperor will definitely put aside the matter of Kairos for the time being and reconsider the solution. Because in the face of this kind of evidence, if we continue to confuse right and wrong, it is likely to destroy the already unbalanced mentality of the Shadow Legion. And they may rebel. Your Excellency Leong! What do you mean? Let me buy these two IOUs and litigate with the other two governors. This will indeed help me. But I don't understand. What good will this do to you? Can you get something? Kairos could indeed think of this. But he didn't understand why Leong did this. I captured both Justice and Lidius. If one of them becomes a marshal, where do you think the Empire's next attack will be? The Lord Lord spread out his hands with a wry smile on his face. Huh? They want to clear away their shame and hide their guilt. Of course they will attack your territory first. I understand what you mean. Debt transfer is a normal behavior. Not only can you recover the debt, but you can also avoid danger. Kairos nodded. Indeed, Leon really had the motive to help him. This was indeed for his own safety. No, you don't understand. I am not trying to collect the debt. Nor do I intend for you to use this IOU to litigate with the two governors. I suggest that you only give the IOU of Governor Levius to Emperor Marius and tell His Majesty the Emperor that you still have the IOU from Governor Justice in your hand. As long as Emperor Marius makes a decision that is in line with justice and conscience, you will also give the IOU from Justice to His Majesty. Leong reached out and covered one of the pieces of parchment on the small table. This will not only ease the relationship between you and Emperor Marius, but also let the Emperor understand that nobles like you who are loyal to tradition are also thinking about the country. Kairos watched Leon's movements, leaned back on the cushions in the carriage, closed his eyes, and thought for a moment. If Kairos gave two IOUs to Emperor Marius at the same time, then the matter would just be a lawsuit between the two camps. But Kairos could take the initiative because there was clear evidence that the two governors were suspected of collaborating with the enemy. Of course, in fact there was no such thing. Justice even misled Leon with false information. But Emperor Marius may still cling to Kairos for the sake of his reform cause. Because Marius definitely wanted to protect justice. A reformist? But if Kairos has information about justice and provides information about Lidius to the emperor, then this is a kind of coercion. Forced Emperor Marius to make concessions. At the same time, this is also a way to change the camp again. This is telling the emperor that they can join forces to deal with Governor Lidius. If Kairos confessed to the emperor that he still had something to do with justice, but did not show it. It would also be an expression of loyalty that Kairos was loyal to the Empire and respected the Emperor. After all, the Emperor only wanted to temporarily protect justice. A reformist? If two IOUs appeared at the same time, Marius would be in trouble. But if the evidence only points to Levius alone, then the Emperor does not need to hesitate. Levius is the commander of the Eastern Front. And he is also a conservative. The matter then became a matter of choosing between Kairos or Levius. Letting Kairos take responsibility is painless and has no actual impact. Even if he is no longer the marshal, the Shadow Army will still only listen to him. But taking all the blame on Levius can make him cut off his flesh at once and may even make him hand over the Shadow Infantry. This is the core idea of upward management to help superior leaders make choices. As for Justice's IOU, the Emperor can keep it in his hand and maybe he can use it in the future. Your Excellency Leong, I sincerely thank you for your advice. You said that you don't plan to collect the debt. It seems that you don't plan to let me buy the IOUs with money. So what do I need to pay in exchange for them? After opening his eyes again, Kairos sat up straight. He used honorifics for this thank you. Chapter 145 The Price of Success I need one million pounds of grain seeds and send a ship from the port to Menheim as quickly as possible to solve the famine there. The Lord really didn't hide anything. Food? I can't provide food to people in a hostile country. It's a serious crime to be an enemy. I can't exchange my own crime for supporting the enemy with the evidence of the other two governors. Mr. Leong, I would rather pay by it at double the price. Kairos refused directly, then stared at the two IOUs with a hesitant expression. It seemed that what he was hesitating about was not whether to trade. Don't get me wrong. The food is not provided to me. I am just helping these Menheim friends solve their difficulties. The person who bought the food is Count Udirian of Menheim. They are not your enemy. Of course, if you are not interested, I can go directly to talk to His Majesty the Emperor. In fact, I originally planned to go directly to His Majesty the Emperor. Leon pointed to the Medenheimer standing outside. Indeed, Kairos is not the only client. He can also talk to Emperor Marius. Moreover, you will be more confident when talking to Marius without Kairos as a middleman. 
The Lord placed his hand gently on the small table, pressed down the parchment, and stared into Kairos's eyes. Emperor Marius would certainly be interested. Before coming here, Leon had great confidence that he could convince the Bacchus Empire, but he originally considered many tricks, such as meeting Kairos in the name of Frederick as an envoy, and then using this to meet Emperor Marius and use the factional struggle in the Bacchus Empire to persuade Marius. Emperor Marius must be willing to solve the famine in Menheim, with the wisdom shown by his majesty in promoting reforms. He must be willing to make Menheim a die-hard ally of Bacchus. It is actually much easier to convince such an emperor than to convince a lord. Leong has always been good at taking advantage of situations. But after obtaining so much intelligence along the way, he finally decided to reveal his identity directly, and directly persuade Kairos with IOUs written by the two governors because Emperor Marius represented the country of Bacchus, and Frederick was the official envoy, representing Medenheim. If it is done in the name of an envoy, this is a purely diplomatic act, and the Lord himself will receive limited benefits. Moreover, allowing a politician like Emperor Marius to support Medenheim would likely have sequelae, such as causing Medenheim to be coerced by the Bacchus Empire. But if you persuade Governor Kairos privately, you don't have this worry. Diplomatic actions are completely different from private transactions but the results Medenheim can obtain are no different. Even if the deal is negotiated diplomatically, Marius will still let Kairos complete the specific steps, because the grain seeds produced near Dillon Port are the most suitable, and they have to be transported by ship from Dillon Port. Moreover, such a private act will earn Leon the greatest gratitude from the people of Medenheim. This is the selfishness of the Lord. He has raised his goal to a higher level. His goal has been upgraded from obtaining the gratitude of some people in Medenheim to obtaining the respect of Medenheim, because this almost single-handedly helped Medenheim solve a big problem. Leon believed that Kairos would be willing to trade, because the demand for Kairos had been fully stimulated, and there were obviously two buyers, which was a seller's market. Moreover, growing one million pounds of grain is not too difficult for Kairos. The territory of Kairos is Dalingang, a large city with a total population of more than 100,000 in the county, and the richest economic center in the entire Bacchus. Dean also carried out water conservancy construction in this area, and there was absolutely no shortage of food. If it's Medenheim, then that's acceptable. Do you just need one million pounds of grain? There's no other requirements. Right. Caro sat up straight again and looked at Leon. It's one million pounds of grain seed suitable for planting near Port Dillon. Sent to Medenheim by ship. Medenheim's envoy Frederick will bring some great swordsmen back to the country with the ship. As long as I see once the ship with food sets off you can send me directly back to the Lion Realm, so you don't have to worry about what other means I will use. Leong finished speaking word by word, picked up the two IOUs and put them in his arms again, and then opened the car door directly. I really came here with good intentions. I believe you can notice it. Make a deal. Karos agreed without any more ink. But before getting off the car, he said softly, Agathon is right. You will definitely become the Empire's enemy. This ability to see into people's hearts alone is enough to stir up the storm. And you are now still so young. The Lord turned back and smiled. What? Are you planning to join me? Lord Kairos? Kairos also laughed. Ha. Ah, this is really not a small tone dot actually. I have been hesitating just now whether to kill you directly. The Lord smiled and shook his head. Lord Kairos? You probably don't know. There is always a marksman watching you from the window. After saying that, Leon got up and got out of the car, stood by the door, and stretched out his hand to support him. The direction of the hand was facing a tree not far away. Kairos got out of the car, and then followed the Lord's hand and looked over. Only then did he see a man in green standing on the branch of a tree holding a big bough. He seemed to be almost integrated with the tree. Probably seeing Kairos gaze, the archer dodged and disappeared into the leaves. That's Lisa Dillon. Kairos returned to the carriage without saying a word and then said to the Lord, Lend me this carriage. I will wait for you at the port in three days. Leon smiled and nodded. Why borrow it? I'll give this carriage to you as a souvenir. Close. Go help the governor drive. Cairo shook his head in the carriage. How many dinars is this carriage worth? Since you know that it can block all arrows and spears, it obviously cannot be measured in dinars. Lord Governor, I hope you can understand my friendliness and sincerity. Leon smiled and waved goodbye to Kairos. Kairos's guards escorted the carriage and left in the direction of Dialingang. Kairos did not refuse to let clothes drive. He knew that this was the contact person given to him by Leong. Watching the carriage go away, 
The Lord nodded to Frederick, who had been looking at him eagerly. Your mission has been completed. Go to the port and wait. You can return to Mendenheim with food in three days. Frederick became full of tears within two seconds and knelt down on one knee facing Leon. My lord, before you set foot on the land of the Iron God, your virtues will be widely praised. As an envoy of Mendenheim, I declare that all the people of the Iron God who hear your name will agree with your will, glory and authority. I will also regard fighting for you as the supreme glory. At this moment, Frederick was representing an independent country as an envoy. This is not a pledge of allegiance, but a recognition of the Mendenheimer's right to rule on behalf of the Lord. From this moment on, regardless of whether Leon has territory or not, and whether he is currently loyal to others or not, he will be regarded by the people of Mendenheim as an equal ruler to Earl Mendenheim. This means that the people of Mendenheim no longer regard him as an ordinary noble lord. Instead, he is regarded as the king of the Allies. Three days later, the emperor arrived at the port. Cairo sent an ocean-going fleet to Mendenheim carrying a large amount of food. All the people of Mendenheim bid farewell to their lord for the time being and embarked on their journey home. They have to accompany the ship to protect them. And they also have to keep an eye on the captains to prevent them from making any small moves. But in fact, those sea ships would definitely not make any small moves. Because Lord Dean also boarded the ship with Frederick. He is going to Mendenheim to build water conservancy facilities and help Mendenheim solve the famine. This is his belief. After all, Dean is the Lord of Bacchus. It is impossible to abduct him to the Lion Realm. This is treason. This is a man who abides by even minor laws such as the age of marriage. He is loyal to the Bacchus Empire and will not commit treasonous acts. And the plague exorcists sent by Creon are still following. But going to Mendenheim, he felt no pressure at all. In fact, even those who expelled the disease felt that Dean going to Mendenheim might be the best choice for him. This would allow him to avoid the guilt of not getting married. But for Dean, this is what Amy said to him. Her teacher will definitely give him a place where he can study and promote high-yielding crops without any scruples. So that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even the entire there will no longer be famine in the continent. Your Excellency Leong, it is the responsibility given to me by the goddess Demaya to solve people's hunger. I will continue my career in Eisenberg. Thank you for your help. Dean waved goodbye to Leon and Amy. Miss Amy, I said I would give you a cart of seeds, but I want to take this cart away. You can go to my house and remove all the remaining seeds in the cellar and give them to my housekeeper. Just leave enough grain for my 200 acres of land and that'll be fine. Amy had hauled a cart of potatoes and corn seeds from his house before. And Dean was going to take this cart of grain directly to Mendenham. Dean gave Leon and Amy a handwritten letter, which was written to his butler. And at the same time, it was also addressed to his father, General Creon. He still has more in his cellar. After bidding farewell to the fleet, only Amy and the few plague expellers were left beside the Lord. While watching the fleet leave with his own eyes, Leon handed the two IOUs to Governor Kairos. Later, Kairos sent troops to send them all the way to Imel village and gave Leon a sum of money before leaving. Not much. Two thousand dinars. It's the money Kairos paid for the carriage. The governor did not accept the gift but paid a reasonable price for the boxcar. Perhaps, he was worried that the Lord would use the same logic to trap him. After all, accepting gifts from enemy lords can easily arouse suspicion. The other two governors wrote two IOUs and were taken advantage of by Leon. If he accepted his carriage, there was no guarantee that he would not be taken advantage of again. Just let your subordinates pay to avoid being cheated. After seeing the archers in the trees, Governor Kairos was very wary of the Lord. However, the Lord just needed cash. And the 2,000 dinars were spent by Leong in the blink of an eye. He used the money to buy five ordinary freight wagons and hauled most of Dean's potatoes and corn seeds back to his territory. Over 3,000 pounds of corn and about 1,000 pounds of potatoes. When we returned to the territory, it was already June. This is no longer the planting season for potatoes. The weather is too hot and the soil temperature is too high. The potatoes will not sprout. They can only find a dry and light-proof cellar to store them until autumn. But corn can be planted in June and July. The corn seeds here in Dean are suitable for autumn corn. The Lord doesn't know how to handle wheat. But he knew about corn. Even more than Dean knew. In order to compare corn and wheat, Dean planted corn according to the wheat cycle and used the same irrigation method. This is actually a bit problematic. Although he got twice the yield of wheat, the yield of 2 to 300 pounds per mu was still not the data that corn should have. 
Wheat is best sown when the temperature is more than 10 degrees Celsius, which is at the beginning of spring. But when it reaches 30 degrees, that is, in summer, it is the most suitable temperature for growing corn. And Dean planted the wheat directly after drying and preserving the corn seeds. But corn is different. Sun-dried corn seeds should be soaked for a day before planting. Otherwise, not only will germination be slow and inefficient, but the quality of the corn grown will also be poor. In relatively cold places in the north, it is even necessary to use pots and warm water at 30 degrees Celsius to promote the seeds, and then plant them in the ground after germination. Although the Lord's understanding is indeed limited, He knows that as long as the correct method is followed, even this kind of corn that has not been improved and optimized can achieve a production capacity of more than 400 pounds per acre. In order to ensure the safety of this land, the two opened up a forest land behind White Deer Fort, and my Xiongling's troops were responsible for planting it. These soldiers who had shares were more trustworthy. More than 3,000 pounds of corn seeds turned into nearly 1,000 acres of corn land in a few days, which is the joint property of Leon and Amy. The seeds were given to Amy by Dean, and the land was planted by the Lord. But the land belonged to Godric. This is really a joint industry. Potatoes were actually stored in the cellar of White Deer Castle. Wheat Xiongling did not find an environment that was dry enough and completely dark. The cellars of White Deer Castle were actually converted from prisons. For these treasures, the Lord also stayed in White Deer Castle. So, just as Godric said, Leon was officially stationed at White Deer Castle to take charge of military affairs. Amy will help him handle the trivial matters. And Leon will manage the two territories together. The people at White Deer Castle quickly became familiar with the young lord and gradually became accustomed to reporting all important matters to Leon. The citizens and businessmen of Makesy Angling are also used to going to Leon for big things and Miss Amy directly for small things. Even the officials in Changha Town knew that if they had any official business, they could go directly to White Deer Castle and find Leon and Amy. It was the same anyway. In addition, there is basically no boundary between Makesy Angling and Bailu Castle. Both sides of the road are now fully planted with wheat, and the residents have also been scattered in the area. There are one or two farms every few hundred meters. The territories are completely connected. By Lubo and Makesy Angling gradually became difficult to tell each other apart. See you in city. There were only two people in the side hall of the palace. Emperor Marius sat on the throne, twirling his thick brown beard on his chin. In front of him was Governor Justice. Justice, my old friend, Baron Leon sold the IOU you wrote to Kairos. You should know what this means. Emperor Marius glanced at Governor Justice meaningfully, with some hint of a joke between friends. Justice bowed and saluted. Your Majesty, I swear that I have never done anything to betray the Empire. I know you won't. You told me before. I just want to tell you that Leon entered the Empire alone a few days ago and transferred your and Lidius's debts to Kairos. This makes I have to acquire your debt again at a larger price. Otherwise your reputation will be ruined. Emperor Marius' communication with Justice was very direct. The two appear to be true. Die hard friends. Your Majesty, my reputation is irrelevant. The Shadow Army is the trouble that must be solved. You should not continue to let Cairo serve as the Marshal. Justice shook his head. But the problem is, Cairo's got these two IOUs, which to outsiders can completely prove that you and Levius had transactions with the enemy during the war. What will the Shadow Army think if I don't compromise with Kairos? Now let anyone other than Kairos be the Marshal. And the Shadow Legion will riot. And they may even directly raise the flag of rebellion. You should know that there is a rebel Augustus in the Empire. And he is a member of the Senate. Shadow the Legion is biased towards him. Emperor Marius reached out and knocked on the armrest of the chair. Looking a little anxious. Your Majesty. In that case, you can demote me. Kairos. And Levius and then let General Agathon serve as marshal. This will appear fair, and no one will object. It seems that Justice was indeed loyal to Marius, and was willing to make such self-destructive suggestions. You are the only one who can support me in completing my reforms. Justice, if you are regarded by most as an incompetent traitor who is in league with his enemies, our reforms will be difficult to maintain. I can't do this. Justice, Taz, people believe in reform because they trust their leaders. If you are regarded as incompetent, I will be regarded as an incompetent emperor, and our reforms will not be implemented. Marius stood up and waved his hand. It doesn't matter if Kairos continues to be the marshal. I can make him responsible for destroying Augustus. And the person who kidnaps you must be an irresistible and powerful enemy. That's the only way. 
so that civilians and soldiers understand that you could not resist the kidnapper at that time. And we must also carry out reforms to deal with powerful opponents. After speaking, he looked at Justice. We need to make that Baron Leon a more famous general than Agathon, so that people will forgive the fact that you were captured by him. But he is indeed just a little Baron. Alas, unless his majesty takes action personally regardless of his reputation. Governor Justice sighed. That's why I called you here. I want to write him a letter. And you arrange for a spy to send it over. Chapter 146 The Conspiracy Strikes Half a month later, the Bacchus Empire made major personnel changes. Governor Levius was transferred to Shield Wind Castle. And Emperor Marius asked him to capture White Hart Castle within a year to prove his innocence. This is already a relatively severe punishment for a governor. It is both a demotion and a reduction in power. Shieldwind Fortress is a purely military fortress with few residents. It relies on the Empire for all supplies. And there is basically no chance of losing territory. In order to achieve the goal of capturing White Deer Castle within one year, this also made it impossible for Levius to drink the blood of soldiers and eat empty wages. Instead, he had to find a way to raise more soldiers and horses on his own. Governor Kairos will still serve as the Imperial Marshal. But his current military direction is to eliminate the rebel, Democy Augustus in the country. Governor Justice was not affected and was still presiding over the reform policies of Emperor Marius. Sarah has been searching for information in Bacchus recently, and she brought this information back to the Lord. Obviously, Kairos got the result he wanted. Or in other words, got the result planned by the Lord. Since the Bacchus Empire will only face one enemy, Governor Levius, Leon is not worried at all. White Deer Castle is strong enough to hold. At the same time, Sarah brought back another strange news. The Bacchus Empire was actually praising Liang's so-called great achievements. And the news was very impressive. For example, some people say that he is an invincible general, has three heads and six arms, and can eat five children in one meal. Some people also say that the soldiers he leads are all two-meter-tall demons, extremely powerful and ferocious, and can kill eight horses with one punch. Some people say that he is extremely skilled and is the best swordsman in the world. He can wield six giant swords at the same time and basically can kill anyone he wants. Anyway, it's basically to get closer to the monster. The name, Leon, can already stop children from crying at night in Bacchus. When Sarah brought back these rumors, she also congratulated the Lord. In her opinion, the Lord's fame was the recognition of him by hostile countries. Although I don't understand why the Bacchus Empire spreads these rumors, the Lord does not pay too much attention to demonizing the generals of hostile countries. This is a normal behavior. If rumors are spread, it is inevitable that they will turn into monsters. Count Odin used to be a monster-like existence in the eyes of enemy countries. Even before Leong saw Odin, he thought he was a rough and strong man. But he turned out to be a skinny old man. Although I don't know why such a small role like me can receive such treatment. It is not surprising. It is probably because I impressed the three governors of Bacchus. But just when the Lord thought he could live a rare peaceful time, Unexpected changes came from within the Lion Kingdom. During the hottest season in mid-July, a large group of Lion Knights came to White Deer Castle and surrounded the main building of White Deer Fort. The leader is Lord Marbert, the acting administrator of Lunga Town. Lord Marbert is the eldest son of Duke Brennus. And Duke Brennus is the current Grand Master of the Lion Knights. He brought a letter to Leon. Along with the letter came a large box full of dinars. The content of the letter is, Your Excellency Leon Griffin, Thank you for your contribution to the Empire. The materials you provided to the Empire have now been used on various battlefields in the Empire. You have helped the Knights of the Radiant Cross and for the safety of the Empire. Your heroic fighting behavior should also be commended. For this reason, on behalf of the Empire, I grant you the position of General of Changha Town and give you 10,000 dinars as a gift to thank you for your outstanding contributions to the Empire. I hope you will all the best in the Lion Realm. My friend. The signature is, in the handwriting of the Emperor of Bacchus. Gaius Marius. This is a personal letter from Emperor Marius. Even the whole text does not use condescending words such as, order, and, edict. But very equal language. This is very rare. What's even more rare is that the position of General of Changha Town is totally causing trouble. Your Excellency Leon, I met a carriage on my way out. But after seeing my flag, the owner of the carriage ran away. I saw this letter, and this box on the carriage. I'm sorry. Out of vigilance and curiosity, I read this letter. So now, you should probably explain why Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire gave you such a high reward. 
Lord Marbert was quite polite and polite. He did not force his way in, but entered the Lord's Hall of Bailu Castle as a normal visit. But the Lion Knights beside him were fully armed. Moreover, these Lion Knights came from the direction of Meixi Angling. But Liang and Amy did not receive the message from Meixi Angling. Obviously, Marbert did not stop at Meixi Angling at all, and did not even reveal any purpose to the people in Meixi Angling. Instead, he directly led the Lion Knights into White Deer Castle in a running attack. The Emperor of the enemy country wrote a letter in his own hand and privately awarded Leon the title of general. The meaning of the letter was very clear. Leon had made outstanding contributions to the Empire. Looking at this letter alone, it seems that Marius was expressing his gratitude to Leon. And Leon could understand that the 10,000 dinars were to thank him for providing those carts of leather in time. But the problem is that the content is too misleading. Moreover, being a volunteer for one night and then providing a few carts of leather goods is not as serious as being a general. Besides, there was also a problem with the place of delivery. This letter was not delivered to Maxi Angling or White Deer Castle at all. This was obviously delivered by Emperor Marius. If this letter was delivered directly to White Deer Castle or Maxi Angling without being seen by other lords, then there would be no problem. After all, what the letter said was actually true. But the letter was deliberately placed in the hands of Lord Malbot. This was obviously a plan to alienate Emperor Marius. And it was the kind that didn't even contain a single lie. I'm afraid anyone who reads this letter will think that Leon has committed treason. After all, an emperor usually would not write a personal letter specifically to alienate a minor lord. For an emperor, such a personal letter rarely appears. And if he does write it, it is to an important minister like Justice. Friends, although Lord Marbert usually just travels around and has fun and basically doesn't care about anything, he will still take it seriously when it comes to treason. As a result, he now personally visited White Deer Castle to deliver this letter to Leon. Accompanying him were most of the Lion Knights. He didn't even seize the box of dinars. If I said this was Emperor Marius's plan to alienate Emperor Marius, would you believe it? When Leon saw the letter, he immediately realized that the previous demonization of himself in the Bacchus Empire was probably in preparation for this letter. But this is a Yin and Yang strategy. And it's hard to explain. I would like to believe it dot but I don't understand why the Emperor of Bacchus would deliberately target a baron like you. If it is my father, I can understand it. Malbot shook his head, with a bit of sarcasm in his eyes. Indeed, the Grand Leader of the Lion Knights, the Lord of Chiaoyan Bay, and currently the most powerful Duke of Brennus in the entire Lion Kingdom, did not receive this kind of treatment. Why should he be a small baron? Why would Emperor Bacchus frame a young baron himself? Leon sighed. Okay. I know this is not easy to explain. So, Mr. Malbert, what do you need me to do? Your Excellency Leong, I don't want to believe that you will treason, but you were named a general by Emperor Marius. This is not a low-level position. I think you should at least go to Lion City and personally explain to His Majesty the King that this is also I came with the intention of bringing the Lion Knights. And I have always treated you with courtesy. I hope you will not make things difficult for me. Malbert did not seem to intend to embarrass Leong. He had indeed been treating each other politely and talked about things without any other emotions. But the people in the Lion Knights seemed to be very wary. Leon even saw the two leading knights wearing shackles. The order they received was probably not to let Leon defend himself, but to arrest the traitor and bring him to justice. It's just that the Lion Knights all know Liang's skill and courage. And Lord Malbert definitely knows Liang's actual status in the eastern region and probably doesn't want to have a head on conflict easily. But even though the Lord has the ability to speak like a lotus tongue, he really can't defend himself at the moment. This is really slander. This letter is Bacchus conspiracy. Malbert. You should understand that Leon is innocent. Amy's head was already sweating. And she tried her best to explain to Malbert. Lord Marbert shook his head. Miss Amy, you have helped Baron Leon handle political affairs in Ayrshire for so long. You should also understand that as the administrative officer of Chang'e Town, I cannot turn a blind eye to this kind of thing. I also I am willing to believe Baron Leon. But this is my duty. Please do not obstruct official duties. This was to put it very politely. Malbert did not seem to have any hostility. Then, Malbot looked at the Lord. Baron Leon, as far as I know, you did go to Bacchus a few days ago. Right? Liang's eyes narrowed. This kid is not traveling all day long, but has been observing the trends in the eastern region? Lord Marbert is really well informed. I did go to Bacchus once. Okay. I know I can't explain it. Can you wait for me outside for a while? And I'll explain the official business to Amy. 
Let's go with you. Leong made an inviting gesture toward the door. Malbot nodded. Baron Leon had better hurry up. We will wait for you outside. Then, he left the main building with the Lion Knights. Leon, are you really going to follow them? This is a trap by the Empire. They just want you to leave the territory. Amy frowned tightly and stopped calling herself a teacher. She could realize the danger Leon faced. Because she knew that this was not a slander. That the letter was genuine and that Emperor Marius did it on purpose. This is similar to the method used by Leon to use two IOUs to make the Bacchus suspect the two governors. It can be said that he was treating the other person with his own medicine. I have to go. Otherwise, I will really become a rebel. The Lion Knights will not come to White Deer Castle casually. The king's order is definitely not to let him talk to me politely. Then dot well dot what should I do? Amy did not argue anymore, but directly asked about Liang's plan. She knew that it was useless to say anything else at this time, and it was only right to solve the problem first. Amy, let Anson move everything in McFragrance to White Deer Keep. Let Sir Roland guard White Deer Keep, and let Leslie gather the elites in the convoy to Lion City. If, I mean if, if you hear someone spreading the news of my treason, then immediately light the beacon fire at White Deer Castle. Regardless of whether you see the enemy or not, you must insist that the Bacchus Empire is attacking White Deer Fort. Leong frowned and explained quickly. I understand. But if you go to Lion City alone with them, if you are framed, Amy nodded, but was quite anxious about Liang's safety. Rissa Dillon will follow me. He will not put my life in danger. But you have to remember, don't trust anyone except Lord Godric. If Lord Godric is not here, don't let anyone else, any troops, enter the city. Leon handed his sword to Amy. Keep it safe for me. I will be back. Amy took the sword helplessly. Don't you carry a weapon? It's useless to bring it. It can only cause trouble. Give me the gunpowder bag. That might be more useful. Leon hung the leather bag containing the musket ignition powder on his body. Took out a small sealed clay pot from the drawer. Put it in his arms. And then walked out. Will King Ulrich take this opportunity to deal with you? Amy suddenly asked, her expression a little sad and her voice low. Leon smiled. Amy, there will probably be those few dukes. My Maishyong company is very valuable. Who doesn't want wealth? Amy nodded. Her voice lowered. The king has a son named Alan Rick, who lives in the noble house of Lion City. Leon. Amy screamed pitifully from behind. Leon turned around. Amy gave him a gentle hug and kissed his helmet. A kiss from the goddess will bring good luck. Leon smiled and nodded. Turn around and open the door. Baron Leon, can you leave? Do you want to take some followers with you? Lord Marbert was waiting outside the door with a smile on his face. Let's go. I don't have any followers. So I don't need to bring anyone else with me. The Lord looked back at the main building of White Deer Castle, casually took a jazz horse from the stable, and followed the Lion Knights directly out of the city. From the shadow of the main building, a man in black carrying a bow an arrow quickly stepped out and left White Deer Castle through the secret door on the side. He followed the Lord in the forest beside the road across a nearly 100 meter wide wheat field. This is Lisa Dillon, Eagle Claw Fort. This is the border castle located in the northeast of Sherhu City. And further east is the Jata Grassland. This is the domain of Baron Kedron. This Baron's family marriages are extremely extensive. And he has some indirect connections with many big nobles in the kingdom. For example, the Duke of Alma is considered his brother-in-law, and his two wives are cousins. Duke Bredis was his cousin-in-law. Lady Bella, the wife of Duke Elfin, was his cousin. There is also the dead Baron Eldred. His brother-in-law Rainier's mother is his cousin. This network of relationships covers more than half of the high-ranking nobles of the Lion Kingdom. This situation served Baron Kedron very well most of the time, and allowed him to gain the territory of Talon. However, in the troubled times of the Lion Kingdom, this kind of large-scale and large-scale construction has become a big problem. The Duke of Alma was involved in a heresy lawsuit due to Lady Bella, and Baron Eldred was killed for treason. As their relative, Baron Kedron will also encounter a lot of trouble. For example, you are often called as a witness. Since he was related to both Lady Bella and the Duke of Alma, he would definitely be frequently called for questioning by the king. Baron Kedron has been traveling back and forth for the Duke of Alma during this period. Now. The Duke of Alma is finally allowed to leave the Lion City. And Ketalan has finally returned to his territory. Kedron, thanks for your help during this time. I will thank you. The Duke of Alma looked a little weathered. But his eyes were still bright. He no longer wears the custom-made armor with the golden lion printed on it. 
but instead wears a set of ranger equipment, which is the ranger armor of the Horn Call Rangers. He was deprived of the privilege of using golden lions as decoration. He was no longer the first duke of the Lion Kingdom. This was the reason why he was able to get out of the lawsuit quickly. He promised not to try to get involved with the Knights of the Lion in exchange for Duke Brennus, who was responsible for investigating heresy issues. To quickly close the case. Today, Alma will have no say in the selection of the Grand Master of the Lion Knights. And Duke Brennus can probably sit in the position of Grand Master of the Lion Knights until death. The person running between the two dukes to witness was Baron Ketelin. Sir, don't be too polite. You have to take care. Look at it a bit. It's not a bad thing for children to have their own ideas when they are older. At least Fathered has shown the ability to inherit the family business. Kevin persuaded Alma sincerely. Duke Alma shook his head slightly. His eyes a little lonely. In the past few months, he had been involved in the heresy and lost Changha Town. Suffered the betrayal of his own son father and heard the news of the death of his illegitimate son Fauché. He was also threatened by Duke Brennus and lost his influence in the Knights of the Lion. For an old man over 60 years old, he is considered extremely strong if he has not collapsed to the point of losing his mind. I will not let a person who framed my own father inherit the family business. Kedron. I hope you can support me. I want to take back everything that belongs to me. Alma gritted her teeth, with a cold light in her eyes. I don't know what it means to admit defeat in this life. Kedron shook his head. Sir, the garrison of Lion Lake City, as well as the garrison you sent to Chunga Town before, are currently in Father's hands. The first flag guard of Lion Lake City is also under his control. That adds up to enough, there are 2,500 troops. But now you only have these dozens of followers. Humph. Do you think an Archduke only has this little strength? The Red Brotherhood in several big cities in the Lion Realm will help me. That's at least a hundred rogue knights and countless manpower. Moreover, as long as I can show up in Shurhu City, who do you think would dare to attack me? Alma still looks like she has the fighting spirit and power of a lion. But Kedron still shook his head. Sir, it's easy for people from the Red Brotherhood to pry for information or make some money. But it will be counterproductive in this kind of thing. You should understand. Kedron, I don't expect people from the Brotherhood to appear directly in Lion Lake City. You should know that after I quit the Lion Knights, I joined the Horn Call Rangers. And now, the Rangers have no Grand Leader. Alma lowered his head and looked at the ranger armor on his body, then turned to look in the direction of Jatta Grassland. Kellen frowned and thought for a while. Sir, you want to use the horn to summon the rangers? But Ralph and Hereward don't trust you very much. I don't need their trust. Hereward is old, and he is far away in the bog and can't interfere with me. It's enough to make Ralph obedient. If you want Ralph to obey, the Red Brotherhood has many ways. My qualifications are enough to become the grand leader of the horn summoning rangers. Alma got on her horse and looked at Kevin. You will support me. Right? Chapter 147 The Actor's Kindness The Lion Knights came with Malbert this time with a large number of people. About 800 people. Including more than 100 Lion Knights. And the rest were Lion followers. This is more than the total strength of White Deer Castle and my Xiongling. Moreover, the Lion Knights are fully armed with one person and two horses. And they seem to be carrying out combat missions that require long distances. Obviously, this was to prevent Leong from jumping over the wall and leading troops to rebel. King Ulrich obviously took this matter very seriously. But Malbert himself was not a lion knight. And he did not have much communication with these lion knights. He was probably the leader only because of his father's relationship. This second generation high-ranking official didn't even wear a knight's armor. He was wearing a set of gorgeous noble half sleeve leather armor. This thing was a summer outfit. Not for going to the battlefield, but for hunting. It was short-sleeved and cooler. Even the horses are all black. Unarmored. Well-bred hunting horses. These are very expensive racehorses and generally do not go to the battlefield. Let alone travel long distances. Whether it was his appearance or his appearance. It didn't look like he was leading people to capture traitors. But more like he was traveling or hunting. This made the Lord find it very strange that Malbert was dressed in such a way that he did not support him going to Lion City at all. He didn't even bring any belongings with him. There is no way that a young man from a duke's family would share a tent with the Lion Knights at night. Right. Unless he has any special hobbies. But even so, you will always bring some followers. Right. Marbird didn't have any followers. So what is his intention? Did he want to deal with himself before dark? Lord Malbert led the Lion Knights to escort or escort Leon to the vicinity of True Brun. 
This is the temporary residence of the Owl Knights. After the last battle, Leon gave this place to the Night Owls. Anyway, no lord in this empty village would come to claim it for a while and claim it as Lady Bella's property. And Lady Bella is now in the prison of Lion City. Probably it will never be released in this life. Marbert suddenly came to Leong at this time and whispered, You should know that owl. Right. They may be able to help you escape. The Lord's heart suddenly became cold. Marbert knows the Knights of Owls are here. He also knew that he knew the group leader Ors. He also hinted that he could use the ability of the Owl Knights to escape. But does Marbert mean well? Will not. Out of good intentions. I would not have read the letter in the first place. But would have returned it to its original owner. This should be deceiving myself. The Owl Knights may indeed be able to take him away. But if he does run away, he will be absconding in fear of crime. And he will basically be charged with treason. With the way that Guy Ors thinks, he will definitely not protect himself. Moreover, in order to ensure the survival of the Owl Knights, if Ors is sure that he will be considered a traitor, he will probably report himself. Marbert, do you want to kill yourself here? But why? Duke Brennus has no grudge against him. That's not the case. Just as I was thinking about it, several owl calls of uh -huh, sounded. No. Leon realized that Marbert didn't want to kill him. This is the whistle of the Knights of Owls. With the ability of the Night Owls, they should have discovered the team of the Knights of the Lion long ago. Marbert must also know this. He didn't want to kill anyone, but he had other intentions. But what is he going to do? Leon glanced at Marbert and felt that Marbert was obviously an actor. He actually had a worried look on his face. As if he was really worried about Leon. Lord Marbert, what are you talking about? What has the power to escape? The Lord decided to play dumb. Oh, it's nothing. I seem to have seen a night owl flying past. It's better to have wings. It can escape the pursuit of most enemies. Malbot also started to show off his acting skills, pretending to be even more stupid than the Lord. But it's daytime now. Well, Lord Marbert is probably too tired to be dizzy. How about we go to that village to rest for a while? Leon was a little unsure of Malbot's intentions. So he simply went into the village to give it a try. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm really a little tired. Marbert smiled shyly and rode towards the village. Leong frowned behind him. What does this guy want to do? But no matter what, with the Owl Knights in the village, he would definitely not kill anyone. And since the Owl Knights know Lehman, they will naturally know some people in the Lion Knights. And there should be no conflict between the two knights. Lord Leon. Sir Marbert. I saw you guys coming from a distance. Where are you guys going? Are you on official business? As soon as they entered the village, Ors greeted them. He had indeed known that this team was coming. Sir Ors, you actually know me. Marbert also looked a little surprised. There is no other way. Only by getting to know more people can you save your life. Do you and Mr. Leon want to take a rest? Why don't you go sit in the house? Ors was obviously a smart guy, and he noticed at a glance that this was not normal. Leon never went out alone. So he politely led Malbert and Leon into a stone house. Then turned to greet the Lion Knight. Running very fast. Probably because he was afraid that if he stayed a second longer, he would know something he shouldn't know. Leon looked back and saw that the Lion Knights did not follow. Lord Marbert smiled at Leon. Baron Leon, I actually didn't expect you to leave White Deer Castle alone. I don't want to leave either. Isn't this your request? Leon also smiled at Malbot. King Ulrich sent this team of Lion Knights to capture you to Lion City. I just helped them lead the way. I will return to Chunga Town in a while. I did not ask you to do it alone. Go with them. I actually hope you can bring more manpower to Lion City. Marbert curled his lips. Why? Is there any problem with a large number of people, but a small number of people? The Lord felt that there was something in this statement. If you were alone, if something happened to you, you wouldn't even be able to get the news out. Malbot smiled a little weirdly. Oh, it's hard to talk like this. I don't think anyone is eavesdropping. Why don't we all be more direct? The Lord Lord looked back, sighed, and decided to ask for more information. Okay, let me tell you straight. I did pick up a carriage, that letter, and a box of money. I also know that it was probably a divorce plan from the Bacchus Empire. But my responsibility is that I must tell my Lion City returns. Lord Leong, you should understand. Right. Marbert was quite happy. Leong nodded. This was indeed his duty as the administrative officer of Chang'e Town. There was nothing wrong with Marbert's approach. 
just three days after I reported back to Lion City. This group of Lion Knights came and brought the King's order. The order I got was to arrest you with the Lion Knights. I can't disobey the King's order. So I led the way and didn't let your subordinates in Nick's Angling know about it. So as not to conflict with you or Lord Godric. Then I gave you enough time to set up at White Deer Castle. I thought you would run away. Or at least I will bring in more manpower. Marburg curled his lips. I'm not treasonous. Why should I run away? Leon also curled his lips. Yes, you didn't run away. And you came out alone. But since you didn't run away, I have to run away. I don't want to follow this group of lion knights to the lion city. I don't know that King Ulrich is arresting you. What are your true thoughts? You should also know that Lehman usually leads them to carry out their missions. But, Lehman is not here. Can you understand what I mean? Malbot shook his head and sighed. Lehman, he wants to garrison the Chicha Fortress. Is it normal that he can't come? Leon actually understood a little bit. Lehman probably didn't want to do this job. And Marbert probably didn't want to do it either. Well, Sir Leon, let me put it this way. The only job the king has given to Lehman and these Lion Knights is to kill the rebels. I have never seen anyone come back alive among the people these Lion Knights went out to arrest. Lehman from my family has been to this village before. So you should know the outcome. I see. Leon thought of the way Lehman hesitated to speak to him several times. Due to the nature of Lehman's job, he really couldn't say a lot to anyone. Only the king and the grand leader of the Lion Knights would know about his actual mission. However, Leon knew that there should still be three prophets who could return home alive. Of course, they may not be considered human beings. Malbot pointed outside the stone house. I don't care whether you have treason or not. I just want to go back to Chang'e town and enjoy life. But you don't have anyone with you. If something happens, no one can prove my innocence. It was me who reported the news. And I was also the one who led the team to arrest you. If you die in Lion City, your friends will definitely think that I harmed you. I know your relationship with Lord Godric. And I don't want to betray it. This scapegoat. But if I run away, dot then, I will really become a traitor who absconds in fear of crime. Leon let out a long sigh. Marbert nodded. You are right. But if you don't run, you will probably die. Anyway, while the Owl Knights are here, they can prove that I didn't harm you. I will be sick after a while, and then return to Chunga Town. After all, the order given to me is just to lead a team to arrest you. I don't want to escort you to Lion City. It's up to you later. I don't want to get involved in this matter anymore. Thank you for your frankness, Mr. Malbert. How do you plan to get sick? Leon nodded and expressed his gratitude. Hey! Hiss. Ouch. Mr. Ors. Help. I have a stomachache. Lord Marbert re-entered actor mode within a second, clutching his stomach with a sad look on his face. Even Leon felt like he was really about to shit his pants. Lord Marbert could say this to himself, and it was indeed out of goodwill. Although this goodwill was just because he did not want to be retaliated by Godric and Amy, he still had to serve in Long River Town after all. But what should I do now? Is it really like Lord Marbert said? Running away. Fletcher Village. As a place directly facing the Jatta Grassland and the Nolder Forest, Fletcher can be regarded as a place in dire straits. But over the past six months, this place has been surprisingly peaceful. Since the last time they dealt with the three prophets together, Godric, Ralph, Charles and others have become closer. Godric is actually a very responsible person. He was initially reluctant to settle in River Town because of his temperament. Since he no longer served as the captain of the Royal Guard, he has not been too keen on power. But now that he has become the military chief of the Eastern Region, he will still be very responsible. It's just that his strategy is different from that of Count Odin. Count Odin is good at using cavalry and mounted infantry. His strategy against the Jatta people is also based on frontal confrontation. And he will pay more attention to the use of cavalry or mounted infantry. Therefore, the defensive tactics that Odin once deployed were often based on offense instead of defense. Or chain defense. The combination of defense and attack eventually led to an encirclement and siege. In fact, it was the method commonly used by the Horn Summoning Ranger Group. Therefore, at that time, most of the funds and energy of the entire Eastern Army were focused on horses and mounted archery, and there were few defensive bunkers and the like on the border. Godric is good at organizing defenses with a large number of archers. He prefers to build fortifications and use infantry to cooperate with archers for regional defense. Although this will put you in a passive position due to the disadvantage of mobility, 
infantry is cheaper to build and faster to train, which can make the overall defense hole smaller. It's just that this relatively passive defense method is difficult to achieve particularly great results. There is no difference between these two strategies. It's just that the leaders have different personalities. The former is aggressive, and the latter is cautious and defensive. An aggressive approach makes it easier to eliminate the enemy's effective forces, while a cautious defense makes it easier to protect the civilians under your rule. Each has its own advantages. Of course, this also has something to do with the current actual situation. Count Odin has spent 30 years of military exploits on the Jata people. When he was alive, the Jata people did not dare to invade Chang'e town from the direction of Brave Shield Castle. But now that he has passed away, the Jata people have no scruples and will probably become more arrogant. Therefore, it is indeed necessary to shift from offense to defense and build more defensive fortifications. During the recent period, Godric has been vigorously building various defense facilities in Union Fletcher Village and Fort Brave Shield, such as arrow towers, defensive horses, trenches and low walls. As a new member of the Sentinels of River Town, Charles is of course willing to cooperate with Lord Godric's strategy. This is the defense method that is most suitable for the Sentinels of River Town to take advantage of their strengths. Therefore, the village of Fletcher now has many watchtowers and arrow stations. And there are trenches everywhere. Ralph has also been engaged in real estate recently. He has built the camp by the river into a wooden fort and is currently building another small fort a few miles across the river. This can form three garrison points together with Fletcher Village. This horn shape can make this area easier to defend. However, unlike Fort Brave Shield, Fletcher Village does not have high walls here. So it is likely to become a breakthrough point for the Jata people. In order to enhance the defense capabilities of Fletcher Village and prevent this village from becoming a passage for the Jata people to enter in the future, Godric decided to provide some support here. Of course, this is partly due to the responsibilities of the military commander-in-chief of the eastern region and to ensure the defense of the border. On the other hand, after all, Fletcher is Leon's territory, and Godric will still take special care of it. He allocated a batch of equipment to Fletcher Village, mainly some inlaid armor and sword shields, which were actually infantry equipment. In fact, this can be regarded as self-serving. Originally, this was the inventory of the inner castle of Chang'e Town. It was the property of the late Duke Alphan. But now it should be regarded as the property of King Ulrich. Of course, as the chief of military affairs, he does have the authority to dispatch these military supplies. Ralph and Charles found a batch of extended rifle bows from the inventory of the Horn Call Rangers. This kind of longbow is a single piece bow with low cost and short production cycle. It is not afraid of moisture. The back of the bow is a complete you would. The entire bow is more than 1.8 meters long. It was once the weapon of the sentries of Chang'e Town. The reason why I say, once, is because the sentries in Chang'e Town now use compound bows. In Chang'e Town, where there is no shortage of bow strings and you would, this single longbow is very cheap. But it is no longer the main weapon of the Chang'e Town sentinels. The longer the body of a single bow, the greater the power it can bring. But the lengthened bow body will cause the pulling force to be too large and difficult to control. Moreover, the longer the bow body, the greater the vibration when shooting. In actual combat, it is not as stable as a compact compound bow, and the requirements for archers are very high. Moreover, because this kind of longbow is longer than a person's height, it is not very convenient in actual combat and marching, and cannot be used for mounted shooting. So they became a stockpile. But as a weapon for training new recruits, this ultra-long single bow is very suitable. It can practice both strength and control. Such a longbow just fits Godric's idea of training infantry. Therefore, Godric personally led the team to train the peasant soldiers recruited by Charles into a complex of infantry and archers, mainly to compensate for their courage to face the enemy directly and how to organize defense without city walls. Charles recruited almost a hundred soldiers in Fletcher. This recruitment ratio was quite large. The entire village actually only had 700 people. However, these conscripts were not professional soldiers. They only served as soldiers in their spare time for farming and war. They were regarded as militiamen who defended the countryside. In order to inspire the courage of these recruits, their inlaid armor was all painted red. Red can make people more courageous and allow the recruits to adapt to the color of blood. During the off-season in late May, they also organized an archery competition to encourage new recruits to train better. Godric and Charles originally planned to ask Leon to come and participate. But at that time Leon and Amy went to Bacchus and found no one. 
But what I didn't expect was that the final champion of that archery competition was taken away by a traveler from Crowland. This really stimulated this group of new recruits. So they immersed themselves in training for two months, like the regular army. Now this special archer unit looks like a decent one. Because they are covered in red armor and hold longbows. This unit is called the Red Arrow Longbowman by Godric. In order to give this unit some practical experience, Godric and Charles took this unit to the grassland hills northwest of Fletcher Village. That was where Ralph led the rangers to raise horses. And there were often small groups of Jatu in that area. Also traveling with them was Ralph's son. The young man who exchanged a hawk strike bow with a visor for Leon. Raphael brought a small group of rangers along with him to embolden these newly minted longbowmen. Godric and Charles did encounter enemies near the hills. But the problem was, the ones they encountered were not Jatu, but a large group of bandits. There were over a thousand people. Chapter 148 Retribution for Kidnapping and Blackmail Malbert was sent back to Lunga Town by the Knights of Owls. The actor played the stomachache with great proficiency. But the Lord did not choose to run away after all. Although it is indeed risky to go on the road with the Lion Knights. At least Leon knows that the Lion Knights will definitely not kill him on the road. The reason is simple. Killing yourself secretly will not benefit anyone. If someone wants his life, no matter who it is, it will definitely be to get his wealth. Unless there is some blood feud. But the Lord thought about it carefully and felt that there should be no grudge against King Ulrich and the Lion Knights at present. And the thing in his hand that people will miss is not direct assets such as land or cash. But the Maishan group? Which is a company. A company is made up of people. If he dies in an unknown way, the people who make up the company are not fools. They will either seek refuge with Godric, the major shareholder, or they will run away directly. And the person who killed him will get nothing. Moreover, even if the king wants to kill himself, he will definitely go through a process. Even if he had to trick himself, find a way to give himself a rebellious name and sentence him to death. He would at least have to execute him publicly in the square of the House of Lords. So there is no need to worry for the time being. Once we get to Lion City, the Lord still has confidence in the abilities of his company's employees. It's hard to say the combat effectiveness of Chang'e Express. But in terms of movement speed, this professional transportation team will definitely be higher than the Lion Knights. Some. Leon has already ordered Amy to ask Leslie to gather the elite of the team to Lion City. Leslie will definitely lead the team personally. With Leslie's execution efficiency, she will probably arrive long before the Lion Knights. Although Leon didn't know how Ulrich was going to treat him. As long as there were enough men there, the Lord would be confident to turn around. After all, he is no longer alone. There is a difference in courage between having subordinates and not having subordinates. But the price for not running away is to be shackled. Of course, the Lion Knights only tied his hands in front of him, probably to prevent him from using weapons to hurt others, and did not restrict his movements, probably out of respect. They didn't gag Leon, and still let him ride the horse by himself, without even searching for anything on him. The suspect has not yet been convicted, and the Lion Knights still remain relatively polite. However, since it involves treason and the king ordered the arrest, the use of shackles is justified. It's just that none of the Lion Knights had any conversations with Leong. This is probably the aftermath of the previous rescue of Amy with the Lion Knights. These Lion Knights may not want to give the Lord any chance to deceive and cause trouble. No matter what Leong said, these Lion Knights just listened and didn't respond at all. So the Lord stopped thinking too much about his words and started thinking about what to do next. The Lord was thinking about things all the way, didn't say much, and didn't try to escape. He looked very honest, without receiving any instructions. Rasadalin did not act rashly, and just stayed behind the Lion Knights. This Nolder Elf's ability to use the environment is superb. The trees, hills, and fog along the way are all tools for him to hide his figure. Except for Leon, who knew he was behind him for a long time. No one noticed. Three days later, Leon was taken to Chicha Fortress. Speaking of which, Lord Lord actually had a pretty easy time these three days. The journey of the Lion Knights was not too fast. And although Leon was arrested, he was a noble after all. There were Lion followers to take care of Leon along the way. So he didn't have to worry about anything about food, clothing, housing and transportation. Leon also gained a new understanding of the quality of life of these Lion Knights. When the Lord was in his own territory, he did many things by himself. When he was at White Deer Castle, there were no servants to serve him. Amy's family didn't even have a housekeeper. And Amy herself didn't bring a maid. 
the lords of the eastern border counties were indeed relatively simple compared to the nobles in the hinterland of the kingdom. Even Godric did not have many attendants. The lord felt a little emotional. He had been in Pender for more than a year, and he had become a noble. But he had not enjoyed the corruption that a noble should, should, have at all. It was really outrageous. On the contrary, after being arrested, he didn't need to do anything by himself. And he was fed by others. It felt more like a vacation. Except no one was talking to him. But this beautiful life ended soon. After the Lion Knights took Leong into the Chicha Fortress, they politely removed his shackles and invited him into the cell. This is not a dark and damp prison located in the basement, but a small stone house next to the city wall. It is probably an independent prison specially used to detain nobles. The lighting in this prison is quite good. The living facilities inside are complete. And it is quite clean. It seems that preparations have been made here. Although this kind of detention is normal, the Lord still expressed his dissatisfaction. Hey, are you just leaving me here? Are you going to Lion City right away? None of the Lion Knights answered, but closed the iron door directly. Leon curled his lips. Looking at it like this, the trouble he was about to face might be a bit tricky, but in line with the purpose of facing the situation in the best condition, Leon closed his eyes and thought for a while, then started to eat and drink enough, and forced himself to sleep. He slept until about midnight, and then Leon was awakened by the sound of the key unlocking the door. He turned over and sat up, and then saw the iron door opened, and Sir Lehman walked in holding a food box in one hand and a torch in the other. There seemed to be a few people standing outside the door. After lighting the lights in the cell with a torch, Lehman inserted the torch into the iron ring on the wall at the door, and then placed the food on the table one by one with his back to Leon. His movement's extremely slow. There is wine and meat, and the dishes are quite rich. But the Lord just stood up and did not take any action. Lehman sighed and turned around, frowned and took off the sword from his waist, put it on the table, and then sat down. Lord Leon, do you know that if you enter the Lion City, you may not be able to get out? Lehman's voice was very soft, and he gestured to the sword on the table with his eyes. Leon shook his head and looked at the people at the door. They can't stop you. With your skills, it's normal for you to run away from those people. Lehman's voice became softer. No, I can't run. I'm not treason. Leon still shook his head. What's going on? It doesn't matter whether you are guilty or not. His Majesty the King originally asked me to capture you to Lion City. And he said that if you resisted, you would be killed without mercy. I didn't dare to agree. So I made an excuse to shirk. Lehman lowered his voice, poured a glass of wine and held it himself, but did not give the glass to Leon. Shoot to kill. It seems that you have made plans to kill me. But if it is to take my life directly, then why take me to the Lion City? Such an order does mean that the situation is serious. It seems that Lehman, like Marbert, feels that Leon may not escape death. But Leon didn't understand why the king had such a plan. Many people already know about the letter that the emperor of Bacchus Empire wrote to you. You should have seen it too. Lehman took a sip of wine, with a trace of regret in his eyes. I might be the last one to see it dot, but the king can't convict me just based on a letter from the empire. Right. Leon spread his hands. It's such an obvious divorce plan. It's not like that. Lord Leon, the main problem is not the letter, but the three prophets. You know, I brought the three prophets back to Lion City. The king did not deal with the three prophets, but released them. You should also be able to think of this. But since then, His Majesty the King has been paying attention to your news. And as soon as the letter appeared, he immediately issued an order to arrest you. It seems that he has been looking for excuses for you. Having said this, Lehman shook his head and seemed a little confused. I don't know why, but the three prophets must have said something to King Ulrich. You have defeated them. They must hate you to the bone, so... Lehman looked at the sword again, then turned to look at the door that was still open. You can run away now. I will lead people to hunt you down. But I know you can definitely run away. Are the three prophets still in Lion City? Leon was indeed a little nervous. Logically speaking, Ulrich should not let the three prophets stay in the city. That's not true. They were in a swamp near Cliff Bay, and I personally led a team to escort them there. Although the king did not kill them, he did not allow them to have an army anymore. They were watched very closely, and for a while you won't be able to get out, Lehman replied, shaking his head. It seems that Ulrich is not that stupid, but it also means that he did make a deal with the three prophets. So, 
It's the three prophets who are harming me. But Lehman, why are you telling me this? If I run away, you will take the blame. Leon was indeed a little curious that Lehman was actually helping him. Why? People like you shouldn't die for such an unreasonable thing. I failed at your hands once. That was the only time I failed in the arena. I haven't been able to win it back with my own hands. Lehman frowned tightly. Besides, I know the relationship between Godric and you. And I don't want to see civil strife in the kingdom. Leon nodded. Thank you. But I can't escape. I'm not a traitor. And I can't bear the charge of rebellion. Lehman sighed again. Said nothing more. Picked up his sword and left. The next day, Leon was taken to Lion City. It was the royal city guards who took him away. The Lord did not encounter any public trial because no one publicly accused Leon. That letter was only a unilateral letter from a hostile country. Although it was written by the emperor, it was not considered valid evidence. In this case, the king can doubt Leon and ask Leon to defend himself. There is no problem. But there will be no trial process. It is illegal in any country in Pender to try a noble on mere suspicion. A trial may only be held unless remarks that can be used as testimony are obtained during the self-defense process. Or someone brings valid evidence to make accusations. But King Ulrich didn't even use the self-defense process. And Leon was taken directly into the secret room of the palace. Leon was brought and blindfolded. This was the custom. Since the establishment of the Lion Kingdom, foreign ministers must wear blindfolds when entering the palace except the throne room. Probably the Lion Kings of all generations had no sense of security. After the blindfold was removed, Leon turned his head and looked. He was in a basically completely airtight room. He didn't see the door. Only a window with iron bars. But the window didn't face the outside. But faced another room. But in the room opposite was not King Ulrich. But Igor. Who was wearing a bachelor's uniform. The Lord is in a luxurious prison. This was probably the secret room where King Ulrich once imprisoned Lord Andrew. And it was probably also the place where he said something to others in private. Baron Leon. Long time no see. You should know why His Majesty invited you here. Igor spoke through the bars. He didn't look very good and his words were a little weak. Grand Maester. If handcuffing me with the Knights of the Lion is considered a request, then I really don't understand the reason. The Lord didn't give a good look. After all, this was a case where the king was doubting a lord's loyalty and moral character. In this case, not being angry would be tantamount to kneeling down. And there would be no good consequences. Marius, the false emperor, gave you the title of General of Chongha Town. Are you not going to explain this? Igor smiled softly and dipped the pen in his hand into ink to prepare for recording. It seems that this can be regarded as already giving Leon a chance to defend himself. This kind of conversation record made by the court bachelor is legal. But this one-on-one -on -one secret room communication is not fair to Leon. How to explain? The Bacchus Empire also said that I can eat five children in one meal. This is just to harm me. Leon spread his hands and said, Grandmaster Igor, how about I also give Emperor Marius a title of Knight of the Maiden Collar? What do you think? Yes, this kind of unilateral reward has a certain purpose. Even Marburg can see that it is a divorce plan. Igor shook his head and laughed. Leon, he is the emperor of a country after all. Why didn't he harm Godric or Brennus? Why did he specifically harm you? You have to give me a reason. Someone told me I. You went to Bacchus territory a few days ago. What did you do? Go buy food. The Lion Knights must have told you that I grow a lot of food in my territory. This is indeed the truth. Leon answered without any hesitation. That means admitting that we are negotiating a deal with the Bacchus Empire. Igor, who was recording, said something and then started writing quickly. Grand Monster Igor, I am buying food, not selling it. Buying food from other countries shouldn't be a crime. Right? Leon shook his head helplessly. Who knows what you bought it for? Igor smiled meaningfully. Okay, this is my fault. I shouldn't have farmed the land, fed the people, and stored military rations, let alone contributed to the country. The Lord started to mess up. Anyway, there is no one else here now. The accusation imposed is not convincing. And such a small crime will not kill anyone. Okay, okay. I won't record it either. Igor sighed, put the pen aside, and stood up. Leon, I might as well tell you straight. Your majesty doesn't care why Marius is targeting you. In fact, no one cares whether you will treason. But your majesty needs your Maishyam company. The lord's eyes widened in surprise. He could imagine that the king wanted to blackmail him but he really didn't expect that the king would directly ask for his company. 
That's a company. Grandmaster Igor. That's not cash. I can't give it to anyone I want. Leon suddenly realized that neither King Ulrich nor Grand Bachelor Igor probably understood the nature of a joint stock company. They probably thought that it was property. Just like those workshop-like industries under the names of ordinary nobles. However, my Xiong company is a joint industry of shareholders. Although Liang is the largest shareholder with absolute control, he cannot transfer his shares at will. Moreover, all the company's businesses are interrelated, and Liang has invested a large amount of money in Chang'e Express, which is not yet profitable. At present, each branch company is continuously conducting internal capital turnover, and no one except Liang can handle this matter. Those investors and businessmen who became agents will now only believe in Leon and Godric, who have always been trustworthy. If the company changes hands, it will probably encounter withdrawals and margin runs in minutes. And it is normal for it to collapse within a few days. Of, it seems that you are unwilling to do so? Leon, Dinar is not as important as life. Igor looked unkind. He thought Leon was unhappy. This is not a matter of willingness. I can give His Majesty the King and use some shares if His Majesty the King is willing to protect the company. But I really can't give the company to anyone. You probably don't know that my Xiong company's current actual assets are negative. Liang smiled bitterly. The current actual assets of my Xiong International are indeed negative. Because the recent expenses have been a bit large. Chang'e Express has been operating at a loss. And territory construction has also been consuming funds. Although I have a lot of silver coins in my hands. These silver coins cannot be moved for the time being. This is the deposit paid by the businessmen who open chain stores everywhere and it is also the principle of the first batch of investors. Of course, with the rate at which those entertainment venues make money, they will turn a profit within a few months. But Igor didn't believe it. Judging from the business foundation of the Lion Kingdom, this bachelor obviously did not understand how Liang's Maishan group operated. Humph. Since you don't want to, then just stay here. The bachelor who attempted blackmail left directly after saying this, with a very bad expression on his face. When the door on the other side closed, the whole room fell into silence and darkness. The company really couldn't give it away, and if it was given, it would be considered as an empty sh. L to deceive others. Moreover, if it really handed over the property, it would probably be dead. The king would not leave a powerful enemy to himself. The lord took out a fire sickle from his body, scraped the iron window a few times, looked at the environment with Mars, and then went to rest without any worries. There is food and drink here. And the bars on the iron window are just ordinary cast iron the thickness of a little finger. Not a modern high-tech product. If you really want to escape, this secret room cannot stop Leon who has gunpowder on him. Besides, someone will definitely come. Since he knows that Ulrich is seeking money, he will not kill himself until he achieves his goal. It's just that the Lord is very unhappy that he has always kidnapped and blackmailed others. But now, he has been kidnapped and blackmailed. It is really retribution. Chapter 149 The Bloodline of Noldor The Lord's prediction was correct. Not long after, Igor left and returned. There was a dim and gloomy light in the dark secret room. Grand Maester Igor held a lamp. It seemed that it was already night outside. This time, the bachelor did not come alone. In addition to a few guards, he also brought another person. Miss Felina, Amy's mother. Igor, where is Ulrich? Is he crazy? Don't you know what it means to imprison nobles without trial? When she saw Leon on the other side of the bars, Philina became angry almost immediately. Your Highness, just think of this as my personal behavior. But no matter what, you'd better not get too angry. I know you're not in good health. Igor smiled humbly at Philina and turned to look at Leon again. But before he could speak, Leon said first, Personal behavior? Eager, if that's the case, my friends and I can kill you for this and sell your whole family to the West Coast as slaves without any liability. Responsibility. Igor frowned and the smile on his face disappeared. Your Excellency Leon, wait until you go out before you say such things. Then he sat at the table again and turned to look at Philina. Your Highness, you have seen me. He is full of energy and unscathed. I think you should be satisfied. From the looks of it, Philina knew that Leon was being imprisoned and asked to come over and take a look. Leon, you weren't abused. Were you? Felina ignored Igor, but looked at Leon carefully. The Lord Lord shook his head. Miss Felina, I'm fine. You don't have to worry. Igor, take me to Ulrich. Felina confirmed that Leon was indeed uninjured, nodded, and turned to glare at Igor. 
your highness. Let me tell you the truth. His majesty the king will not see you. And I don't think it is a good thing for you to come to visit your friend overnight. This may bring trouble to yourself and Lord Godric. Igor had a little helplessness on his face. He was just the king's scapegoat. He had nothing to do with a princess like Felina. So he could only explain it nicely. Felina stared at Igor for a long time, then shook her head and pointed to the door. In that case, I ask you to get out first. I want to talk to Baron Leon alone. Igor sighed, shook his head, lit the candlestick in the room, turned around and went out and closed the heavy door. Miss Felina? You? As soon as Leon opened his mouth, Felina put her index finger in front of her mouth and made a shut-up gesture. Then, she picked up the candlestick from the table, turned around and walked to a corner, pulled out the candle alone, and knocked the copper candlestick hard on the corner. Song! Ah! There was a crisp chime of brass, followed by a shrill scream. It seems that there is a copper pipe in that corner leading to other places. On the other side of the copper pipe, there must have been someone eavesdropping with their ears pressed against the copper pipe. However, by directly hitting the copper pipe with metal, the eavesdropper's eardrums were probably shattered, and the screams were transmitted along the copper pipe. There is no other mechanism here, Dot Leong. You can speak now. No one can hear you. Felina blocked the opening of the copper pipe with a ball of wax from the candlestick, put the candlestick back on the table, and walked to the iron window. Miss Felina, why are you here? This is Ulrich's habit. As long as he is being held privately, he will lock people here. I received a letter from Amy this morning. She asked me to tell you that your transport team is gathered at the Lion. All over the city. Your subordinates are waiting for you at the Adventurer Tavern. Philina handed the candle to Leon and took out a small bottle from the lining of her clothes. This bottle was also brought to you by Amy. She said it was something you put at Miss Leslie's place. Miss Philina gave the explanation very quickly. After speaking, she turned to look at the door. Seeing that there was no movement, she turned to Leon and told Leon, Don't admit treason. Find a way to get out first. As long as you don't admit it, no one can kill you. How about it? Thank you, Miss Felina. Of course, I will not admit it. I have not treason in the first place. But I don't understand why the king would so directly seek to seize my property. Leon asked softly, If a noble is treated unfairly by the king, he can actually unilaterally terminate his allegiance without being blamed. But the problem is that King Ulrich did not come forward in person. And it was Igor who was doing the blackmail. This means that the king wants to leave room for things to change. If necessary, Igor can take the blame and punish this. Scum who used the name of the king to extort money. Of course, the king would not kill the nobles easily. Nor would he personally seek to seize the nobles' property. In this way, even if Leon knew it was entirely due to the king's instructions, there was nothing he could do to Ulrich. But Leon really doesn't understand. The king is so anxious to make money. What is he trying to do? Is it necessary for a king to be like this? Ulrich may have been bewitched by those witches. His health is getting worse day by day. And sometimes he becomes a little crazy. And his temper gradually becomes irritable. A month ago, the garden of the House of Lords. Felina was still lying on the deck chair in the garden. Ulrich was still standing by the pavilion. Holding a glass of blood like red wine in his hand. Sister Felina. Can you write a letter to Godric and ask him to help me capture some Noldor elves? Ulrich had always respected his cousin. But this request didn't sound like something a king should do. Ulrich, what happened to you? Why did you look so bad? Why did you catch the Noldor elves? Felina sat up and looked at Ulrich carefully. The king now looked ashen. And there seemed to be some bruises on his arms. Like corpse scars. Sister, as you can see, there is something wrong with my body. Ulrika did not hide it from his sister. I can feel the life draining from my body. At night, the pain in the bones all over my body is unbearable. And sometimes I lose control and go crazy. I haven't been able to sleep for a long time. Have a good sleep. Dot only alcohol and LSD can stop my pain. Felina stood up with a look of horror on her face and murmured, Echimia, pain, madness, wine and drugs. Ulrich, your father was. The Mad King was like this back then. He had echimosis all over his body. Complained of pain all over his body every day. Often went crazy and lost control. Drank alcohol all the time. And took psychedelic drugs every day. Eventually, he became a real madman. Yes, dear sister. You are the person who knew me best. I don't want to become a madman like my father. I have to cure this disease. 
facing the sister he respected most in his youth. Ulrich showed real sadness. Is this a disease inherited from the bloodline? Felina asked. Maybe. I don't know where my bloodline is wrong. We have a common grandfather. But he is fine. And you and my uncle are fine. Only my father and I are like this. Is this because of our status? Is this a curse that the king has to bear? Ulrich drained the wine in his glass in one gulp. Then immediately poured another glass. What do the doctors say? How should we treat it? Of course, Philina also sincerely hopes that her cousin can be cured. But she also knows that the hope of treatment for this genetic disease is really slim. Those court doctors are all incompetent that they don't know anything. I tried to find the three prophets before. And they gave me a magic potion. This medicine is indeed effective. At least after drinking it. Can suppress my pain. Ulrich took out a small bottle from his body. Which contained some strange red liquid. You dare to drink those witches' medicine? Felina frowned. The three prophets just want glory and wealth. They are not witches. In the final analysis, they are just a few women who are good at changing their faces. They can live forever because of this medicine. It is said that this medicine is made with magical power. Made of the blood of elves. It can give people a life force as long as the Nolder elves. Ulrich shook the delicate little bottle, but shook his head with a wry smile. Getting the life force of the Nolder? Ulrich, I'm afraid this is a lie. You shouldn't believe them. Felina felt that Ulrich must have been deceived. I actually don't care about immortality. I'm not afraid of death. But this medicine can really relieve my pain and make me more awake. Even if it's poison. I can only accept it. I still want to restore the kingdom. The glory of the past. I must at least keep a clear mind while I am alive. Ulrich looked at the bottle of blood red medicine with a complicated expression in his eyes. But your health seems to be getting worse and worse during this time. Your face now looks like a corpse. Ulrich. Alcohol and drugs will not make you like this so quickly. It is the reason for this drug. Bar? Thelina shook her head sadly. Yeah. I have to drink one bottle every month. Every time I drink it. I can feel my strength fading. This medicine eats up my strength and makes me weak. Just like drinking poison quenches thirst. But there is no doubt that it can indeed relieve my pain. According to the three prophets, the potion in my hand is made from the blood of ordinary Nolder elves and the remaining magic power in their blood is limited. If I use a more noble and pure Nolder noble girl, then I only need to drink another bottle of this potion, and I will never be troubled by illness, and I will not continue to become weak. Ulrich muttered. So you want to capture the Nolder elves and use them to make medicine for the three witches? Or the Nolder noble girl? But, as far as I know, there are not many Nolder nobles. You want to capture the Nolder nobles girl. Unless we send out an army to start a full-scale war with the Nolder Elves. Felina understood Ulrich's intention. Yes, sister. That's why I'm asking for your help. Ulrich let out a long sigh. I'm sorry. Ulrich, you should know what kind of person Godric is. He would not do such a thing. If the kingdom and the Nolder went to full-scale war, the consequences would be unpredictable. Ulrich, you can't do this. Do. Felina shook her head and refused. She knew history. Hundreds of years ago, the nobles of the entire continent also sent out large armies to capture Noldor. But the end result was just the creation of countless widows. I understand. I understand. I will not let the soldiers of the kingdom die. I will hire adventurers to do this. Ulrich didn't force anything more. He was not unreasonable. And he also knew the price of this matter. Within a few days, Felina got the news that Ulrich was raising funds and hiring adventure groups everywhere. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights also set out in large numbers to the Long River Forest. In the secret room, Leon listened quietly to Philena's story. This king seemed to be in desperate need of treatment, but the three prophets did give him the only solution. So, he needs a lot of funds to recruit mercenaries to round up the Nolder. Leon understood why Ulrich took the opportunity to blackmail him. Probably so. Although I don't know how big your business is. Godric has indeed become a lot richer after partnering with you. It's not surprising that you would be targeted by Ulrich. Falana nodded, and then sighed. But if a king does this, sooner or later the people will betray their relatives. Leon also sighed. In fact, Leon can understand Ulrich. The Lion Kingdom is surrounded by enemies on all sides. The troops must be used to protect the country, and cannot go to the Long River Forest to die. So Ulrich could only get money, then hire slave-catching teams and adventure groups across the continent and organize a huge mercenary army to capture the Nolder noble girl he wanted. Anyway, 
This is a one-time task. And it will not require continuous investment. At least it will not be a thorn in the side of the country. But Auric obviously also knew that it was difficult to get many girls. An ordinary elf girl is still worth a hundred thousand dinars. Let alone a girl from a nolder noble. So he needs a lot of money. It is understandable that a king does not have any spare money. After all, this is a huge additional expenditure. And there was no such budget before. Just like what Lehman said. After Ulrich released the three prophets, he targeted himself. The king probably not only targeted himself, but probably also targeted many wealthy little nobles. The rich are just like fat sheep in front of the power machine. And it is the same in ancient and modern times. And Emperor Marius happened to be trying to trick him at this time. I don't know if the Empire got any news. It is estimated that the Empire still has many spies in the Lion Realm. It's just that King Ulrich's method of making money is really a bit too simple and crude. It's no different from the Underworld. Of course, speaking of it, Ulrich had no choice. Regardless of whether the three prophets were deceiving him or not, he was still trying to save his life. Can the blood of the Nolder Elves really cure diseases? Leon became a little curious. If Nodo's blood had this function, how could they survive until now? The three prophets must be cheating. Before this, I have never heard that the blood of the Nolder Elves can cure diseases. But, Leon, the blood of the Nolder Elves is indeed not infected with diseases. Not even the Red Death. Miss Philina said seriously. You won't get the Red Death? Are you sure? You doubt well. You may not know it yet. Your mother Helen never got sick. You know, 150 years ago, almost all the members of the Pender Royal Family died of the Red Death. Of course, the blood of the Pender Royal Family, there is no way to resist the Red Death. But Helen once rescued a village. And most of the people in that village were infected with the Red Death. But Helen remained safe and sound inside. Felina looked at Leon. Helen's grandfather, your great ancestor, was a Nolder elf. Leon, you are one-eighth of Nolder blood. Is this dot really? The Lord was really shocked now. Leon, your father was a famous knight in the world at that time. And your mother was also the kindest girl. Thirty years ago, she once rescued a village that was suffering from the Red Death. You should know that there is no cure for the Red Death and can only be controlled through isolation. However, the manpower around her was limited at that time. And there were nearly 3,000 villagers in the entire village. At that time, the Lord there had run away. And the surrounding nobles did not dare to approach, let alone provide help. In order to allow the villagers to stay in the village for isolation with peace of mind, she still entered the village even though most of the villagers were infected, and told the villagers that she would also stay in the village. Since then, she has been helping the villagers in the village. It was not until several weeks later that Leonardo arrived with the Lion Knights to help, and she brought out more than a thousand survivors who were confirmed to be free of the disease. That's when I met her. I saw her disheveled and tired look with my own eyes. I couldn't even believe that this was the courage that a noble girl could have. But she did not contract the disease. She even took the surviving villagers to find another place to rebuild a village and continued to be isolated for a month. Since the more than a thousand surviving villagers lacked food and clothing after leaving their homes. I was young at the time and did not understand the dangers of the world. I informed the Mad King about this, hoping to raise funds to help them. Result, the Mad King led some nobles to slaughter all the villagers and planned to take Helen away without even mentioning a reason. I don't know why the Mad King wanted to capture Helen, but he failed at that time and Helen was saved by Leonardo. You know what happened next. Leonardo killed many nobles and became a rebel in the kingdom. A few years later, the Mad King finally caught Helen. But when Helen was imprisoned in the palace, the Mad King died suddenly. After telling the past story, Miss Philina shook her head. Later, I took in refugees in Helen's newly built village and built it into the current Yaju village. I was forgiven by Leonardo and became friends with Helen. But I found that she never got sick. And when I asked about her, I found out that she was of Nolder blood. Leon suddenly raised his head and looked at Philina. The Mad King also had a deal with the three prophets. Could it be that he also wanted to kidnap my mother because of a genetic disease? They may not want to use Nolder. Making medicine. Maybe he wants his descendants to have the blood of the Nolder. King Ulrich's son, Prince Alan Rick, is probably already an adult. Right? Felina was stunned. Your Highness Philina, you should leave here. The door was suddenly opened, and Archmaster Igor stood at the door and shouted, Chapter 150 Reva's Redemption. After Miss Felina left, Grandmaster Igor came and threatened her verbally for a while. But Leong, 
who knew the reason, no longer planned to ignore him. Ulrich just wanted to get enough funds to capture the Nolder noble girl, not to kill himself. Igor was just bluffing. The news brought by Felina reminded Leon of Alaric, the noisy member of the alcoholic group. Alaric gained great power after taking the elixir, but he would lose control and go crazy, suffer from unbearable headaches, and find it difficult to stay awake. He could only drink it drunk to avoid the pain. The potion Ulrich took would make him lose strength and become weak, but it could relieve his mania and pain. This magic potion seems to be the exact opposite of the elixir. Is this really made of the blood of the Nolder? Was Ulrich lying? Or were the three prophets lying? Or are they all lying? In addition, the names of Alaric the Noisy, Node 1, and Alaric Node 2, the king's son, are somewhat related. Leon didn't know what was going on, but he knew that Ulrich would let him go soon. As long as the king hasn't become a fool, he will. He just had to wait, and wait for White Deer Castle to light the beacon fire. In fact, on the same day that Leon was imprisoned in the secret room of the palace, the beacon fire at White Deer Castle had already been lit. Because, not long after Leon was taken away by the Lion Knights, news began to spread in Bailu Castle and makes the angling that Leon had committed treason. This must be a rumor spread by the Bacchus Empire because it would not have spread so quickly without someone deliberately spreading the rumor. Even the Lion City had no such rumors. Leon had not been escorted to the Lion City at that time. However, this rumor will not have much practical impact on the White Deer Castle area. For the people of Makes Yangling, it doesn't matter whether the Lord rebels against the country or not. Even if he rebels, they will follow Leon. Most of the residents of Makes Yangling were originally helpless and unable to survive. People, the Lord has given them a way to survive. And they can live better than ordinary people. The troops of my Xiangling have gained a lot of benefits from following the Lord. And they are more loyal. Let alone treason. They may even dare to go against the gods. People here at White Deer Castle also don't believe that Leon will treason. You must know that Leon kidnapped two imperial governors in White Deer Fort only half a year ago. People in other places may not feel much about this. But the people in White Deer Fort know very well that without Liang's rescue, White Deer Fort is now the territory of the Empire. Does it matter whether it is treason or not? This treasonous rumor was naturally created by spies from the Bacchus Empire to cause trouble for Leong. This was to ensure that a rift was created between King Ulrich and Leon, and it was also to make the other nobles of the Lion Kingdom suspicious. Whether they doubted the king or Leon, because no matter whether it is true or false, any king will be very concerned about rumors of treason. In this case, Leon will definitely be detained. The nobles who support Leon will certainly not believe the rumors. But such rumors will make them think that the king has treated Leon unfairly. Nobles who have listened to rumors or are suspicious of Leon may think that Godric and others are also accomplices. This simple rumor will create a kind of confrontation. As long as the king or Leon loses his composure, a little more provocation and guidance from the secret agents of the Bacchus Empire may trigger a civil war. Emperor Marius probably not only wanted to force Leon to rebel, but also wanted to cause internal strife in the kingdom of the lion. But Amy faithfully carried out the Lord's instructions. After hearing the news of Liang's treason, Amy immediately lit the beacon and sent messengers to Chang'e Town and Lion City for help, claiming that the Bacchus Empire attacks again. Of course, the Bacchus Empire did not attack. Liang asked Amy to do this in order to use the rumors of the Bacchus Empire to prove his innocence. Everyone knows that once White Deer Castle and Makes Yangling are occupied by the Bacchus Empire, the consequences will be disastrous. Liang is the Lord of Ayrshire and the current actual manager of White Deer Castle and makes the angling. If just after hearing the rumors of Liang's treason, he immediately received the news of the Bacchus Empire attacking White Deer Castle. All the lords and even the common people would realize that Liang's treason must have been caused by the Bacchus Empire of. This is also forcing King Ulrich to release him. With the enemy on the eastern border, if the king allows border lords like Liang to receive any unfair treatment, he will probably lose both territory and popular support. That's why the Lord was able to be taken away by Marbert so confidently and boldly, and was locked in a secret room without any intention of escaping. Amy actually did something extra. While Long River Town asked Leslie and Eric to dispatch personnel to Lion City, Amy asked the personnel of Long River Express to send a message to her mother Philina in the fastest way, asking Miss Philina to find a way to communicate with her mother. Let's meet Leong so that Leon won't suffer any hidden losses. After Leslie learned about the situation, she handed over the snake heart stone sealed in her hand by Leon to the messenger and took it with her. 
Both Leslie and Eric knew how Lisa Dillon got out of trouble. After returning to Makes Angling, Amy also worked with Sir Roland and Anson to transfer all the supplies from Makes Angling to White Deer Castle as quickly as possible. Liang's instructions were carried out efficiently without any compromise. But what no one expected was that before the cavalry sent by Amy for help could reach Lion City, the situation in the eastern region suddenly changed. Logically speaking, when White Deer Castle was invaded by the Empire, Amy's beacon fire call for help should receive a comprehensive response from the eastern region. As long as the beacon fire was lit, both Chang'e Town and Brave Shield Castle should send people to support. But it doesn't. Lord Marbert was only in charge of government affairs and had few troops under his command. So he could not send anyone out. The members of the Horn Call Rangers were unexpectedly absent from Chang'e Town. And they didn't know where they were. Godric was not in Chang'e Town for the time being. And the garrison in Chang'e Town had not received orders and could not leave their posts. Leofric of Brave Shield, Charles of Fletcher, and Ralph of Riverside Camp were also missing. No reinforcements were sent out to rescue White Deer Castle in the entire eastern region. Fortunately, the beacon fire and enemy attack this time were fake. If the Bacchus Empire really attacked, it would be really dangerous. Godric, Leofric and Charles are actually all together now. They were blocked by an army of thousands of people more than a hundred miles northwest of Fletcher Village. This is a desolate hillside on the edge of the Jatta grassland. Godric and Charles were originally going for actual combat training. A few days ago, they led the Red Arrow Longbowmen to look for traces of bandits in the area. Ralph's son Raphael brought 20 rangers to help them act as scouts. Raphael discovered many robbers in this area. But what they didn't expect was that the robbers did find them. But they found too many. They ran into an army of bandits led by hundreds of rogue knights in a valley. This is certainly not some wild bandit. These are the members of the Red Brotherhood that the Duke of Alma spent a lot of money to gather from all over. When Godric discovered this large force, he immediately led the archers up the hillside and occupied the commanding heights first. This is the right choice. When facing an enemy ten times your own, it is the last word to find a favorable terrain for defense. Raphael reacted quickly and immediately planned to run away with the rangers, preparing to go back and bring the horn call rangers over to suppress the bandits. But young Raphael was not surprised to be able to run out. The large forces of the Red Brotherhood were dispersed and surrounded from west to east. So of course Raphael could only run eastward. Unexpectedly, as soon as they reached the ridge, they ran into nearly 200 cavalry. Alma herself was among them. And so was Baron Kadrin. The overwhelmingly large Red Brotherhood army was actually just a cover on the surface. And was actually ambushing on the other side of the ridge. Alma took advantage of the geography of this hillside and at Kedrin's troops on the other side of the gentle slope of the ridge. This is the same way that Leong originally asked Lehman to take the Lion Knight to block the enemy's scouts on the gentle slope near White Deer Castle. Raphael couldn't see the situation on the other side until he stepped onto the ridge from the valley. When he got to the ridge, the cavalry from the other side rushed over and blocked him. Raphael tried his best but couldn't escape. All twenty rangers were killed and Raphael was captured. Subsequently, the Red Brotherhood force composed of about a hundred rogue knights and a thousand underworld members, besieged Godric on the hilltop. After Alma captured Raphael, she immediately rushed to Ralph's camp. Godric was surrounded by archers, and they defended from a high position. They could barely hold on for a while, but they definitely couldn't break out, and they couldn't hold out for long. They had no supplies and only brought a bag of arrows with them when they set off. Charles and Godric are trapped at the top of a mountain. Fortunately, Charles is lucky. He has a sister who hides in the dark and is unknown to anyone. Riva has been secretly protecting him in the past few months. And now she is also keeping an eye on him from the outside. But Riva, who only had dozens of bandits and bandits under her command, was unable to break through the encirclement and save others. But fortunately, the bandits under her didn't look much different from the bandits at the bottom of the Red Brotherhood. So neither side noticed her presence. So, the female bandit thought of an unconventional way to seek help. She quickly rushed to Brave Shield Castle with her men, and used her group of real bandits to attract Baron Leofric. After all, Riva is a bandit. No one except Leon knows that she is Odin's daughter. And Leofric doesn't know her either. She can only use this method to lure Leofric to where Charles is trapped. Place. However, this method of using real bandits to attract Brave Shield Castle to pursue it resulted in Leofric not bringing many troops. He only faced dozens of bandits. So he only brought more than a hundred cavalry troops. Of course, it would be good to have this cavalry as reinforcements. After all, 
Baron Leofric is a regular army on the border. In Reva's view, if Leofric's cavalry could be brought to the foot of the hillside, it would definitely be able to distract some of the enemies or create a gap in the encirclement. As long as there is a chance, she can use her familiarity with the surrounding terrain to rescue Charles. After all, the enemy who implemented the siege was only the Red Brotherhood. The battlefield discipline of those gangsters was not as good as that of Reva's bandits. With more than a thousand people, they could only trap Godric and Charles in the wilderness. The infantry archers who were unfamiliar with the environment. Reva's plan did come true. She successfully brought Leofric's troops near the hillside, allowing Leofric to see the two flags on the top of the mountain. And the people of the Red Brotherhood began to pursue Leofric's cavalry as she expected. Without Alma's ambush this time, the gangsters of the Red Brotherhood were indeed unable to surround Leofric, which forced them to send additional manpower to pursue and intercept him. As a result, the encirclement surrounding the mountain became much weaker. Baron Godric also seized the opportunity. When he saw the enemy moving at the foot of the mountain, and a cavalry team attracted the enemy's attention, he immediately led his men to break out. The shooting skills of the Red Arrow Longbowmen may not be very good, but they are not pure archers. Godric equipped them with inlaid armor and swords and shields. These archers can be used as infantry when breaking through. In order to boost morale, Godric and Charles took the lead, waving their swords and rushing out towards the east, where the enemy was weakest. This was also the direction in which Leofric's cavalry was located. There is nothing to say about Godric's martial arts. He has served as the captain of the Royal Guard, so his skills can be imagined. Even though he is now in his fifties, he still has the ceiling of combat power in this battlefield. He led the charge and killed more than a dozen people in a row. The enemies in front of him retreated and did not dare to stand in front of him. He quickly led the team to rush in at the foot of the mountain. But just when they were about to break out of the siege, Charles couldn't hold it anymore. Charles's combat effectiveness was far inferior to Godric's. When he broke through, he was surrounded by several rogue knights and was slightly injured. Injury on the battlefield was originally a common thing, and Charles's injury was not too serious. But the enemies they faced were all from the Red Brotherhood. Seeing that Charles was injured, these gangsters and gangsters abandoned the powerful Godric and no longer cared about the encirclement. They all turned around and swarmed up to deal with the injured little lord. A whole host of rogue knights and scoundrels descended on Charles. This gangster mentality of bullying the weak and fearing the strong caught Godric and Charles off guard. Godric had indeed experienced many battles and was highly skilled in martial arts. But he only had one man and one sword. And he had already taken the lead to break into the enemy group outside and could not be rescued in time. Although he kept slashing hard and killed many enemies. There was no way he could turn around and help in this situation. Ah! Get the age! Hell out of here! At the critical moment, Reva, who had been watching the battle, shouted loudly and rushed into the chaotic battlefield with dozens of bandits regardless. She still held an iron drill more than one meter long in her hand, and still wore the old leather armor. Behind him, there were still dozens of bandits with incomplete equipment and rags, but her violent screams echoed through the wasteland even covering up all the killing cries nearby. The people fighting on the sides were all stunned for a moment. No one expected that a woman could make such a roar. And the momentum with which she charged into the battle also amazed everyone. Everyone get out of here! Reva rushed into the crowd, roaring like a wild beast, and the iron drill in her hand danced wildly. A rogue knight slashed her shoulder with a sword, but then her iron drill was stabbed into her eye socket through the gap in her helmet. Then he kicked away the rogue knight's body, pulled out the iron drill, and continued running forward. This woman seemed to burst out with infinite power at this moment, and she completely ignored the sword swinging at her. No matter who attacked her, she would not dodge, but stabbed back directly with the iron pick. Many wounds soon appeared on her body, but at least seven or eight enemies were stabbed to death by her with an iron pick, and she never stopped taking a step. This madman-like fighting style caused her to suffer numerous injuries within tens of seconds, but for a while no one could stop this life-threatening female madman. In her own way, she blazed a bloody trail. That was the way out for Charles. This kind of madness without fear of life and death happens to be what the members of the Red Brotherhood fear the most. And it is also the reason why Reva can become the bandit leader as a woman. Her martial arts skills were far inferior to those of Charles. But her completely desperate performance at this time frightened those Red Brotherhood gangsters. A fearless leader is formidable. Even if it's a woman. Because this allows her people to know that on the battlefield, if you are not afraid of death, you will often not die. The bandits under Leva were roaring like her at this moment 
and charging towards an enemy that was several times their size. The pressure around Charles suddenly decreased, and many enemies turned to face Riva. There were also some enemies who avoided her direct front in fear. Charles saw Riva rushing towards him. He had cooperated with Riva to deal with Eldred under the arrangement of Leon. Of course, he recognized Riva and knew that she was one of his own. But he did not know that she was his sister. But perhaps because of the blood connection. When he saw Leva's fearless charge, he dropped the shield in his hand and gave up his defense. Then, like Riva, Charles roared back and charged in Riva's direction. He used the method of killing the enemy, the method of exchanging injuries for lives that Leon taught him, and the same method of charging into the formation as Leva now, and headed towards Leva. After paying the price of being bruised and bruised, Riva finally succeeded in leading a dozen of her men to stand beside Charles. The two siblings were standing back to back, covered in blood and crumbling. Come on! Come and kill me! Charles roared like a villain, and moved out step by step with Riva. But no enemy around them dared to get close again. At this time, Godric finally led the archers to kill the surrounding enemies, and rushed over to relieve the siege. The enemies were running away, and the people of the Red Brotherhood were already a little timid. But just when Charles turned around and planned to rush out of the siege with Godric, the woman he was leaning on fell down. Riva's leather armor couldn't protect her very well, and she suffered too many injuries. After the long journey, she couldn't rest for a moment, and she charged into the battle with all her strength. She spent all her life saving Charles. In other words, redeeming herself. Riva! What's wrong? God, don't sleep. Don't sleep. Charles picked up Riva in panic, but Riva had lost all her strength and the bloody iron drill fell from her hand and fell to the ground. Charlie, let's go quickly. Riva only said one sentence and then closed her eyes. This was the first sentence she said to Charles. Let's go. Don't stand there. Godric supported Charles and asked several bandits to lift the unconscious Riva and quickly left the battlefield. 